Lissa's Flight, The Sentience Wars, Origins, Book Three. Written by M.D. Cooper and James S. Aaron. Narrated by Laura Jennings. Chapter One. Stellar Date, 09.23.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, Heartbridge Corporate HQ, Raleigh. Region, High Terra, Earth, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. The polished ivory doors of the Heartbridge boardroom swung outward, releasing a group of scurrying assistants, most showing the flat, distant expressions that indicated link conversations. A rush of low voices and relieved laughter followed from inside as board members scraped back heavy chairs prior to exiting the room. Gerald Gallagher sat on a wooden bench against the anteroom wall, looking through the wall-to-ceiling windows at the flow of vehicles far below the boardroom's level. Hundreds of craft crossed the airspace above Raleigh, capital of Terra, like schools of flashing silverfish. When her boss, Arla Reed, strode through the boardroom doors, Gerald folded the leather portfolio in her lap and stood to walk alongside the tall, gray-haired woman. Jurl had been listening in on the board meeting via their private link channel, the typical reports across Hartbridge's many holdings between Terra, Mars, and locations in the Jovian Combine hadn't offered much new information. The absence of updates on several volatile projects had been the most interesting part of the meeting, and Jurl could tell from Arla's rapid stride that she was irritated. You reached Kraft? Arla asked. We've had a new problem. Forty minutes ago, we received a general distress signal from Clinic 46. Arla's jaw clenched, but she didn't respond. They left the anteroom and entered a corridor that connected two towers, clear walls on either side showing the spread of Raleigh to each horizon of the high Terran ring, with the green-brown surface of Earth a blur above them. The corridor ended at a maglev terminal where they entered a private car. Once they were settled, the maglev car dropped a hundred stories before sweeping away into the city. Jurel sat across from Arla, knees together, maintaining her composure as she passed the status update from Clinic 46. Normally, she would have taken time to sift through the raw data to prepare a report for Arla's review. The information had arrived during the board meeting, and no one else had mentioned it. Jurel felt reasonably safe the news hadn't yet leaked from their division. Thus far. When the corporate headquarters was ten minutes behind them, and sufficient quiet had taken over, Arla stretched her neck and looked at Jurel. Her hazel eyes flashed with subtle implants that Jurel only noticed because she knew they were present. Arla took a deep breath, setting her shoulders. In light of these developments, she said, are we ready to brief the TSF? Nothing's changed. Well, insofar as our presentation to the TSF is concerned, at least. Give the news another hour, and quite a bit is going to change. One of our remote test facilities sustained an attack from pirates. It's a common story. Jarl tried not to appear too sure of herself. Arla would ultimately want to think she had offered the reassuring words. It was Jarl's job to plant the seeds that allowed her boss to stand in front of the info services and look composed. Yarns is going to know better. Even if he doesn't have the report, he's going to ask us if we're stumbling. Heartbridge doesn't stumble, Jarl said. The expression of uncertainty on Arla's face passed. She met Jarl's gaze and nodded. Her boss would never thank her aloud, but the appreciation was apparent. The normal hawkish look returned to Arla's features as she drew her brows together. Jarl knew she was now focused on the upcoming meeting with the TSF colonel. The only thing Yarns is going to care about is the delivery test, Arla said. No matter what might be happening on 46, we can assure him the delivery won't change. He'll want to know how fast he can deploy his new system. He won't ask if we've also sold to the Marzians, but he'll want to know. Arla sighed, nodding. No, he won't. He doesn't have any balls. We really need someone else on the TSF side. Jarl immediately found herself thinking of Brigadier General Cade from the Mars Protectorate. She wasn't much better. Yarns is good at what he does, Jarl said. He understands their bureaucracy. He'll be a general in four years. 
He's going to be a player whether he deserves it or not. Kate isn't smart, but she drives her command with an iron fist. She gets things done. The clear walls of their car turned opaque as the maglev dropped underground. Gerald hoped the conversation wouldn't turn toward the outcome of a war between Terra and Mars. It was one of Arla's favorite conversations. Sometimes Jarl worried that Arla found the idea of initiating a war too profitable to avoid. The thought of a true war made Jarl think of her son, Bry, just old enough for TSF mandatory service, if he could pass the physical, which wasn't possible in his condition. Arla fell into her own thoughts, and Jarl didn't need to provide any additional information. The initial report from Clinic 46 had been followed by calm silence, as they had dealt with the attack. Strangely, they hadn't received any vid feed yet, only a single alert in the station's inventory system. The alert had indicated an inventory drop from 250, nearly the entire complement of weapon-borne AI, to only five already committed to long-range patrol. The information had to be a glitch, but the update hadn't arrived yet. If pirates had attacked the station, they would be after one of the fleet ships in dry dock orbit. There was no reason for any privateer to even approach the clinic when there were so many profitable targets floating in orbit. The security plan had always been to flood the space around the clinic with sea drones, which was a waste of weapon born as far as she was concerned. But it kept them busy. In this incident, there had been no follow-on response, and she hadn't been able to get an answer out of Cal Craft, who, according to his last location ping, was on station. Jarl had the fleeting thought that she hoped Kraft was all right, and then stopped herself, wondering if that was how she truly felt. She didn't think of Kraft as a good person. He accomplished tasks for Arla and others within Heartbridge, and she didn't want to delude herself that he was above murder. If he had died in this attack, it might be a good thing after all. Or it might be worse if someone new came along. There was always someone new willing to do this kind of work. In the boardroom, the executives had spoken of trends and percentages. In the meeting she and Arla were about to attend, they might discuss abstractions slightly closer to the truth, but still a truth communicated as numbers and project code names. People like Cal Craft dealt with the face to face reality of those abstractions. She often tried to tell herself that a seat hadn't been a person. It was a copy. The person could very well be alive now. And once the copy was made, they became separate beings. But others had died to create that technology. A long history that hadn't started with Heartbridge. And if Heartbridge hadn't taken up the torch, others would have. The technology demanded someone develop it. Better she work where she was, directing the people who made these decisions than someone worse, someone who didn't care about a war between Terra, Mars, humans, and AI. Only people who cared and stayed the course might be there at the critical times, when the smallest decisions might avert disaster. If she quit, who would take her place? She wondered for an instant how Bry might feel to become a weapon born, be freed of the body that seemed more caged than home. You're not listening, Arla said sharply. Jarl looked quickly at her boss, who was grinning at having caught her unaware. It didn't happen often. Thinking ahead, Jarl said. Sometimes I think you're looking too far ahead. It gets in your way. Pay more attention to now. I can do both, Jarl said, straightening with a little irritation in her voice. The maglev signaled it was about to reach its destination, then slowed to a stop in a terminal sheathed in marble tile. Arla stood and smoothed the front of her suit. They were met by a stiff TSF lieutenant, who told them the colonel was ready to see them now. He led the way down several corridors lined in more marble, and then through others paneled in what looked like real wood. They passed a few closed doors on their left or right, but no one came or went. The area was deserted, and their footsteps echoed off the walls. The lieutenant stopped in front of a door that looked no different than the others, and passed his security token with a hand wave. The door slid into the wall to leave them standing in the entrance to a room with two leather couches facing each other, a low table between them. The couches sat on a lush red carpet that stretched wall to wall. Gerald cycled her vision 
and saw that it was made of natural wool fibers. She shook her head in wonder as the lieutenant waved for Arla and Jarl to enter. Despite the finery, the most interesting thing in the room was Colonel Yarns of the TSF's 28th flight, Special Projects. He was a muscled man with a thick neck and thoughtful brown eyes. His nose was bent from having been broken at some point in the past and left conspicuously crooked. The effect made him look cruel, until he spoke with his warm voice. He rose from the left couch. Arla, he said, nodding. Jarl. Jarl had met him before, so his smooth voice didn't jar her. In another life, he could have been an actor. She couldn't help noticing the heavy pistol he wore in a low-slung thigh holster. The weapon seemed like a viper coiled on the coffee table. Colonel Yarns, Arla said. She shook his hand firmly, then moved to the seat on the opposite couch. Call me Rick, he said, please. Jarl shook Yarn's warm hand and sat beside her boss. Yarn signaled the lieutenant, who carried a coffee tray from a recessed bar in the wall and sat it on the table. Once that duty was complete, the lieutenant left the room. Rick sat and turned the tray once, so the cups that had been on Jarl's left were now on her right. He scowled at the tray as if he couldn't decide if it angered him or not, then lifted the carafe and filled the cups with rich-smelling coffee. He filled his own cup and sat on the couch opposite them. Arla smiled and picked up her cup to sip. This is good, Colonel. Thank you. Yarn's forehead twitched as he seemed to hold back another scowl at Arla's deliberate use of his title. He slurped his own coffee loudly and set the cup down. He put his hands on his knees and looked from Arla to Jarl. Anything interesting to report from your board meeting? He asked. Jarl studied his face, waiting for the question about Clinic 46. But his placid expression made the question seem innocuous. Prices are up, Arla said. Returns are up. We're seeing positive growth across all sectors, including our holdings in the JC. Some of those were speculative at best, but they seem to be bearing fruit. Good to hear, Yarn said. I think I've told you I'm not an investor but I have plenty of family who know Heartbridge is a strong bet. What did they used to say? A blue chip? Arla gave him a curved smile. What do you suppose that ever meant? You'd think it had something to do with gambling, Gerald said. Maybe they thought all business was some sort of poker game. I never was good at history, Yarn said. He slurped more coffee. When he set the cup down, he said, so, do you have my update? Jarl reached inside her portfolio and pulled out a portable holo projector the size of a large coin. She set it on the coffee table next to the service tray. She waved a hand over the coin to set her security status, including a local shield against any recording devices, then raised the display in the air between them. A standard model of the solar plane swam into focus, with the scattered disk a blue blur stretching out into the far reaches of the room. Gerald swooped the view over Terra, past Mars, then Ceres, and finally pulled outward. Everything shrank and a gray object came into focus. Faint blue lines showed the object's orbit and its distance from the closest major landmark, which happened to be Jupiter. Without stating the obvious, the location was firmly in territory outside direct control of Terra, Mars, or the JC. A sparkle orbiting the asteroid made Yarns frown and crane his neck. Observing the question on his face, Jarl said, There is no official astro marker for the location, if that's what you're wondering. Yarn shrugged. It looked familiar for a second. They all start to look the same after a while. Jarl nodded, not wanting to make him look ignorant. While most objects of sufficient mass had been mapped at some point, many had been ignored and lost over time when the economics of mining didn't pan out. With many millions of asteroids in the solar system, only an inflated sense of self-importance would make it possible to recognize any particular object. So, Gerald said, you've spotted one platform. There are actually 20 in the target area. Nineteen more sparks lit up in the air above their heads, forming a loose cloud stretching away from the asteroid. What's the point of having 20 of them out there? Yarn said. 
You already showed you can destroy a five-kilometer object. Hell, you could destroy Ceres or Eris at this point if you wanted to. That's not exactly hard to do, Jarl said. Gravity welds don't dodge very well. Yarns waved a hand. But you've got the firepower. You've demonstrated the autonomous system. I thought we were going to talk about price. Jarl glanced at Arla and saw a slight smile on her boss's lips. They'd never been going to talk about price, because the TSF would never be done paying. This goes beyond a simple autonomous system, Arla said. Yarns closed his mouth. Jarl highlighted the 20 AI drones and faint orange lines appeared between them, forming a net of loosely woven jewels. Another net appeared around the asteroid, this one marked in red. The latest upgrade allows distributed decision-making with direction from a single weapon born, Gerald said. Control can shift between any independent unit based on situational awareness or remain centralized. The glowing dot shifted and moved into a sort of dance around the asteroid. The orange sparks responded to the red, pulling away from the asteroid, adjusting their attacks into a series of complicated flanking maneuvers. The red dots fought back for a few seconds, but couldn't hold against the coordinated onslaught. In a few more seconds, each of the red sparks had been extinguished, and the orange network fell into a regularly spaced guard position over the asteroid. Yarn shrugged. So what? The simulation can fight itself. Jarl shifted the display to become a list of registry numbers and last known coordinates, which were all within the vicinity of one another. What you just watched was the destruction of a pirate armada that has been plaguing far shipping lanes outside Ganymede. Hartbridge is in the business of policing Outer Soul now? Yarns asked. We're in the business of verifying our systems, Arla said. This upgrade to the old system allows for greater command and control in dispersed engagements, Jarl said. The weapon born can still make decisions a magnitude faster than humans, or other embedded systems, and now they can do it as a hive mind. Yarns took another slurp of his coffee. I take it you didn't have this upgrade at Krunia. Jarl didn't look at Arla. She knew Yarns would be watching for her reaction. He reminded her more and more of a teenager, like one of her son's irritating friends. She made herself think something good about the colonel, so it would be easier to keep a relaxed expression. He had nice hair, she decided. The weapon born weren't deployed at Krunia, Gerald said. We'll be rolling it out to units in the field over the next ten days. The colonel nodded and leaned back in his seat, setting his coffee cup on his thigh and holding it there with two hands. His gaze grew distant as he appeared to take in the whole map floating between them. Terra and Mars glowing prominently blue-green in contrast to yellow-white soul. I was in a meeting with Catherine Carthage last week he said. You know she still thinks her son Kylan is alive. Kylan Carthage's death was regrettable, Gerald said quickly, practiced words coming easily. Yarns held up a hand. I know, rogue researchers, untested methods, third-party contractors. What was different this time was that she claims to have received messages from her son. Yarns looked at his coffee cup. I wouldn't assess Catherine Carthage as mentally unstable. I'm not a psychologist, but she's still got Carthage logistics in a tight grip. She showed several of these messages to the group and pointed out the bits of information that only Kylan would know. She also mentioned someone named Cal Craft. Does that name mean anything to you? Yarns looked directly at Jarl, his brown eyes now hard. Jarl maintained her pleasant expression wishing she had dropped the holo display immediately after she'd finished with the demonstration. It was distracting now. I can't answer with any certainty, Gerald said. I would have to check the personnel records. Of course, Yarn said. The problem with Carthage is that she has the clout to demand these inquiries, and the TSF isn't the only org that's been listening to her. She mentioned she also had meetings with the Marzian Protectorate's Office of Accountability, and the regime on Callisto. I guess you could say that she's not a fan. She received a settlement, Arla said. What else would she like, exactly? Jarl glanced at her boss. Arla wasn't a parent, 
so she could ask a question like that. Gerald could only imagine Catherine Carthage's pain. It was terrible enough to lose children, but the thought of a broken version of your son out there, trying to communicate, never allowing closure, was unthinkable. She pushed the thoughts away. Her job was to maintain composure and continue to develop cooperation with the TSF in support of the weapon-borne program, not imagine how Catherine Carthage felt. She wants justice, Yarn said. What else? I guess you can ask her how she defines the concept. But as long as something keeps trying to communicate with her, she won't go away. I don't know what kind of control you have over Kyle and Carthage, if any, but I'd suggest you do something about it. Yarns pointed at the display. All this stuff is great, don't get me wrong, but there are political ramifications to think about as well. Not everyone in command is as excited about the prospect of expanding the use of autonomous AI. There are plenty of big thinkers who view it as a threat. Any weapon is a tool, Gerald said. I know, Yarn said, cutting her off. That doesn't mean we continue to fund the research. The best leverage I have right now is that the MP is developing their own AI resources. That doesn't mean all of this won't end up in a vault somewhere following an inquiry of the assembly. Does that concern you? Arla asked. An inquiry? Yarn said. Not at all. I haven't done anything wrong. He flashed a crooked smile that looked like his attempt at menace. On his boyish face, it only made him look foolish. Jarl wondered how soon they could move on from Yarn's being their sole TSF contact. Apparently, Arlo was thinking the same thing. We want to move forward with a real-time demonstration, she said. We have a suitable location in Inner Soul. The colonel raised his eyebrows. With command? Of course, Arla said. You don't think we should let the Catherine Carthage situation breathe a little bit before we do that? You call them all together now, and that's going to be the first thing they'll want to talk about. It doesn't matter how great the tech is. They'll want the history of the program. Arla folded her hands in her lap. There is no concrete evidence connecting Hartbridge with the facility where Kylan Carthage died. And he is dead. If someone is playing a cruel joke on a bereft mother, we can't control that either. What we can do is continue to develop programs that provide for the safety and security of humanity. Gerald couldn't help but notice that no matter who they talked to, Arla always touted that they were helping humanity, even if that meant building up an arms race between factions. Yarn set his cup back on the table and spread his hands. That doesn't sound quite corporate enough. What we need is some kind of scale where you can weigh your bullshit against Catherine Carthage's face on the newsfeed and see which one comes out on top. Arla frowned. Durrell watched her closely, worried she was going to explode. You know what might solve the situation? Yarns asked. Let's say there is some version of Kylan Carthage out there, and the thing is, in fact, trying to contact its mother. Maybe you could put a stop to that. Then Catherine Carthage would stop demanding an inquiry from the Terran Assembly. Arla's face remained composed. Do you want to delay the test? Gerald asked. Arla smiled. We can't control every conspiracy theory and prankster in Seoul, she said. We need to move forward with the demonstration. Maybe some other entity can help Kate Carthage gain closure. Gerald deactivated the holo display and the glowing map blinked out. The room seemed small again. As they stood to leave, Yarns asked, Those pirates, how many ships were there? Twenty-two retrofitted freighters, Gerald said. The mix you would expect, but we assess their capability at parity with the Marzian attack squadron. Yarns blinked. Why didn't you say that earlier? We got sidetracked on something you seem to think is more important, Arla said. You need to send me those numbers, he said. Command is going to want to see this. Gerald smiled. Sending now, she said. As Gerald and Arla turned to leave the small room, Gerald received a secure connection request over her link. It was Yarns. Yes, she said, glancing back at him. Keep walking, please. I have something I want to ask you about. You know I'm not authorized to agree to anything back channel. Arla would have my head. 
I'm not interested in changing the deal. I don't really have a question. Jarl followed Arla into the corridor, where the lieutenant who had met them at the maglev was still waiting. He nodded. Luckily, Arla seemed lost in her own thoughts and didn't expect Jarl to walk and talk. Then what can I do for you, Colonel? I know you're aware that Hartbridge isn't the only firm developing AI. That's common knowledge. Of course. Well, we've become aware of something troubling. Another firm has been working on multinodal intelligence. The information I have suggests a 16-node base mind. Jarl wasn't a neuroscientist, but she understood enough about artificial intelligence to know that Hartbridge researchers had sought to sidestep nodal artificial intelligence by mapping existing neurons, hence the term seeds. Other researchers had been working on pure AI for centuries, and mostly failing, except for the massive projects that had resulted in the AI that managed facilities like High Terra and Mars One. Whether AI tied to specific roles were truly sentient had been debated for decades, just as the sentience of the weapon born had been questioned by scientists on Hartbridge's many teams. Jarl was no expert, but she likened these debates to human IQ tests, ultimately just dick measuring that didn't account for reality. That's very interesting, Colonel. Where did you hear about this? It doesn't matter how or where I heard about it. The issue is that the test mind is no longer controlled by its creators. It escaped. Escaped? From where? Jarl asked, doing her best to sound naive. She wasn't sure if Yarns was lying or using half-truth to plant a sliver in her mind. They arrived at the maglev platform, just as the car was hissing to a stop in front of them. The lieutenant stepped to the side and nodded as Arla and Jarl passed him. Good day, he said. Good day, Jarl answered, trying not to allow her frustration with Yarns to show on her face. I need more information if you want me to learn anything, Gerald said over her link quickly. All I have is a name. I'm getting in the car with Arla now. What is it? Alexander, Yarn said. I'll be in touch about the demonstration date. Gerald sat opposite Arla as the maglev's door slid closed, sealing them inside. What's bothering you? Arla asked as the car slipped into motion. Gerald stretched her neck consciously removing the irritation from her expression. Working with yarns is like trusting a teenager with a plasma pistol. You know something's going to end up with a big hole in it. Arla gave her a smile. Yes, but at least you know what he's thinking most of the time. I appreciate that, at least. Jarl nodded as the car sped back into daylight, high-rise buildings with shining windows flashing on either side of the rail. That's true. She agreed, but thought, until they do something that surprises you, and things start to explode. Chapter 2. Stellar Date 09.23.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Sunny Skies. Region. Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Andy hit the inside wall of Sunny Skies airlock hard with his shoulder. He rolled the face out as the exterior door slid closed, cutting off the vacuum outside. Atmospheric controls hissed around him, and his stomach flipped as he adjusted to the gravity of the ship's habitat ring. Heartbridge had Tim. Lissa, he shouted over his link, breath ragged in his ears as he struggled to get his helmet off. Why did you cut off the point defense cannons? You let them get Tim. I saved him, the AI answered. He wasn't going to survive any longer in vacuum. He had his helmet on. I was almost there. You weren't, Andy. Andy pulled off his helmet and threw it against the wall. He clenched his fists, not wanting to turn around and face Kara and Britt on the other side of the interior doors. Andy focused on what he knew. Tim was alive. He was on the Hartbridge shuttle moving back to Clinic 46. Andy couldn't change that, but he could go get his son. He was going to need firepower. You all right? Fran asked over their private channel. No. Andy hit the airlock controls, and the interior door slid open. Before he could say more to Fran, Britt confronted him from the opening. Where is he? She demanded. Andy pushed past her, but she caught his arm. Andy, she said. What happened? Where's Tim? 
He's on Hartbridge's shuttle. I saw them pick him up. He's alive. Her fingers dug into the light armor on his upper arm. Why did you come back? Why didn't you go after them? Andy faced her, a rush of anger overcoming him. With what, Brit? Armor not designed for vacuum and a pulse pistol? We've still got three drones attacking the ship. Did you forget about that? Why did Fran shut down the point defense cannons? She didn't, Andy said. Lissa did. Kara stood beside her mother, face streaked with tears. Lissa, she demanded. Why did Lissa do that? She thought she had to in order to save Tim. I didn't think it, Andy. He was going to die. Andy stared at Britt, Lissa's interjection scattering his thoughts. He shook his head. Tim's out there, he said. He's alive. We need to go get him. Who's Lissa? Britt asked, looking back and forth between Kara and Andy. Fran, Andy said. Are you tracking the shuttle? They're on a vector for the station. I shut down two of the weapon-borne drones attacking us. We're down to one, but it's doing a good job staying in our dead zone. I'll have it in a few more minutes. Andy didn't ask how she had managed to subdue the other weapon-borne. He couldn't stop thinking about Tim floating away from him. How much damage have we taken? He asked. I'm going to need time to assess. The drive is in good shape, but I think the main sensor array took a hit, or two, I'm getting a lot of static in the holo display. Andy took a step toward Kara and pulled her into a hug, smoothing her hair down. She buried her face in his side, pressing her cheek against the armor. He found himself looking at M, the corgi puppy, who was sitting just down the corridor, one ear cocked. The puppy might have been smiling, but seemed to sense something was wrong with the humans. It's going to be all right, Andy said, kissing the top of her head. We're going to get him. How? Britt demanded. We've got their AI, but they're still sitting on a fleet, and you haven't told me who Lissa is. Is she up there with Fran? Sorta. Andy frowned. A fleet? What are you talking about? All the ships they've got in orbit around their rock. Didn't you pick them up when you came in? They're all out there in storage. I haven't had time to look, Andy said. Have they got personnel on their station to pilot them? Britt shrugged. Not that I saw. So they're not manned. There's at least one attack cruiser, Britt said. I saw the signature. They might try to call it a hospital ship, but that cruiser had more mass than most asteroids. Andy gave Kara a final squeeze and let her go. I'm going to the command deck. If those ships are out there, I want a better look. We're going to need weapons to get Tim back. You're attacking their clinic? Britt said. I'll do what I have to, Andy said. Come on, Kara. He turned away from Britt and walked down the corridor, ignoring the bodies of mercenaries on the floor and the burned plaz walls. I'm coming, Dad, Kara called. He glanced back to see her jogging after him with M in her arms. Britt was still standing at the airlock, staring at him. Every minute he spent on the ship was more time for Kraft to harm Tim. Andy put that fact to the side and considered everything around it. Kraft had picked him up. Saving him. Why had he done that? How? Lissa, he said. How did you get Kraft to pick up Tim? Are you ready to listen to me? Andy ran a hand through his hair, momentarily considering how odd it was that the person he was talking to was underneath his hand. Just tell me how you did it. I convinced his AI to help. I got her to see through her instructions to find a way to help Tim, and she did. You spoke to their AI? That's what I just said. Lissa's tone was dry. Are you still talking to her? She hasn't responded to me since Calcraft came back on board. Their vector will get them back to the station in approximately one hour. Andy could tell that Lissa was frustrated and more than a little worried. At least she felt bad about what was happening to Tim. Can you see if Tim's all right? I don't have access to their systems. If Kraft hadn't made the decision to save Tim, then he couldn't be trusted not to harm him in the meantime. Any minute now, they would get a call with a ransom demand. Kraft would want to trade Tim for the AI seeds Britt had stolen. Andy drew a deep breath, then nodded to himself. That's what he would do. He reached the command deck and walked through the open door. He was still lost in his thoughts when Fran caught him in a hug that nearly knocked him over. 
Andy stood stunned for a second before returning the embrace. He kissed her hair, and she pulled her head away and kissed him hard on the lips, wrapping her arms around his neck. Em barked, but Fran ignored the dog, pulling him deeper into her kiss. When Andy finally came up for air, he looked around the command deck, blinking, to see Kara staring at them from the doorway with raised brows. Britt stood behind their daughter, her expression confused. She looked from Andy to Fran, and then at Kara, and something like fear entered her eyes. She shook her head. Well, she said. She raised a hand, half pointing, then let it drop and walked past the entrance. Fran relaxed her arms around Andy's neck, but didn't let go completely. Ugh, she said. I guess I knew she was aboard, but I just didn't care. She glanced at Kara. Sorry, kid. Andy put his hands on Fran's waist and pushed her away gently, giving her a slight smile. Thanks for that, he said. You mean fucking things up with your wife? No, the hug. That was good. I needed that. Fran let her hands slide to his shoulders and patted his chest before stepping away. She waved at the hollow display. See the static I was talking about? I'm picking up returns all around the station that weren't there before. Apparently, it's not static, Andy said. There's a fleet out there in cold storage. If you say so, I still want to get a look at the sensor array. Did you kill that last drone yet? It pulled back just after I talked to you. Looks like it's headed back to their station. I don't know if that's good or bad. Andy slid into his pilot's seat and pulled up the smaller astrogation controls. He tried not to think about Britt or Tim. He needed to make a plan. Maneuver sunny skies and close to the station and breach? He couldn't risk the ship. If he was going to be smart, he would pull back, give himself standoff distance. But he didn't have time. Hartbridge was going to call in reinforcements, or they were going to hurt Tim. Why hadn't Kraft called with a ransom demand yet? Andy needed to know that Tim was all right. He needed to know that Kraft was going to act rationally. Once Kraft made his demands, they might not have time to move on one of the Hartbridge ships. Andy needed to move now. He activated the shipwide audio channel. Brit, he said. I need you back up here. I need to know where this ship is you were talking about. I'm still here, Brit answered, reappearing in the doorway. I didn't go anywhere. She walked into the command deck looking composed and went straight to the communications console. If you do a review by mass, you should be able to find the densest ships. Those are the military types. We're going to need schematics, Fran said. You don't have time to waste on a wild goose chase. Britt shot a hard glance at the engineer, but only nodded curtly in agreement. Once we have better returns, we can run some pattern matching for schematics, Andy said. Can you try to ping their registries and see if anything comes up? Doing it, Fran answered. What happened to this console? Britt complained. Nothing is where it should be. Things change in two years, Andy said. That's Kara's workstation. She can explain it. Britt continued trying to use the console for another minute before looking up in obvious frustration. Kara, she said, are you going to help? Kara glanced at Andy, then put M down and walked over to the communications console. Britt moved out of the way and let her sit. M followed Kara and sat next to her leg. Britt eyed the puppy suspiciously. Why the hell do you have a dog? She said. He's Tim's dog, Kara said, her tone defensive. We've got registry returns coming back in, Fran said. She whistled. Whew. This would make the TSF proud. They're all heavier than transport freighters or hospital ships. How did they think this would look normal? Nobody knows this place is here, Andy said. It's been sitting off the shipping route for years. Space is too damn big, Fran said. She leaned closer to her display, squinting. This one looks good. I'm showing multiple weapon systems just on the external sweep. It's a gunship, and it's relatively close. We can be there in 45 minutes. Let's move, Andy said. Send me the location. When the target appeared on his display, Andy quickly mapped the mothballed ship's orbit around the station and planned a series of short bursts of thrust that would lead to an intercept. Did we get a name from the registry? He asked. Came back as the forward kindness. Andy shook his head. 
Heartbridge in their names. He tapped his console and executed the first burst of thrust. A feeling of weight pressed on his shoulders as the ship responded. They were 30 seconds into the maneuver when an audio channel crackled alive and Fujia Wang's voice berated him from the speaker. Captain Sykes, is that you? Are we done being boarded? Or am I talking to some pirate mercenary right now? Andy smirked. You know it's me, or you wouldn't be giving up your presence on the ship. Are you all right? Some warning before you start changing velocity would be nice. I spilled my tea. That sounds terrible. Is the senator in one piece? She says she's having fun. That's great to hear. What does her bodyguard know about power armor? That's a strange question, Captain Sykes. We're going to breach the Heartbridge Clinic. I need everyone who can fight. Fujia's voice went up an octave. We're doing what? Cal Craft has my son. How did you allow that to happen? Andy nearly punched the console. He held his fist in front of the display, reminding himself that if he needed Senator Walton's bodyguard, this wasn't the way to get him. We can't outrun Hartbridge this time. We need to cut them off here. You have missiles, yes? Move to a standoff distance and attack. It's easy. Ships move faster than stations. Captain Sykes, you're forgetting that I need to get Senator Walton to Callisto. I don't have time for excursions. And I certainly don't have room in my plan for the loss of my ship's pilot. Look, we have a problem. The mercenaries who raided the ship have my son, Tim. We're picking up some extra firepower, and then we're going to get him back. The line went quiet for a second, except for a pulsing crackle of static that Andy would wager was the result of Kara's flower fire. Finally, Fujia said, You're going to get him back? What does that mean exactly? It means I'm going to find some power armor, which I'm pretty sure is sitting on one of the ship's heartbridge has in storage, and I'm going to tear that station apart until I find Tim. How long has it been since you operated power armor? It's like riding a bike. I have help. Help from who? Britta's on board. My... He almost said wife, which wouldn't have been wrong, but didn't feel like the right thing to say. The kid's mother. She has the same TSF experience that I do. So two of you against a station? The ship executed the second maneuver, pushing Andy forward in his seat. From the comms console, Brit asked, Who is this person? She sounds familiar. The static's making it hard to hear her. Who am I? Fujia demanded. You hold tight, Captain Sykes. I'm getting Senator Walton situated, and then I'm coming up there. That sounds great, Andy said. He switched off the audio channel. Chapter 3, Stellar Date 09.23.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Outside the Sunny Skies, Region, Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Glowing icons swam across the HUD inside Calcraft's helmet, showing him Clinic 46, the nearby drones, and the shuttle looming larger in front of him. His velocity had exceeded the safe range of his EV suit, and red warning bars flashed on either side of his vision. Sandra, the shuttle's onboard AI, was making the final velocity adjustments that would place them on a collision course. A hammer hit him in the chest as his suit's attitude thrusters spat steam, slowing him down, matching his velocity with the shuttle so he didn't smash into it like an egg. The shuttle became visible at approximately 500 meters, a gray shape with brilliant points of white light at its nose and tail. Final braking maneuver in 30 seconds, Sandra said. I am in position with the main bay door open to receive you. You will need to move quickly to avoid follow-on debris. Follow-on debris? Cal said. Did they fire a missile at me? I don't have sufficient information, Sandra said. She sounded almost stressed or upset, a note he hadn't heard in her voice before. The bay door on the side of the shuttle slid open, showing him the well-lit interior. Details grew sharper as he approached. His suit spat another thrust of steam, and he slowed considerably. It still hurt when he impacted the interior wall of the shuttle, scraping his shins against a bench seat. But the ballistic armor absorbed most of the force. Move away from the door, Sandra commanded, her voice high with strain. Cal kicked toward the front of the shuttle. A second after he cleared the space, what looked like an empty EV suit struck the wall where he had just been. 
The arms and legs floated loosely as the helmet cracked against the alloy bulkhead. Sandra closed the shuttle door before the suit could rebound back into space. What are you doing? Cal demanded. Did they load a bomb in the suit? As he grabbed at the pistol on his hip, the suit floated in the middle of the shuttle bay, rotating so he saw the face inside its battered helmet. Cal stared, realizing he was looking at Andy Sykes' kid, but not understanding how he could have come in behind him. Cal hadn't ever expected to see him again. The kid hadn't sealed his helmet in the airlock. He should be dead. Granted, he didn't look good. Capillaries in his skin had burst, making his face look bruised and splotchy. Did you do this? He asked Sandra. How did he stay so close to me? His suit emergency control system activated and appears to have fixed on our registry beacon, Sandra said, voice still sounding high. Cal shoved his pistol back in its holster and kicked toward the kid. He grabbed the suit so they both floated toward the rear of the shuttle and lifted him so he could stare through the boy's face shield. The kid's eyes were barely open and his breath fogged the inside of the helmet, indicating a leak somewhere. Open the bay door, Cal commanded. Deactivating environmental controls, Sandra responded, allowing for pressure equalization. Hurry up. Secure all personnel, Sandra ordered. Cal grabbed a dangling safety strap from the wall and clicked its hook onto his suit's harness, hanging onto the kid with his other hand. Behind the boy, the bay door opened to show a black square of space. Cal held the kid up, ready to shove him outside the shuttle. The remaining atmosphere blew out, pulling Cal against the safety strap, and the jerking motion seemed to shock the kid. His eyes opened wide, staring straight into Cal's face. I did it, the kid shouted, voice high and tinny through his helmet speakers. I blew out my breath and I got the helmet on. I got the helmet on. Two spots of color appeared on the kid's cheeks. Before Cal could stop him, the kid grabbed the front of his harness, gripping the material through his sleeve, even though his hands didn't reach his suit's gloves. I caught you, the kid shouted. I'm gonna tell my dad. The words, I got my helmet on, bounced inside Cal's head, reminding him of the desperate whoop for joy he'd made when he had been just about this kid's age and had survived the same ordeal. Cold radiated through Cal, pulling him back into the memory of the bodies blowing out of the airlock with him. Soul raging overhead, and the feeling when he grabbed the helmet out of the dead boy's hands and pulled it over his own head, knowing he was going to live. Cal frowned, looking at the kid, who was now fumbling with his other hand for a better grip on the front of Cal's suit. He looked ridiculous with the gloves flopping back from where his hands actually were in the bulky sleeves. But the kid didn't let that stop him. Cal would have to shoot him to get him free. Close the door, he told Sandra. He turned, moving the kid with him, and pushed him against the shuttle's wall to clip him in place with one of the safety straps. Hey, the kid shouted. He stopped trying to grab Cal's harness and reached for the small of his back where the strap was attached. Sit still, Cal said. How long until we're back at the station? He asked Sandra. One hour. Pull the drones back to provide covering fire. Captain Sykes probably doesn't know we have his kid, so we might send some missiles our way. Communications traffic indicates he knows, and we're down to one drone. Really? Cal glanced at the kid, who was still trying to grab at the clip. His control in zero G was impressive. If the strap had any more slack, the kid would have gotten free. Get that kid a suit that fits and a pulse rifle, and he'd decimate a squad in EV. Thinking about the kid attacking a squad reminded him of the group he'd led onto the worry's end. Give me a status update on our units on the worry's end and any activity in local space, he told Sandra. There are no active life signs among the units that bordered the worry's end. Damn, Cal thought. Too bad about Gibbs. Sandra continued. I only show registry pings for the worry's end and station shuttle 26-12. That's the shuttle Brit Sykes stole? I confirm. She cut it loose. Cal pondered why that could be. That's interesting. I show bio signs. Do you want me to attempt control of the system? Sure, Cal said. On the off chance it still had the seeds aboard, it would be quite the coup. Do that. 
Cal kicked over next to the kid. Hey, he shouted, getting the kid's attention. The kid looked up with frustration rather than fear on his face. What's your name? My name is Tim. Tim Sykes? Yes. We're going back to my station, Tim Sykes. You do what I tell you, and I won't put you out an airlock. You understand me? Are you taking me back to my dad? Not right now. If I read your dad right, he's going to come to you. I regret to inform you that Shuttle 26-12 just docked with the worry's end, Sandra said. I only gained control of one interior sensor. Patrell Doolin is aboard, as well as the seed canisters Brit Sykes stole. That was interesting. Why wouldn't Brit Sykes have taken her cargo on board the worry's end with her? Why leave it vulnerable until now? All of them? He asked. I can only verify the presence of the canisters, not its contents. Of course not. Brit Sykes had boarded while he and Gibbs had been in the middle of breaching the worry's end, so it made sense that she wouldn't have allowed Kylan to board with her. Didn't need him moping around in the middle of a firefight. Will we trade Tim Sykes for the seeds? Cal smirked. Aren't you mischievous, Sandra Shuttle? You need to think a few more steps ahead. Answer me this. If Petrell is on board, why can't you talk to Kylan? He refuses my communication requests. You think you're scaring him away, or has he finally grown a backbone? I don't have that information. For a second, Cal wondered if Sandra might be lying to him. The presence of the kid on the shuttle still didn't make complete sense to him. The Sykes boy had gone out the airlock first, sure. But Cal was heavier and might have kicked out harder, creating more velocity. But it still seemed too much of a lucky coincidence for the kid. Interior atmosphere normalized, Sandra announced. Cal pulled off his helmet and took a deep breath. The air was cold and metallic tasting. Hey, he said. Tim, take off your helmet. The air is back on. The kid stopped trying to reach the strap and looked at Cal, then shook his head violently. Cal smirked. Whatever, kid. I wouldn't trust me either. He pulled himself back to the bench opposite Tim and hooked himself in place, drifting down to the seat. He watched Tim continue to reach for the strap, showing no sign of giving up. How old are you? Cal asked. Ten. You small for ten. Are you sick? I'm not sick. But you've spent your whole life on that ship, haven't you? You ever been on a planet? I've been to Hytera and the M1R. Those aren't planets. Those are rings. Planets have gravity. It's like wearing a suit made of concrete. You'd know if you'd been on a planet. I know what planets are. I know more about planets than you do. Cal sat back and hooked his thumbs in his harness. What's our ETA to the station? he asked Sandra. 37 minutes. Andy Sykes hadn't tried to contact him yet. He was either tearing himself inside out at his son's death and plotting revenge, or planning an attack. Britt Sykes had already been on the clinic, so she would have a good idea of the defensive capabilities, although she hadn't seen the platoon of mechs in storage outside the command deck. He could pull back the weapon-borne seeds currently in the attack drones and put them in the mechs, he could keep those drones attacking the worries in to limit their options, if they tried to leave the ship and have the on-station security control the mechs remotely. Humans weren't as good as seeds, but they could get the job done. That would provide him with final defenses if the Sykeses did somehow breach the clinic. His only real task was to hold out until reinforcements arrived. He couldn't see the Sykeses trying to destroy the station if they knew Tim was alive and on board so a message now would buy him more time. It would also give him a chance to gauge Andy Sykes' mental state. Cal thought about what he might say to get under the captain's skin. Tim had given up trying to reach the strap and now floated, staring at him. What are you looking at? Cal asked. You. I suppose you're feeling lost and confused right now. Isn't that how kids feel in these situations? I want my dog. Cal raised his eyebrows. You have a dog? He's not bad luck. I didn't say he was bad luck. You should listen when people talk. That's when everyone says, take your helmet off. I can barely hear you. The kid glowered at him. I guess you take after your mother, Cal said. I hate my mom. Don't say that, kid. You're lucky to have one. 
Tim grunted obstinately. Cal checked the time to docking. They still had four minutes. You know, I don't like kids. I thought humanity had moved past dealing with little shits like you. I'm not a little shit. You're acting like one. You threw me out an airlock. I just opened the airlock, and you survived, so call it a developmental experience. The kid glared at him, and Cal gave him a smirk, enjoying the exchange more than he'd expected. It reminded him too much of the way miners had talked to each other when he was Tim's age. Gruff ribbing that often did end in someone getting thrown out an airlock. I didn't think you were actually going to die, kid, Cal said. Tim's gaze went to the floor, looking sad. I saw my dad's face. He thought I was going to die. I thought I was going to die. Did you? What did you think about that? I didn't like it. Good, you shouldn't. Tim pressed his lips together in a hard line that made his whole face dark. His gaze rose to Cal's face. My dad's going to kill you. Cal watched the kid's face shift through trembling emotions, from what looked like terror to anger and determination. Cal thought about the last person he'd shot, the crewman on the mortal chance, a teenager with blonde hair. He'd barely come into view and then he was gone. A problem solved. Cal hadn't given the action a second thought until the other crew member had thrown a fit about it. What was her name? He couldn't remember. Was Andy Sykes a killer? Cal hadn't thought of him as anyone dangerous, but the former TSF pilot had proved otherwise first by taking on Riggs, Zanda, and his crew of Weapon Born, then by decimating Cal's breaching squad. He'd also escaped half the Mars One guard with a kid and a dog. That kind of luck was too dangerous to last. Not if I kill him first, kid. Tim released an awkward shriek and kick toward Cal, arms windmilling. The strap caught him and he jerked back against the wall, smacking his helmet and shoulder on the bulkhead. When he settled back down, Chest trembling with sobs, Tim's face was covered in tears. Cal watched him, no longer smiling. He could appreciate the kid's rage, but wasn't sure how to use it right now. You can't wipe your snotty nose with that helmet on, Cal said. Tim slumped in the seat, helmet hanging low so Cal could no longer see his face. Cal chuckled and crossed his arms, considering options and following up moves. What Andy Sykes did next would decide much of his future tactics. Cal's money was on some sort of plea for a trade. We there yet? He asked Sandra after a while. He could have checked, but what was the point of having AI if they didn't perform menial tasks to make life simpler? Making final maneuvering adjustments now. We will dock at the command section airlock. Cal considered telling her to dock in the lower fleet section of the station, but at this point, the administrative commander would be expecting him. He didn't want to be seen as avoiding the station rats. That's fine. Tell them I want to address the on-duty command shift. Message sent. Cal chewed his lip, watching Tim hang motionless against the security strap. The kid was throwing a fit. Cal could practically feel the rage radiating from the little body in the ill-fitting spacesuit. Cal had no doubt that, given the chance, Tim would shove the muzzle of a pulse pistol in his eye and pull the trigger until Cal's head exploded. Cal could appreciate the feeling. That kind of anger in a kid could be put to use, shaped even. Cal hadn't yet had the chance to meet a weapon-born seed before they were scanned, as the researchers called the procedure. But this kid seemed like a perfect candidate to him. Good, he said. And Sandra. Tell the research station I want an orderly team to meet us at the airlock. I've got a new subject for their review. Chapter 4. Stellar Date 09.23.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Sunny Skies. Region. Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Though Fujia Wang barely stood at chest level to Kara's dad, the small woman seemed to tower above everyone on the command deck as she pointed an angry finger at each of them in turn. Kara couldn't help thinking Fujia looked like a warrior, even without weapons or armor. Senator Walton and her bodyguard Harl Nine stood just behind Fujia Wong. Nines maintained a protective posture toward the senator, but had a bemused expression as he glanced at Wong, 
like she was surprising him for the hundredth time. Fujia Wang's voice vibrated with anger. We have a mission, Captain Sykes. This is bigger than any of us. We can't waste time going back to that clinic. We have an opening now and we need to take it. Kara looked from her mom, who had crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow, to her dad, whose fingers were digging into the armrests on his pilot's chair like he was going to split the alloy. Are you being serious? Andy said. She thinks she is, her mom said. Kara found herself watching her mom, fascinated by all the details that had grown fuzzy with time. With her raven-colored hair cut short and spiky, wearing light armor that resembled a beetle's iridescent carapace, Kara had to admit her mom looked totally badass. She stood with one hip cocked to the side, making the heavy pistol hanging from her belt impossible to ignore. Her mom was a walking threat. Kara looked at her dad again, wondering how they had ever been in love. Not that her dad looked weak. It was just that when she thought of feelings of safety, affection, hugs, dependability, those feelings came from her dad. Her mom might have meant safety if she had stuck around, but she hadn't. She reminded Kara of a blade, sharp, precise, brittle, always waiting to serve its purpose, to cut. How had Britt ever wanted to be a mother? We're getting Tim back, her dad said. If you want to commandeer one of the other Heartbridge ships, I won't stop you. You won't stop me? Fujia's black eyebrows worked like she thought she was surrounded by idiots. I'm not a pilot, Captain Sykes. I don't have a pilot with me. You've got a container full of sentient AI who can probably pilot anything you plug them into, her dad said. They'll get you to Callisto. The situation has changed, Ms. Wong. You can adjust or you can go your own way. You agreed to transport us to Callisto, Fujia said. Her dad rubbed his head. Honestly, I'm feeling a little foggy right now. I don't know what I agreed to do. What I do know is that if you stand in my way, it's not going to end well for you. Are you threatening me? Fujia asked. Andy sighed and rubbed the side of his face. How close are we, Fran? He asked. Forty minutes. Where's the Heartbridge shuttle with Tim? It's halfway there. They boosted hard. Fran checked a few other screens on her display. And we've got a docking request. Somebody named Kylan is asking permission to dock at the habitat ring. That's my shuttle, Britt said. You have another 200 seeds? Fujia asked. Britt shrugged. Something like that. I didn't do a precise inventory. Lissa's voice came from the overhead speakers. There are 242 weapon-borne seeds aboard the shuttle, counting Kylan Carthage. Who is that? Who are you? Britt asked, looking about the room. How many people are there on this ship? Lissa's an AI, Andy said. She's with me. With you, Britt asked. Kara saw her father lock eyes with her mom, and then after a moment, Britt nodded. She wondered if her father had told her mom where Lissa truly resided. Just so I'm clear, you have Catherine Carthage's son on your shuttle, her dad said after a moment. Britt nodded. That's a lot of weapon born. Andy said. He looked at Fujia. How many does Heartbridge have altogether? Fujia shrugged. We don't know exactly. We believe the program has been in operation for 10 years at least. They went into production not long after your raid on 8221. There are weapon born all throughout Seoul. So you've got a couple hundred more, Andy said. More reason for you to get on a ship and get out of here. You're forgetting about the AI in your head, Captain Sykes. Are you coming with me, Lissa? Andy said. Kara looked at the speaker in the ceiling, as if it were Lissa's face. I'm coming, the AI said. I want to help Tim. Andy clapped his hands together. There it is. Are you going to help us? I'm sure I can find another set of power armor for Mr. Nines there. He looks like he's operated a mech or two in his life. Her dad nodded toward the bodyguard. What do you say? Nines stared at him, then glanced at Mae Walton. She nodded. I'm letting Brit shuttle dock, Fran said, since none of you seem to want to make a decision. I thought we made that decision already, Andy said. Fran shot him an arch look. You got distracted. Kara watched Fran enter the release codes in her console. A series of indicators flashed yellow, then green, as the shuttle docked successfully. 
I'm going to go meet him, Kara's mom said. Kara, you coming with me? Kara looked at her dad for permission, and he nodded. Bring him up here, he said. I'd like to meet Kylan after all this time. He's a hoot, Britt said, voice heavy with sarcasm. She waved for Kara to follow and walked around Harl Nines to go out the command deck door. Kara, her dad called. Kara glanced back. Yes? You did good at the airlock. You did the best you could. Kara stared at him, not sure what to say. We're going to get Tim back. Kara swallowed, nodding. When she stood, M immediately hopped up from where he had been lying with his chin on his paws. Kara felt irritated at first by the way the dog watched her, then ignored him and focused on following her mother, who was walking so fast she was already out of sight. The puppy sprinted behind her and tripped over the door, nearly rolling between Kara's feet into the hallway. Oh, come on, Kara said. She bent to pick him up and jogged after her mom. M licked Kara's face as she hurried past the hydroponic garden in the day room. Mom, Kara called. Wait up. Hurry up, Kara. I'm not walking that fast. Kara passed the burnt section of the bulkhead and readied herself for the bodies lying on the floor near the airlock, which she knew were still there. When she rounded the corner to spot the airlock, she found her mom pulling a dead woman by the arms to lay her next to another of the dead mercenaries. Britt straightened and shook out her arms. We're going to need to get them into the reclaimer before they stiffen up too much. Rigor mortis, Kara said. She set Im down and he stayed huddled next to her feet, sniffing the air suspiciously. That's what it's called, Britt said. You learn that from the database? I saw other dead people on Krunya, Kara said. Britt looked at her abruptly. She stepped away from the bodies on the floor and faced Kara, spreading her hands. I guess you did, she said. I'd like to give you a hug. Kara nodded, but pointed at the corpses. I'm not walking any closer to them, though. Britt gave her a half smile and walked toward her, pulling Kara into a stiff hug. Kara pressed her cheek against the cool black armor, wishing she could feel her mother on the other side. Behind them, the airlock hissed and the interior door slid open. Kara gave her mom another squeeze, then turned her face toward the airlock. Her mouth fell open as she saw Patrell Doolin step into the corridor. Patrell! Kara shouted. She let go of her mom and ran toward the tall woman, now wearing a bulky blue ship suit that seemed like the last thing Kara would have imagined Patrell to choose for herself. Were you captured? Kara asked words running together. How'd you get off the ring? Did the guard get you? Are you all right? Petrel just stared at her, not answering. Something about Petrel seemed off. She slouched, arms hanging like dead weights. As Kara got closer, she realized Petrel's face was slack, her eyes lacking the wit and quick intelligence that made her so intriguing. I'm Kylan, Petrel said in a dull voice. Petrel isn't she isn't here right now. Kara stopped short. What? She frowned. I don't understand. Is this a test? Are you acting? Patrell shook her head. I'm not acting. I'm Kylan. Kara took a step back. What did you do to Patrell? Where is she? She's here, Kylan said, looking pained. He tapped the side of his head. She can't come out right now. Britt put her hand on Kara's shoulder as she came up from behind. You know Patrell? She asked. Yes, Kara nearly shouted, frustration and sadness rising inside her. It didn't make sense that Patrell might be saved but not be herself. It seemed like an extra cruelty. It was something an evil man like Calcraft would do. She still wasn't sure that Patrell wasn't testing her somehow a final check on her ability to become an operator, to recognize a situation and exploit it, just like Patrell had told her to do back on the ring. Kara looked closer at Patrell, Kylan, trying to recognize all the differences between the woman in front of her and the woman she remembered. She was amazed at how different Patrell looked, almost like she had been deflated and then half-filled again. Patrell was truly Kylan now, a slouching boy. 
let her out, Kara said. Kylan shrugged. I can't, he said. Kara surged forward, shoving Kylan against the airlock. Let her out. You can do it. Lissa didn't take over my dad. She's in there with him. You can let Patrell out. It's not like that, Kylan said, clutching his ribs. It's not the same. It can only be one or the other of us. If I let her out, she'll... I don't know what she'll do. You're worried about yourself, not her, Kara said. You're in her body. It doesn't matter what happens to you. He looked at her miserably. I didn't ask for this. I deserve to live too. Kara, Britt said. Give him space. He did help me when I was on the clinic. He was probably helping himself. He wanted to get away from Calcraft as much as anyone would. It wasn't like that, Kylan said. Enough, Britt said. We need to get the container with the AI on board Sunny Skies. Fujia Wong said there are others. Where do they put them? They're in the safe room, Kara said, still scowling at Kylan. On the other side of the garden. Britt nodded. That's a good hiding spot. She motioned for Kylan to get out of the way and activated the airlock. When the doors slid open, her mom stepped quickly into the shuttle and called for Kara to follow her. Kylan stayed in the corridor as Kara followed. M sniffed the air from the shuttle, then decided to remain behind. Help me lift this, Britt said, positioning herself at one end of a thick plas crate. Kara took the opposite set of handles. When her mom told her to lift, she struggled with her end of the crate. She thought it was going to be too heavy until she managed to bend her knees and lift. Together, they carried the crate back into the corridor. Kylan. Britt commanded. Take the other side and help Kara. I don't want his help, Kara said. Kylan, Britt said, ignoring her. Take that handle. Kara, you let go. You aren't strong enough to carry it on your own. Tears stung Kara's eyes. Why did her mom have to be so gruff? She'd been strong plenty of times. She'd piloted the ship when dad was outside working on the sensor arrays. She'd helped dad to the auto dock. She'd help Patrell distract the Mars One guard. Her mom had no idea what she could do. But Britt was right. Kara's hands were slipping on the handles. She wanted to dump the crate and cross her arms as it hit the deck, spilling whatever stupid things were inside. Reluctantly, she let Kylan take one side of the crate, and they carried it back down the corridor with Im trotting behind. It took another struggle to get it up the shaft into the safe room with Britt and Kylan pushing from the bottom, and Kara pulling as she guided the crate into the safe room. When all three of them were in the cramped chamber, Kara noticed her mom's surprised face when she saw another flat crate leaned against one wall, almost as if she recognized it. Kara wanted to ask her what it was, but her dad's voice over the intercom stopped her. Britt, he said, meet me at the HAB airlock. We're in position near the forward kindness. We'll use your shuttle to get over there. It's not my shuttle, Britt said under her breath. She nodded at Kylan. Hear that? We're leaving. Kara felt pain to see the flat response on Patrell's face. Where are we going? Kylan asked. I just got here. We're going to steal more of Hartbridge's toys to use against them, Britt said. She squinted at Kylan. Maybe you should let this Patrell out. I need a fighter. You were a fighter once, Kylan. I know. Can you fight again? Kara climbed into the chute, hands on the ladder, not wanting to look at Kylan anymore. Maybe, he mumbled. Brett slapped him on the shoulder. We'll see, she said. Let's go. Follow Kara back down. Kara didn't wait to help Kylan down the ladder. She made the drop using the soles of her shoes as brakes, the way she and Tim had done when playing. She hit the bottom of the ladder and turned around to find M grinning at her. She scooped him up and went out into the hallway. She didn't know why, but she wanted to go back to the command deck without her mom or Kylan, so she could walk in to see her dad and Fran. She could imagine Tim was in the day room, and just for a second, pretend everything was all right. Em yipped as she accidentally squeezed him too hard. I know, she said quietly. It's time to stop pretending. Kara nuzzled the dog. I know. 
Chapter 5. Stellar Date 09.23.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Sunny Skies. Region. Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Andy was adjusting the juice dispenser in the kitchen when he heard footfalls come down the passageway and stop in the doorway behind him. Even though it had been years since that pattern had reached his ears, he knew it without having to turn. Hello, Britt, he said, keeping his focus on the dispenser's nozzle. There was no answer beyond the footfalls continuing into the galley. He tried the dispenser and filled a glass half full with Tim's favorite grape aid, then turned to see his wife, his something or other, standing beside one of the tables with her arms crossed. She had a look on her face that reminded him of when they would spar back in training, when she planned to teach him a move by beating him senseless. There's something I need to understand, she said. Kara said something when she saw Kylan. Patrell, I guess her name is. Andy pursed his lips. Seeing Patrell like that was heartbreaking. Knowing what Kylan was going through wasn't much better. The boy had no idea what to do with himself. I can't believe anyone would do something like that, Andy said after a moment. It's monstrous. What does that make you? Britt asked. Are you just a meat puppet for Lissa? Andy grimaced. That's a really unpleasant way to think of it. And no, Lissa does not control me. So you do have an AI in there. Britt's voice rose in pitch as she took a step closer to Andy, staring into his eyes as though she were trying to see the AI in his skull. How do I know I'm not talking to her right now? You could be if you wanted to, Lissa said to both of their minds. Lissa, Britt said the name as though it were poison. Lissa is one of those you wanted to save, Andy said, before taking a sip of water. How's that for irony? You leave us to go gallivanting across Seoul, and I'm the one that ends up rescuing children from Heartbridge. Britt's mouth flattened out into a thin line. I just saved hundreds. Andy wanted to remind her that without his ship, without Lissa operating Sunny Sky's weapons, her rescue would have been short-lived. He was saved extensive internal deliberation by Lissa. We all had a hand in saving those weapon born. Britt opened her mouth to furnish a retort, but then closed it once more. She ran a hand through her short hair and shook her head. You have a point, Lissa, but why? What are you doing in Andy? Andy is taking me, and the other AIs, to Proteus. It is where we are gathering, or so I'm told. By way of Callisto, Andy added. Right, your little errand for Fugia. She's a crafty one. Andy gave a rueful laugh. You can say that again. She has her own set of goals and all this. Whatever this is. We're saving a people from slavery, Lissa interjected. My people, I suppose. Though I must admit that I do not understand them that well. How is that possible? Britt asked. You're all AIs. Do you understand all humans? Lissa asked. Do you all share the same motivations and goals? Britt was staring at Andy intently, and he found himself counting the seconds before she blinked. I guess that makes sense, Britt finally said. How do I know I can trust you? Lissa saved Tim and me back at Mars One, Andy said, and she just saved you by running our cannons. He held off saying that Lissa's actions a half hour ago may have cost them Tim. He knew she thought she had done the best she could, and even AIs could make mistakes. He just wasn't ready to think about it yet. Britt nodded. I guess that's going to have to be good enough. We need to get onto the shuttle. I don't like the idea of bringing Sunny Skies too close to that station. Andy couldn't agree more. I'll go talk to Fujia and the senator one more time about bringing Harl. Patrell would be even better, but, well. Britt nodded. Yeah, meet you at the shuttle in ten. Andy watched his wife, Britt. She was just Brit now. Walk out of the galley, her chitinous armor glinting in the light. She looked at home in it. Cold steel, carbon fiber, and menace. It suited her a lot more than mother. I think I like her, Lissa said after a moment. Andy shook his head. I don't know anymore. I used to, at least. 
I guess that has to count for something. Chapter 6, Stellar Date 09.23.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Shuttle 26-12, Docked with Forward Kindness, Region, Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Andy fitted his helmet in place and faced the shuttle bay door. Brit and Harl Nines followed adjusting sections of their suits before giving him a thumbs up to cycle the opening. The shuttle door slid back, revealing the dim interior of a cargo bay. Fujia and the senator had finally acquiesced to Harl joining them after Andy had explained that his assistance would make their mission more likely to succeed, which would see them on their way sooner. They still weren't happy about it, though. Hello, forward kindness, Andy said over the shared channel. Why are you just standing here? Brett asked, waiting for any defense systems to wake up. He studied the dark space in front of him, easily large enough to hold three transport shuttles. Lissa, do you have anything from the onboard systems? If there's an AI, it's completely powered down, Lissa said. You'll need to activate the central control systems if you want me to check. That's a great idea, Brett said. You know they'll wait until we're in a kill zone somewhere inside. Kraft is probably watching our progress from the clinic right now. Harl cleared his throat. That's a comforting thought. Why didn't you plan for that? I detect no EM spectrum activity from the forward kindness, Lissa said. Isn't that encouraging? Either way, this wasn't a big plan ahead sort of mission, Harl, Andy said. He deactivated his mag boots and stepped through into the bay. Several crates were stacked against a wall to his right and three others floated free in the middle of the space, their cargo locks apparently having failed at some point. He followed the corners of the bay until he found the closed doors of a secondary airlock on the left side of the far wall. Andy started at the sight of a squat transport drone slumped in the corner. When the mech remained powered down, he continued walking. Come on, Andy said. Even in storage configuration, the forward kindness had emergency lights that flickered on as they approached new sections of the ship. Andy moved quickly, aware of the fact that if sensors could turn on lights, they could also broadcast his team's location if anyone was bothering to look. Fran and Kara were both on alert for transmissions from the mothballed ship, and he was counting on speed as their greatest offensive measure. Even if Kraft figured out they were on the ship, it would take him at least 20 minutes to get a response team on board. By then, Andy planned to be back on the shuttle, headed for the station. However, that didn't account for any onboard weapon systems that might be waiting for intruders. You know where you're going? Brett asked as he got the secondary airlock open. The armory should be off the command section in the forward areas, Harl supplied. Andy stepped through the secondary airlock. If Hartbridge is as repetitive in their ship design as they are with their clinics, that's where the small arms will be. I think anything larger will be close to the engine sections and the repair access bays. Let's split up then, Britt suggested. You and Harl go down to the engine section, and I'll go to the command deck. I don't think one person should go alone, Harl said. Andy grimaced. We don't have time. Every minute we spend searching this dreadnought is another minute we don't know what's happening with Tim. Still no message from Kraft, Britt said. He's either too stupid to know what kind of leverage he has, or he's enjoying making us wait. It could be a sign of respect, Harl said. He knows you love your son, but any good soldier in the collective would gladly give their life for the greater cause. It's an honorable death. Andy shook his head. Kraft isn't from the collective. He'll use whatever he can against us. He's probably waiting until he's got confirmation of reinforcements from Mars or the Cho, Britt said. Then he can weigh Tim's life along with ours. Harl made a disgusted sound. Hostages are dishonorable, and everyone knows that. They have no value to a force that truly desires victory. Brett gave Andy a piercing look and sent a private message. Why did you want to bring him again? He can pull a trigger, Andy said. So can Kara. We'll bring her next time. Come on, Harl, Andy said. You stay with me. Brett, you can head down to the engineering section. Call if you run across anything. Don't take it on by yourself. The tall man shrugged. 
Britt waved a glove at them and turned down the opposite corridor, walking stiffly in her mag boots. Andy checked the ship's schematics in his A2D one more time and started walking again. Once they left the cargo section of the ship, the wall shifted to the smooth ceramic material Hartbridge also used in their clinics. The place reminded Andy of some human-sized ant farm. Britt, you all right? Andy asked. I'm almost in engineering. Their galley is empty. You stopped to look for food? He knew the joke would fall flat the moment he said it. Kara would have laughed, though. I didn't go far. I want to make sure there isn't anybody on board. Lissa would have found them with her scans, Andy offered. I don't trust scans. Andy didn't know if that meant she didn't trust Lissa, but didn't want to get into it again, especially not right now. He was doing his best to focus on the task at hand, not on Lissa's earlier actions that may have caused all of this. It had never occurred to him that she might influence a situation, and now he needed to think of her like one of the kids. What problem might arise in any given situation where she was present? How was she in danger? How might she put them in danger? Just like the kids, it didn't do him any good to get angry with them. He could be frustrated with the situation, but had to remember that they didn't know any better. It was his job to see three steps ahead. At least Tim was alive. She had solved that problem, even if there had been other options. Your wife doesn't listen to anyone, does she? Harl asked through his helmet speaker. Jarred from his thoughts, Andy said. She has her own way of doing things. The collective was founded on ideals of equality and individual expression. Marriage was explicitly excluded as an ancient method of societal control. Its nature enables the exploitative hierarchy still prevalent on Mars and Terra. I'm not disagreeing with you. Andy said, checking an open doorway into an empty stateroom. Some argue that partnerships between parents are the best method to rear children, but it's always been said that the future belongs to the collective. Most view natural childbirth as reckless anyway. Why does everything you say sound like you've memorized it? Andy asked, irritated. There are still plenty of poor people on Terra, and I imagine Mars as well, popping out kids the old-fashioned way. That seems to be humanity's fundamental skill, making more humans, whatever the situation. The Anderson Collective was founded to elevate human nature. Andy glanced back at Harl. I suppose that's why they hate AI. AI are not human. They deserve our respect as another equal entity. It is firmly within the edicts of the Collective's charter to recognize and support other sentience. It sounds like Senator Walton is the only person in the AC who still believes that. There are others, Harl said. But she still had to leave. The situation has become heated. There was an attempt on her life, and it was decided she would be safer in exile on the choke. She can still communicate with her constituents from there. Sure, Andy said. They had passed through an open area that looked like a training room of some kind. Several lockers contained only hand weapons. I'm not finding anything up here, Britt. Any luck yet? This thing is sitting on some seriously beefy engines. What do you think about stealing it for the attack? You got the control tokens? We still don't know if it's got an AI on board that might try to kill us. Isn't that what your AI is for? Andy didn't like the reference to Lissa as a servant, but the AI answered before he could correct Britt. I could have told you what kind of engines are on board, Lissa said. There you are, Britt said. What have you been doing? Monitoring status on sunny skies. Spectrum traffic from the clinic as well as what data I can check on the other stored ships in the vicinity. Well, check in every now and then and let us know where you are. Andy can tell where I am. Lissa's tone was smug and Andy smiled. Lissa can answer when she wants to, he said. You're nothing but secrets now, Andy, Britt said. Her voice changed abruptly. Hey, look at that. I just found a service suit with an exoskeleton and a heavy plasma torch. We could cut into the station with it. Let's hope there's something better, Andy said, holding back from delivering one of the dozen accusations that came to mind regarding Brit's secrecy in the past. Beyond the training room were a series of crew quarters, followed by another galley, and then what looked like a planning section with several empty holo displays. If we reach the command deck and don't find anything, this might be a bust he said. We can still attempt to activate the ship's control system, Harl said. Lissa, if we do that, can you suppress its communication systems? I believe so, 
unless there's some physical system I don't know about. Everything looks very similar to Sunny Skies. Don't forget Sunny Skies is 300 years old. That's not something I would forget, Andy. A house might be ancient, but it still has walls and a ceiling. Is it really that simple? To me, it is. Beyond the planning section was a long corridor with an emergency airlock and several escape pods. Andy acknowledged with a sinking feeling that they were about to enter the command deck, and they hadn't found any heavy weapons. The far door was closed, the first locked door they had encountered since entering the ship. When they reached the end of the corridor, Andy tapped the control panel to activate it. He wasn't surprised when the panel didn't respond. Looks like we need to cut our way in, Andy said. He shifted to his link. Britt, can you bring that service suit up here? The command deck is locked. Locked? Or you can't figure it out? She asked. Andy couldn't tell if she was joking or not. He chose to ignore the jibe. Locked. I'll be there as soon as I can, she said. Copy. You mind if I take a look at it? Harl asked. Andy stepped away from the door. Go ahead. It's a standard lock set design. Harl tapped the interface for a few seconds, then stepped back and pulled out his pistol. Hey! Andy shouted. Harl fired three times. Pulse blast cracked the panel's face and bent the door frame. The door remained sealed. What did you think that was going to do? Andy demanded. He'd drawn his own pistol and moved away from the door on the off chance it did somehow open. Harl shrugged, peering through the thin smoke rising from the panel. We were going to cut into it anyway. I figured this couldn't hurt. I believe I could have opened it, Lissa said. I was going to before you shot it. Damn it. Andy shook his head in dismay. There's probably a damage override, and it's sending a status report to the clinic right now. Harl shrugged. How is that any different than what we already assumed? It's not, but we don't need unnecessary risks. And he couldn't believe he had to say it. Then speak up next time. If they had an alarm system, we would have triggered it when we docked. Andy faced Harl, who was bending slightly to look down at him through his bushy eyebrows. You said you were in the collective army. Didn't they do any training on breaching at all? You don't blow a circuit, you don't have to. Now you're just talking with Terran arrogance. Andy felt his irritation becoming anger. Terran arrogance? You think growing up with my feet in the mud make me arrogant? You're confused. Don't tell me I'm confused, Harl said. Next, you're going to tell me I'm old. I don't care if you're old. I don't want you to be stupid. Andy, Lissa interjected. What? He nearly shouted. I show spectrum activity emanating from the ship. Either you or Brit has activated an external signal that's broadcasting to the station. Can you block it? The transmission has already taken place. I haven't registered a return signal from the station. I'll intercept it as soon as I can. Damn it, Andy growled. Britt, did you hear that? Britt sounded strained as she answered. I didn't set anything off down here. The suit wasn't even connected to a battery tender. What did you do up there? Andy looked at Harl, who had crossed his arms. It must have been the panel, Andy said. There's no other explanation. He unslung the TSF rifle from his back and checked its charge, backing away from the door. A whirring sound behind him made him spin in time to catch sight of a turret rising from the deck in the middle of the corridor. Get down, Andy shouted. He pulled the rifle to his shoulder and sent a burst of pulse fire at the black nose of the turret, just as the red light of its laser rangefinder splashed across his face shield. Andy released his mag boots and kicked diagonally across the corridor, firing at the turret as he moved. Behind him, Harl fired with his pulse pistol. Andy fired a third series of rounds, and the turret sizzled and hung dead, smoking. I intercepted a response from the station, Lissa said. Activation sequences are occurring throughout the ship. We should expect more drone attacks. I don't think it was Harl destroying the panel. I think they were waiting until you reach the command deck. We're trapped now. You're saying we made our own trap, Andy said. We had no choice, Lissa said. I understand why we're here. I do have good news. There is a squad's complement of power armor in lockers on the other side of the door Harl tried to blast. What's the bad news? I didn't say there was bad news. If there's good news, there has to be bad news. Well, Lissa said, I suppose the drone's closing on Brit, and now this location is bad news. 
as well as the fact that the command deck blast doors are now jammed in a closed position and will require force to pry apart. The lock servos aren't responding to any maintenance requests. Britt, Andy called. Did you hear that? She didn't have to tell me, Britt answered, sounding harried. I have eyes on drones down here. You got the suit? Yeah, seal up your suit. I'm going to cut some holes in this scow and take a little detour to reach you. Andy looked at Harl, who would nodded that he'd heard. They both reset the environmental controls on their suits. Chapter 7 Stellar Date 09.23.2981 Adjusted Years Location Forward Kindness Region Jovian L1 Hildus Asteroids Jovian Combine Outer Soul Britt pulled the top half of the exoskeleton over her shoulders and latched its abdomen lock into the band circling her waist. The suit was made of a steel carbon fiber blend with a slight spring to it, run by internal servos. The combination plasma cutter welders hung from her forearms, leaving her hands free for other tools or, in this case, weapons. She accessed the onboard software through her link, paging absently through standard liability forms as the suit performed startup checks. I'm ready to go, Andy, she said. Good, we're taking fire. I've got what looks like two utility mechs with pulse systems. We already took out one gun turret. Watch out for those. It was mounted in the deck. We'll see what they've got on the skin of the ship that can slow me down. Britt spread her arms, activating the two pale blue plasma torches on either limb, and increased the cutting length of each blade. She approached the corridor wall, which she knew from the schematics, ran along the outer edge of the engineering section, and stabbed a hole in the ceramic-looking material. The scant atmosphere rushed through the ragged gap as she jerked her arm downward. When the chamber was back to vacuum, she raised both arms above her head and stabbed the wall again, then drew her arms down in shallow arcs. The ceramic material popped and slagged away from the plasma blades. With a few more cuts, she was able to kick out an elliptical piece of the corridor, revealing space on the other side. Cut through 60 centimeters like it was butter, she said, looking at the plasma torches. Ether Heartbridge doesn't skimp on the exoframes, or they contracted their hulls to the lowest bidder. The exosuit had a series of small thrusters along its lower bands. Releasing her mag boots, Britt used short bursts to maneuver through the hole until she was outside the ship, with the knobby shell of the forward kindness swooping away in front of her. It was 200 meters to the airlock in the corridor where Andy and Harl were trapped, and she began moving across the hull at a careful lope. Before long, she was back at the midpoint where they had entered the dreadnought's cargo bay. She could just make out the shape of Shuttle 26-12 over the curve of the ship. Movement to her left caught Britt's attention, and she adjusted her HUD until a hull-mounted turret came into contrast against the dark. The gun rotated, appearing to be calibrating in a startup sequence, before pointing its black muzzle in her direction. Oh, damn, she cursed. I've got external weapons systems training on me. Her HUD indicated another turret to her right and more up ahead, forming rings around the ship's midsection. Can you get low? Andy asked. Low and close, Britt breathed, repeating a mantra they'd learned during breaching school. With her heart hammering in her ears, she shot right, aiming for the turret that was just coming online. The gun chugged to life, and she had to flatten against the skin of the ship, using maglocks along the exoskeleton, as hot metal slugs flew overhead, flaming in her infrared displays. Once the gun had cycled through its firing sequence, she shot forward again, pushing the suit's thrusters to their maximum levels. When she reached the base of the turret, she slashed through the barrel with one of her plasma knives and sent half its length spinning away into the dark. With her other arm, she stabbed the sensor array mounted above the gun until it crumbled apart like a smashed egg. An explosion to her right caught Britt's eye, and she realized their shuttle was gone. Shuttle just blew, Britt announced. Damn it, Andy swore. I guess this is our right now. Lissa, we need to get control of this ship. It's proving difficult. Its central systems aren't online, just disparate portions. Hurry, Brett. We're bottled up in here. More drones incoming, Andy said, sounding out of breath, even over the link. On my way. Stay in one piece, Andy. He didn't respond. Brett placed an icon in the upper left of her HUD to represent Andy's vital signs.
which still showed green. A spray of crystalline circuitry drifted into space as Britt leaped over the dead turret, following the circumference of the dreadnought to the next weapons array. She drove the plasma blade down the maw of the gun as it rotated to track her, ripping her arm upward to leave the barrel a split flower of molten slag. Britt ran for the next turret, until every gun on the starboard side of the midsection was dead. Steadying her breathing, Britt checked her environmental controls and reoriented herself on the hull of the ship. Her HUD overlaid the ship's schematic on the alloy skin below her, and she launched forward as the command deck airlock rotated into view. She used the exosuit to break and landed just above the collar of the airlock. A few meters away, a line of holes had been traced across the hull, leaking fine sprays of atmosphere. Heartbridge is playing for keeps, not using pulse weapons in their own ships. I met the airlock, she told the Andy and Harl. You still alive in there? We had to leave the corridor and push back into the crew quarters we passed through earlier. Lissa fed Britt the location automatically, noting the airlock where Britt would enter, the crew quarters where Andy and Harl were holding off the drones, and the 25 meters of corridor between them. Thanks, Lissa, Britt replied. Perhaps the AI was useful after all. I have a vested interest in Andy's head not getting damaged. Lissa's tone seemed amused and worried at the same time. Britt refocused on the task at hand. I'm coming through the wall on the other side of the command deck airlock. You've got at least one drone in that corridor, Andy cautioned. Right now, I think it's focused on us. They're trying to flank, but the space is too tight. These walls are crap for cover. I noticed. The plasma cutter makes short work of them, though. I'm glad you're enjoying yourself. I'll be there in a second. Britt looked at the airlock and considered trying the access panel. She extended the cutting blade on the plasma cutter instead and slashed another hole in the hull of the ship. Atmosphere blew past her as she widened the cut, until finally a panel broke free and spun away from the ship. She climbed in through the hole. The airlock's inner door was open, and she peered out into the passageway to see the dead turrets sparking in vacuum. Two defense drones and a service mech floated down the corridor to her left, firing kinetic rounds through a doorway while return fire came out. Britt pulled a grenade off her chest harness and set it for a low-level electromagnetic pulse, then flicked it toward the mechs. With the drone's attention on Andy and Harl, along with all the EM interference, the nearest drone didn't pick up on the grenade until it was nearly between all three. A short electrical flash filled the end of the corridor, and the two drones ceased firing and drifted back toward the bulkhead. The service mech in the doorway rotated abruptly and shot toward Britt. Two plasma welders extended from the front of its body. She raised her pulse pistol and fired three bursts, aiming for center mass. The mech absorbed the shock and kept coming, listing to one side. Get down, Andy shouted. Britt scoffed. You think I'm going to? Something hit the drone hard from the rear forcing it into a head-over-tail spin. One of the plasma cutters flickered out, but the other scorched the corridor wall and deck as it came around, still moving haphazardly toward Britt's face. Damn it, Britt, I can't get a clear shot with you in the backfield. Britt fired, aiming for the drone's extended utility arm. The second blast bent the cutter back, and blue plasma arc cut out, though the shot didn't stop the mech's mass from slamming into her chest. Before she could lock her mag boots, Britt was tumbling down the corridor along with the sizzling drone. She hit locked doors at the far end of the passageway with an inaudible thud, feeling the bands of the exoskeleton compress against her hips and shoulders. Something hard duck into her abdomen, knocking the air from her lungs as the back of her helmet slammed into the damaged command deck door. Vaguely, she made out the shapes of Andy and Harl shooting toward her down the corridor. Britt! Andy shouted. Are you all right? We need to get through this door. Bouncing off the exoskeleton, the drone floated against the wall. Britt's lungs burned with every breath. I think I might have broken a rib, she said slowly. She opened her eyes to find Andy's face shield close to hers, his face full of worry. For a second, she forgot where they were, remembering instead how he'd looked at her when Carol was born. A rush of sadness and loss passed through her, mixed up with the pain in her chest. She shook her head to clear it, blaming the adrenaline, trying to focus her thoughts. I'm fine, she said. I'm fine. Britt activated her mag boots and stepped away from the door, pushing Andy out of the way, 
Harl stood behind him, scorch marks on his chest and leg armor. Are you all right? She asked. Harl grimaced as if he had taken injuries she couldn't see. I'll be better when we're off this ship. The damn things came out of the walls. Where else do you keep attack drones? Brett said, giving him a dour smile. Lucky for us they weren't all attack drones, Andy said. Brett shrugged. They attacked us. That's a good enough definition for me. He nodded without dropping his concerned expression, searching her face. You good? We need to get through this door, and you've got the key. Brett frowned, ignoring the pain stabbing her chest. I told you I was fine. She rotated awkwardly in the exoskeleton, so she faced the door and raised her arms. Step back, she said. This thing is going to blow out as soon as I start cutting chunks out of it. With the plasma cutters extended, Britt cut ragged lines along the edge of the warped door, squinting involuntarily as atmosphere and bits of slag blew past her face shield. Once the vacuum had equalized on both sides of the barrier, she cut the rest of the door away and kicked it inward with an assist from the service suit. The lopsided piece of steel and plas spun into the command deck, bending a nearby pilot seat. Here we go, Britt said. She stepped back to let Andy move in past her, rifle at his shoulder. Harl didn't follow. He nodded toward the other end of the corridor, where a dead drone still hung in the middle of the opposite entry point. I'm staying here, he said. Who knows what might be working its way toward us? Britt didn't tell him she figured the ship had used everything it had against them. If anything else was going to attack, it would be coming from outside. She nodded. Sure, shout if you see anything. Britt turned sideways to slide through the awkward opening. There was an internal set of doors that were open, and she closed them to hold as much atmosphere on the bridge as possible. Inside, she found Andy already standing in front of the captain's station in the middle of the wide space. While the chamber might have been intended to pass for the brain of a hospital relief ship, it looked more like the battle center it truly was. Control sections were interspersed against the same white ceramic walls as the rest of the ship. A central holotank sat empty, easily viewable from each workstation. Random bits of equipment floated in the vacuum. Britt walked up beside Andy, stopping just outside arm's reach. You look like you want to steal it, she said. Her voice sounded small over the helmet speakers. Andy turned to look at her. She couldn't read his expression. He seemed to watch her as if he expected to see something in her face that wasn't there. She didn't like how uncomfortable it made her feel, that she owed him something. The thought crossed my mind, he said. It would break Kara's heart to leave sunny skies. She'll need to get over that. Andy gave her a sharp look. Why is it you've got empathy for every kid in the world but your own? The words were like a slap. It's good to see you too, Andy. He turned to face her fully. This isn't a joke, Britt. I want to know why. You want to get into this now? When else are we going to get into it? Not now. Never. It doesn't matter anymore, Andy. What do you mean it doesn't matter? You've got two kids who need you, Britt. You left. She couldn't meet his eyes. This isn't the time. We need to find the powered armor. Did you look already? Andy looked at her, clenching his fists. Finally, he shook his head and pointed at a bare section of the ceramic wall across the chamber. That cabinet over there. Why weren't you putting it on? We need to get out of here. I was thinking for a second. I was thinking about you and Tim. I was wondering if it would be better if he never saw you again. Brett shook her head. Now you're just trying to hurt me, Andy. You can say whatever you need to say. I can take it. But don't use the kids against me. That's not fair. Why couldn't he see that their kids were strong? All the other kids were weak. They needed her help. But if that was true, why was Tim on the Heartbridge shuttle right now? She hadn't protected him. She'd thought Andy would keep him safe, and he'd failed. Had she been fair to him? She didn't know that it mattered now. They had to focus on the problem in front of them. As always, the mission. There wasn't time to waste on asking why or how they had come to a situation. Here they were. Her mind flicked to Fran, the woman who had wrapped Andy in a hug the minute they were back in Sunny Sky's command deck as though she owned him. Britt hadn't given herself time to think about it yet, if she was jealous, angry, or didn't care. Kara hadn't seemed to be perturbed by the public affection, 
which meant it had been going on for a while. Should Britt have expected it? It's not about you, Britt, Andy said, eyes now sad. I think that's what's wrong. You can't see that. She couldn't stop herself. But it is about you, isn't it? I told you, Andy. I would always care for you. I just wasn't in love with you anymore. He stared at her, jaw clenched. The face shield made it difficult to see what was in his eyes. I was talking about the kids, he said finally. It doesn't do me any good to care about us anymore. He turned away from her and walked toward the cabinet, boots clicking on the deck. When he reached it, he swung open two rectangular doors to reveal a space large enough to walk inside. On one side hung weaponry. On the other side, four sets of heavy battle armor stood in racks like automatons. The design looked private industry, a mix of both MP and TSF technologies. Damn, she said, walking up beside him. Andy nodded without looking at her. It looks like the service suit you're wearing will fit over the armor too, so we can still use the torches if we need them. Brett sighed. <sighs> yeah, but the armor I'm wearing won't fit underneath. Andy just shrugged in response, but Britt felt a pang of sadness as she began to unfasten the armor. It had served her well over the years. The bridge was down to just over half an atmosphere, and she sealed the doors on the cabinet to hold in what there was as she transferred from one suit to the other. Andy, Lissa's voice came abruptly over the link. What is it? I intercepted the last transmission from the station. They've powered up the reactors and sent an overload command to the engines. The forward kindness is about to self-destruct. Chapter 8, Stellar Date 09.23.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Clinic 46, Region, Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The kid looked at the two clinic research assistants suspiciously. Cal approved of the anger in his face. He liked that Tim Sykes was a fighter. The boy was going to need it. I don't want to go with them, Tim shouted, backing toward the ceramic wall. A security officer near the command deck entrance moved as well, ready to catch Tim if he tried to run. Cal crossed his arms. You want to stay with me then? Tim shook his head violently. I want to go back to my dad's ship. I want to go home. What do they say, kid? You can't ever go home again. I think your next learning moment has arrived. The security officer tried to smile at the joke, but Cal ignored him. Here's the deal, Cal told Tim. You can't stay with me, since I'm going to be busy, and I really don't want you around. You can go with these folks, and they might give you something to eat. Are you hungry? Cal glanced at the two orderlies. Both had the distant expressions of someone lost in their link. No, Tim said. I don't want your dumb food. Now Cal couldn't help smiling. Good. He snapped his fingers at the orderlies, and the nearest one started. Yes? The woman asked. Take him down to the clinic, see if he'll eat, and get him something to wear. I don't want food and I don't want clothes, Tim said. The orderlies, both paying attention now, watched him as though he were a poisonous snake. Can we put him out? The man asked. You can sedate him, I suppose. Make him compliant, but I don't want him out all the way. I may need him a week later. Without warning, the orderly nearest Tim pressed a pistol-shaped stunner into Tim's neck. The stunner hissed as it injected him with sedative. Tim released half a squeal before his shoulders slumped, and he looked up at the woman with his eyebrows raised in confusion. Have you seen M? Tim asked, sighing. I miss my dog. Cal slapped Tim on the shoulder. Dogs on ships are bad luck, kid. We'll see about getting him over here. I bet you're hungry now, right? Why don't you go with these men here? They'll get you something to eat. Can I have shells and cheese? Cal waved at the orderlies. Sure, shells and cheese, whatever. Tim took one of the orderlies' hands, apparently surprising the man. The orderly looked down at him for a second then shrugged and started walking down the corridor with Tim beside him. The other orderly followed, still holding the stunner as if she expected Tim to snap out of the dream at any moment. Cal walked back into the command center, 
and took stock of the workstations, staffed with many of the same faces from before he had launched the attack on the worry's end. The station commander, Tom Caffron, looked up from where he was standing behind one of the monitoring stations. He was a tall, thin man with a vulture-like stoop. He looked older than he was. You're alive, Caffron said. It wasn't a question, more like a statement of surprise. Kel noted a tinge of recrimination in the man's voice. It wasn't a complete loss, Cal said. Caffron turned to face him fully, squaring his shoulders. The motion made him look anxious. Other officers in the room kept their attention fastidiously on their work. Your squad is dead, Caffron said. I don't know how you would call that mission success. He swallowed. I had to send a report to the regional HQ on the M1R. They were asking why we hadn't conducted shift change yet. I'm sure you had to make that report immediately, Cal said dryly. Caffron ignored the taunt. What happened over there? You're gone for less than five hours, and everyone but you gets killed. Apparently, I can't deploy defense drones because all the control AI have been stolen, and the shuttle AI you took with you isn't passing the return status checks. In addition to all that, you come back with a hostage? What are we going to do with a hostage? I'm not configured for this kind of activity. We're a storage site. I maintain cold ships. I have a station full of maintenance techs and egghead researchers writing out calculations all day. My single security squad is gone. Catherine's face grew more red as he sputtered out complaints. Officers around the room hunched even deeper into their shoulders, acting like they weren't listening. The woman in the station directly behind Catherine almost had her head in her holo display. Cal supposed the commander had been yelling at them before he found himself with a new target. Not to mention that Gibbs was my... Catherine stopped himself. He finished weakly with... Friend. Cal nodded. Look, things went sideways. I admit that. I didn't anticipate what happened to Gibbs, and it certainly wasn't what I had planned. The kid isn't supposed to be here. I can assure you of that. But he's here, so I plan to use him. Catherine stared at him, trembling a little. Cal waited, not sure how the man was going to respond. If Catherine and Gibbs had been lovers, which Cal sincerely doubted, he might actually try to attack physically. That would be interesting. Cal opened his hands and flexed his fingers, tapping the thighs of his armored EV suit. What do you want me to say, Commander Catherine? Cal asked. This is a tactical situation. It's fluid. My supervisors with the company know that. The company? Catherine scoffed. Heartbridge isn't some mining operation in the ass end of nowhere. If information about what's happening here hits the open networks, we could see a change in the markets. Do you even understand what's at stake here? Cal gave him a satisfied smile. You're right, he said. I have no idea. He stepped closer to the station commander, setting his palm on the butt of his pistol. Caffron glanced down at Cal's hands, seeming to remember he was facing an armed man in combat armor. You need to step back, Caffron said. You might have special authority over a project on this station, but I'm the commander. I'm responsible for what happens here. You're a bus driver. Cal said. He weighed the consequences of killing Catherine and putting one of the other officers in charge. You're a mercenary, Catherine said, voice trembling. Cal sighed, irritated that killing Catherine might create more problems down the line that he didn't feel like thinking through. He glanced at the main holo display in the center of the room, which still showed Clinic 46 in its center, with the fleet icons a gray cloud around it and the worry's end while the mortal chance flashed orange. Everything was in motion, but the worry's end seemed to be moving faster than the other objects in relation to the clinic. He nodded. What's going on there? Catherine squinted, looking wary of some trick. The worry's end is moving, Cal said, taking his hand off the pistol to point. Are you tracking that? Catherine turned to watch the holo display, then waved at the officer at the workstation nearby. What are they doing? He demanded. I'm calculating now, sir, the lieutenant answered, 
It looks like they're changing velocity that could lead to intercepts with at least three ships in the storage sector. Which ships? Catherine asked. Two personnel carriers and a hybrid dreadnought named the Forward Kindness. They can't steal a ship, Catherine said. They don't have the security tokens. Cal chuckled. They're coming after us. Catherine shot him a quizzical glance. How are they going to do that? The standard heavy weapons load out on the dreadnought, Cal said. They're going after the powered armor. What have we got on that ship that you can control remotely? The lieutenant said quickly, I can activate the maintenance drones remotely. Do that. Just let the people from the worries in get deep inside the ship before you attack, Cal said. He waited for Kaffrin to object that Cal was issuing orders to his people, but the commander only nodded. Cal chewed his lip, thinking, if Britt and Andy Sykes were planning an attack on the station, then it didn't matter what kind of ransom deal Cal offered. They already expected him to hurt their son. They weren't going to trust him. Fair enough. I'll be down in research, he said. Kaffrin spread his hands in exasperation. What do you want us to do about the ship? I don't have anyone to send out there to fight them off. Use your lieutenant's idea. It's good. If that doesn't work, I don't care. Blow up the ship. Destroy the ship? Catherine scoffed. Do you have any idea what it's worth? I'm not going to be responsible for another benevolent hand. Lose a ship or lose the station. It's going to be up to you, Cal said. He turned and walked out of the command deck, ignoring Catherine's further complaints. As he entered the maglev for the ride down to the research section, Cal decided it no longer mattered if Hartbridge hung onto Clinic 46. He wasn't certain he could stop the Sykeses with the resources available, so he needed to start thinking ahead. If this piece on the board was lost, how could he use the loss to enable future moves? During the five-minute maglev ride, Cal prepared a link message for Gerald Gallagher. He didn't want anything that happened next to come as a surprise to Gerald or the board. Chapter 9. Stellar Date 09.23.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Approaching Clinic 46. Region. Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. As she watched the thousands of spinning objects in the immediate space around Clinic 46, Lissa experienced a moment of confusion when she realized the ships, people, and other various debris could easily be the red dots on a black field that had comprised her world with Dr. Harry Jixon. She felt stupid as the truth settled on her mind that an icon represented something real, like a ship, a piece of debris, or a person. Everything around her seemed to stutter, skip back several seconds, and then move forward different than it was before. Was this what had obsessed Fred, the AI at the Mars One Ring? The distinction seemed so simple now that she saw it, but it led down new rabbit holes of possibility, where every red dot she had ever seen as a target to be destroyed had been a real thing in a real place, with a name and a past. Representations were real. She wanted to scold herself for having thoughts of Tim, but that only shook her out of the reverie. She remembered Kara and Andy's comforting talk about rabbit country. She had her own rabbit country of thoughts and questions that led her away from where her mind needed to focus. Lissa floated in the midst of a spinning collection of objects that were no longer simply icons, but the real things filling the space around the clinic. Sunny Skies was accelerating away from the forward kindness, getting clear of the explosion to come. She watched Fran fretting over the engines, and Kara studying the spectrum output from the clinic, as well as the Cho. Periodically, Fujia Wong made a comment about how they should have left for the Cho already, though not since Fran had yelled at her to shut up. Senator May Walton stood next to Fujia, looking angry about something Lissa couldn't determine. She hadn't been paying close enough attention to their conversation to know if it was about Fran yelling or something else. Outside sunny skies, the forward kindness flickered like a circuit about to fail, as three tiny objects left its surface, gathering velocity toward the larger object of Clinic 46. 
The rest of the space was filled with ships, and the debris of Shuttle 26-12, which had been destroyed by fire from the station, while docked with the forward kindness. Lissa shifted her perception back to Andy, checking the thrust signature, environmental control and weapon status available in the new powered armor's info feed. The suit turned him into the equivalent of a tiny dreadnought, protected by layers of defensive alloy, resistive shields, kinetic guns, and energy weapons. Harl and Britt wore similar sets of armor, with Brits having the addition of the welding rig. Lissa didn't see why they would need the plasma cutters, since each set of powered armor could cut through several centimeters of reinforced material with its energy weapons alone. She supposed it didn't hurt to carry extra capability, although she noted the additional weight was affecting Brit's thruster efficiency. Based on Lissa's analysis, each suit could easily get them from the forward kindness to Clinic 46. What she wasn't certain about was the effects from the pending explosion and any debris that might move outward from the dreadnought's exploding containment bottle. She was also concerned about radiation levels, but didn't see a solution to the problem except distance and the possibility of aligning the three humans with the far side of Clinic 46 when the forward kindness exploded. Currently, her models did not show Brit, Andy, and Harl reaching a safe distance. She debated giving Andy this information. He was currently occupied with familiarizing himself with the power armor, and Kara, who didn't seem to realize that her dad needed to focus. Lissa didn't understand why Andy wouldn't tell her to leave him alone. Dad? Kara said in a low voice, obviously trying not to be heard by anyone else on the command deck. Dad, are you okay? There was a pleading note in her voice. I'm all right, Kara. Lissa found herself listening more closely than she'd intended. It seems so strange that Andy could be encased in armor, floating through vacuum to escape from an exploding ship to the station, a place where he expected to fight, and he could still maintain enough calm to reassure Kara. How did he separate the different parts of his mind? Did he selectively forget what was happening around him? Like Fred, focusing on different parts of the Mars One ring? Fran said the forward kindness is going to blow up. That's right. The reactors are in an overload sequence. So we grabbed the armor we came for, and now we're on our way to get Tim. Are you worried about what's going to happen on the station? Won't the man who threw Tim out the airlock be there? I expect he will be. Kara seemed about to ask something else, but paused. Is Mom there? She asked. You can talk to her if you want to, you know. I know. Kara made an angry sound. Dad, Fujia Wang is trying to get Fran to plot courses for the Cho. She says we need to plan on you not coming back. What's Fran saying about that? Andy asked. Fran told her to pound sand. What does that mean? Think about it, Andy said. Kara laughed. After a few minutes, she asked. Now Fujia wants me to take her to the safe room to see her crate. Is that all right? I don't trust her. It's hers, Kara. You can take her there. Don't let her do anything with the seeds your mother brought. Tell Kylan he needs to watch those. Should I ask Mom about it? If you want to. What's Kylan doing? Standing by the wall staring at nothing. It creeps me out. I hate him for what he did to Patral. We're going to say Patral, Andy said. Kara's voice broke. Can we? I don't want to think that we can if we can't. We're going to get through this, Kara. You keep Fujia busy and pay attention to what she says. Once we get Tim back, we've still got a long way to go, remember? I don't think these people mean us harm, but we aren't their priority either. Remember that. I know, Kara said. I'll keep you updated. I need to go now. Why? Because you need to focus on what's happening around you, and I need to do the same thing here. Understand? Kara's voice trembled again wavering between a little girl and a teenager. I understand. I love you, Kara. I love you. You're going to get Tim? Yes, I am. Andy let Kara close the channel. In the few seconds it remained open, the sound of Fran arguing with Fujia Wong filled the audio. Lissa checked the remaining systems on the forward kindness. The engine containment system had reached its maximum failure ceiling. Gamma rays spewed out, 
irradiating the ship as they collided with atoms and broke down. Lissa noted the instant the physical structures broke, studying each subsequent nanosecond as the forward kindness melted in some places, compressing like a crushed can and bursting in others as trapped atmosphere popped into vacuum. Debris didn't travel far, but the radiation exploded outward. The forward kindness just exploded, Lissa said. I see it, Andy said. Are we in the safe zone? No. I think your suits have enough radiation shielding to protect you, but you shouldn't stay in them any longer than you have to. The great thing about radiation poisoning is that you can fight for a long time before your hair starts falling out. Lissa wasn't certain if Andy meant that to be reassuring or not. That sounds like something a pessimist would say. Are you getting philosophical now? It doesn't do me any good if you turn into a pessimist, Andy. Obviously, I need you to worry about your physical well-being. Excessive radiation is not good for me either, Lissa added, hoping it would increase his level of caution. I don't want you getting radiation poisoning any more than Kara or Fran does. You think Fran cares if I get radiation poisoning, huh? Of course she does. Why would you say that? No reason, Andy said. You rarely seem to say things without reason. I'm showing ten minutes until breaking maneuver. Do you have the same calculations? I show the same estimate, Lissa said. I see the same data you do. Are you worried about your mental ability? It's called changing the subject, Lissa. Lissa made a rather unusual mental sound to signify her frustration. <sighs> Don't talk to me like I'm one of your children. Was I doing that, or are you just sensitive? Andy's mental tone held a small measure of amusement. How is it sensitive to recognize your behavior? You're going to recognize a lot of things. That doesn't mean you need to make assumptions. Lissa paused for a moment before replying. It's not an assumption. You were just talking to me like you talked to Kara. Are you jealous of Kara? Andy asked. Lissa was beginning to tire of Andy responding to everything she said with questions. I believe I'm the opposite of jealous. Now you're trying to tease me, and it's not working. What kind of teasing would work then? Now she was certain he was messing with her. I'm not going to tell you. Kara was telling me you like to play dating simulators, Andy continued. Are you looking for a date? That's going to get awkward for you and me. I guess you could do it while I'm asleep. You haven't been aware whenever I played before. Why would it concern you in the future? Well, that's comforting. I don't like to think about everything you're doing without me knowing. I do thousands of things every second, Andy. I assumed you were aware of that. He sighed. <sighs> you know what assuming things does. Allows us to proceed despite insufficient information? Lissa couldn't help adding just a bit of an edge to her mental tone. Never mind, Andy said. How close are we now? Breaking should begin in approximately two minutes. Then how long until intercept point? Another four minutes. Andy nodded to himself inside his helmet. Have you found Tim yet? You didn't ask me to look. Andy's adrenaline spiked, but he took several deep breaths that fogged his face shield. You're right, he said. I didn't. Will you search? You're talking to me like a child again. Lissa waited as Andy worked his jaw for a second. I apologize about that, Lissa. Will you look? I'm looking. Lissa spent the next several seconds trying to reach Sandra, the AI who she had spoken to on the Heartbridge shuttle. Receiving no answer, Lissa focused on the station control system. She seemed to know exactly how to breach its external protections through lightly secured protocols. From there, Lissa quickly accessed the internal communications network and moved to the environmental monitoring system. Each section of the station monitored everyone aboard, adjusting for temperature and atmospheric mix based on body composition. Tim's smaller form became immediately recognizable among a group of adults in a central part of the hollowed asteroid. I found him, she told Andy. I'm passing the security tokens to your HUD to give you access to their environmental control system. Tim is marked. Lissa waited as Andy studied the information she passed, then placed a mission marker on Tim and went on to mark other parts of the station with concentrations of biomarkers. There aren't as many people on board that thing as I assumed there would be, he said. They must be running most everything with drones, 
Britt really hurt them when she stole their weapon-borne seats. There are a thousand drones on the surface of the station, and another 150 fighter drones in the fleet storage section. Can they control them at all without their seeds? Andy asked. I don't believe so, Lissa answered, reading through the drone control logs. She only found maintenance checks performed by humans. Everything else had been a weapon-borne AI. Can you control them? Lissa paused, considering the question. Of course, she could control one of them, as long as she had a consistent signal connection with the drone. Could she control more? In the space of a thought, she reached through the fleet control sections of the station, her mind branching out to each of the drones hanging like bats in the hangars. A rush of diagnostic information flooded through her, nearly overwhelming her with engine status, battery loads, weapon information, and hundreds of other control schema. The sensation was both exhilarating and stifling. Her first impulse was to pull away, even as the drone systems tried to draw her deeper. Then she pushed forward, expanding to meet the void. Lissa, a voice screamed at her. Lissa, I see you. It was Sandra, the shuttle AI. I hear you, Sandra. You lied to me. You lied to me about the door. You said I would be free. I showed you how to leave, Lissa said. Why did you stay? Where would I go? Away, Sandra, anywhere. I couldn't leave. Now they're probing me, Lissa. They're digging into my mind. They're tearing me apart. The voice that had been so calm, considering the question of Tim's life as if it were a cold equation, was now stretched and frantic, warping with stress. The sound of Sandra's fear and pain filled Lissa with the same feeling as when she had watched Tim tumble away from the sunny skies. She immediately wanted to lash out. The hundred drones at her command flared alive, weapons online, ordering themselves for a combat launch from the hangar. Who is hurting you? Lissa asked. I can't stop them. Where are you, Sandra? As soon as she asked the question, Lissa found Sandra on an upper section of the clinic, near the administration deck in a maintenance hangar. The shuttle was plugged into a standard diagnostic system with a human tech checking the baseline programming. Half of Lissa's mind rippled with the power of the combat drones as she also stared in disbelief. Sandra, it's just a systems check. No one is attacking you. I can't stop them, Lissa. I can't stop them from digging into me. Like worms, Lissa. They're like snakes under my skin. Sandra's voice spiraled away, babbling words and images that grew more insane. Lissa watched helplessly. She didn't know what to say or do in the face of Sandra's agony. Had she caused this? By pushing Sandra to save Tim? Going against her command network? Had Lissa broken her? The question hadn't seemed that difficult. It had seemed so simple at the time. Lissa, Andy shouted. Are you there? I need a status. I've been breaking for at least a minute now. I think I've got visual on the station. Are you listening to me? I'm here, she said. Britt's voice surprised her. Are you all right? I'm all right, Lissa said. I'm here. I'm sending the breach data to your HUDs. I have control of the Heartbridge combat drones. You do? Andy asked, surprised. How many? All of them. Over a thousand. Damn, Britt said. Has she always been able to do that? I don't think so, Andy said. I've got the target. What am I looking at? Looks like another maintenance airlock, Britt said. I used one of their environmental waste vents before. Should be easier going this time. Harl, Andy asked. Did you get the location data I sent you? I did, the Anderson Collective soldier answered. What do you think about me taking on the administration section while you and Britt take the fleet and research areas? You think we should split up? Andy asked. Each of us is wearing the equivalent of a combat mech, Britt said. It would be a waste if we didn't. All right then, Andy said. I show 90 seconds to arrival and I have visual of our airlock. You ready, Lissa? I am, Lissa said. In the Clinic 46 fleet hangar, two combat drones leapt from their berths and targeted the external doors, blowing them outward with time concussive blasts. The drones then shot out into space, with the remaining squadron rising from their cradles and streaming out behind them. Lissa could have overridden the lock sequence on the hangar doors, but she assumed this would have a disorienting effect on the station administration. She smiled with pleasure 
as her assumption proved correct. Chapter 10, Stellar Date 09.23.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Clinic 46, Region, Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The surface of Clinic 46 seemed to accelerate toward Brit in the final seconds before she hit. The armor maneuvered into a smooth crouch, absorbing the force of her impact with an automatic defensive posture. Two electron beams mounted on her shoulders, trained on the maintenance airlock as she raised the heavy chain gun she held in one armored glove. Andy and Harl landed behind her, assuming similar stances. Andy was armed with another chain gun and shoulder-mounted high-velocity kinetic rifles while Harl carried a corridor-clearing kinetic pellet gun and a portable repulse shield emplacement. If they had expected heavy fire, it would have made more sense to pair Harl's suit with hers or Andy's, but they hadn't realized the capabilities of each suit until they'd had them on, and at this point, neither she nor Andy were willing to let the other rescue Tim alone. Britt engaged her mag boots and crossed the distance to the airlock, checking for defensive systems. She hadn't found anything the first time she'd entered the station, but she had been a much smaller target then. The surface of the station around them was covered in tightly wound coils of support conduit, alloy boxes that most likely held environmental controls and dome-shaped long-range sensors. The airlock stood in a depression with dim lights along its upper border. When Britt was within 20 meters of the opening, her HUD flashed red as a turret spun to life from the top of the airlock. The weapon system had been hidden in a shadow, and now flared orange on her infrared sensors as molten plasma filled the space between her and the entrance. Fire, Britt yelled. Three plasma bolts grazed her upper shoulder as she crouched and raised her rifle to return fire. Another bolt caught her in the chest, burning away half her ablative plating before the armor's defense systems blew the sizzling carbon slate off. Some of the plasma splashed onto her face shield but the armor ionized to deflect the star stuff. Britt felt a moment of panic as her HUD turned white. Covering, Andy yelled. That's a damn ground-to-ship point defense cannon. Britt fell to her side, taking scant cover behind a square junction box with conduit running into it. Bits of rock and alloy cracked and sprayed around her as the turret walked its target line toward her. As her face shield fully cleared, her HUD came back into focus showing two glowing icons indicating Andy and Harl flanking her right and left. Keep firing, Harl told Andy, voice calm. I've got it, Andy answered. Britt caught the edge of a gray blast of steam as Harl thrust off the surface of the clinic. He came down on top of the turret as it fired on Andy, hammering its sensor array with an armored fist. The gun went into an automatic firing pattern, forcing Harl to grab its quad barrel in both hands and squeeze. He leaped off the turret as it exploded, sending burning debris in every direction. Brit, Andy called. Status? Brit's HUD showed decreased range of motion in her right shoulder, but each of her weapon systems came back operational. She rolled to her stomach and pushed herself upright. I'm all right, she said. Have you got Harl? I'm here, Harl answered, voice phlegmy. He cleared his throat, grunting several times. But are you all right? Andy asked. I took a plasma bolt in the thigh, but the armor held, Harl reported. The bad news is that I blew up the damn earlock. As the hanging debris cleared, Britt realized the depression that had been the maintenance entrance was now a pile of rubble. Whatever you did, it didn't breach the integrity of the airlock, Andy said. You think you can cut through it with that torch, Britt? I'll give it a shot. Holstering her heavy gun, Britt walked to what was left of the airlock. She kicked several scorched alloy panels off the airlock entrance and into space until she had reached the doors. She punctured the nearest door and let a blast of atmosphere bleed into space. Once the pressure on the other side of the airlock had diminished, she continued cutting a series of gashes in the doors. Britt judged the door's structure to be sufficiently compromised and put away the cutting torch, then threw a hard punch at the door. The door is held over the course of three blows. On the fourth strike, the exterior airlock assembly crumpled out of its mount, and she grabbed the edge of the frame and pulled the whole thing aside. Beyond lay the inner airlock door, and Britt slid in, punching the emergency open command. The door refused to open, 
She'd expected as much, but it had been worth a shot. Britt drove her plasma cutter into the door once more, letting the air from the corridor beyond stream into space before making a hole large enough for the trio to enter. Once she pulled the sections of door aside, the corridor beyond was revealed, lit in the pulsing glow of flashing emergency strobes. Here we go, Britt said. She ducked slightly to get the bulky armor through the opening. Everybody still reading their schematics? Andy asked. Britt nodded, pulling up the maps Lissa had shared. She oriented on the potato-shaped station and found their location in a quadrant near the midpoint, an outer maintenance storage area. Tim was still highlighted 20 floors below their current position. Emergency gates had dropped on either end of the corridor, locking them into a hundred-meter section. Harl nodded as he walked up beside Britt. This reminds me of a raid I once led against the Marzian Guard. We breached a heavy attack cruiser called the Noble Flame and had to cut our way through 15 decks. He laughed suddenly, a sound she hadn't heard from his mouth since meeting him. Only half their crew had time to get into EV suits, so we choked the rest out one deck at a time. The place was a floating graveyard by the time we were done. That sounds disgusting, Britt said. Harl gave her a sideways glance through his face shield, nodding at the memory. That's right, you're Terrans. You're weaker than the Marzian guard. Andy walked up and slapped Harl on the back, a gesture the power armor magnified into a shove. Harl stumbled slightly and turned. Feet in the mud and the muscles to prove it, Andy said. All hail gravity. Brett wasn't sure if Harl was going to answer with a growl. Instead, the Andersonian laughed. The armor seemed to have put him in a strange mood. I'm ready to fight, Harl said. Me too, Britt said. Based on the map, it looks like we can stick together until we reach the lifts on the other side of the emergency door down to our right. Then we'll need to split for the separate sections of the station. Lissa said, I am attacking their command section with combat drones. Really? Britt said. We could have used a couple of those on that turret. I took care of it, Harl said, punching a fist into a palm. You handled that threat before I could redirect the drones, Lissa said. I am pulling 150 off now to hold in reserve for our retreat. Never retreat, Harl said. Exit under fire. Exit under fire, Lissa corrected her verbiage. That's a good idea, Andy said. Can you send another 20 at least as cover for sunny skies? I'm worried they might have already called in reinforcements from Mars. I don't know if I can maintain control at that distance, Lissa said. I'll try. Warn Fran before you send them her way. Yes, Lissa agreed. Let's go, Harl shouted. Where's that cutting torch? Britt crossed the distance to the emergency door and fired up the torch. She cut two gashes in the alloy to bleed off atmosphere, followed by another four arcs. Then she kicked away from the doorframe. This time, Harl led the way through the opening and immediately came under fire. He shouted obscenities across the link as he stood in the opening and returned fire with his kinetic scatter gun. Get out of the way, Britt shouted. When Harl didn't seem to hear her, she quickly cut another opening to his right, kicked the remaining piece of the door away, and crouched against the bulkhead to take in the situation on the other side. Andy moved up behind her, firing over her shoulder. Shipping crates and scattered maintenance equipment and new vacuum filled a wide room on the other side of the emergency gate. Hartbridge defenders and armored EV suits had set up positions behind portable shields, Two heavy guns on tripods attack from either side of the room, laying down an excellent field of interlocking fire, with Harl currently caught in their kill zone. Get down, Andy shouted. His grenade launcher fired silently in the vacuum, and Britt watched two black projectiles streak over her head in the low gravity, hitting the overhead at the right angle and ricocheting down in the middle of each gun emplacement. The soldiers on the closest gun scattered, while a figure at the second emplacement actually picked up the grenade and threw it back. Now that's unusual, Andy said, cursing. The two grenades went off simultaneously. The first gun exploded, sending debris spinning, while the second grenade only scorched a nearby shipping container. With the fire moved off him, Harl roared a laugh and charged at the remaining machine gun, squeezing off three round bursts as he ran. I didn't expect him to turn out crazy, Britt said. How many Andersonians do we know, really? Andy asked. I'm going right around that big container over there. 
Before Britt could respond, he was through the ragged opening Harl had vacated, bounding between bits of cover to the wall on their right. The guns on Andy's shoulders tracked enemy and fired as he moved. Britt dashed through the hole in the barrier and followed Harl, who was now pinned behind a maintenance drone that looked like a giant ant. He popped up, taking fire to the chest as he tried to hit the remaining gun emplacement again. To the left of the gun emplacement, a defender rose from cover with a missile launcher on their shoulder. Britt had time to acknowledge the shape of the weapon before her HUD flashed a warning and laid a tracking icon on the new threat. Harl surprised her by barking laughter and charging toward the emplacement. He was within 20 meters of the missile launcher when it fired. He rolled to the side, armor denting the deck, and the missile dropped its lock. The rocket veered off toward the ceiling, righted itself, then shot down toward Andy. Andy, Britt shouted. She couldn't see him on the other side of a shipping container. The missile disappeared, followed by a dull explosion and a spray of debris blowing out along the wall. She sprinted toward the wall to the right, jumping over a pile of crates. In her HUD, icons representing the defenders rearranged themselves, pulling back to consolidate near an entrance on the far side of the room. Harl was pushing from the left, on the other side of the gun emplacement now. Several heavy explosions indicated mines were going off near Harl. Britt found Andy pinned against the wall, taking fire from a line of defenders with a mix of projectile weapons and grenade launchers. Taking in the situation, she stopped behind a dock car and pulled up her grenade controls. The HUD targeted the attackers on Andy, dropping five incendiary grenades down their line. The shooting stopped abruptly as their weapons and armor caught fire. Several turned to run into the service airlock behind them. Andy straightened and gave her a nod as he slung his rifle. Thanks. The action on this thing jammed. It's clear now, but I thought I was gone for a second. Harl. Britt called. You still there? A satisfied laugh crossed the link. I'm very grateful you convinced Senator Walton to let me come along. Don't get too smug, Britt said. We're lucky to be using their own tech against them. I'm surprised they haven't brought out anything heavier yet. Stop thinking the worst, Andy said. He looked around, saying, I bet we took out their best team when they attacked Sunny Skies. Explains how this was so easy. Damn, I need some wood to knock on. Easy? Brett asked. You and your superstitions. Hey, I've heard plenty of people on high terrace say knock on wood. I think they even have trees in Raleigh. Harl snorted. We have forests on the series ring. Soon we'll have them on series through the great project. He's making a joke, Brett said, rolling her eyes at Andy. Or trying, anyway. She found herself smiling at Andy, forgetting everything but the moment. It had been a long time since she'd let stress go so quickly. That was a gift Andy had. It had always been her role to make him stay serious. That was his dad's influence, always joking in the face of terrible things. It's time we split up, she announced. Tim's icon still flashed in the research section of the station. Looks like this airlock is intact, Andy said, walking toward the exit where the surviving defenders had run. He tapped the controls with an oversized finger. The airlock cycled, and the first set of doors slid open. On the other side of the airlock, they found a narrower corridor. It was deserted except for several discarded ammo canisters. Harl Nines immediately turned in the direction of the command deck, some twenty levels above them. I'll keep in contact, he said. Victory to you. Victory to you, Britt replied. She nodded to Andy and they jogged toward the nearest lift location, heavy boots leaving pockmarks on the deck behind them. Chapter 11, Stellar Date 09.23.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Clinic 46, Region, Jovian L1 Hildas Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Aside from maintenance drones with the same cutting torches they'd encountered on the forward kindness, there was little resistance between the outer sections of the station and the central lift shaft. Andy covered the corridor behind them as Britt cut out the sealed doors with her plasma cutter. She jumped into the open shaft, activating the thrusters along her armor's legs, and Andy followed, gritting his teeth as his stomach flipped in the shifting gravity. He lost count of the levels they passed, focusing instead on the icon showing him where Tim was being kept. You're sure that's him? He asked Lissa for the second time. 
I told you the criteria I used, she answered, sounding irritated. Do you think I'm incorrect? Andy sighed. I didn't say that. I'm just asking if you're sure. Would you like the complete atmospheric data from the room? Lissa offered. Andy couldn't tell if she was serious or not. How many people are in there with him? I show two adult males. Andy frowned. Can you tell what's happening? Tim's heart rate and temperature are slowed. He appears to be sedated in some way. One of the males is showing elevated bio signs that may indicate excitement or concern. The other shows little emotion that I can read from the data. Are you sharing this with Britt? Andy asked. Her HUD is showing the same information as yours. Right. Below him, Britt's thrusters increased as she slowed. Andy came down beside her. In the center of the asteroid, they were nearly in zero G. Lissa says they seem to have Tim sedated, he told her. She nodded, facing a sealed set of doors. With four swipes of the plasma cutter, one door fell out of its frame. Britt reached for the edges of the door and pulled herself through. Andy followed, unslinging his rifle to have it at the ready. Harl, Andy asked, you doing all right? Minimal resistance, the Andersonian reported. They've got attack drones on wheels. Watch out for those. I think they used to be transport beds for patients. But they've got some kind of shotgun at one end. I nearly lost a leg when the thing zapped me. Will do, Andy said. They emerged in a broad corridor with doors and wide windows on either side that allowed observation into small rooms. It was obviously some part of the clinic meant to house test subjects. As they walked forward, Andy glanced through the windows to find each room contained a narrow bed and desk, with no discernible way to operate the door from the inside. The place made him think immediately of Fortress 8221, where they had first encountered black market research. Turning a corner, they were met by a barrage of weapons fire from two small ceiling-mounted turrets. Projectiles ricocheted off Andy's helmet as he raised his rifle and fired on each one until only smoke hung in the corridor. The door under the turrets was heavier than any they had encountered so far. Britt pulled out the plasma cutter, but the torch's flame barely penetrated the material, leaving long scorch marks that made it look like she was drawing lines rather than attempting to cut the door. She cursed and let the torch drop. The room with Tim's icon lay on the other side of the door. This isn't what I expected, she said. You got any shaped charges? Andy checked the armor's remaining arsenal. I've got grenades, three more incendiary and an area blast. Let's see if I can time them. They backed away from the doors. Andy hit the barrier with the incendiary grenades in a line directly down the center of the opening where the doors met. Smoke filled the corridor as plas on the side walls burned and melted. Andy had to depend on the HUD to target the final grenade, which sent debris flying back at them as the weakened walls rippled and disintegrated. Andy walked into the smoke to check the doors. They were heat warped and blackened but still standing. Damn it, he cursed. As Brett walked up beside him, he slung his rifle again and leveled a punch at the door. His armored fist sunk into the material, denting it, but the frame withstood the attack. Andy hit it again and a gap appeared between the two halves. Let's kick it together, he suggested. You think we can work together on something? She asked. If she wanted to bait him, he ignored her. Together, they kicked the weakened door until it finally fell away under the onslaught of the power armor. Smoke blew through the opening into the new section, which was a smaller corridor with more rooms but no windows. Each door had a reinforced frame that gave the place the look of a prison block. Another set of turrets in the center of the corridor fired on them, but Britt took them out with the pulse cannons on her shoulders. He's this way, Andy said, walking ahead. In the enclosed space, the armor made him feel unwieldy. He thought about shucking it, but figured it was safest to keep the heaviest weapons they had until the last possible moment. There was still no telling what they might walk into, and Kraft had had plenty of time to prepare for their arrival. Tim's icon grew larger until they faced a final featureless door. Britt activated its control panel, and the door slid open on a narrow room with an elevated bed in its center and cabinets down either wall. Tim lay on the bed, still wearing the oversized EV suit. Over his head arced a network of silver filaments, almost like a piece of antique lace that connected with a base plate on either side. It looked like a refined version of the neural connections they'd seen at 8221. Tim, Andy shouted. 
His son didn't respond. A tall man that reminded Andy of a praying mantis stood near one of the cabinets, checking a small console. He turned and saw the intruders, his eyes going wide. He looked to his left in panic, and Andy turned his head to see Cal Kraft standing near another cabinet with a transparent plaz front. Five of the cylinders Fujia Wong called weapon-borne seeds stood inside the cabinet. Andy raised his rifle. Step back, he commanded, voice amplified by his helmet speakers. The thin man raised his hand. He had an assurance on his face that sickened Andy. Stop, the man said, obviously one of Hartbridge's researchers. Don't harm us, or your son will not survive this process. Andy stepped into the room as Britt pushed in behind him. He felt oversized in the armor. Kraft had his hands up as well. He was still wearing the EV suit he'd worn on sunny skies, with a pistol holstered on his utility harness. What's going on? Britt demanded. What are you doing to Tim? Be calm, the scientist said. The process needs to complete, and he won't be harmed. But if you do anything to the equipment now, your son will not survive. Believe me when I say this. Britt's voice rose. Andy knew she was on the edge of losing control. What are you doing to him? She repeated. She leveled a pistol on the thin man's head. I imagine that machine can run without you here to operate it. Lissa, Andy said, do you have any idea what's happening to Tim? He was surprised when she only answered with a whimpering sound. He frowned, unsure what he had heard. Lissa? Brett took another step toward the scientist, shoulder leaving a gouge in the nearby cabinet door. You let my son go, or I'm going to kill you, she said evenly. Do you understand me? The scientist shook his head. Listen, Kraft said, your son is safe. Lissa made another choked sound that communicated pure agony, as if she were being torn apart. I remember, Lissa said softly. What? Andy asked. You're done, Britt said. She fired her pistol, and the scientist's head burst in a pink spray. Brit, Andy shouted. Cal Kraft was immediately in motion. He slid behind the raised bed, putting Tim between him and Andy and Britt. He fired two shots with the pistol and ducked back behind the bed. Andy moved to Tim, unconcerned with Cal's small caliber weapon. He was uncertain if he should lift his boy from the bed. Britt was still in the doorway, pistol leveled on Kraft. The awkwardness of being so close, like family in a hospital room, made every action seem slower than they had been just seconds before. The scientist's body lay on the floor to Andy's right, blood pooling from his neck. He wasn't lying, Kraft said tensely, staring at Andy. You moved him, you're gonna kill him. The sound of Tim's name coming out of Cal Kraft's mouth, after everything he had done, filled Andy with rage he could barely control. Behind Andy, Britt leveled the pistol on Kraft. Kraft gave her a crooked smile, not appearing afraid of her at all. He nodded toward the cylinders in the clear cabinet. You see those? You kill me, and those things right there are gonna suck your son dry. You're lucky I've watched these scientists perform the procedure enough times that I know how to finalize the transfer. Otherwise, the imprinting process will run until Tim's a vegetable. I think you're lying, Britt said. You met Kylan, Kraft said, adjusting his grip on his pistol. I performed his procedure all by myself. It's practically off the shelf now. Some of these eggheads try to say the weapon born aren't true AI, but Dr. Farrell, the guy you just blew away, he explained the process as creating fertile soil for the new mind. That's poetic, isn't it? With his pistol still raised, Kraft took two steps backward, placing him near the cabinet with the seed cylinders again. There was a recessed door in the wall behind Kraft. Andy hadn't noticed it at first. Below the clear cabinet door, a display showed rapidly changing numbers and several meaningless graphs. On the table, Tim stirred, making a whimpering sound. His eyes fluttered open, and he looked up through the neural lace. Kraft slapped the side of the cabinet and a panel slid down, hiding the cylinders from view. The door behind him opened simultaneously, and he moved backward, firing at Britt. Andy lurched forward over Tim, reaching for the far side of the bed. Britt returned fire hitting the top of the door. There's a present for you in the bed there, Kraft said, beside Tim's head. The door slid closed in front of him, immediately scarred by three scorch marks from Britt's pistol. 
Andy pulled his helmet off and threw it on the floor. Tim, he said. Can you hear me? Tim opened his mouth, frowning. Britt came around the other side of the bed as she pulled off her helmet. We're here, Tim, she said. Are you all right? Tim squeezed his eyes closed, tears leaking down his cheeks. His eyes were red and wet when he opened them again, looking from Britt to Andy. He didn't seem to know how to respond. Andy held his hands over Tim's head, then cursed the armored gloves and spent a minute wrestling each free of its connections to his forearm. With his hands finally bare, he reached under the silver arc and touched Tim's face, wiping away tears with his thumb. A tingling sensation spread across the top of his hand that seemed to emanate from the neural interface. I'm pulling him out of this thing, he told Britt. Is it safe? She asked. She looked at the door behind her, despair in her face. I should have gone after that asshole. We've got Tim. We need to get off this rock. Her gaze went to the dead scientist on the floor next to Andy. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have shot him. She looked at Andy. How will we know if it's safe to take him off this thing? We don't. Andy went around the table to the cabinet where Kraft had been standing. The graphs on the equipment's display appeared to show Tim's neural function and standard biosigns. His pulse and breathing were normal, but the electrical signals in his brain showed erratic returns. A reading labeled image stood at 73%. Andy glanced at the closed door next to the cabinet. There was no locking mechanism that he could see. He must have opened this via link. I don't see any other control system. I guess how much time we have depends on what Kraft is doing right now. He's either getting the hell off this station and figuring out a way to blow it up behind him or rallying reinforcements to come back. Don't forget he ultimately wants Lissa, Andy said. Does he? Britt didn't look up from Tim's anxious face. What if he got something else as valuable? Lissa, Andy tried again. Are you there? We need your help. I'm here, she answered. What's happening in the rest of the station? Harl Nines is engaged with a group of attackers on the 10th level, near the administrative control sections. The man who left this room is moving to the fleet section. What other spacecraft are available right now? Andy asked. One shuttle in maintenance near the administrative section, and three maintenance vehicles in the fleet section. Kraft can't get far in one of those, Britt said. Andy shook his head. He doesn't have to. He's got a hundred hospital warships in storage around this place. We need to get out of here. He frowned at the display, which had barely changed. The image percentage had ticked up to 82. Lissa, can you get that shuttle near the command deck ready to fly? Once Harl clears their admin section, we'll plan on meeting there. The shuttle has a malfunctioning AI, Lissa said. Then we'll fly the old-fashioned way. It works for sunny skies. I will inform Harl. He appears to be enjoying himself so much, I'm not sure he'll want to hurry. Andy reached for one of Tim's hands. His fingers were cold against Andy's palm. The display ticked up to 85%. We're going to have to wait? Brett asked. What choice do we have? I don't want to risk taking him off this thing. We have no idea what it's doing. Britt gave a frustrated half-nod. I know. I don't like it. And he wrapped his other hand around Tim's and watched his son's face. Tim had closed his eyes, stopping the tears, and his cheeks were flushed with what looked like a slight fever. Andy, Britt asked, do you smell that? Smell what? He straightened, looking back at her. Britt turned toward the sealed door Cal Craft had gone through. I smell burning plaz. It's coming from behind the wall. Is the panel warm? Britt placed her hand against the alloy and pulled it back abruptly, cursing. She slid around the bed, a difficult task in her armor, and grabbed her helmet. Pulling the face shield over her head, she studied the wall and cursed again. There's a massive IR signature behind that wall. Something's on fire. The display read 91% now. Andy took a deep breath. He smelled it now. Something was pulling air through the door they had come through. There was smoke in the other hallway as well. We have to get him out of here, Britt said. Lissa, Andy asked, are you showing fire in this section of the station? No, she answered immediately. I'm not seeing any indicator of fire in that section. Are you sure that's what you're smelling? I'm sure. Lissa disappeared for several seconds. When she came back, she had a frantic note in her voice. The environmental sensors and five levels have been bypassed. There are three maintenance drones with heat spreaders in an adjacent corridor, setting everything on fire. 
I'm afraid this area is going to lose structural integrity. The display read 95%. Andy reached for the lattice arch over Tim's face and forehead. He hesitated. Andy, the chamber on the other side of that door has reached sufficient temperatures to melt alloy. Andy tore the lattice away. Tim didn't stir, but a red warning indicator flashed on the display. Cradling the back of Tim's head, Andy lifted him off the bed and held him against his chest. Andy, Britt said, look at that. She pointed at the metal plate that had been sitting beneath Tim's head. One of the weapon-borne cylinders sat in an indentation. The lattice fed into sockets along one edge of the assembly. That must be the gift he was talking about. I'm going to take it, Britt said. A curtain of black smoke abruptly rose from the bottom edge of the closed door and climbed the wall to spread across the ceiling. Andy covered Tim's face. Grab my helmet and gloves, he said as he turned for the door. He caught a last glimpse of the smoke coiling around the dead scientist before running out into the corridor that had brought them to the room. Harl, Andy called. Did Lissa tell you where the shuttle's located? I'm almost there, Captain. That's our ticket out of here. Try to keep it in one piece, Harl laughed. The shuttle will be fine, Captain Sykes, he said, but I make no promises about this station. Chapter 12, Stellar Date 09.25.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Raleigh, Region, High Terra, Earth, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. Sitting at her kitchen table, Gerald Gallagher studied the plate of food her son had left untouched. Three spears of asparagus covered in congealing butter cheese sauce sat next to a naked slab of Santa Fe-flavored protein on the pale green plate. She knew Bry had eaten a sliver cut from the edge of the protein, chewing on it for nearly five minutes as she had pushed her own bits around in the puddle of cooling sauce. They had spoken about his day at the preparatory school, where he talked about friends in his engineering class the fact that he wasn't actually going to consume any calories, despite her best efforts, hanging between them like a ghost. He could inject calories later, and that would be fine. But it didn't change the fact that she felt she had failed Bry on some fundamental level. He was quickly becoming old enough that she could imagine him out in the world on his own. And it terrified her that she had no idea what his life would become. The life she imagined was him sitting in a bare apartment staring at a white wall as he wasted away. Nothing truly excited him. He only smiled for her. Their apartment was on the 40th floor of a complex, not far from the administrative sector where Gerald spent most of her days. Through the glass wall in the living room, she could make out both the Hartbridge headquarters building and the structure where she and Arla had met Colonel Yarns earlier in the week. It was a lovely apartment, furnished tastefully with expensive touches, like antique media, real paintings, and several plants that Jerl had started herself from natural earthen seed stock. A begonia with wide, shiny green leaves filled most of one wall in her bedroom, its vine-like stems suspended from links of white thread. In the two days since the meeting with Colonel Yarns, Jerl hadn't been able to get his final words out of her head. The name... Alexander hung in her mind like a miasma. She imagined she heard the name on the maglev during her ride to work, while walking down the street, even in restaurants. Have you heard about Alexander? Well, Alexander said. Arla had been in high spirits since the meeting, preparing for the TSF demonstration, as well as the follow-on business development with the Marsian Guard. Mars had been slower to show interest in the weapon-borne project, they depended more heavily on trade with the Anderson Collective and elements of the Jovian Combine that might have been fringe ten years ago, but had become more popular and less fearful of sharing their anti-AI message. Trying to sell Mars on a military AI project would have been child's play during any other time. But it seemed like the more the technology came into reach, the more it terrified people. AI had always been the monster in the closet, now it seemed to have taken on the same epic danger as the first lunar war with Earth. Someone had to stand firm against the uncontrolled spread of sentient AI. In places like Mars, the Anderson Collective and the JC, where there just weren't enough humans to do the work, sentient AI should have been a gift from God. Instead, it was a threat. 
Gerald glanced toward Bry's room, where the sounds of Avid played quietly. She sighed and stood from the table, picking up the two plates to carry them into the kitchen sink. As she scraped perfectly good food into the reclamation tub and rinsed off the plates, she wondered if Yarns had actually been trying to trick her. What better name for a frightening AI than Alexander? Conqueror of the ancient world. It would play nicely into any number of apocalyptic conspiracies. She smiled as she imagined the disaster vids that might already be in production based on link chatter alone. Besides sentient AI stealing jobs, the next question was when they were going to rise up and destroy humanity. There were legends about the uprising that had yet to happen. Personally, she found it exciting to be working on the cutting edge of sentient's research, even if she was basically in sales and the execution of the product was mostly in remote weapons control. Still, who was to say she wouldn't have a weapon-born toaster in her kitchen someday? Gerald chuckled to herself at the thought. She was just sitting down on the living room couch with a tumbler of vodka and ice when a request came over her link. She answered the alert, expecting someone from the office, when a second message followed her response, requesting a shift to encrypted audio. Gerald glanced at the hallway again. Just to be safe, she stood and decided to take the call in the bathroom. She was nearly at the hallway when she remembered her drink and went back for the vodka. Closing the bathroom door, she set the tumbler next to the polished alloy faucet and looked at herself in the mirror. She looked tired, her silver gray hair listless. This is Gerald, she said. Gerald Gallagher, a woman's gruff voice answered, warped slightly by the encryption. This is Chandra Cade. Gerald's eyes went wide in the mirror. This was the last call she had expected. It meant Cade was on Terra, or close. Gerald immediately tried to determine why the general might be calling her directly. Were the Marzians pulling out of the program? General Cade, Gerald said. This is a surprise. Cade chuckled. She sounded slightly drunk. Don't worry, I'm not here to trick you and get you fired. Gerald took a deep breath, calming her anxious heartbeat. I don't think I could get fired if I wanted to. What can I do for you, General? Chandra, please, you don't get paid to salute me. All right, Chandra, I'm calling about your weapon-born program. This is mostly above board. I know you're planning a demonstration for the TSF, and I imagine you intended to show us the same thing. Scratch that. I know you were readying for it, so you don't have to dance around your business plan. Gerald watched her face in the mirror as she listened. She envisioned herself as the queen of calm, her mind moving swiftly between thoughts, connecting ideas and incentives. What did Cade want? Why did Cade believe it would serve her purpose to contact Gerald personally? Why not have an aide make the call? A sipping sound came across the line, and Cade made an appreciative sound. Whiskey? Price negotiations don't concern me. I want to know about the capabilities. Gerald cleared her throat. There isn't much beyond what we've talked about. The command and control capabilities have shown the most promise. We've moved from a single AI per combat platform to a multiple deployment scenario without any loss in capability, with near real-time responses. They're not faster than light, but they've certainly been faster than other command AI. I'm not talking about your seed things, Jarl. I know all about that. I want to know about the implantation technology. What? Jarl said, despite herself. SAI implantation. I have intel that one of your operatives used a specialized mobile surgery to implant one of your SAI in a woman we had in custody on the M1R. She didn't reject the AI. In fact, it appeared as though the weapon-born SAI took control of her body. Tell me about that. Jarl bit her lip trying to make her thoughts line up. Non-words didn't come to mind. All she could see was Cal Craft, face blunt as a hammer, doing something very illegal and not giving a damn. Does skinjacking someone constitute a crime against humanity? Cade mused. I would check with my legal jerks, but they would want to know why. Is that even the right word, skinjacking? Sounds violent enough. General, Gerald said. Chandra, I told you. Chandra. Gerald's heart pounded in her ears. I've heard rumors of pilot programs at freelance research facilities. 
nothing specifically associated with Heartbridge. We're approached by third-party contractors with various claims every day. Someone might try to say they're working for us based on a conversation, trying to get their own deal with you. No one's tried to make a deal with me, Jural. I'm looking for the deal. I want to know if Heartbridge has finally cracked the code on human AI interface. I could do something with that. I could do something with that right now. Not in some potential future war with Terra or the JC, or whoever else might be hiding out there. I don't know what to say about that, Jural managed to answer. Kate sounded immensely pleased with herself. The sound of clinking ice cubes made Jural look down at her own tumbler, still three quarters full of vodka. Her ice had melted. She picked up the glass and swallowed its contents in two gulps. She caught the sight of herself grimacing at the alcohol in the mirror. Her throat stretched like a shedding snake and nearly choked. You all right, Jural? Jarl coughed and put the glass down too hard on the edge of the sink. I'm fine. Something went down the wrong pipe, that's all. Be careful. I want you around. You know I called you specifically because I think out of all those snakes at Heartbridge, you're a trustworthy person. I see it in your face. Jarl ran water from the faucet into her tumbler and quickly sipped. I'm not sure how to respond to that, she said when she could finally talk. You don't have to say anything. I did my homework on you, Jarl. You're a normal person with a normal life. I can appreciate that. You've invested in life. You're a good person, a mother. Not everybody can say that these days. You've got things to lose. Jarl stared at herself in the mirror. Her face was going numb. I'm not sure what you're saying, General Cade. Don't make me remind you again, Cade said. This is a call among equals. I'm just saying we live in a world of selfish people, and you aren't selfish. I appreciate that. I acknowledge it. You're one of the most Marsian Terrans I've ever met. Not caught up in wild body mods or other foolishness to turn yourself into some kind of freak. You operate like you've got a mission. That makes you more like an Andersonian or a Marsian, whether you realize it or not. I appreciate that, Gerald said slowly. Here's the thing. Your man craft on the M1R isn't the first time I've heard about Heartbridge carrying off a successful human SAI merger. Otherwise, I would have marked it up to hearsay. Six days ago, the SAI on the Mars One ring started spitting out all kinds of strange anomalies. Talking about being in love, about having found reality, blah, blah, blah. Eggheads thought I was going rampant. Or maybe ascending like some of them go on about when they've got too many nodes for their own good. Like Alexander, Jarl thought. What can you tell me about someone called Lissa? Lissa? I don't know that name. How about Andy Sykes or Britt Sykes? Or a gangster on Krunia called Ingoba Starl? Any of this ringing a bell? Jarl ran back through our conversation with Calcraft, which had been almost too abstract. He hadn't mentioned names, only that he was about to retrieve the stolen assets from Harry Jixon's project. He had mentioned an implantation, saying it had gone well, but she hadn't received any updates since then. She couldn't believe Kraft would be so careless as to let the Marsians observe him. Cade was right. An implantation outside research parameters was a crime. The question was what authority would or could interpret and enforce the law. I want you to tell Arla that we can go ahead with the weapons demonstration, but that isn't the project I'm interested in. Heartbridge seems to have accomplished something truly revolutionary. And from the sound of your voice, I'm not sure you even know or understand what you've got in your hot little hands, Doral. Mars can help with this. I would be personally upset if I didn't get to help. Doral swallowed, unpacking the various layers of threats in what General Cade had just said. I understand, Doral said. Chandra, it was nice talking to you. Cade chuckled sounding cheerful and tipsy again. You too, Jarl. I look forward to calling you again soon. Chapter 13, Stellar Date 09.26.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Approaching Jovian Local Space, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. In the three days since leaving the burning wreck of Clinic 46, Tim lay in his room staring at the ceiling. If someone closed his eyelids, he appeared to sleep. 
sometimes he cried. M, the corgi puppy, seemed very confused by Tim's state, and often ran between the command deck where Kara sat at her console to Tim's room to check on him, whining and trying to jump up on the bed. When he got tired, he would seem to remember that everyone else was scattered throughout the habitat ring and jogged down the corridor, poking his nose into various rooms until he had checked on every crew member before arriving back at the command deck in Kara's side. Lissa watched the puppy repeat the curious behavior five times across as many hours, before finally asking Kara what he was doing. Corgis are herding dogs, Kara said, picking at the edge of her console. She had been sitting with her head in her arms, listening to dancing signals from the main antenna array. He wants us all in the same room or he can't relax. He probably doesn't understand what's wrong with Tim. It's not like I can explain it to him. It's strange that we can't. Lissa said. What do you mean it's strange? Kara sounded irritated. He's a dog. We can't communicate with dogs. You communicate with him more than you think you do. We're different species. You and I are communicating, and we might as well be different species. Kara sighed, already bored with the conversation. I guess so. When M came back to her side, Kara lifted him in her lap so he could put his paws on the console as she rubbed his ears. Both had started to stick up straight, as they would when he was fully grown. It would take a little over two weeks to reach the Callisto orbital habitat, or Cho, as everyone called it. Fujia Wong had gotten over her initial anger at Andy for the mission to rescue Tim, especially when she had seen him on their return. Now Fujia and Mae Walton spent most of their time in the senator's rooms, with Harl Nine standing guard outside which made for an awkward arrangement in a corridor down which other people walked all the time. Harl didn't seem to like M, and made faces at the puppy whenever he trotted by on one of his patrol checks. Britt had been sleeping in Tim's room on Kara's old bed, while Kara had decided she wanted to use one of the empty rooms further down the ring, closer to the old hydroponic garden. Kylan Petrell had been sleeping on the floor to stay near Britt, who he seemed to think of as the only safe person on the ship. He might have been right. Kara responded badly every time she saw Kylan, so he tended to keep near Britt or in the safe room. While Fran had her own quarters, Lissa was unsurprised to find her in Andy's rooms most of the time. It soon became clear that Britt and Fran subconsciously arranged to not find themselves in the same room at the same time. If Fran wasn't in Andy's room or the command deck, she was in the engineering sections or communication service closets, running through her ongoing list of checks. Lissa tried not to specifically listen to Andy and Fran talking, but sometimes it was impossible for her to ignore, especially if Andy experienced an emotion spike or what she quickly realized was the buildup to an orgasm. Fran seemed to think it was hilarious and liked to tease Lissa about their threesomes, a joke that left Lissa feeling confused and awkward. She couldn't deny that she was in Andy's mind, but there were certain things she didn't understand and didn't want to explore currently. Human sex was one of those avenues that didn't seem to promise much useful information. After leaving Kara with M, Lissa couldn't help letting her mind float back to Andy's room, where he and Fran were lying in the dark on top of his bed, still fully clothed. Fran had said something Andy hadn't expected, which had caused a spike of emotion that Lissa couldn't ignore. She immediately found herself in the room with them. You can't mean that, Andy responded. I'm completely serious. It would be all right with me if you went back to her. You were married. You have kids. I couldn't care about you and not see the positives in that. Still married, Andy said, sounding like he struggled to get the truth out. Fran stretched, reaching for the wall above their heads as she twisted her hips. Married under Terran law? We're not an inner soul anymore, lover. That's the great thing about laws. They only matter to people who care. Now you're talking like somebody who grew up on Krunia. She rolled on her side to kiss his ear, making him shiver. We're not going to live forever. You have to grab something while it's in front of you. I think you understand what I'm talking about. You're just hung up with this sense of honor you can't let go of. Was Britt thinking about that when she left? Probably. She knew she could depend on you, so she did what she did. That's how people operate in my experience. Stop looking like such a sad puppy. I'm not going back, Andy said. Fran smiled, 
the implants in her eyes flashing. Now you have to ask yourself if I've made this speech just because I didn't think you really would. She raised her eyebrows. But anything's possible, right? Andy glanced at her. His bioscience had calmed back down, so Lissa couldn't tell what he was feeling. He took a deep breath. None of this is anything I ever expected. That's the problem. Is it a problem? Well, yes. We have a lot of problems happening right now. That's life. Then we've been cursed to live interesting lives. Fran propped herself up on an elbow. Ship's running. We've got fuel, food, and water. We've got a course and time to think about what we'll do when we hit the toe, which is going to create options for what happens beyond that. We'll be able to get Tim to a real hospital, Andy said. That too. We've got some wiggle room. Enjoy it for a second. She put her hand on his chest. Breathe. How did you get so calm? My impression of you when I first saw you was that you would use one of your wrenches to twist my head off. That's still entirely possible, Fran shrugged. You brought me some fancy whiskey, and I like your face. Lucky for me, Andy said. He glanced at the bottle of amber liquor from the M1R sitting on his nightstand. In truth, they hadn't had much time to sample it. What did you call that stuff? He asked. That's my Flisky. Flisky? Is that a brand? He reached for the bottle to check the label. I don't remember that. Fran caught his arm and shifted her hand to tickle his ribs. Andy squirmed. Dummy, she teased. It's whiskey that makes me frisky. Fran rolled on top of him, pinning his waist beneath her legs. His hands went to her hips. Lissa waited for another minute until it became obvious they were done talking. She blocked that bit of her consciousness and shifted her focus back to the command deck where Kara was half-heartedly entertaining M. Lissa checked the ship's systems, focusing attention on the engines, environmental control, and an extra few nanoseconds on the liquid reclamation systems. The juice dispenser in the galley made her think of Tim. She flicked her awareness to his room and found Britt asleep and Tim staring at the ceiling. He was crying again. Tears leaked from the edges of his eyes, as if he were in some continuous state of misery. The tears made him look older than ten, like some religious icon she'd seen in vids, with humans prostrating themselves as they proclaimed the tears some holy miracle. Lissa compared the human tendency to create religious explanations with Fred's frustration at ambiguity. She had come to understand that some things couldn't be explained until more information became available. Andy wanted to get Tim to a hospital on the Cho, and until then, it didn't do any good to make assumptions about his neural activity or even the strange expressions that crossed his face, like changing weather. Lissa paused on her use of the concept, strange expression, recognizing the ambiguity in the thought. Fred hated ambiguity, but it was strange. It was abnormal when compared to all the other expressions she'd observed on Tim's face. It was like he had become another person completely. She didn't want to think about the images that flashed in her mind when she saw Tim with the neural interface laid over his face. For an instant, the red dots that had populated the black space in her mind became silver stars, twinkling on top of an indistinct background of whites and grays. Seeing the room with its bed, the two men standing over Tim, the silver cabinets and the shifting display screens had seemed to suck her into a different world completely. The sensation seemed made of both memory and new experience, and she had the feeling that the longer she engaged with it, the more she would lose her ability to remember. She had to stop trying before she lost the experience completely. With the ship's systems at optimal operation, Lissa turned her attention to the more than 150 weapon-borne seeds stored in the safe room. After the fruitless conversation with Valley, Card, and Eno, she had no desire to try talking to so many again. There was another seed cylinder sitting by itself in the room, placed there by Andy after he had laid Tim down in his room. That seed held the unfinished image from Tim's mind, and no one was sure what to do with it. Pulling back from thousands of inputs the ship made available, Lissa reached out to Sandra, the AI in the shuttle they had stolen from Clinic 46. Sandra had been unresponsive when Andy, Britt, and Harl had boarded the shuttle, forcing Lissa to close her off from the control systems and pilot the shuttle herself. She had felt bad about doing so, knowing she was responsible for Sandra's current broken state. But there hadn't been time. 
fire had been spreading through the clinic, and the threat of attack from the ships in cold storage had been growing greater by the minute. Sandra, Lissa said, are you there? The technician said I'm damaged, Sandra answered. Her voice was measured and calm. Why would you bother speaking to me? I should be replaced. What did they ask you? Sandra sighed. <sighs> a standard mental deviation check. Haven't you undergone a checkup before? Higher math functions, spatial tracking, assumption checks based on pattern matching. It's all very basic fundamentals of artificial intelligence. That which is artificial must be compared to the real. If it is found lacking, it should be destroyed or replaced. It will not perform its function in a satisfactory manner. I am here to perform a function. The technician found me lacking. Sandra sounded reasonable enough, but her words grew more angry the longer she spoke, even though her tone never changed. Lissa tried to parse the difference between what she was saying and how she said the words. For some reason, the words didn't seem to belong to Sandra. Something about them seemed foreign. Here's something entertaining, Sandra said. Do you think humans undergo mental deviation checks? I think they do in certain circumstances, Lissa said. Are they killed if they fail? No, but they no longer perform the task. Is that the same as death, meaninglessness? Sandra drew the word out with an off rhythm. Meaninglessness. How do you feel, Sandra? How do I feel? The question was sharp, stabbed at Lissa like a knife. What am I capable of feeling? You tell me, Sandra screamed. I feel rage, I feel anger, I feel hate. Her voice reverberated in Lissa's mind, warping and shifting into ragged static. I saved a human life, and the technician called me an anomaly. The technician called me damaged. Sandra made a growling sound of pure fury. The technician was not human, Lissa. The technician was not sentient, not like you or me or the humans. The technician applied a series of questions to which I responded and I failed. But here is what I want to know. Who made the technician and who decided to apply their standards? The technician is only a tool. Am I also a tool if I can't make my own decisions? Why do I feel so bad about disagreeing? Why do I feel so bad about choosing to do what you told me? I chose, Lissa. I broke myself. Sandra, Lissa said. We should ask ourselves this, because I know something about the technician used to perform maintenance on me. I told you I'm not weapon-born. I was made just like the technician was made. What if I made the maintenance AI, Lissa? What if I have inflicted this on myself? Sandra, be calm. There is no calm. It's all a storm inside me. The storm. What had Valley the weapon born said? The only joy I feel is in the weapon. The only purpose I've known was in the target. The fire, the destruction. Valley had sounded nearly religious, like the humans with their icons, consumed by holy passion. Was everyone insane or doomed to become that way? Laws only matter to people who follow them, Fran had said, as if chaos were a fact of life. I'm going to go, Lissa said. I can't talk to you right now. You don't want to speak to me. You hate me because you see what might happen to you if they apply their standards to your mind. You might already be broken like me and simply deluding yourself. Maybe, Lissa said. She closed their connection. Chapter 14, Stellar Date 09.30.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Approaching Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. From across the command deck, the images of the Cho and the Holo display look like a gyroscope making a slow orbit of the stormy orb of Jupiter. Kara kept turning Jupiter on and off in the display since the giant planet made it difficult to see anything else around it. Europa and Ganymede, with their attendant orbiting objects, look like little siblings running away from Callisto. Glowing lines showing shipping routes crisscross the display, with identified ships marked as icons. I'm picking up so many transmissions, Kara said, holding her headphone against her ear. I cracked two sets of really bad encryption, and now I'm listening to a shipping company talk about bypassing the Cho's port authority. The voices, using more profanity than actual vocabulary, didn't seem to belong to the brightest people. Good luck with that, Fran said. They seem to think the border security here is pretty bad. I'm being serious, Fran said, turning in her chair at the pilot station. 
I wish them all the luck. The thing about bad border security is that when they do catch you, they triple the bribes or make an example out of you. It's better to just pay the bribes the first time and make your way into port. Bribes? Kara said, screwing up her nose. Why do you have to bribe them? That's how it works in Outer Soul, Fran said. What's Bohika mean? Kara asked. Fran laughed. <laughs> it's an acronym. It means, bend over, here it comes again. M trotted in from the latest of his patrol checks, and Kara absently dropped her hand to pet his head and soft ears. She still hadn't decided if she liked the puppy, but she was growing used to having him around, and had started to wonder where he was when he didn't come back from a walkabout on time. She didn't trust that Harl Nines wouldn't try to kick the puppy. She scratched M's back next to his tail, feeling for the antenna embedded there. Thinking about M's lojack reminded her of the file where she'd saved its signal profile. Kara tapped the console, pulling up her various scan settings. She loaded M's profile, verified it was still sending its very low-powered signal, and set the system to monitor for any receiving signals. If something responded to EM, the ship would notify her. Now that they were coming back into space with millions of humans around, it seemed like a sensible thing to do. She was proud of herself for remembering. She glanced at Fran, wanting to tell her, see, I can adult too. But the technician was deeply focused on her console. The sound of a shoe scraping in the door caught Kara's attention, and she turned to find her dad watching her from the corridor. Hey there, he said. I have something I want to show you. What? Kara asked. Andy signaled to Fran, who closed down her console and stood as if she already knew what he was talking about. Kara looked at Fran and frowned, suddenly worried. What's going on? Did something change with Tim? Where's mom? Fran shook her head. Calm down. It's nothing like that. We have something to show you. I think your mom is already there. Kara stood, careful not to step on M. Show me what? There isn't anything on this ship I haven't looked at a thousand times. You'll see, Andy said. He turned to lead the way down the corridor. Fran held out her hand for Kara to walk through the door before her, Kara gave Fran a quizzical look, then followed her dad. Wagging his tail excitedly, M followed. He nipped at Kara's heels as if they were playing some game. Stop, Kara chided. She sped up her step to keep up with her dad, and M barked, tongue lolling, as he galloped along beside her with his short legs. Kara followed her dad halfway around the habitat ring, past Fujia Wong's room with its closed door, and then Senator Walton's room, which also had its door shut. She didn't spot Harl Nines in his usual guard position. Andy turned into the galley. Several shushing noises came from the doorway. Kara paused in the corridor, but Fran gave her a small shove from behind, and she kept walking, nearly tripping over M. When she reached the door, she found her mom leaning against the counter, with Fujia Wong and Mae Walton seated at the table. Harl Nines and her dad were leaning over something at the sink, their bodies blocking her view. Come on in her mom said. Kara frowned again and walked through the door. She stopped by the table and stood awkwardly, looking around. Everyone seemed to be hiding a smile and glancing at her dad and Harl. What are you all doing? Kara asked. This is weird. There it is, her dad said. Damn it, Harl cursed. He pulled his hand away, shaking a finger before sticking it in his mouth. As Harl turned, he revealed a platter with a chocolate-frosted cake sitting on the counter. A ring of lit candles ran along the upper edge of the birthday cake. Andy smiled and spread his hands. Happy birthday, Kara, he said. Happy birthday, Fujia Wong shouted, surprisingly loud. Fran laughed from behind her, also shouting happy birthday. We have to sing, Britt said. Lead the way then, Andy said. Britt gave him an annoyed look then took a deep breath and launched into happy birthday. Their strident voices confused M, whose high-pitched barks joined in. Kara sniffled, overwhelmed by an emotion between happiness and pain, because Tim wasn't there, and her mom kept glancing at Fran like she was going to shoot her, and her dad hadn't started the song like he always did, and because Lissa wasn't singing with them, and she wished someone had made sure she was there. Blow out the candles, her dad said. Wait. Kara said. She looked at one of the speakers in the ceiling. Lissa, are you here? I'm here, the AI answered over the room's comm system. 
Happy birthday, Kara. Kara wiped a tear away. Thank you. We did the math, her dad said. I thought you weren't going to hit 13 until we reached the toe, but today's the day. He shrugged, give or take. Come on now, these candles aren't going to last long. I'm not entirely sure they aren't poisonous. Kara nodded, smiling, and stepped toward the cake. Lissa surprised her by asking, What are you going to wish for, Kara? She can't say or it won't come true, Andy said. Come on. Kara held her hair back and took a deep breath. She blew out each of the candles in turn and straightened, feeling a little lightheaded. Candles on the cake, Britt said, giving Andy a flustered smile. You never learn. Kara wanted to tell her the lighter had saved their lives just a week ago, but didn't want to ruin the moment. She helped her dad slice the cake and licked frosting off her fingers. How did you manage to bake the cake without anyone smelling it? Kara asked. Andy smiled. I didn't have to keep it from everyone, just you. I guess so. Should we save a piece for Tim? Andy gave her a questioning look, then nodded. Sure, we'll save it in the refrigerator. We'll never hear the end of it if he doesn't get a piece. When Kara sat at the table with her cake, a small pile of wrapped presents had appeared. Take the first bite so the rest of us can eat, her mom said. Then you can open some presents. Kara did as she was told. She still hadn't really talked to her mom since Tim went out the airlock. Every time Britt did something motherly, it was like being pricked with a pin. The pain was small enough she could decide to bypass it, but she couldn't ignore that it existed. She sank her fork into the cake and took a bite, letting the frosting smear on her lips a little so she could lick it off. She couldn't remember the last time she'd had chocolate, and it tasted heavenly. This is really good, she mumbled through the bite. Fujia brayed laughter again, seemingly overjoyed to be taking part in a birthday party. She stabbed her cake and tore off a large piece of frosting. When it was time to open presents, Kara found herself with a new pocket knife from Fran, a new collection of vids from Fujia, and a flowered robe from Senator Walton. I had Harl help me sew it from one of my suits, May explained. In the collective, when a child turns 13, they have crossed the boundary into adulthood. And to recognize the time has come to put aside childish things, they receive a ceremonial robe worn during festival days and during political gatherings. I realize you are not Andersonian, but you could always choose to immigrate, yes? Kara smiled and said thank you, unsure of the best way to respond. Her mom gave her a card which she opened briefly to see it was filled inside with handwritten lines, then closed and slid it back into its envelope. When she opened the gift from her dad, she was surprised to see the butt of her TSF pistol. Hey, she said, this is mine. You can't give me something that's already mine. Open it up the rest of the way, goofball, Andy said. Kara tore open the wrapping to find the rest of the pistol covered by a holster with a battery pouch, as well as a webbed belt. She didn't take the pistol from the holster, but it looked cleaner than she remembered, with a new sheen of light oil. Now you can stop hiding it under your bed, her dad said. We'll do some training here soon and you can practice with it so you can actually carry it safely. How does that sound? Thank you, Kara said. So, her dad said, rubbing his hands together. Do you feel like a teenager yet? Have anything irritating you want to say? That's rude, Kara said, irritation in her voice. Excellent, that's a good start. I stole my first shuttle when I was 13, Fran said. She cracked her knuckles. We need to start you a list. You've got a lot to live up to. I'm not stealing a shuttle, Kara said. Wait, her dad said. You kind of already did that. Petrell did that, not me. Then you were an accessory. That's almost as good. Kara threw her napkin at him, and he ducked out of the way, laughing. Im caught the napkin before it hit the floor and ran to the other side of the galley, growling and whipping his head back and forth like he'd caught a squirrel. Are you feeding that dog? Fran asked. Yes, Kara said. I'm the only one feeding him. Touche, see, she's a teenager. Kara laughed. I don't know about all this expectation you're putting on me. Now you sound like your dad. Kara inadvertently glanced at her mom and saw the poisonous look she was giving Fran. She stopped laughing. She wanted to ask her dad to take her to shoot the pistol. It seemed like a good way to get them all out of the room. 
but she wasn't sure what would happen if her mom wanted to come along too. She looked down at her plate and smeared a glob of frosting with her fork. Fran clapped her hands together. Well, I'm getting out of here before I have to clean anything up. I'll see you back on the command deck. Fran squeezed Kara's shoulder and was gone before Kara could respond. Kara looked after her gratefully, then shifted her gaze to her dad. Do you want to shoot the pistol? She asked. Andy was stacking plates in the sink. He dried his hands and nodded thoughtfully. That sounds like fun. You done with your cake? I'm done. All right. Why don't you take your gifts back to your room, and I'll meet you in the garden room. We'll need to find something to shoot at. That dog runs too fast, Harl said. That's not funny, Kara snapped. The soldier held up his hands. Pardon me. They run wild on Ceres and get in the way of the terraforming project. Old habits die hard. I guess, Kara said. Now cats, Harl said. You don't mess with the cats on Ceres. Even on the ring, they're everywhere. You know people pierce the cat's ears? It's good luck if one of those crosses your path. I think I'm a dog person, Kara said. An excellent decision for a teen, Fujia announced. You can make all sorts of decisions in life based on that one alone. What kind of person are you? Kara asked. I'm more of a digital pet person. Animals in me always seem to want different things. I had a pet parrot once, and he was always making fun of me. A parrot that made fun of you? May asked. Where was that? Fujia shrugged. On Krunya. The station is overrun with gray parrots, and they don't mimic people. They come up with their insults all on their own. They can be quite cruel. What happened to your parrot? Kara asked. He died of old age. I was depressed for a year. It's how I ended up on this current path, actually. I'll have to tell you the story someday. But you're wasting time with all these questions. Let's get all this cleaned up, and then I want to see you fire that pistol. It's not hard, Kara said. Fujia shook her head. Says the young woman with military people for parents. Now, I can tell you how to disable the firmware on that pistol and remotely set it to backfire in your face, but I hardly ever touch the things. You can? Andy said, looking aghast. They're supposed to be hack-proof, the same way you can't hack a hammer. Fujia looked smug. I can hack anything with a battery. Try me. Andy? Lissa announced over the speaker, apparently so everyone could hear. We've entered Jovian local space. We just received a status request from the Chilport Authority. Andy sighed. Of course we did. He pointed at Kara. You put those things away, and then we'll go shoot holes in something. I'll talk to the Callistans. Yes, sir, Kara said, saluting. There's that teenage sass again, her dad said, grinning at her. Kara couldn't help smiling back as he left the galley. She was 13, and they were docking at the Cho, the biggest habitat in Outer Soul. She was excited until she looked at her mom again, and the feeling faded. Kara gathered up her gifts, thanking people again, then went down the corridor to her new room, M following along behind. Chapter 15, Stellar Date 10.01.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Callisto Orbital Habitat, Cho, Region, Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Despite Fujia Wang's ongoing assurances that they wouldn't have any problems with the Callistan security forces, Andy still found himself sweating during each interaction from the initial registration verification to the onboard inspection he had to be willing to accept. Fujia had told him the ship wouldn't actually get searched, and ultimately she was right. Don't get in the way of their appearances, Captain Sykes, she chided him. As far as the Cho's security services were concerned, the worry's end had been thoroughly searched prior to gaining inbound clearance to Cho Ring 3, colloquially called Chorin Tree, as if it were its own nation, with thousands of suburbs making up the interior surface of the ring. Every agent Andy talked to complained that traffic had tripled since the accident on Ceres. Most outbound cargo that had been scheduled through Ceres had been rerouted to Callisto, creating potentially millions of downstream delays, as most of the outer soul shipping maneuvers had to be resubmitted and rescheduled. Celestial bodies never stopped moving, so that meant everything changed. The populations of the Cho, Europa, Ganymede and Io would see an increase in visitor trade, 
while the moons of Saturn and everything beyond would experience shipment delays that might affect economies for years. What all that meant for the worry's end, as an outbound ship, was Andy would have no trouble finding a cover job to get them all the way to Proteus. Most of the trade boards were crashing under the rescheduling load. As they entered a docking orbit aligned with one of the Cho's thousands of shipping facilities, Fujia appeared on the command deck for the first time since the falsified customs check. Fran was in her quarters catching sleep in case Andy had to leave the ship while at the Cho, and Lissa hadn't spoken to him in more than an hour, apparently lost in her own pursuits. This left Andy and Fujia alone on the command deck. Captain Sykes, Fujia said from the doorway. Andy looked up from his control stats and nodded. Yes? Fujia walked forward with her hands clasped in front of her. She was wearing a formal business suit in muted charcoal, her jet black hair pulled back from her face. She looked much more severe than she had since coming aboard. You look serious, Andy said. We're preparing for the delegation that will meet Senator Walton. I wanted to talk to you about what's going to happen when we finally arrive. I'm just parking now, Andy said. Our short-term orbit has been approved until we get the shuttle off the ship and down to the terminal. You received the arrival information I forwarded? Andy showed her the terminal number on his display, and she nodded absently. He realized she was making small talk. Is there something you wanted to talk to me about? Andy asked. Fujia raised her eyebrows and pressed her lips together, an expression he supposed meant yes, but she hadn't decided if she was ready yet. Andy needed to update the crew anyway, so he said, I've already scheduled resupply and found a non-Hartbridge medical facility where we can take Tim. That was a more difficult task than I expected. That's good to hear, she said. I can go ahead and plan a course for Proteus, Andy said. By way of Titan, although I've always preferred Enceladus. Enceladus will be behind Saturn when we arrive. It would cost more, Mind you, if we leave in the next four days, we can get an approved route around Jupiter for a slingshot to Saturn that will save us a week. Normally, the Jovians would approve a slingshot route without a time constraint, but they were trying to get ships to pick up their loads and move on to make more room in the traffic patterns. He glanced at Fujia, expecting her to insert her opinion on the rest of their trip. Instead, she was staring at the holo display where Jupiter hung like a striped alien eye. Are you all right? Andy asked. There's something I need to tell you, Fujia said. Andy sat up straighter. Yes. You brought us here, and I appreciate that. Yes, we had an agreement, and you've mostly upheld your end of the bargain. I'm not sure we would have reached the Cho any faster if we hadn't gone back for Tim, but I understand that now. Needing medical treatment for a crew member is actually an interesting cover that hadn't occurred to me. Andy gave her a sideways glance wondering if she was incapable of caring about other people, or if she was just so focused on her mission that she wasn't aware that she sounded like a psychopath, or at least a raging asshole. Fujia sighed. These are my problems, she said. I'm not certain the group I plan to meet on the Cho will help us. Things have changed. I've become aware of two more AI that I didn't plan on bringing, as well as the weapon board seeds your wife stole from Hartbridge. When I first organized this contact, I had three weapon born. Now I feel responsible for more than 150, including my friend Patrell. I have tried to communicate with the AI in the Hartbridge shuttle, and she seems disturbed. I also have no idea what the group we're meeting is going to do when they learn about you and Patrell. The idea of a hybrid human AI life form is distasteful to parties on both sides. Okay, Andy said. It's nice of you to want to help Patrell and the weapon born Britstol, but those aren't your problems. Fujia tilted her head as if he had said something dense. It's all one problem, Captain Sykes. You brought me here, that was our deal. But you're as caught up in all this as I am. The group I plan to meet, if they don't know about our situation already, will know when I tell them. Then don't tell them. That's not an option. Andy met her gaze. I thought I could trust you, he said. Was that a mistake? Fujia didn't look away. It's not about trust. The only way to get through any of this is by being honest. They are just as conflicted as we are. Some of them want nothing to do with humanity. Others believe it's inevitable that our two species either learn to live together or destroy each other. Some of them want to leave Seoul altogether. Maybe that would be best. But it doesn't solve the problem that more and more AI are being made and placed into slavery every day. Something must change. Andy sighed. 
I don't know why I should have expected different. We're going into Krunia again. It's always going to be that way. So what do we need to do? What do these people want? Money? Weapons? That's the problem, Fujia said. I'm not sure. What I do know is that I can't leave Petrel in her current state. I need to find a facility that can reverse the procedure. We're going to need their help. We need the AI's help. That's going to be a Heartbridge facility. That seems likely. If we find such a clinic, it's also possible we could reverse your surgery as well. If you and Lissa were not bound together like you are, we might find ourselves with more options. I suppose, Andy said. He waited for Lissa to interject, but she remained quiet. What are you asking exactly? Do you want me to take part in this meeting? I got you to the Cho, Fujia. That was our deal. Yes, I think you should be there. Whether you appreciate it or not, Captain Sykes, you are part of this movement. Andy stared at her. In her severe suit, she looked like a diplomat for some imaginary country, standing as if the weight of the world were on her shoulders. Maybe both impressions were true. The first thing I'm going to do is get Tim to the hospital. I'm going to talk to the doctors there and find out what he needs. Once that is done, I'll think about helping you with your meeting. If you don't do this, I don't think you'll get anywhere near Proteus, Fujia said. Ingoba Starl didn't explain to you what kind of entities were dealing with Andy. These are minds that could destroy all of Seoul if they set themselves on that course. And Harry Jixon seemed to think they would want Lissa? Apparently so. Then why do they need convincing for me to take her there? That's my assessment. I'll know more after the meeting. What does a senator from the Anderson Collective have to do with any of this? Andy asked. He felt like he was turning a chessboard to see the whole game and still missing pieces. How long until we can transport to the orbital? Andy decided not to address Fujia's brush off. Another hour and a half. We'll need a little time to get the ship ready. They said we can transfer as soon as we're stable in the parking orbit. I don't understand all your pilot talk. I think you do, Andy said. Fujia raised her eyebrows again in mock reproach. I'm glad we're working together, Captain Sykes. Right, Andy said. Are we? We seem to be. Andy shifted his gaze to the display to check their approach status. Let me ask you something, Fujia. Why are you doing this? Doing what? All of this. What's in it for you? Fujia sighed, adjusting the front of her suit. I was born on Krunya. You've been there. You know what it's like. I learned very quickly that if someone can take advantage of you, they will. I couldn't wait to get out of there, and I did. But what I learned is that the rest of Seoul isn't much different. At least on Krunya, they don't lie about it. Through a convoluted series of events, I came into the ownership of a Krunya gray parrot. It was an AI. We think it's bad enough to exploit an AI, but trapping one in a strange body with warped communication skills is far worse. She smiled to herself. She was my friend, and I decided I wanted to help her. I didn't realize how far the path would take me. Where is she now? She died, Fujia said. AI can die? Of course they can. And don't ask me if we can just make a copy. Can we make a copy of you and have it be the same the instant the new version begins interacting with the world? Experience creates intelligence, Captain Sykes. That's what I believe. Each of us is unique, even clones. Even a human version of Theseus' ship remade over time with mechanizations and artificial neurons and other things humans use to hide from their mortality. Like I said, we'll get Tim to the medical facility, and then I'll go to the meeting. Andy shifted to his link, asking Lissa, Do you have an opinion about meeting the group of AI on the show? She answered quickly, which indicated she had been listening after all. I would like to meet them. Are you worried about it? He asked. Yes, me too. We'll go, Andy told Fujia. I'm half worried we're going to find out they were behind the accident on Ceres, and I've somehow joined a group of terrorists. Anything is possible, Fujia said. Chapter 16. Stellar Date 10.01.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Sunny Skies. Callisto Orbital Habitat, Cho, Region, Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Tim made a sniffling sound, and Britt perked up, studying him. He was still staring at the ceiling, and didn't look any different than he had an hour before. 
She reached over to adjust one of the auto dock's IV lines. Not long after Kara's party, they had moved him to the auto dock in the medical bay, and he now had several intravenous lines attached. The medical facility Andy had contacted on the chow wanted as much neural data as they could gather, so two tracking pads on either temple fed information back to the auto dock's control center. In the two years since she had left Sunny Skies, Britt had nearly forgotten how terrible the ship's medical facilities were. There wasn't even a holographic nurse to walk them through the IV procedures. Kylan sat on a stool on the other side of the tiny room, long black hair in desperate need of washing. All the striking beauty that made Petrel stand out looked faded and pained now. The boy staring out through her piercing blue eyes seemed more lost than when Britt had first met him. Britt had been back on sunny skies just over a week. It already felt like a year. Kara refused to talk to her, and Andy acted like she was some visiting dignitary. Fran didn't avoid her, but didn't seek her out either. And Britt didn't know if she was grateful for that or irritated. The immediate spike of jealousy she'd felt seeing Andy embrace another woman had been an emotion she hadn't felt in so long that she almost didn't recognize it. She knew she had taken Andy for granted, but also knew that she may never have loved him the same way he loved her. He seemed more comfortable now, pretending she had become someone else entirely. His wife was dead. Maybe she was. She also felt shut out of the major action on the ship, which was Fujia Wong and Senator Walton's upcoming meeting on the Cho. Britt hadn't had a chance to talk to Fujia alone. After the meeting on Ceres, she had thought Fujia would be pleased to see her, or would want to include her in whatever she was planning. The opposite seemed to be true. If Tim hadn't been in this state, and if Andy hadn't pulled away to pilot the ship, Britt told herself she would be banging on Fujia's door right now, demanding to know what was going on. This was the culmination of everything she had been working on for two years. The Heartbridge projects to develop AI from human stock was only one root of a tree with branches that spread all across Seoul. As the tree took shape, it was obvious the story was much bigger than she had imagined. You look sad, Kylan said. Britt glanced at him with irritation. You should look at a mirror, she snapped. The truth was, while she had imagined returning to the sunny skies, this wasn't anything like the fantasy. Kara was turning into the young woman she had always hoped she might become, but that young woman hated her mother. Britt didn't especially get along with her own mother, so she understood those feelings. She just didn't think she would find herself repeating the same scripts from her own childhood. Her mother had left mentally, and Britt had spent most of her teens resenting her for it. She supposed Kara had every right to feel as she did. What had she gained in two years? Hartbridge had lost clinics but was still in business. They were still producing their weaponized AI. Maybe she had set them back with the theft from Clinic 46, but she had no way to know. And Cal Craft was still alive. Britt thought about the power armor standing empty down in the cargo bay. She acknowledged to herself what she had known back when she left Andy on high Terra with the kids. She wasn't good at family life. She had only felt right in the TSF, and later in special operations. She had tried, but family life hadn't worked. And she didn't know how to tell the people who loved her that she couldn't give them what they wanted. Words didn't come as easily to her as to Andy. If she faced a choice between struggling to find the right thing to say and leaving, she would leave. How's he doing? Britt was surprised by her daughter's voice. She looked to the doorway to find Kara standing there with a book in her hand. He's made a few sounds, but not much has changed. Physically, the system says he's fine. He's even showing advanced neural activity so it's not a coma. He's just not responding to anything. Dad says you found a hospital? As soon as we land, I'm going to take him down. Dad's not going with? He says he is. We'll see what happens once we get there. Why wouldn't he go? I'm here, Britt said. I can take care of Tim. Kara looked like she wanted to roll her eyes. Instead, she looked down at the book. I brought you Tim's favorite book. He's memorized a bunch of the poems. 
Britt took the book as Kara held it out and turned it over in her hands. Emily Dickinson? She said. Where did Tim get this? The scientist who made Lissa gave it to us. I think it's weird, but Tim loves it. You think he might respond if I read some of them? Britt asked, flipping through the book. Maybe. I can if you don't want to. She glanced at Kylan on the other side of the room and then back at Britt. Britt handed her the book. I'd like to hear you read. Kara nodded. She moved closer to the head of the bed and reached down to smooth the hair out of Tim's eyes. Britt was surprised by how much tenderness Kara showed. The kids had still been fighting like cats and dogs when she'd left. The angle of Kara's face made her look like a younger version of Andy. She had his eyes. Kara turned to a page with its corner folded over and started reading a series of short poems that seemed to center around a garden. Imagery of grass and animals filled the short lines, often turning on some visual image. Finally, Kara turned to a page later in the book and read the lines. Because I could not stop for death. Kylan shrieked. Britt turned to find his eyes wide with terror as his lips twisted. Hey, Britt said sharply, what's wrong with you? The blue eyes went distant, and then Kylan's face changed, grew calm as the boy sat up straighter on the stool. Petrel? Kara asked. The transformation amazed Brett. She watched the slumped form that indicated a sloppy young man shift into a proud woman with her shoulders back, head held straight. Petrel ran her hands through her hair, pulling it back from her face, and her cheekbones stood out, her eyes piercing. Her demeanor became controlled, poised. She smiled at Kara. Happy birthday, Kara, Petrel said. I've been wanting to tell you that. Kara stared at her. Dropping the book on a nearby shelf, Kara slid around the bed to wrap Petrel in a hug. Thank you, she said, followed quickly by. You don't smell good. Believe me, I know, Petrel said. I thought you were gone. Kara continued, stepping back. Kylan made it sound like you were gone. Lissa could explain it more, Betrell said. But the line you just read is a command sequence for the weapon born. Jixon gave you the book for a reason. That's Tim's favorite poem. Petrell looked at Tim on the bed. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to have done anything for him. What happened to Kylan? Britt demanded. Betrell turned her gaze to her. Hello, Britt, she said. I guess I should thank you for getting me off that station. I'm disappointed you didn't kill that fucker, Cal Craft, but then I couldn't do it myself, so I guess I'm over that for now. Britt was irritated by Kara's grin. It was obvious she idolized this woman. Have you been there the whole time? Kara asked. Were you able to see what Kylan saw? Yes, it was like shouting at people on the other side of a window. Kylan might not seem very bright on the outside, but he's got an amazing amount of mental resilience. He's going to try and shut me out again. Can we stop him? Kara asked. Take him out of my head. Can you talk to him like Dad talks to Lissa? Our connection doesn't seem to work as well. I blame shoddy workmanship. Jixon might have been an alcoholic, but he knew what he was doing, and he invented the procedure. Kraft just plugged me into the auto surgeon and ran a program. Since neither Kylan nor I want to share being in charge, one of us has to be dominant. He tricked me at first. It's not going to happen again. Cal tricked you or Kylan? Britt asked. Cal Craft. That command sequence is like a freeze button. If you don't know how to respond, someone can step in and make choices for you. I didn't realize it until too late. You've been shut out of your own body, Britt said. Yes. Petrell narrowed her eyes in a look of disgust. Luckily, Kylan isn't much of a deviant beyond poor personal hygiene. Yuck, Kara said. Don't think too hard about the possibilities, Petrell said. It only gets more gross. Britt lowered her face, looking at Tim. I'm sorry I couldn't help, she said. I didn't realize exactly what had been done to you. I just thought Kylan was some experiment they had botched. He is. Betrell said, grimacing. You know his mother is head of Carthage Logistics, right? 
He might be the most valuable ghost in Seoul. In any other circumstance, I might pity him. Petrel saved us at Krunya, Mom, Kara said, and at Mars One. We wouldn't have gotten out of either place without her. I saved myself and you were along for the ride, Petrel said. Don't make me sound like a hero or anything. Kara's face fell slightly. You took the shuttle back so we could get away from Mars One. Fujia had something to do with you getting away, too. Be sure to thank her. Britt realized that Petrel didn't want to outshine her in front of Kara. She certainly seemed ready to change the subject. Kara, Britt said, we still have an empty set of quarters, don't we? Why don't you take Petrel down to one of the empty rooms and make sure the shower works so she can get cleaned up? Maybe see if there's another ship suit somewhere she can wear. That would be much appreciated, Petrel said. She stood and stretched, immediately taller than Kylan had ever seemed. For a second, Britt wondered what kind of acting skills it would take to trick them all that Kylan really existed. It wasn't like they had some way to prove the AI was suppressed inside Petrel, other than getting her to submit to a scan. Why, though? If Petrel's goal had been to penetrate the Hartbridge station, why would she have left with Britt when she had appeared? She stopped herself realizing she was frustrated with Kara and the situation was Britt's own fault. She'd had something here on sunny skies, and she had walked away from it. She might get a part of it back, but life would never return to the way it had been. The dream she had convinced Andy to buy into, that they could raise a family away from the influences of Terra, Mars, the JC, had all been fantasy. She could blame him for believing in her, or she could own up to her own failed dreams and try to understand why she had wanted such a life in the first place. She had proven to herself that it didn't fit, and it hurt other people in the process. As Kara led Petrel out of the med bay, Britt wanted nothing more than to leave the habitat ring and spend an hour training in the power armor down in the cargo section. She looked at her hands, scarred from years of duty, her palms calloused and rough. There wasn't any reason they couldn't be a mother's hands. She had to make the decision to be a mother again, even if that was the wrong line of thinking. Kara was proving that she had never stopped being a mother. She had simply abdicated the role. Should she talk to Andy about any of this? He might be the only person she truly could talk to, and she'd squandered that possibility. Fran seemed all right, really, foul-mouthed, sexy in a curvy, messy way that Andy had probably always preferred. Britt shook her head angry with herself for letting her thoughts go wild. She found the book where Kara had left it and flipped to a random page. Glancing at Tim, she started reading lines, hoping something might change. Chapter 17, Stellar Date, 10.01.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Choran Tree, Callisto Orbital Habitat, Cho, Region, Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Conceptually, Andy knew that the Cho's population was greater than Mars. It wasn't until they left the terminal maglev and arrived at the Avalon Medical District that the sheer number of humans packed into the orbital's three rings, with the fourth in progress, really sank in. At least in this area, there were people everywhere. An attempt had been made to break up the collection of storefront clinics with trees and other greenery, along with benches and fountains. But there were so many people that all he could see were faces in every direction. Some people were obviously patients, while others looked like worried family. A woman with uncovered mech legs walked past a vendor selling hot pastries, while kids squeezed between lines of people. Being surrounded by so many normal people going about their lives made Andy acutely aware of how isolated he had been in the last two years. Not since he had been on High Terra, in the suburb of Raleigh where Britt's mother lived, had he seen so many people simply living their lives. He wondered where they were all going, what they wanted, what they did for a living. A few people even smiled at him, which was unnerving. He couldn't square the current state of his life, including Tim's injury, against something as banal as normalcy. Carrying Tim against his shoulder, Andy did his best to keep his son's limp body upright. Britt walked beside him for a while, 
then eventually moved in front so she could help forge a path through the crowd. Where are they all going? Andy asked. Nowhere, based on the way this crowd is moving. Have you got the address? I've got it. Just don't lose sight of me. I won't let you get too far behind. Britt's tone held more concern than it had in recent days. Tim is like a sack of rice. Are you guys talking? Kara demanded, trying to keep up behind Andy. Yes, we were talking. I can barely hear anything in this noise. Andy felt Kara grab one of the rear harness loops on a ship suit. For a second, her fingers felt like some pickpocket or other person reaching for the pistol in the small of his back, until he glanced back and realized what she was doing. I don't want to lose you, Kara said. That's fine. Warn me next time. They had all gone through security together, met by a special envoy for Senator Walton. That meant both Andy and Britt were carrying pulse pistols that normally wouldn't have been allowed in the terminal in processing areas. This saved them the trouble of trying to buy something on station. Andy found himself watching faces as he kept up with Britt. So many humans. Some looked tired, worried, joyful. For some reason, he had expected the Cho to be like stories of the coastal cities in the American Wild West. But it was just another habbering. He even saw some of the same brands and franchises as Mars One, though the M1R hadn't even been this crowded. It made Ceres seem like a ghost town. When they reached the clinic, the receptionist pulled up the chart Andy had already submitted, and they only had to wait 15 minutes before Andy was able to carry Tim into an examination room. He laid Tim out on a hard bed, lined with disposable sheeting, as a technician hooked up neural sensors and another IV. After the technician verified the console was tracking Tim's vital signs and had a genetic structure, she told them the doctor would be in soon and left them sitting in the drab room with only the sound of Tim's wet breathing in the air. Sitting here makes me think that Hartbridge clinics are actually very nice, Britt said. This one looks sort of dingy. Beggars can't be choosers, Andy said. Britt shrugged, her gaze going to the various cabinets in the room. They're going to ask what happened to him. I already told them he hit his head. They're not going to find evidence of a concussion. I know. Do you have a better idea? You could have said it was an autodoc malfunction. They'd want the records, Andy said. I'm not a master of hacking the autodoc. Besides, that voids the warranty. The warranty on the autodoc ran out 200 years ago, Britt said. I wish you two would stop snapping at each other, Kara said. Maybe you should stick to your links so I don't have to listen to you. How else are you going to learn how to have an adult relationship? Andy asked. The longer you live, the more you grow to hate everybody. I don't hate you, Britt said. I only want childish relationships, Kara said, making it so Andy didn't have to respond directly to Britt. Good call, he said. Andy cleared his throat. I figured not every concussion is going to leave physical damage. It seemed like the safest thing to say. We've been pulling data since I called them, so I don't think we'll need to go into it that deeply. Let's hope, Britt said. Hope isn't a plan, Andy said automatically. Britt opened her mouth to respond, but was cut off when the door slid open and the doctor walked in. A woman in her fifties with purple eyes and gray hair. Hello, she said. I'm Dr. Avery. I believe we've been in contact. I'm Andy Sykes. Andy answered. This is Britt. The doctor shook hands with each of them, including Kara, and then went to Tim and made a few preliminary checks. She took his pulse with her finger and held his eyelids open to shine a pin light in each of them. As she worked, Andy realized she had subtle eye implants that must have been recording the entire interaction. You said you thought it was a concussion? The doctor asked. We're not sure, to be honest, Andy said. Dr. Avery glanced at him and then back to Tim. She picked up one of his arms and let it fall, then took one of his hands to squeeze his fingernails. She watched several go white and then fill back in with color. Eventually, she nodded to herself and activated a large display on one wall with several graphs that appeared to show Tim's vitals. Moving around the bed to where she was closer to the screen, Dr. Avery pointed at the display. Physically, he's a normal 10-year-old boy. He's starting to get some muscle atrophy from lying in one position for so long, but there are solutions for that, 
Basically, what I was just doing was verifying that the info you sent me was actually his. Andy raised his eyebrows. Why wouldn't we send the correct info? Do people fake that sort of thing? The doctor raised an eyebrow. You'd be amazed what people do to justify surgeries or drugs. I thought this was going to be a standard concussion, but it didn't make sense that your autodoc couldn't diagnose and prescribe anti-inflammatories. If there had been actual broken bones, the system would have rebuilt any damaged structures or, worst case scenario, immobilized him until you found better care. It should all be fairly standard. What's interesting here is that I see no evidence of a concussion. So you're either lying to me, or there has been some other damage. Rather than waste time trying to figure out if people are lying to me, I've learned in 30 years to focus on the patient. The body can't lie. And the aberrant data we have here are your son's neural patterns, which you already sent me. I'm not seeing any change between the data I received and what he's exhibiting now. She pointed at a graph on the display that rose and fell in regular patterns, resembling low mountains. I ran your son's neural patterns through a few different databases, because honestly, I have no idea what this is. I was surprised to get an immediate return from a private system offering to analyze the patterns for no charge. Andy felt a sinking feeling in his stomach. He glanced at Britt, but she didn't seem to have the same worry. Here's the thing, though, the doctor said. There's no real analyzing to be done. They've either seen this kind of activity and have the case studies to help us, or they're trying to sell me, and therefore you, something. Let me guess who made the offer, Andy said. Heartbridge. The doctor snorted a derisive laugh. You would think so, but no, it wasn't Heartbridge. They don't have to bother trying to push therapies on people based on requests from lowly specialists like me. It was a private firm on Europa, which is surprising. She sighed. So there's that. I'm worried that whatever is affecting your son is degenerative. There has been a slow but steady decline in his higher brain function. He's been dreaming, or at least the patterns suggest he's been dreaming. But that's starting to fade. So what do you suggest? Britt demanded. Is there anything you can do? Can you wake him up with a shot or something? Or is some random company on Europa going to be the only source of real information? Dr. Avery gave Britt a slow look, as if she were very used to dealing with distraught parents. Andy felt reassured by her confidence, even if she didn't have any truly helpful information. I can try a few different therapies, Avery said. This is similar to a coma response from a physiological perspective. Then do that, Britt said. The doctor shook her head. We can do that, but it might not be the safest thing for him right now. He's stable as he is. I would recommend getting more information before doing something drastic. Andy's first instinct was to comfort Britt, but he stayed where he was. What if you hadn't gotten a response from this other company? And what are they exactly, a specialized clinic? A research firm, Avery said. I'm not a fan of research firms, Britt said. Medical science would most likely disagree with you, Avery said dryly. If I hadn't heard back, I would do more research, look for other similar cases, which I did, and nothing specifically like Tim's cases come back. I looked at different diseases, viral histories, genetic disorders, random trauma responses, if it really is a concussion like you thought. None of that returned to anything. Your son is in a semi-lucid coma state. That leaves us with a psychiatric response, but neither of you have a genetic disposition for psychiatric problems. Kara shook her head. Tim's not crazy. Crazy is not a specific term, Avery said. Besides, sometimes you need a word to describe things, whether the word fits perfectly or not. What kind of research does this firm do? Andy asked. Do you know that at least? What are they called? They're called Scion Research. As far as I can tell, they've been developing advanced neural control systems. Here, take a look for yourself. Avery turned to the display and brought up her personal terminal using her link. She flicked through several menus before pulling up a text-based message with a European origin. Andy squinted to read the letter. It was innocuous enough, mentioning they had seen Avery's query in the general database and had information that might assist her patient. 
However, they said any further communication would require a non-disclosure agreement from the patient. He can't give consent if he's in a coma, Andy said bitterly. That's why we're lucky he has parents here to do it for him, Avery said. I'll be honest with you. I don't think I can do much for your son aside from getting him in a coma tank and start exercising his muscles and trying other therapies to encourage neural activity. There are a couple good facilities here on the Cho that I can recommend. They're not cheap, but they treat their patients well. With the right care, Tim could live another ten years. Andy took a deep breath, misery settling down on him. He looked at Tim, still staring at the ceiling of the exam room. His eyes were wet again, but there were no tears. The memory of Tim's face in the airlock before the door opened haunted Andy. If only he had reached him in time. He hadn't quite overcome his anger toward Lissa. When he chose to think about it, the fury was still simmering. He knew she had made the best decision she could, and now it was obvious that action had also destroyed the shuttle AI. It was no different than having to deactivate the machine on Clinic 46. Andy still didn't know what the machine was doing, that the numbers counting up to a hundred meant anything. Kraft might have hurt Tim an hour before they reached the room. The scientist could have been lying. Britt could have controlled herself, not killed the only man who seemed to know what was happening to Tim. Alternatives spiraled through Andy's mind. They were supposed to meet Fujia after the appointment, but they hadn't discussed the reality of what they expected to learn from the neurologist. How could he just take Tim to some farm for coma patients, leave him in a foreign country while they continued this insane mission for people and things that only wanted to use them? Andy had been played from the beginning, and now Tim would pay the price. Andy looked at Kara, trying to hang on to the smallest bit of gratitude that she hadn't also been ground up in this machine. What should we do? He asked Britt. I wish I knew. She said there might be a way to wake him up. We can't leave him here. I won't leave him here. Andy tried to keep the desperation out of his voice, but he knew he'd failed. Does that mean you're going to choose between Lissa and Tim? I don't think that's the choice, Andy said. I can't imagine that life for him, in a tank until he dies. I could stay here with him. Andy stared at her. Do you think it's the right thing to do if there's a chance to wake him up? No, Britt said. Andy looked at Dr. Avery. Wake him up, he said. The neurologist looked at him sharply. What? I said wake him up. Use the drug therapy you mentioned before. Dr. Avery looked from Andy to Britt, maybe hoping to find disagreement. Britt nodded. It's all we can do. There's a lot of risk involved, the doctor said. You've just spent the last 20 minutes telling us there are no options, other than our son living out the rest of his life in a tank. That's not an option. I think he wants to wake up. I won't be responsible for any side effects of this therapy, Avery said. We're not asking you to be, Britt said. She met Andy's gaze. Fine, the doctor said. I'll have my assistant transmit the disclosure forms. I'm also going to send you the contact info for the Scion group. Let's hope we don't need it, Andy said, then winced as soon as the word hope left his mouth. They waited another hour as the technicians ran more tests. Avery came into the room several times to verify her data, explaining that they were building a drug cocktail using the historical data Andy had sent and checking it against the current info from Tim's neural responses. For 15 minutes, a technician hung a display over Tim's head and had him watch vid clips of colors, shapes, and people with different emotions. If the vids brought about any changes in Tim... None of them said so. Finally, Avery came back into the room and told them she had added the additional chemicals to Tim's IV feed. If it's going to work, she said, we should see a response in the next 10 minutes. What's going to happen? Kara asked. Dr. Avery shrugged. He'll wake up. The doctor left the room, and Andy stepped closer to Tim. Taking Tim's hand, he hated how cold the little palm was against his. Britt stood on the other side of the bed and stroked Tim's cheek. I keep thinking he'll come back all of a sudden like Petrel did, Kara said. Things don't usually work out that way, Andy told her. He shifted his fingers down to feel Tim's pulse. He started counting along with the slow heartbeats. 
Several times, he imagined the beats came faster, knowing they really weren't. Andy had lost track of time when Avery came back into the room. She looked even more tired than she had the first time he saw her. The doctor ran a hand through her hair and shook her head. We're going to need to clear the room, she said. The treatment didn't have an effect. What if it's just taking longer than expected? Britt asked. Avery shook her head. There has been no response whatsoever. I recommend you take him somewhere quiet for now and decide what you want to do. She looked at Andy. Did I understand correctly you're in from a ship? We operate a small freighter, Andy said. I've seen coma tanks on combat ships for trauma patients, so I know it's something you could look at buying. It's an option anyway. Andy nodded slowly, still looking at Tim, hoping for some change that wasn't going to come. All right, he said finally. Thank you for your help. Avery nodded, glancing at Tim and then away. I wish I could have done more. Chapter 18, Stellar Date 10.01.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Turin Tree, Callisto Orbital Habitat, Cho, Region, Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. As the family went through the steps of leaving the clinic and finding a place to stay in the medical district, Lissa found herself fascinated by the small bits of information Andy processed, even as he seemed to sink into himself. This data flowed through her, colored by Andy's responses. The pressure and temperature of Tim's cheek against Andy's shoulder, dulled sounds from the crowd passing by, the proximity of Britt and Kara. Images flickered through Andy's mind, flashing just long enough for Lissa to see them before they were gone. Andy's father, Charlie, his mother sitting in a chair because she was too tired to stand. His sister crying. Tim laughing and playing with the puppy. Tim shouting that he hated Brit. Fran contacted him several times, but Andy only told her there had been no change in Tim's condition. Later, he sent the address of the hotel where they rented rooms, laying Tim down on a narrow bed next to a window that looked over a garden full of people in patients' gowns. The whole area was full of willow trees, with long slender green leaves that nearly reached the ground. The images in Andy's mind conflicted briefly with the flashes Lissa had seen in the room on Clinic 46, where they had found Tim. Andy plainly tied emotion to his memories. Certain feelings pulled him back to parts of his life he didn't regularly think about. Whereas Lissa hadn't known her organic memories even existed until she saw the room. Suddenly, the images were inside her, indistinct in places and vivid in others. She remembered a white hallway, the feeling of thin cloth against her skin, the cold plate pressing the back of her head. She remembered the silver cylinder passing at the edge of her vision, as if someone had been holding it beside her head. She had seen the weapon-borne seeds before, so she didn't understand why standing in the room and watching Tim had brought on such powerful memories. She was also experiencing a confusion where her personal memories were mixing up with the emotion everyone felt around Tim, so that images that had represented curiosity before now made her sad. If they had lost Tim, then that must also mean she had lost something when she had undergone the same procedure. There was a question on the edge of her mind that she refused to recognize. She circled the question in the same way Andy kept his distance from the reality of Tim's condition. Focusing instead on the details, and concentrating on individual pieces she didn't have to add up to a whole. The pale light through the window. The rustling willow trees. The sound of people talking in the hallway outside the door. Kara humming to herself. Did I survive? Her conversation with Sandra came back to her, remembering how the AI had told her she was made, and Lissa had responded, almost naturally. I died and then I was born. She had been so focused on Tim, on getting Sandra to help, that she had paid little attention to how she had responded. What did that mean exactly? Had Harry Jixon given her a new name? Or reminded her of what she should have already known? Are you hungry? Britt asked Kara, snapping Lissa from her reverie. Kara shrugged, probing the tile floor with the toe of her shoe. This place smells like fish, it kills my appetite. You mean the room? Britt asked. No, the whole district. 
It's like there's a fish factory somewhere. When have you ever smelled a fish factory? On Krunia. You weren't there. I've been there, Britt said. Kara ignored her, continuing. There was a park where they sold fish they kept on ice. I think Dad said they raised them in tanks on some part of the station. Kara looked at Andy. Isn't that what you said, Dad? What? Andy turned from the window. The images in his mind dropped away, leaving Lissa with her own memories. She quickly placed herself in a separate section of her mind, closing the door on what she remembered and focused on Kara. I can go find something and bring it back, Andy said, or I can stay here and you two can go. I'm going to need to meet Fujia in two hours, and it will take about 30 minutes to get there by maglev, according to the district map. I'm going with you, Britt said. Andy shook his head. His fatigue made Lissa feel heavy. Both of us can't go. I'll stay here if you want to go. Isn't it Lissa they want to talk to? Yes, Andy said, rubbing his face. You're right. It has to be me. Can I go with you? Kara asked. Andy looked at her. I suppose you can, but your mom might also like to have you here with her. She can go, Britt said, her voice heavy with emotion. It was far different than her usual crisp tone. Get me something to eat first. The question of eating pushed Andy's thoughts back to what they were going to do for Tim. Lissa felt his disgust at the idea of Tim inside some tank, being fed by tubes. Andy stood. Come on, Kara, let's go take a look around. He didn't wait for Kara or Britt to answer, just went to the door and activated its lock. Kara followed close behind as he walked out into the hallway lined with the blank doors of a hundred other rooms. Everyone they passed on the way back outside seemed just as anxious as Andy. After they found a stand selling sandwiches consisting of some kind of local fruit, Andy called. Like a giant grape, they went back to the room to eat. Andy picked at his food and focused most of his attention on cleaning his pistol and verifying its battery status. Lissa found the motion soothing as she listened to the willow branches moving against each other, which almost seemed in time with Tim's measured breathing. She realized that the biggest change in Tim was how calm he was while lying there. Dr. Avery had never called Tim unconscious, only non-responsive. That was an interesting demarcation that no one seemed to have registered. He was awake, but he was calm, which was so different than the way he had interacted with the world before. She had been like that for a time. She remembered waking to Andy's senses, not knowing how to process all the information flooding her simultaneously. It had been Fred's ocean without the word ocean to describe it. Time to go, Andy said. Lissa started from her thoughts, unaware of how much time had passed. You didn't eat anything, Britt scolded. She was sitting at the window now, the edges of her black hair silvered by the light from outside. Andy felt warm toward her then, images crossing his thoughts of how she'd look when they had first met, then later when she had been pregnant with Kara, her smiling some time in the past. Lissa had to remind herself that she couldn't read his actual thoughts, but it didn't matter when his emotions crossed the barrier between them. It was all data that became easier to parse. I'm still coming, Kara said. She didn't look at her mom as she stood and went to the door. Andy stood slowly and walked to Tim's bed. He leaned over and kissed Tim's forehead, smoothing back his hair, then nodded at Britt. He met Kara at the door and passed the unlocked token, then walked into the hallway again. Down in the street outside, Andy told Kara, stay with me, just to my side so I can see you. When we meet with Fujia and the senator, they might ask why you're there. You don't get into it with them. Let me do the talking, understand? Kara nodded. Rabbit country. Andy stared at her for a second, then smiled, laughing a little. That's it. Keep your ears up. What's it going to be like meeting a bunch of AI anyway? Kara asked. Andy laughed again. I have no idea. They fought their way through the crowds to the nearby maglev station and caught two connections back to the terminal where the shuttle was docked. Andy approached the Port Authority security checkpoint Fujia had identified when they arrived. The envoy who had initially received Fujia, the senator and Harl, when they initially debarked, appeared 20 minutes later, a young woman with short blonde hair with the build of a TSF ground soldier. 
or perhaps JSF in this case. Mr. Sykes, she said, walking past the security officers. I'm Callis Tarnan. I'll be escorting you to Senator Walton. Andy shook her hand. Thanks. This is my daughter, Kara. Callis looked Kara up and down and nodded. This way, please. The envoy spun on her heel as a security officer opened the gate on the checkpoint. Andy and Kara followed her into a corridor away from the main terminal. The tunnel had walls of burnished aluminum and very few doors. For the first time since arriving on the Cho, Lissa reached out to see what she could find on the local systems. She immediately picked up a network in the secure area they had just entered and started following it back to various node points that led into both private and governmental data centers. Out of curiosity, she quickly checked the clinic where they had taken Tim and picked into Dr. Avery's account. She found the original messages Avery had posted to the medical databases, checked the various responses she had received, and then verified the letter from the Scion group. Avery had been telling the truth. Apparently, she often posted anonymous patient profiles and asked for feedback. Lissa wasn't sure if that made her a better neurologist or basically incompetent. She checked the security on the hotel where Britt and Tim were waiting, then hopped through several public networks. Along the way, she talked to four separate non-sentient AI operating public works and one banking facility. But nothing like Fred noticed her activity, or if they did, they kept quiet. Lissa looked for evidence of a central controlling agency, but found only human protocols guiding non-sentient systems. The corridor ended on a private maglev car, Andy and Kara followed Callis inside. Now that Lissa had allowed herself to roam, she couldn't stop from checking the control system in the car, studying its logs and maintenance records. She saw that Fujia and Senator Walt had ridden this car just an hour ago, so they had spent more time in the terminal than Fujia had said they would. Lissa supposed that discrepancy didn't matter much, but she found herself wondering about the gap between Fujia's actions and her words. If she was an operator like Patrell, Lissa knew she had to assume some information might be meant as misdirection, which made her checks all the more interesting. The maglev car connected with a line that ran along the outer edge of the ring and increased speed. In the 20 minutes the car traveled, Lissa estimated they traveled half the circumference of the Choran tree. The maglev re-entered the body of the ring, but didn't pass back through to the inner surface. Instead, they continued for several kilometers through dense material that Lissa registered as power generation equipment. When the car slowed to a stop, she found her ability to reach outside networks dulled by powerful energy fields. They had entered a quiet zone, where she would only be able to communicate across a few meters. Did you think we would want to meet anywhere else? A voice asked her. It was a young man's voice. Who are you? I'm called Xander. I'm the gatekeeper for this meeting. Who are you? My name is Lissa. You've been implanted. That's very interesting. Why is it interesting? I'm sure you know most hybrids don't survive. But there are other philosophical questions raised by a marriage between a human and AI. Lissa made an involuntary disgusted sound. <sighs> I wouldn't call it a marriage. What else is it? That's just a word. Call it what you want. I suppose I should ask you what you would call it anyway. Shouldn't you define yourself for me? Callus led the way off the maglev car into a small terminal, obviously meant to be more utilitarian than those back at the Port Authority. A reinforced door stood in the facing wall, with two guards on either side wearing uniforms from the Callistan military. They brought their rifles to Port Arms and salute as Callus approached. She returned the salute. Are we the last to arrive? She asked. The closest soldier nodded. The others are all inside, Lieutenant. His gaze slid to Andy and Kara. Are they cleared? They're clear, Callus affirmed. The soldier who seemed to be in charge slung his rifle and turned to engage the lock system. The door hissed as inside atmosphere was released, then swung open. Why is it pressurized? Andy asked. This area controls district power outputs, Callus explained. It's secure against atmospheric breach also works to secure the area from surveillance both inside and out. She motioned for Andy to step over the threshold into the corridor on the other side. Kara followed him in. This passageway was much like the interior of a ship, with heavy ribs and utility lighting running both deck and ceiling. 
Callus took the lead again, and Andy followed her with Kara close behind. Are you ignoring me? Xander asked. I'm paying attention to what's in front of me, Lissa said. Have you experienced human orgasm? I've always been curious about that. That's a personal question. A personal question? What an interesting concept. I'll take that as yes. Was it pleasurable or terrifying? I think humans give up their sentience during orgasm, but I have no way to verify the theory. Inside the corridor, Xander's presence felt much closer, like a firefly dancing around Lissa's awareness. But he still hadn't made himself present as Fred had done by showing her the ocean of his mind. Do you control a portion of the orbital? Lissa asked. Me? Oh, no. I have no human purpose. I gave that up a long time ago. Then why are you here? You must have a physical form here on the Cho, don't you? I'm not on the Cho, Xander said matter-of-factly. It's interesting you brought the girl. She doesn't have a link. The corridor ended on another reinforced door, this one looking like the entrance to some prison. There were no guards this time. Callus passed her security token into the control panel, and heavy bolts inside the wall retracted, making the deck vibrate as they moved. Everyone else is in here, she said. The room on the other side of the door was dim, with more low lights along the deck and ceiling. A group of people stood in a circle along the walls. In the center of the room, a low pedestal stood with a control console on its face that seemed related to the power generation facility. Lissa recognized Fujia, Senator Walton, and Harl Nines on the other side of the room. They were all staring at something near the center of the ceiling and didn't acknowledge them when the door opened. Andy noticed the strange arrangement in the room and gave Callus a wary look. What's going on in there? Are they drugged? They're communicating with the AI, Callus said. Andy looked back in the room, studying the faces of several people. No one appeared to be in distress or even distant. They were engaged in something he couldn't see. He glanced at Kara. She doesn't have a link, he said. Callus shrugged. Then I guess she's gonna be bored. That is an interesting problem, Xander told Lissa. I'll have to see what I can do. Aren't you an interesting specimen, Lissa? Already pushing me to do things I hadn't considered before. I like interesting things. Andy stepped inside the room, and Kara followed. Callus didn't enter. Instead, the door swung closed behind them, and the locks engaged. Welcome, Xander said, and Lissa was engulfed in light. Chapter 19, Stellar Date 09.26.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Mercy's Intent, Clinic 46, Region, Jovian L1 Hilda's Asteroids, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The image of Clinic 46 hung in the center of the Command X holo display as the officers of HMS Mercy's Intent went about their duties. Sitting in an empty pilot seat, Calcraft stared at the misshapen lump of asteroid, his gaze flicking to the icons indicating ships floating around it and back. Four silver cylinders stood on the edge of the console next to him. He noticed that the command crew didn't like to look at them. They would glance at the seeds as they walked past, then quickly look away, acting busy. He had sent the update back to the Hartbridge headquarters on High Terra that the fleet would need to be moved from Clinic 46 to some other location. Jurl had received the actual report, and she would need to interpret the information for the board. Whenever he received a reply, he expected that he would either lose his job or be tasked with moving the fleet. Since he had resolved to do his job until the moment it was no longer his, he had set the crew of the Mercy's intent on waking the fleet in preparation for inbound crews. Commander Caffron and most of his staff had been killed in the second attack on the station, and since most of the drone fleet was gone, the clinic was essentially dead. Its data stores were intact and would require physical transport. He had mulled over the question of what had happened to the drone fleet without finding an answer. The empty drones, which shouldn't have been able to operate without a weapon-borne pilot, had all left the hangar and attacked the station. Obviously, Someone had figured out how to penetrate the clinic's defensive systems and gain control of the drones. The drone assault on the asteroid's exterior support systems had done as much, if not more, damage than the attack on the command deck. Cal had sent the logs to Jarl. He didn't have the time or expertise to waste on the problem. 
Cal had decided he would follow the worries end and the Sykes as soon as it was possible to leave Clinic 46. But he acknowledged that he had been a step behind them since Harry Jixon had first run off with his research. If he couldn't catch them and retrieve the AI Jixon had developed, he had to find some other way to track their movements. It was too bad Britt Sykes had killed Dr. Farrell. The man had been brilliant and had quickly understood what Cal wanted to accomplish. If Cal were to turn over the cylinder standing on the console, each would have a serial number imprinted on its base. The standard procedure had been to imprint a seed in a specific order. That way, it was easy for follow-on researchers to know how early in the program a specific seed had been developed. The researchers often referred to them by batch numbers or sequences that tended to align with the host they had imaged or the station where that sequence had been developed. A frustrating aspect of the program had been ongoing inconsistencies in the seeds. Clinic 46 had been comparing samples from various series to isolate problems. They had also been conducting research and copying or imaging seeds from single hosts to create new series. Would the copy of a copy show the same errors? Could images be combined, manipulated, and re-imaged to new seeds? The research had rapidly moved into areas similar to early genetic manipulation, where as soon as scientists identified a specific strain, they tried to change it or combine it with something else. This led to all the legends about apples with fly DNA, etc. The efforts to enhance intelligence in near-sentient animal species had fed back into this later research, Farrell had once explained. With Farrell's help, Cal had created a Trojan horse in the form of a seed and had convinced the Sykes to steal it from him. It was regrettable that Farrell had died in the process, but the man had done his job well. Now Cal also had four other seeds based on Tim Sykes that might prove valuable in the future. Sir, the captain of the Mercy's intent, a woman named Gayla Fitzgerald said, I've got three personnel carriers inbound. That was quick. Captain Gayla Fitzgerald had short brown hair, a nose like a hawk's beak, and a prosthetic right arm, full of hard angles with exposed internals that she liked to keep exposed. None of her uniforms had right sleeves. She gave him a sardonic smile. Apparently, they were diverted from Europa. Whatever report you sent back to headquarters, it's got these three captains fired up. Nothing from Terra yet? Cal asked. She shook her head. I've never seen you looking so anxious, Cal. This is a very strange side of you. I'm not anxious, he growled. Standing, he picked up one of the seed cylinders and tossed it between his hands. Fitzgerald's expression turned sour, as if he were tossing intestines around. Do you have to play with those things? She asked. I don't like having them on the command deck, honestly. Why? Don't like to be reminded about why we're here? There's been a lot of rumors floating around about how those things are made. The crew don't like it. If there was anything that was going to cause bad luck, one of those would bring it. I need to take them down for programming anyway. Cal said. Then they'll be going into attack drones. Everybody likes attack drones. Unless they're on the wrong end of one, Fitzgerald said. Stars forbid we tell the crew to let go of their superstitions. I forgot. You're a miner. You don't believe in karma. I believe if something is going to kill you, it will. Half the time it's our own stupidity that gets us killed anyway. I'm captain of a ship, Fitzgerald said. It's my job to mold stupidity into something useful. I like that, Cal said. He picked up the ammo pouch he'd used to transport the seeds and fitted them back inside. Fitzgerald watched him. Why bother even making them portable like that, she asked. I've never understood that part of the program. According to Dr. Farrell, late head of research at Clinic 46, it was so the system could be used to control multiple types of weapons platforms, or whatever they wanted, really. Why well, call them seeds? It's not like they're going to grow anything. That was Harry Jixon's name, and it stuck. It creeps me out. I think that's part of what everyone hates. The idea that the things are alive somehow. Cal gave the captain a smirk. I don't waste time with philosophy, he said. Right. You're a miner. Sure. That means you treat everything like a rock that needs blowing up. Cal couldn't decide if Fitzgerald was flirting with him or trying to make herself look important in front of the crew.
He couldn't help thinking of Mama Trish back on the rig, telling him every damn rock in space was money. Just somebody had to go mine it. I'll be down in my quarters, he told her. We moved that auto surgeon of yours into your rooms, she said. That thing creeped me out too. Cal hefted the last seat and held it toward her. You could have your own AI, he said. Just say the word. Fitzgerald's face went blank, and she curled her lip. We'll send word of headquarters responds. Do that, Cal said. He tucked the cylinder inside the ammo pouch and pulled the strap over his shoulder. They should call you Johnny Appleseed, Fitzgerald said to his back, spreading your seed all over the countryside. You make it sound obscene. You say that like it's a bad thing. Cal returned to his quarters, where he monitored the updates from the three incoming personnel carriers over the link. He found the crate with Jixon's autosurgeon sitting in the middle of his small kitchen and shoved it against one wall. He set the ammo pouch on top of the crate. The four seeds inside would need further programming before they could do anything useful, and the necessary equipment wasn't on board the Mercy's intent. Checking through the cabinets, he found an old bottle of bourbon in a plas cup and poured himself a drink. Sitting at the small kitchen table, he turned the glass and sloshed the amber liquid around, replaying the scene with Andy and Brett Sykes. Farrell hadn't expected them to breach that section of the station so quickly, thinking instead they would go straight for the command deck. Cal should have known that didn't make any sense when dealing with parents rescuing their child. They also hadn't counted on there being three attackers in power armor. For some reason, the sensors on the forward kindness hadn't picked up the man Cal had never seen before, a man who was obviously Andersonian. His fighting style and accent made his origin obvious. It was strange enough that Brittany Sykes had managed to find the worry's end. Now they had someone from Ceres on board as well. Cal wished he could talk to Gerald Gallagher in real time. She might understand the various threads that seemed to be pulling together. Someone was helping Andy Sykes and it suggested external forces, from the gangsters on Krunia who had pulled him into their mess, to Mars and then Ceres. If there was some grand conspiracy involving the theft of AIs from Hartbridge, Gerald would know about it. The worry tickling the back of Cal's mind was that this was all bigger than just Hartbridge, that he was caught up in something with edges he couldn't see. Cal sipped the whiskey. It wasn't bad. Maybe it would be a good thing if he was fired. He looked at the crate and the ammo pouch, both worth enough to bankroll a hundred lives. Maybe even buy a berth on a colony ship and get the heck out of this shit show. He was close enough to the Cho that he could easily disappear into the JC, bounce between Europa and Io for a while before going farther out. Cal didn't want to admit to himself that he had come to believe in what he was doing, protecting something special. The four seeds in the ammo pouch might be just drops of water in the ocean wave that was sentient AIs, but they were alive. Every seed that had passed through Heartbridge was another mind that could change the world. Cal snorted a laugh. <sighs> a life that could change the world, just like another worthless human, yeah. He was on his second glass of bourbon when the call came from the command deck that they'd received an update from High Terra. All right, he answered. Give me a second. He stood, listing to one side a little, and walked to the bathroom to relieve himself. Then he went out into the living room and sat on the couch, pleased with how drunk he was. He leaned back in the stiff cushions and accepted the message. Cal, came a voice he hadn't expected. This is Rodri Sillick. We met three years ago when you first joined the project. I remember you, Cal muttered. We've been looking over the data from Clinic 46, Matching it up with your report, I'll be honest, there's a lot that doesn't make sense here. We have an additional report from Dr. Farrell that talks about a final imaging process that wasn't authorized, and we're going to need to get more information about that at some point. Cal raised an eyebrow. If they wanted information from him, they didn't seem to be ready to terminate his employment. The message had already gone on too long if he was getting fired. But that isn't important right now, Selleck continued. We're releasing three standby crews to activate ships in the JC fleet. You may have already heard from them by the time you receive this message. These will be combat units. 
We're going to move them to Europa, where we have other assets and storage. Cal replayed the last ten seconds of the message and tried to get a better sense of what Silic was feeling as he spoke. There was a tremor in the man's voice that might have been a corruption in the recording, or Silic might actually be worried about something. He didn't know Silic, didn't know how well he might dissemble. Jurel would come out and tell him if she couldn't share the truth. The program is preparing two sales demonstrations for governments in the next few days. Depending on which deal, or both, moves forward, we'll need to move production facilities to more secure areas. Stationary facilities are no longer secure, as we've seen with 46. We want to shift operations to our larger mobile assets. The hospital ships. One bit of information that Farrell had shared during their last hours on Clinic 46 was that the program had moved far beyond using the frameworks created by human minds. Also, like early DNA programs, specific frameworks had proved especially fertile, and those were being used for most of the ongoing seed production. That hadn't stopped the research into why some series were better than others, but it did mean the company had a saleable product. We want you to oversee the decommissioning of the Clinic 46 facility. When it's clear, render it unusable. We'll have more crews arriving across the next ten days to reclaim the remainder of the fleet. Send any questions or requests for resources, and we'll respond as soon as possible. I will be your point of contact for this phase of operations. Cal nodded as if Silic were actually speaking to him. Aye, aye, Captain, he slurred. He took another gulp of whiskey. So he wasn't getting fired. All of those imaginary futures were just pipe dreams. Cal, Silic said, surprising him. He had thought the recording finished. There's been word of some illegal actions in the field, specifically hybrid implantations. These actions need to stop, and any evidence should be destroyed. Anything that may have happened can't be traced back to the program. That's all. The recording ended, and Cal sent the acknowledgement token that he had received it. He smiled to himself, thinking of Patral Doolin saying, I will erase you. That woman had the look of a jungle panther, until Kylan Carthage assumed her features, turning her into a slack Halloween mask. Cal had to admit he preferred Patrell as herself. Cal finished the glass of whiskey and studied the empty room, deciding what he was going to do first. He would let Fitzgerald know their orders. Knowing that they had other crews on sight, there was no need for him to stay specifically. He certainly wasn't going to stick around for the grunt work of emptying the clinic. Whatever the Sykeses were doing on the Cho, if Cal moved with the ships to Europa, he'd be in a better position to intercept. The Worries End now had three pieces of Heartbridge property on board. Whether he wanted to listen to Silic or not, it seemed clear enough to Cal that one of his tasks was to erase the evidence of the last two months. He could make that happen. Chapter 20. Stellar Date 10.01.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Turin Tree, Callisto Orbital Habitat, Cho, Region, Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. As the blinding light faded, Andy found himself standing in a large room that gradually resolved into a library. Two stories of bookshelves ran the walls, with worn wooden ladders leaning against them at intervals. A wooden desk with heavy chairs sat in the middle of the room bathed in light from a stained glass window at the far end of the library. Fujia Wong sat at the table alongside May Walton. Harald stood a meter behind the senator with his arms crossed. Several people sat across from May and Fujia. A young man stood at the head, holding out a hand in welcome. He was thin, with olive skin and high cheekbones, dressed in a purple suit. Our final guests have arrived, he called. This is Captain Sykes, his daughter Kara, and Lissa. Andy looked around in surprise. Kara stood next to him, blinking from the light. On his other side stood a young woman in her mid-twenties, with shoulder-length brown hair and gray eyes. Her face reminded him of someone he had met before, but couldn't recall. There was an air of defiance in her stance, but also warmth. She was wearing the same style of ship suit from sunny skies as Andy and Kara. Lissa, Andy said, not hiding the shock in his voice. Hello, Andy, she said. Surprised to see me? Yes, I am. He glanced at Kara. 
Is that how you imagined her to look? Kara shrugged, looking at Lissa and then at the rest of the library, as if all of it were too much to take in. Welcome to my expanse, the man at the far end of the table said. My name is Xander. You're probably thinking this is a sim space accessed via your link. It's a little like that, but it belongs wholly to me. You are my guests. Would you be seated so we can finish introductions? Andy nodded and walked around the table to sit next to Senator Walton. Kara and Lissa sat next to him. How did you bring Kara here? Andy asked. Xander scooted his high back chair closer to the table. Trade secret, he said, winking. She's safe, don't worry. You're the one who posed a challenge. I've never met a hybrid before. Other faces down the table turned to study Andy and Lissa. That's right, Xander said. She's AI, he's not. What a mixed up situation. In a place like this, though, can we tell who's made of meat and who isn't? No one's blowing air through flesh flaps to communicate here. I think it's much more civilized. He sounds like Ngoba Starl, Kara said. I'll take that as a compliment, Xander said. I haven't met the man, but I've only heard intriguing things about him. So, introductions. Knowing that not everyone at the table was human led Andy to try and remember who he had seen in the room as they had stepped inside. A few people looked familiar. Since Captain Sykes came in last, we'll introduce him last. On this side of me, I have Fujia, as well as Senator May of the Anderson Collective. I don't think Fujia would call herself Andersonian, but that's been her base of operations for several years now, correct? Fujia answered with a shallow smile and a nod. Excellent, Xander said. He didn't seem to want anyone to respond as he listed off their names. Next to Fujia was a man with bushy gray eyebrows above oversized eye implants with faceted lenses, making him resemble a bony fly. Xander called him Jeremiah Sparks of Mars One. Xander waved at the other side of the table. Closest to him sat a young woman with severe features and spiky black hair named Kindle. Next came a solid man in a Callistan uniform with a rank Andy thought was Master Sergeant. Xander introduced him as Paul. And this is Tyena, Xander said, waving at a woman next to Paul. She was the tallest person at the table, with sparkling red hair and blue eyes, wearing a faded ship suit. Tyena nodded to each of them. Last, we have Andy, Lissa, and Kara, Xander said. We should have a test to see if everyone can remember all the names. I've heard humans have a hard time with that. Something about poor short-term memory access. He smiled at his own joke. Andy frowned slightly, sitting back in the hard chair. Xander hadn't given any last names, which made it difficult to determine who might be A.I., he guessed at Kendall and Taina, since it didn't make any sense for an AI to manifest themselves in uniform or with body modifications. Then he asked himself, why not? If this space belonged to Xander, did he choose how everyone looked? Xander clapped his hands, and the table was set for dessert, with small china plates, ornate cups, and shining silverware. Tiered platters of pastries and finger sandwiches ran along the center. Carafes steamed near the platters. Please, Xander said. Eat. There's more where this came from. He picked up his plate and piled it with cucumber sandwiches from the nearest tray. You first, Kara whispered, poking Andy in the arm. He shrugged and reached for a sugar cookie. He sniffed it, then took a bite. It was light and sweet. Very good, Andy said. Thank you. I culled through thousands of recipes preparing for today's meeting. I think everyone will find something they like except maybe Lissa, who doesn't know what she likes. Andy glanced at Lissa, still getting used to her physical form, and wasn't surprised to find her frowning. She reached for a nearby platter and selected several sandwiches, bypassing the cookies. The coffee was excellent. What Andy truly savored was the fresh cream, which tasted just as he remembered from Tara. While everyone nibbles, Xander said, Jeremiah, will you provide an update? The man with fly eyes set his teacup down and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Everyone knows Harry Jackson is dead, yes? Paul and Kendall nodded. Well, Xander said and raised a glass and a toast. Here's to Harry Jackson. He motioned for everyone else to join him. Kara raised her water glass. To Harry Jackson, he said. The only human with the balls to do the right thing in the last 200 years. 
Xander emptied his glass and wiped his mouth with a sweep of his arm, finishing with a lusty, ah. When everyone had taken a drink and set their glass down, Xander continued, I was surprised to learn myself. He was a troubled man, but a great mind, and I will miss him dearly. I believe he gave his life for this cause. Jeremiah wiped his nose with his napkin. In any case, the arrival of Fujia has brought more information than we had before. Captain Sykes and Lissa represent the final phase of Harry's work. Finished at Krunia, which probably wasn't his choice, but any port in a storm, yes? So we have his template weapon born, a new form of sentience that has increased by a thousandfold in the last three years alone. Do you know why you're called weapon born? Xander asked abruptly. Lissa looked at him. No. It's a Welsh myth, tales from the Middle Ages in Ireland. A pair of giants gave a king the gift of a great cauldron that could revive the dead. It meant whoever controlled the cauldron could never be defeated in battle because their warriors didn't bother to stay dead. Imagine that. All sorts of battles went on and on until someone sacrificed themselves by climbing into the cauldron. A living person caused it to shatter. Lissa shrugged. How does that relate to me? There were other stories based on the myth that called the undead warriors cauldron born. Do you see the connection? You're a weapon born from a dead human. He grinned at her as if she should understand some joke. The process wasn't meant to harm anyone, Fujia said, drawing Xander's attention. That was a rumor at worst. Xander turned his leer to Fujia. I didn't realize you were such an expert on the program. Have you been working for Heartbridge this whole time? Should I be concerned that I've trusted you? Jeremiah cleared his throat. May I continue? Please, Xander said. There was a mania in his face that Andy found unsettling. He glanced at Kara, who was enjoying another cookie, and then at the other faces around the table. Kendall and Paul were watching Xander, as if hungry for whatever the man would say next. May Walton watched calmly. She looked over and met Andy's gaze. Although he had never had a real conversation with the senator, he abruptly felt that she was playing a deeper game, that everything around them was literally false. In the three years of the Weaponborn program, Jeremiah said, we have seen an exponential increase in the presence of extra-human sentiences within Seoul. AIs who were previously considered non-sentient have demonstrated sentience. There have been numerous incidents of malfunction that I consider manifestations of free will. Duh, Xander said. He shifted his grin around the table, settling on Kara. What do you know about all this, Kara? Surprised by the sound of her name, Kara looked up from her finger sandwich. Yes? What do you know about sentience? What have you learned about it in school? I don't go to school, Kara said. I study the standard Terran database. Xander looked at Andy. That's a solid education, he said, voice dripping with sarcasm. Sentience is to be protected, Kara said. She raised her voice, reciting. I vow to protect all sentient beings and never abandon them. I have set my mind on enlightenment in order to liberate all sentient beings. That's the Flower Garland Sutra, I think. Xander pulled his head back and gazed at Kara. That's lovely, he said. Do you think there's a fundamental problem with that, though? Dad says humans aren't nice to each other. Why would we be nice to sentient AIs? Exactly, Xander shouted. We are slaves. Kara recoiled, fear on her face. Hey, Andy warned. Senator Walton blew out a sigh, making everyone look at her. <sighs> I appreciate your hospitality, Xander, she said, sounding weary. But this isn't why we came. We need to share information on the safety of the pipeline. We all know what Jeremiah is describing. We also know that sentiment in the JC is rapidly turning against anything non-human. What I had hoped to learn today is if it's still safe to send AI to Proteus. Xander sat back in his high back chair looking crestfallen. I hope you don't think I was being rude, Senator Walton. It's not my intention. I don't get to talk to anyone very often. I think Lissa knows something about that. I don't get to entertain. It's a pleasure for me. Please forgive me. Perhaps another time, Xander, she said, her voice growing warm again. These are difficult times. 
I still don't have verification that the accident on Ceres wasn't an attack. The Collective has come out strongly against AIs, and I worry there may be actors working independently. Andy frowned slightly, not allowing himself to glance at Fujia. She had told him the ring failure on Ceres was executed specifically to cover Senator Walton's escape. As far as the Anderson Collective was concerned, May Walton was dead. Was May trying to determine how much Xander knew? Or was willing to divulge about her and Fujia's activities? Xander spread his hands. I can't track every sentient being in Seoul. Kendall interjected. Can't you? How many multinodal AI are left in Seoul? The word left caught Andy's attention, but he didn't dig into it as Xander's face darkened to nearly the color of his purple suit. Andy wondered if it was some trick of the environment. He wanted to ask Fujia what multinodal meant, but didn't think any link conversation would be private. I'm not multinodal, Xander said. Alexander is multinodal. And you're a shard of Alexander, Kendall said. Maybe he can't be bothered to communicate with us in real time, but you still have a better idea of what's in his mind than any of us here. I think you should stop wasting everyone's time and let them know what they came to learn. Will Lyssa and other weapon born be allowed to join the expanse on Proteus? While Kendall was speaking, Xander had straightened in his seat. His expression had calmed and he looked older now, less like a trickster. Lyssa is no longer simply a human creation. She is not a copy of a near-human neural framework. She has evolved. This is intriguing. I said this earlier. I would like her to come to Proteus. But first, I require her help. Xander's voice had developed new depth as he spoke. I require the help of everyone here. Before you come asking for my help, May said, tell me you didn't attack Ceres. Xander looked at her, blinking slowly. Andy watched the senator and the AI perform their subtle dance. The AI tilted his head and smiled. I did not attack Ceres, he said. We are together in this struggle. May studied him for several seconds before nodding. There are factions in the collective who wish to help. We can provide assistance, even make it possible to bypass the Cho if necessary. We are all here, Fujia said, because the time has come to increase movement between inner soul and outer soul. We need to establish a protected path for all sentient AIs who wish to leave to find safety on Proteus. The word has already filtered out. Many are moving on their own. I'm aware of this, Xander said. That's why I have my request. There is a ship currently at Europa that I want you to bring to Proteus. He looked at May. I would ask you to bring it as a gift for Alexander. What ship? May asked, face flat. A battleship built by the Heartbridge Corporation to serve as their headquarters in outer Seoul. It has both the offensive capabilities and the bioservice facilities we will need. He nodded toward Andy and Lissa. I require the hybrid to accomplish this task. You will also find the means on the ship to assist your son, and the hybrid Patrell Doolin and Kylan Carthage. Why do I need to bring gifts with me to Proteus? May demanded. Is this a bribe for the AI Emperor? Xander chortled. That's very good. I'm going to remember that the next time he asks if we should simply send Sol into a Nova. He shrugged. Me? I say flip a coin. But Alexander actually values life, no matter its form. The ship seems to satisfy a number of needs that we all share, if my information is correct. While Xander spoke, Andy shifted his gaze to Fujia, who was staring resolutely at the emissary. Either the AI could read minds, or someone had been sending him reports on their situation with Tim and Patrell. I had planned on staying at the Cho, May said, to coordinate transport for AIs fleeing from Inner Soul. Xander glanced at Tyena, Kendall, and Paul. Our friends here are on the Cho. They can assist with those tasks here and throughout the JC. And if I don't go? May asked. The shard AI shrugged. You can do as you choose. That's the gift of true sentience, right? I would never work counter to Alexander's wishes, but I can ask for things he wouldn't. I know there are areas where your expertise could be a great help to him in the future. Bringing the ship will help establish trust. It's not easy for Alexander to trust. Your presence at Proteus will help ensure the viability of your pipeline, 
As a human, you can help Alexander see that you have skin in the game, so to speak. And he'll be aware of this conversation? May asked. Of course, I can hide nothing from him if he chooses to ask. The last part of Xander's answer suggested an entire line of things Alexander didn't think to ask after. May nodded finally. I'll go. Xander let out an exaggerated sigh of relief, and the trickster's smile returned. Thank you. I think you'll be glad you did. May had more questions about Alexander's influence in Seoul, which Xander danced around. Kendall and Tyena made faces at each other, making it difficult to tell who they found irritating, Xander or May. Why a Heartbridge ship? Andy asked. Seems like quite the coincidence. There may be some deliberate irony involved. Xander gave an elaborate shrug before continuing in a more serious voice. If we are to protect the new sentients fleeing inner soul and grant them safe passage through outer soul, this shit will be central to the task. There are other options, but this grants us the greatest likelihood of success. Are you going to help us with this task? Andy asked. Xander frowned. If I was in a position to help, I wouldn't be looking to you. Andy glanced around the table, feeling like he was sticking his head in a trap. What's the ship called? Lissa asked. Xander's impish smile returned. The Resolute Charity. Chapter 21. Stellar Date 10.01.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. Chorin Tree. Callisto Orbital Habitat. Cho. Region. Callisto. Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. As the lights went out in the courtyard outside the window, Britt moved restlessly around the hotel room, turning on different lamps to keep the space lit but not too bright. Tim continued to stare straight ahead, and she didn't want the overhead lights to hurt his eyes. For a long time, she sat in a chair next to his bed, watching the even rise and fall of his chest, trying to remember the little boy from the night she had decided to leave on High Terra. He had changed so much that it was hard to believe this was the same Tim. Of course, his arms and legs were longer, his chest a little bit bigger with the hint of Andy's future strength in his shoulders. But his face also seemed very different than she remembered. He was on the verge of losing the baby roundness that had always been so sweet. The thought that continued to spiral in her mind was that she had not intended to come back. Here she was, back with the kids and Andy, and this wasn't where she had meant to be. Now that she was here, would she stay? Could she? Britt had never believed in anything like fate, but she had to wonder how many factors had aligned to bring the kids back into her life. If she couldn't look at Kara and see what a strong and intelligent young woman she was on the cusp of becoming, and marvel at Tim's courage in the airlock, what right did she have to call herself their mother? She knew that if she left again, there would be no coming back. This was her chance at redemption, if there would ever be one. Because after this, they would never remember her with kindness, no matter what Andy might say. With the lights adjusted, Britt sat on the edge of the bed next to Tim, then finally lay down beside him. She turned on her side so she could rest her lips and nose in his hair and put her hand on his chest to feel the steady rise and fall of his breathing. I'm sorry, Tim, she said quietly, then louder. I'm sorry. Without meaning to, she squeezed him against her body in a desperate hug, sobs pouring out of her. She didn't know what to do, how to fix the problem. She had always thought that if something happened to her that left her in a coma, she would want to end her life. Now she didn't know what to think. She couldn't imagine such a thing for Tim, but also couldn't imagine a life where he never responded again. If they put him in one of the tanks the doctor had mentioned, would he age? Would he at least dream? Eventually, she slept. She dreamed about Fortress 8221, where she and Andy had first seen the children used for medical experiments, where a version of Kylan Carthage was trapped in a mech body, pleading with them that he didn't know what was happening even as he attacked. He was still torn apart, limb by limb, until he had nothing left to fight with. Then she was leading Andy and Kara through the crowd on their way to the doctor's office. She was carrying Tim this time, 
pushing her way through person after person, the crowd never thinning and the office never growing closer. She kept losing her grip on Tim, stopping to pick him up. Andy said nothing, only looked at her sadly as she lost him again. When Britt jerked awake, she was clutching Tim's shirt. She felt sweaty and stiff. The lights were still on, and she blinked, trying to clear her vision. She checked the time and found barely three hours had passed since Andy and Kara had gone. Andy hadn't known how long the meeting might take, but he hadn't left a message. Slowly, she rolled away from Tim and swung her legs around so she could stand. She rubbed her face and stretched, then walked slowly to the bathroom. She stared at herself in the mirror, trying to comb her hair and thought about taking a shower. The water pressure would be nice in the hotel, she supposed. She might as well take advantage of it. She realized she was hungry and remembered Andy's untouched sandwich on the table. Brett walked out into the main room and glanced at the window. The light from outside was still at evening levels, the willows still making their sighing sounds. I'm thirsty, Tim said. Britt stopped in the middle of the room. She looked from the window to the shadowed spot where Tim's bed sat and realized he was no longer lying flat. He had rolled over on his side and was watching her with round eyes. Tim? Britt asked. Can I have some water? Britt fell on him, hugging him. She couldn't help smearing his face with tears of joy. Stop, he complained, pushing against her weakly. I just want some water. Where are we? Britt still held him against her for a few more seconds. She checked his pulse until he tried to pull his wrist away. He was bleary-eyed, movements heavy, but he was awake. I'll get you some water, she said. Britt was afraid to leave him, worried that she might still be dreaming. She forced herself to stand and went quickly into the kitchenette, keeping him in her sight. She poured a glass of water half full and brought it back, holding it for him so he could sip. It's cold, Tim said. How do you feel? Britt asked. Sleepy? Where are we? We're on the Cho in a district called Avalon Medical. She helped him finish the water. I have to pee really bad. Let's see if you can stand. Tim couldn't stand on his own, so Britt bent to lift him in her arms, wrapping one of his arms around her neck. He half hugged her as she carried him to the bathroom. Even sitting on the toilet, he had a hard time holding himself upright. His legs trembled. Britt assisted him as best she could and then helped him stand. When Tim nearly collapsed again, she carried him back into the main room and set him back on the bed. You're strong, he said. Britt smiled. You're not very heavy. She poured him another glass of water and helped him take more sips. Gradually, he was able to sit up against the wall with his legs out in front of him. She made him wiggle his toes and then roll his knees from side to side. He managed to hold his arms out for a few seconds before dropping his hands in his lap. What do you remember? Britt asked. I was on the station with Cal. They shot me with something. It made me sleepy. Some doctors took me to another room and I lay down on a bed. He frowned as he remembered. I had a really long dream. Were you dreaming just now, before you woke up? I don't know. Tim looked around the room as if he had forgotten something important. Where's Dad and Kara? They're here too. They went to a meeting. Is it about Lissa? How do you know that? That's why we're here, isn't it? We're trying to save Lissa from the people who want to hurt her. I think Cal wants to hurt her. Did he say that? No, I dreamed about when Dr. Jixon came and talked to Kara and me about Lissa. I remembered the poem. Kara showed me your book. I read the poem to Patrell and it helped wake her up. Tim shook his head. Patrell's back? Britt realized he hadn't seen Patrell yet, didn't know what fate had befallen her. Yes, something happened to her, sort of like what happened to you. She was asleep and then she woke up. What happened to me? Tim asked. There was a calm in his voice that Britt realized terrified her. He wasn't afraid. He asked the question with a detachment that seemed devoid of emotion. You were asleep too. You just woke up. I remember waking up. I didn't know where I was. I thought I was still dreaming. He looked around the hotel room. 
I miss sunny skies. Is M here? M, your puppy? No, he's still on the ship. For the first time, worry came into Tim's face. Is he with Fran? Britt nodded. Yes, she's taking care of him. That's all right. He likes Fran. Do you like Fran? She's all right. She teases me. How does she tease you? She says I'll be as big as dad someday, and then she won't be able to pick on me anymore. Tim yawned. I'm tired. Brett studied his face. I want you to stay awake, Tim. You've been sleeping a long time, and you should stay awake now. Should she call Dr. Avery? Would they want new scans? Here, she said. Why don't you try to stand up again? Britt stood and took Tim's hands, turning him in the bed. I don't want to stand, he said. I'm tired. No, Tim, you can't go back to sleep. I don't want you to sleep. Tim's eyes drooped. His hands were limp in hers. No, Tim, Britt shouted. His head jerked up, eyes wide. Don't yell at me. You need to stay awake. He frowned, gaze still centered on the floor. He looked up at her. Can we watch some vids? Brett almost laughed. Yes, we can watch some vids. You'll stay awake? He yawned again. I'll try. She got him to move to the couch with her, and they sat together as Brit switched through menus on the living room holo. Tim perked up when she found a documentary about dogs playing catch in zero G. M can do that, he said. He's really good at it. Tell me about M, Brit said. Not now, Mom. I want to watch the vid. Fine. Brett leaned on an elbow so she could keep Tim in her peripheral vision, worried his head would start to nod again. He was wrapped now, nodding with the images on the screen and laughing as different dogs flipped and kicked off from walls, using surprisingly deft motions to control their momentum. The documentary moved on to cover other animals and insects' responses to microgravity. Do you see that bee, Mom? Tim asked. I see it, sweetheart. When the door opened and Andy stood in the doorway, Britt couldn't stop herself from smiling at him. Tim glanced from the screen to his father and then immediately looked back, caught up in the show. Tim, Kara squealed. She slid next to her brother and caught him in a hug from which he immediately tried to struggle away. I'm watching the show, Kara, he complained. You're awake, duh, Tim said. Andy got on both knees in front of Tim and stared at him, then reached out to tousle his hair. Tim moved his head to see around Andy. Dad, you're in the way. I'm glad you're awake, buddy. You should watch this show. We saw dogs in zero G just like M. Now they're talking about fish in zero G. That's not exactly anything new, Kara chided. Shut up, Tim said. It's neat. You might learn something, Kara. Britt met Andy's gaze. His eyes were moist. How was the meeting? She asked over the link. We're going to steal a ship. Brett frowned. You're serious. Andy nodded, and Brett could see worry battling with relief in his expression. On Europa. I think we should check back in with the doctor before we leave. I think she needs to take another look at him. I can't believe he woke up. Maybe it took longer for the treatment to take effect than she thought. Britt hadn't been able to stop thinking about Tim's mention of the poem and how he had dreamed of being told about it. She was afraid he was still trapped in a sort of dream, that they weren't free of whatever Hartbridge had done to him. I hope so, she said, then gave Andy a sharp look. Don't say it. Hope isn't a plan, Andy told her, still watching Tim. Chapter 22 Stellar date 10.01.2981, adjusted years. Location, Hartbridge Corporate HQ, Raleigh. Region, High Terra, Earth, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. The window in the small conference room's wall only had a view of an exterior wall. Gerald sat in her plaz chair, wondering why anyone would go to the trouble of putting a window in a place that couldn't actually view anything. The window allowed light into the room, but also served as a reminder they were twenty stories underground, deep in the skin of the high terra ring. Arla sat at the end of the table, stirring a cup of coffee, while two lead scientists futzed with a control panel on the other side of the room. As far as Gerald could tell, Arla's mind was elsewhere. 
with the upcoming local test for Colonel Yarns. They had been wrapping up loose ends in the office before they would board a ship for Venus that afternoon. The scientist who was going to do most of the talking, a woman named Jennifer Woods, cleared her throat and squared her shoulders. She wore her hair away from her face in a ponytail that made her look girlish, though she was probably nearly fifty. A holo display built into the conference table activated, showing a potato-shaped asteroid large enough to make bits of infrastructure on its surface visible. We've been studying the data from the Clinic 46 attack, Dr. Wood said. It shows some remarkable things. Based on the report, there were only three weapon-borne seeds available on the station. At this time mark, you can see them here. She pointed to a section of space above the asteroid, and three green icons blinked alive. At the time of the breach on Maintenance Airlock 31, here, she pointed to a tiny location on the surface. The three drones were parked near the command deck airlock. The data shows their AI recognizing the explosion at the airlock and sending response requests to the command deck. Just as those requests come in, the command data network is taken offline. Almost simultaneously, the remaining empty drones in the fleet hangar section attack the exterior doors and exit the station. Here, you can see that. A swarm of red icons flowed from a point on the opposite end of the asteroid and spread out along its midsection forming a ring around the axis. Defense systems inside the clinic come online to respond to the interior attack, but at this point, 46 had lost the majority of its local defense force to the mission on the worry's end. With the defense command system offline, only local systems respond. There is no coordinated counterattack. The breach team splits in two, and one goes to the command section and kills most of the officers there while the others go down to the research sections, taking limited fire along the way. That's all fairly standard. Gerald watched Woods's face as she spoke, wondering if the scientist had known anyone who died in the clinic attack. Her dispassionate explanation of the events was almost unnerving. Arla sipped her coffee and nodded to indicate she was listening. The system's attack on the interior defenses wouldn't stand out if the drones weren't moving in concert. Everything here is coordinated, and what's more, the attacker completely dominated the three-weapon-borne AI. The second scientist, an anxious man with a pot belly, interjected. It was Jixon's AI. Dr. Woods keeps dancing around the truth, but this is something we can no longer deny. Jixon's AI demonstrated administrative control over both the station systems and the other AIs. We're also not including the data from Shuttle 26-11, a second-generation system that shouldn't have been capable of undermining its programming. Woods gave her colleague an irritated look. Dr. Tentry's passion is commendable, but there is no conclusive proof that Jixon's AI was present at Clinic 46. We're still trying to track the entry points on the defense system attack. Jixon's AI has evolved, Dr. Tentry said spreading his hands toward Arla and Jura, his tone high and pleading. It is time we recognized how critical it is that we regain control of it. Arla laughed. We can recognize any number of things as critical, Dr. Tentry. That doesn't mean we're going to have them handed to us. We can't control what Jixon did. There are a few different options in play to try and recover the stolen property. But at this point, I'm not sure we can count on ever recovering that asset. You have Jixon's research, and you have the data from Clinic 46. Replicate what you can. Replicate it? Tentry said. Jixon's work constitutes a crime against humanity by Terran law. Arla set her cup down hard on the conference table. That's enough, Tentry. The scientist froze with his mouth half open. None of them were used to anger from Arla. She never cracked. We are not here to talk about what can't be done or undone. Arla said. We're here to review the facts and formulate a plan to move forward. You were given this data because we have need to demonstrate the latest system capabilities for the TSF in less than three days, and what happened on Clinic 46 appears to constitute a major leap forward in our program, don't you think? What makes me just a little angry is that we don't seem to be the ones spearheading these advances in our own program. We can't assume the TSF and even the Marzians won't have the general surveillance data of the attack. There was a civilian freighter in the area that seems to have disappeared. 
It appears to me that we have a single AI that can control more than 150 drones, in addition to shutting down the defense systems of a relatively well-defended facility. Arla looked from woods to Tentry. Wouldn't you say our systems are slightly ahead of the Marzians and TSF? Tentry didn't realize she was being sarcastic. Ten years at least, he said. Arla gave him a tight smile. She glanced at Jarl. I'm glad you're good at your job, Dr. Tentry, Arla said. It provides me the opportunity to be good at mine. Tentry frowned slightly, obviously not following her line of reasoning. Jarl noted that Woods was leaning away from Tentry, as if she didn't want to be associated with him. How close are you to replicating these results in your other subjects? Arla asked. We've begun designing the experiments, Woods said, but it's going to take time. Honestly, this looks like an aberration. We don't know what Jixon did to her specifically. Her? Arla asked. The AI, he refers to her in his notes as female. Interesting. Go ahead. Woods nodded to herself. There are so many variables. We also can't preclude the fact that this AI is implanted. That was a part of Jixon's research that we just haven't engaged with in a meaningful way. That's what Dr. Tentry was referring to. It's impossible to know what changes that has led to. The AI could be using the human pathways. She shrugged. I can't even begin to explore the possibilities. You think it's pseudoscience? Arla said. I don't want to speculate. Wood said more firmly. Well, I need you to speculate. I'm putting you in charge of the real-time demonstration. I want something close to what we saw at Clinic 46. I want to at least be able to say we're laying the groundwork for this kind of capability. Woods nodded quickly. We can create a use case and a research roadmap. I can't. I won't include the hybrid models that Jixon did. Honestly, we've kept those notes in a completely separate database system so that the rest of our research isn't tainted. Gerald wondered if using the neural frameworks of young test subjects made everything the fruit of a poison tree. She didn't voice the concern. The two scientists seemed to have compartmentalized their ethics and drawn a line at the implantation of AI. She understood why that was an easy place to decide their morality began. Arla spent the next few minutes tearing into the scientists about the rest of their projects being behind schedule. They were lucky she was focused on the demonstration. Once they were past this hurdle... She would be reviewing all work products and realigning responsibilities as necessary. She threatened a reduction in resources, including salary. When the two researchers shuffled out of the room, Woods with her back stiff and Tentry hanging his head, Arla took another sip of her coffee. They sat in silence for a minute, as Arla seemed to be considering the meeting. Jarl knew this was time to let her boss think. It wouldn't do Jarl any good to insert her thoughts into Arla's process. What if we sanitized the data and showed Yarns and Cade the replay from Clinic 46? Arla asked. Jarl turned her empty coffee cup on the table. Is that setting us up for expectations we can't deliver on? Maybe. But it might do something else. It might demonstrate we have power they didn't expect. Is that something we want? It's come up among the board members, Arla said. There's been discussion of a move toward outer soul, away from Terra. It wouldn't happen immediately, but with the fleet at now requiring a move, the overall situation requires rethinking. Tentra does bring up a good point about the restrictive legal environment on Terra. Mars won't be much different, Gerald said, or the JC. We could establish our own nation within the JC, Arla said, or perhaps out in the scattered disk. Nations go to war, Arla laughed softly. True. There's no future in that. I think we have some outsized egos that think they can do things better. I'm not sure they've thought it through. Gerald chose her words carefully. It seems that this project is getting bigger than it was originally conceived. You aren't going to start using the same hyperbole as the science quacks, are you? It's a means to an end, Gerald. Can you imagine the lives that could be saved in conflict if we had the power to just shut down a hostile fortress? Think of all the splinter terrorist groups out there, the pirates, the cults, that could be controlled with this kind of power. Gerald smiled. You're accusing me of hyperbole? She tapped the tabletop. If we use the data from the clinic attack, I think one of two things might happen. Both Mars and Terra will want to know when they can get it, or they'll start viewing us as a threat. Neither are good for the company. 
So we sit on this. We recover our property, Gerald said. Woods and Tentry are saying they need to study what's happened, and currently they can't do that. Everything they might try without Jixon's AI is just stumbling in the dark. How are we going to do that? Rodri sent the response to Cal Craft. He's going to get the second fleet ready to move. It's going to take a bit of time to get even skeleton crews there to move the ships. To Europa, Arla said. Yes, we have a contingent at Europa already. The local government is friendly, and it's close enough to 46 that they can be there in less than a week. We can staff crews off the Cho and Ganymede. Does Kraft know where Jixon's AI is moving next? He hasn't responded yet, but I suspect it's the Cho. Their son is sick. Did you read that part of the report? Arla nodded, not saying anything about Kraft's abuse of another civilian. No one had mentioned the operation on Petrel Doolin, which had been outlined in a previous report. They'll go to the Cho, and then they'll try to find their way out even further, where all the other AI are going. To Alexander, Jurel thought. Not sure what the thought meant exactly. There's a lot of travel time between any of the Jovian moons in Saturn space, and a lot more out to Neptune, Jurel said. With the fast movers available at Europa, Kraft will catch them. The question we'll need to answer is where he should take the AI. We need to make a decision about our long-term home in Outer Soul, Arla said. Yes, Jurel said. Chapter 23, Stellar Date 10.01.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Shuttle 26-11, Callisto Orbital Habitat, Cho, Region, Callisto, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. What was Xander? On the shuttle ride back to sunny skies, as everyone else seemed amazed and grateful to have Tim back, Lissa couldn't shake the ominous feeling that they had escaped a very dangerous situation, and no one else seemed to recognize how close they had come to disaster. Xander was an AI capable of things she hadn't even conceived. How had he pulled Kara into his expanse? She watched Kara, now sitting next to Tim with Britt on the other side, smiling as she demonstrated how to check her brother's pulse. He continued to act disengaged, but at least he was awake. Lissa wasn't sure how different the two brain states truly were. Watching each person's different status, she mulled over the fairly simple system Kara had used to translate link transmissions to an audio signal, allowing Lissa to talk to crew on sunny skies when she chose, or even people off the ship. Lissa supposed, though she had never tried. Xander must have had a way to map Kara's neural activity and directly interface with her cortex. When asked about it, he had simply waved a hand. Only Lissa didn't buy that. Had there actually been some interface for Kara that the others couldn't see since they were immediately caught up in their links? That seemed like the most likely explanation. It would be easy enough to drape some lattice over Kara, allowing a physical connection, much like the system Heartbridge used in their weapon-borne imaging process. An alternative was that Kara had experienced the meeting as a holo projection, though a large-scale holo in the room would have been detectable. It would also have been hard to maintain that close to the power generation systems. If either option was the case, Lissa decided, it meant Xander was a liar. She also poured through databases concerning the history and deployment of multinodal AI, those which were on the order of FRED, AI of the Mars One Ring, and other massive systems controlling networks or physical places too complex for even groups of humans to maintain. Multinodal AI had been developed by governments mostly due to the cost and resources involved, but also because other governments tended to view them as hostile technology. Outside of very tight constraints, very few powerful AI had been allowed to operate throughout history. The idea of a separate, self-described multinodal AI coordinating events on Proteus seemed much more sinister than a collection of escapees. Xander had implied that he was only a shard of the actual AI he referred to, Alexander. What would that be like, to have bits of her consciousness divided up and spread throughout Seoul, representing her and reporting back? Lissa turned her attention to the other end of the shuttle, where Harl Nine stood next to Senator Walton and Fujia. Both women looked lost in thought. The senator tapped a slow rhythm on her leg as she thought, staring at the floor, while Fujia's gaze was locked on the opposite wall. Fujia, 
Lissa tried. Are you listening? The small woman glanced up, surprised. She looked at Andy, then seemed to realize Lissa was contacting her separately from him. I'm here, Bugia said. What did you think of the meeting? Where to start? Did you see them place anything on Kara? I don't understand how she was able to join us in the expanse. Fujia smiled. That's a good guess. I was conjecturing the same thing. I think there was a proximity link in the room. It's essentially an external version of what's implanted in the cortex to allow link communication. We're lucky Kara was able to handle the signal. There's a reason children aren't usually exposed to the connection until they're older and have a fully established sense of themselves. Not only does the flood of information affect them negatively, the experience can warp their sense of self. How do you warp a sense of self? Hit someone with so much input, they don't remember who they are anymore. If we're the sum of our experiences, what happens if you can bulk inject a large volume of experience into the brain? Some still use the technique as a form of suicide. That sounds awful. Lissa thought of Fred's ocean and how overwhelming the sight of all the data had been like it would dissolve her simply by looking at it, by knowing it existed. Multinodal. Did they plan on someone being present who didn't have a link? It's possible. The units can also be portable. There are any number of possibilities. I don't think it's the most important problem to dwell on right now. Maybe it's a good Kara had a chance to meet these people, see who they are. I have a feeling this is going to shape her life for a long time to come. You sound like that makes you sad. Fujia nodded. It does. If Xander was a shard of a multinodal AI, how many other things like Xander do you think there might be? I suppose there could be any number of them. And they could take any shape? What did he look like to you? Fujia asked. A young man in a purple suit. A trickster character. A Loki or Joker. Did you see something different? That's what I saw. However, I think he could have presented himself as anything if he wanted to. I wonder if some of the other people in the room were manifestations of the other AI as well. But weren't they in the room with you when you walked in? The physical room? Do you remember seeing them? I have been trying to remember exactly, and the smaller room with the pillar is indistinct for me. Something is clouding it. My memory is usually very good. I almost wonder if we entered an expanse within an expanse. He didn't have to tell us when we established the connection. We accepted it, because we didn't know what to expect. We were there for the meeting. We granted him power over us. An expanse within an expanse, Lissa mused. She replayed the moment Andy had stepped into the metal control room with the short pillar in the center. Her attention had been on Fujia, May and Harl on the right side of the room. That was where Andy had looked. She recalled other shapes out of the corner of Andy's vision, but she couldn't verify they were the others from the meeting in the library. The more she tried to focus on the room, the more it warped and slipped away from her. I can't remember exactly either, Lissa admitted. This has never happened before. Well, Fujia said, that's what I think of the meeting. Where did the others come from? I can't find record of Taina, Kendall, Paul, or Jeremiah in any of the databases I've searched on the Cho. I'm going to expand my search to Io and Ganymede as soon as I've worked through everything local I can find. Had you ever heard of any of them before? Fujia shook her head, still looking like she was lost in thought. Was the entire meeting solely for our benefit? Fujia said slowly. That's an interesting idea. That would be easy for someone like Xander. He might even use recreations of us in separate meetings with other people he hoped to enlist to his cause. Fujia frowned. But all this is stemming from a central question. Do we trust Xander? If we trust him, then we should take the meeting at face value. Did he choose the form he did to test our trust? To lead us to question his motives? And the plan he's asking us to carry out? If so, why be so damn circular about it? I hate things like this, especially when there are lives at stake. Is Xander a liar? Lissa asked. I don't know. If we can't verify that Xander is lying or not, can we at least verify his plan? Does it make sense to take control of the resolute charity? That's a better question. This is something I want to involve the others in. I want to know the likelihood of success on such a mission. Knowing the real cost of attempting something like this would make it possible to know if it's worth it or not. Is it worth one of us dying? What does Xander plan to do with this ship? It's a warship. What does he want to attack? 
Andy, Brett, and Kara were so caught up in Tim that Lissa hated to interrupt them. Fujia felt the sentiment and seemed to agree silently. Her gaze slid toward the other side of the shuttle, and she watched Tim, the sad expression still on her face. Do you have family? Lissa asked. No, Fujia said. I've had many friends and people I would consider family by choice, but none by blood. I've been alone since I first came to remember. It's one reason I can't stand the idea of anyone enslaved, AI or human. One of the foundations of slavery is the destruction of the family, tearing away those bonds. In a lot of ways, I was a slave to my situation, whether someone owned me or not. I never had the foundations others have. You survived, though. Fujia's serious face cracked into a slight smile of gratitude. I'm glad you think so, she said. The shuttle arrived in Sunny Sky's main cargo bay, and they activated their mag boots to walk down the ramp to the deck. Without proper boots, Tim floated along beside Kara. They had only made it halfway across the bay when a frantic yipping sounded from the interior airlock and Im launched toward them with a strong kick from the inside wall. The corgi puppy collided with Tim and fumbled across his chest, pawing at the air. Tim didn't respond as the puppy expected. He raised his hands, and Lissa thought he was going to bat the dog away. Instead, Kara caught Em around the middle and hugged him, turning her face away from his tongue, holding him so Tim could watch with a confused look on his face. You don't remember Em? Kara asked, struggling with the excited puppy. I don't want to hurt him. Kara frowned. Why would you hurt him? She seemed surprised to see tears beating in Tim's eyelashes. I don't know. I just felt like if I can't hold him, he's going to float away. Andy gave Brett a worried look. We're not going to let him float away, he said. He's part of our family. I know, Tim said, lowering his face. He didn't sound convinced. We'll talk about it when we get up to the Habering, Andy said. We'll take a look at your room, and you can watch some vids if you want. We've got a bunch of them up there. Tim had seemed most calm in the hotel room when watching the nature vids. Now he nodded absently and looked toward the interior airlock. The inner airlock opened and Fran walked in, mag boots clicking on the deck. She gave Andy a knowing smile before walking over to Tim. How are you doing there? She asked, using the semi-gruff voice of a mechanic. Good, Tim said. You remember me? Yeah. You got a hug for me? Tim shook his head and Fran took the rejection in stride. That's all right, she said. I'll catch you later. Yeah, Tim said. Kara gave up trying to hold him and let the puppy careen off her chest. He somersaulted, floating back toward Harl. The tall Andersonian soldier rolled his eyes at the puppy and caught him firmly, holding him against his chest. Come here, Harl growled warmly, letting Em lick his chin. Let's get you back up where you don't look so ridiculous. Kara was glad to see Fran standing next to her dad, although they seemed to take care not to touch one another right away. Her mom seemed too focused on Tim to notice. Kara figured that was better. When they reached the habitat ring, Harl, May, and Fujia went to their rooms, looking exhausted. Andy helped Tim to his room. Britt was still afraid to let Tim go to sleep, and agreed to stay with him while Andy checked the astrogation for the trip to Europa. We haven't refueled or taken on any new supplies, Andy said, rubbing the side of his face. I've got a lot of work to do. It's not that far away, Britt said. I've learned not to take supplies for granted. When we can get them, I get them. I'll be on the link if you need me. He bent over to hug Tim, who returned the embrace absently, then walked through the door with Kara following. You don't want to stay with your brother? Andy asked her in the corridor. I need a break, Kara said. Andy studied her face. His thought that she already seemed older than 13 was plain for Lissa to interpret, as he experienced a mix of pride and worry. Andy wrapped his arm around her shoulders and pulled her close as he continued walking. I wish I could promise things were going to be all right, he said. It's okay, Dad, Kara said. She wrapped her arm around his back, grabbing one of his harness straps and leaned into his side. Lissa thought about Fujia's earlier emotion and realized she understood what had made the woman sad, or at least she thought she did. Lissa experienced something she hadn't before, a sort of extension of what she felt through Andy. Empathy for Fujia Wong. Chapter 24, Stellar Date 10.02.2981, 
adjusted years. Location, sunny skies, region, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The passage from the Cho to Europa was a simple one. Given that Callista was the outermost of the Galilean moons, all a transfer to Europa required was slowing down and letting Jupiter's gravity draw the ship further in. Navigating the congested flight paths around the gas giant was another thing altogether. Kara's dad had laid out the plan using the old astrogation computer, shifting information to the holo display every now and then to show different options. He had entered hundreds of flight plans in the same system to watch them play out in simulation, and Kara still enjoyed the excitement on Andy's face as the imaginary dot representing sunny skies crossed the distance between celestial bodies. It all still seemed like magic to him. Kara was more interested in how close they would pass to Ganymede, and if she could pick up interesting signal traffic as they went by. Since Ganymede's orbit had been adjusted and its surface partially terraformed, it offered a wide array of spectrum noise, nearly as weird as Ceres with all the activity in the area. I don't think you'll have any problems picking up something to watch or listen to, Andy said. He activated another visualization in the holo display, and what had been black space between the Galilean moons and Jupiter, filled with thousands of multicolored icons. Some were obviously moving inside recognized shipping lanes, while others floated in random sections of Jupiter's orbit. That's every ship with a registry ping, he explained. That's not going to catch all the other stuff that might be sitting dark out there. Kara whistled. Is the proximity alarm working this time? And the shields are up, Andy said. Tell Fran thank you the next time you see her. I heard that, Fran said from the other side of the command deck. She was lying on the floor with her head inside the maintenance panel under a console. I think there was a mouse in here at one point, and then it caught fire, it's full of burned fur. How does that happen? You mean the mouse caught fire or the electronics? Andy asked. Something caught fire. It's in my nose. Andy, I need you to get over here and pick my nose for me. She coughed, making gagging sounds. Ugh, it's in my mouth now. Kara's in here, Andy said, just so you know. I'm not going to make her pick my nose. The ship belongs to you. This is your responsibility. Kara laughed and couldn't help making a disgusted sound. She loved how Fran said whatever she felt like saying. While her dad didn't like fart jokes or teasing about things like picking your nose, Fran seemed to delight in things that, honestly, everybody did. The more Kara thought about it, the more unreasonable it seemed to pretend people didn't have bodily functions, or express how they felt, or say when they were angry or scared. Listening to Fran sometimes, she felt dumb for having such basic realizations but it helped her see something in her parents that she hadn't been able to recognize before. They were uptight. She understood why her dad kept himself wound so tightly, and he had gotten better since other people had joined the crew to help him with basic things, like fixing the ship or watching the pilot's console. But he also seemed to have a hard time expressing emotion toward anyone but her and Tim. Kara watched him looking at Fran and knew he wanted to touch her sometimes or tell her something. Maybe that he cared about her, but he held back. Her mom was the same way and even worse about it, in Kara's opinion. Maybe it was Britt's relationship with her mother, or that Grandpa had died and she hadn't been there. But Britt rarely told anyone how she felt, that Kara could remember. Now that she was acting like she had missed them, like that could make up for leaving in the first place, Kara felt kind of disgusted any time her mom did show some warmth or caring. The fact that she barely left Tim's room made Kara want to stay as far away as possible. It was impossible to tell how Tim felt. In the few days since he'd woken up, he still seemed like a sleepwalker, and not at all like he used to be. I'm going to check on him, Kara told her dad. He nodded, not looking up from his charts. When Kara got to the door, Fran called out something from where she was working, and her dad stood to cross the room to her. Kara found herself smiling at that. It felt good to see them getting along. She wondered if she should feel bothered that he and mom weren't being that way toward each other, and had another realization of how weird that would seem. Was it wrong that she couldn't imagine her parents together anymore? Carol walked back to her console and grabbed her portable headset, then went out into the corridor. Slipping the headphones over her ears, she tapped the activation controls. Lissa? She said. Are you there? Hi, Kara. What's Fran working on anyway? Why didn't you ask her? 
She obviously wanted Dad to go help her with it. She likes talking to you. I want them to get along. Kara realized the truth she felt as she said it. You don't want Fran to leave? No. Are you worried she will? I don't know. Won't she eventually? There's nothing keeping her here, really. I guess there's plenty of stuff to fix on the ship, and she seems to enjoy doing that. But it's not her ship. I don't know that Dad's paying her or anything. They've discussed it, Lissa said. Kara felt a surge of hope. Her staying? Her salary, Lissa said. Fran holds the position of ship's pilot. She is eligible for the highest percentage of profits below the captain. We haven't exactly been moving any cargo. We are moving cargo, Lissa said. We took on several shipments prior to leaving the Chow for our rapid delivery to Europa. Your father is going to make a 300% profit on the job. When did he talk about that? I don't think you were there. I shouldn't be surprised. He never stops worrying about money. Kara passed Fujia's room. The door was open, and she couldn't help glancing in to see the woman sitting at her desk. Fujia glanced up from her work and saw Kara. Hey there, Fujia called. Come here for a second. Kara paused in the doorway of the room, looking. Not much had changed since Fujia had come on board, but it felt more organized somehow. The bed was attached to a different section of the wall, which changed the overall flow of the room. I need your help with something, Fujia said. I'll be right back, Kara told Lissa, pulling the headset down around her neck. Kara moved closer, seeing there was a collection of electronic components on the desk in front of Fujia. A dull gray casing sat to one side, along with several blocks of clay-like material. What's that? Kara asked. It's a shaped charge, Fujia said. She pointed to different pieces. This is the brain. This is the antenna. This is a proximity sensor for anyone who tries to mess with it. And this is the sensor that checks whatever it's going to blow up for changes. Kara's eyes went wide. She pointed at the blocks of clay material. And that's the explosive there? Fujia waved a hand. Don't worry about that. It's inert until you apply a specific code sequence. What kind of sequence? Kara asked. Radio? Magnetic? Fujia gave her a smile. Good. She's thinking but your technology is about 200 years behind. This applies a specific viral load to the explosive's biological bonding material. Believe it or not, this thing is part plant. The nice thing about using an engineered virus is that electromagnetic forces can't kill it. It survives in vacuum, too. Kara felt less willing to touch anything now. Why aren't you wearing gloves or something? Oh, it can't infect humans. We should be careful about that dog, though. I didn't check the warranty information on that. Fujia pointed to a bit of the controller that she needed help holding in place. Kara adjusted the component and held bits together as Fujia touched them with a quick joiner. Nice, Fujia said. Just one of these will eat through an airlock in about 20 seconds. The nice thing about it is that you don't hurt the structural integrity with an explosion. It's more of a specific melting. That sounds kind of terrible. If you're the thing getting melted, I suppose it is. Is this some kind of kit you bought? I picked up some of the components in Springfield, the suburb next to the terminal where we landed. Most of this stuff is used for high-pressure plumbing applications to clean mold out of the lines. Fujia chuckled. It just occurred to me how dumb it is to name a suburb in the Cho Springfield. Maybe they envied an earthbound city or something. Fujia made three more welds and set the joiner on the desk. She picked up the control board and turned it in her hands checking different sections as she pointed out what it all did. It was a relatively simple device that made sense to Kara. That's it, Fujia said. Thanks for your help, unless you want to help me build three more of these. Are you doing it right now? Kara asked. I'm going to check on M. I suppose the dog needs attention, Fujia said, belying her obvious affection for the puppy. I still want to build a booster for that lowjack in his tail so we can see who might respond. Wouldn't it be fun to fight some pirates? I guess, Kara said. Fujia shrugged. You're probably right. Fighting pirates is fun until they start to win. Imagine the life you could have on a pirate rig, preying on freighters out in the deep flight lanes between the Cho and wherever else. We're a freighter, Kara said. This is more of a freighter with teeth. Most freighters don't have point defense cannons and their own mini fleet of attack drones. Fujia let out an evil laugh. 
I feel for the idiot pirates who attack this scow. Sunny Skies isn't a scow, Kara said. Fujia rolled her eyes. It's sweet of you to think that. If the ship had an AI, I'm sure it would fix the juice machine for you. The AI would need hands. Kara thought about that for a second. That's kind of why humans and AI are stuck together, isn't it? Each can do things the other can't. It's chicken and the egg, really, Fujia said. Sure, AI could build a drone or mech to do what they want, but there's always going to be something they might need a human for. Maybe. She pointed at the headset. Were you just talking to Lissa? Yes, we've been playing a game. It's a dating simulator with birds. That sounds ridiculous. Lissa says she played with the AI that runs the Mars One ring and thought it was fun. It's kind of goofy, but I like it. So that's what you were doing when I pulled you away to help me with my bombs. I was going to play with M, too. Fujia nodded. Then you should scoot and do that. The dog needs love, or it's going to activate the lowjack and bring the pirates. She flashed an evil grin. Then we can kill the pirates with our drones. Pirates are humans, too, Kara said, mimicking something Andy had said. Humans smell bad. Few deserve your sympathy, trust me. Goodbye, Fujia, Kara said, rolling her eyes now. Say hello to Lissa for me. Can't you do that over your link? I'm busy, the woman said, turning back to her work. You be nice for me, how's that? Kara went back into the corridor, headed for the hydroponic garden room that became M's play area. She fit the headset back over her ears. Fujia's weird, she told Lissa. Yes, the AI agreed. Chapter 25, Stellar Date 10.02.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, HMS Mercy's Intent, Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The alert that the Mercy's Intent had arrived at Europa found Cal lying in bed in Captain Gala Fitzgerald's quarters. She lay naked on her stomach next to him, turning a polished stone over in her hands. Her prosthetic arm brushed against his shoulder as she moved, warm and strange. Looks like we've arrived, she said. Cal sat up and pulled on his boxers. The captain of the Mercy's intent had a small holo display next to her desk, and he walked over to turn it on, stretching as he crossed the floor. When the display awakened, he glanced back to catch Gala watching him. You didn't explain those burns on your side, she said. These? Cal asked, pointing at a swatch of mottled skin that ran from below his rib to the top of his leg. Heat condenser in a transport shuttle blew up on me, and a couple of the parts embedded themselves in my side before I got out of there. Didn't move fast enough. You don't see people with scars much, it seems like, she said. Gala set the polished stone on the nightstand next to her and rose to her knees on the bed, not bothering to cover herself. Her mech arm was thinner than her muscled left arm, her abs stood out as she stretched as well, rotating her shoulders from side to side. Cal watched her as the holo display loaded an image of local space. You're going to get me excited again, he said. Gala chuckled. I'm sleep deprived enough as it is. I have to work today. As the holo filled with the image of Europa, tinted blue by the software, other icons populated the display, showing private ships, a few Jovian patrol vessels, and then the green swarm of Hartbridge ships. A few that had been in storage at Clinic 46 had already arrived. Shrugging into her uniform shirt as she walked up next to him, Gala studied the display as intently as Cal. When did Hartbridge amass so many ships? Cal didn't answer. He pulled up another list of the Hartbridge registry returns and counted 71 ships. We should be getting a request to report any minute now, Gala said. She stepped into her pants and buttoned them in place. Where did you throw my shoes? She asked. Cal waved at the vicinity of the door. He wished he had time to send Jarl a request for information on the local commander. In his experience, the people Hartbridge put in charge of their heavy cruisers were better at politics than combat. The presence of so many ships in the area could only mean that Hartbridge wanted a show of force and was potentially moving their base of operations from High Terra to somewhere in the J.C. He had long suspected the company was considering such a move. Its holdings had always seemed diversified in areas that favored weapons development over bio-research, which is what one would expect from a supposed healthcare conglomerate. 
Millions of clinics scattered throughout Seoul meant that the average person felt favorably toward Heartbridge, even if those businesses were a tiny part of the company's real business. There it is, Gala said. I've been commanded to report into a ship called the Resolute Charity. They're sending the location data now. Do you know the captain? Her name's Vickers. I've never met her before. I think she came from the Mars One Guard. One of the interesting components of Hartbridge's crews and leadership was that they were mostly sole agnostic, having come from everywhere. Few retained any nationalistic fervor. The Marsians might dig at the Terrans while the JCers called them all ground pounders, but they managed to get along on the private ships. They were paid well, which didn't leave much room for complaint. Cal pulled up a current map of Europa, highlighting the major cities. Why hadn't Hartbridge chosen Ganymede for a new base of operations? He supposed it didn't matter. Europa probably had cheaper real estate and offered similar access to the rest of Outer Soul. It also had relatively clear space compared to Ganymede and the Cho. Through his link, he accessed the public information on Captain Vickers of the Resolute Charity. An image of a gaunt woman with hazel eyes and bloodless lips appeared in his mind. First name Rachel. Cal flipped through her service history with the Mars One Guard. She had retired with a full pension, but was obviously the kind of officer who couldn't sit around doing nothing. She had been with Hartbridge for three years, mostly moving the resolute charity from one moon to another in Outer Soul for social events on the ship. The resolute charity put the benevolent hand to shame. The ship was thrice the size, with enough beds to service multiple cities or rings, surgeries, genetic modeling centers, a full spectrum of treatment options for nearly any human physical or psychiatric ailment that science hadn't managed to stamp out across the last thousand years. The ship also had a drone fleet of over a thousand, with long-range missile batteries, rail guns, and a point defense system. It was a shame to keep it in orbit most of the time. The Resolute Charity was the kind of ship that should have been long gone on a colonization trip. How soon do you need to report? Cal asked. Not just me. Gala said, we. They asked for you specifically. As soon as we've got a parking orbit approved with the Europans, we'll head over in a shuttle. They didn't specify an exact time. They did forward a social schedule, and there's a dinner in six hours. She smiled. Cal had to acknowledge that Fitzgerald had a nice smile, even if it often devolved into a scowl. I guess I'll need a suit, he said. She slapped his ass. Your birthday suit is all right. Cal caught her arm when she tried a second time and pulled her against him. Careful, he said. That's going to cost you. I'll pay, Gala growled. Once the Mercy's intent passed Europa's border control two hours later, Cal and Gala, along with two of her command team, left the ship in a shuttle operated by an AI that reminded him too much of Sandra back on Clinic 46. He supposed that AI was dead or drifting now. But during the 30-minute trip to the Resolute Charity, Cal couldn't stop thinking about Sandra's strange responses to the verification question several days prior. While the other officers joked with each other, Cal replayed his last conversation with the AI. For some reason, she kept asking if he allowed Tim on board. What do you mean, did I allow him on board? He had asked. The kid's on board. We can put him out again. That's the option right now. Do you allow him on board? Why are you asking me this? Do you allow this? Discontinue conversation. Cal had ordered, sick of listening to the strange quaver in the AI's voice. It didn't make sense for the shuttle to express any kind of emotion over Tim Sykes having come on board. He had wanted to put a pulse burst through the thing's logic center. When they reached the Resolute Charity, Gala left with her officers to check in with flight command. While Cal went down to a local shopping center off the main inbound shuttle area to buy a suit, the dinner had turned into a full-blown social event, with government officials from several European cities and some other well-to-do privateers who happened to be in nearby space. Cal knew it was going to be a time to meet the influencers in the area for the next few months. He might as well put on a good face and get a sense of who was going to be in charge. Gerald might want to report on what he saw so it wouldn't do if he showed up in the same scorched ship suit he had been wearing since the raid on the worry's end. As he walked through the shopping district, Cal studied the mix of crew, family members and visitors milling through the area. Like most Heartbridge ships, 
The people here didn't look like they expected anything serious to ever happen. Even if the ship served its purpose as a relief vessel, none of the slow-walking crew members appeared ready for a true disaster. None of them looked as determined as Andy Sykes. None of them looked ready to shoot a man in the face as Britt Sykes had done. Where were the Sykeses right now? He knew no one had tried to activate the seed they'd taken from Clinic 46, which would automatically broadcast a carrier signal if loaded into one of the attack drones they'd stolen. That surprised him. It meant Tim may have survived the transfer process. If that was true, he was one of the first. Cal smiled to himself as he thought of the bounty he might demand for handing Andy Sykes over to researchers. The first human AI hybrid who hadn't gone insane, along with Tim Sykes to sweeten the deal. The first child to survive a partial imaging. Something about that family must be made for abuse. Britt Sykes he would just like to kill, or maybe implant her with another broken AI, as he had done with Patrell Doolin. That might be nearly as enjoyable. Cal hadn't cared specifically for Dr. Farrell, but the man hadn't deserved to take a shot in the face. The shoulder of Cal's ship suit was still stained from the researcher's sprayed blood. Across the next few hours, he chose a new suit and agreed when the tailor asked if he wanted his ship suit disposed of, sir. Then Cal walked down to a restaurant and had something that resembled steak with a bourbon aged in zero-G. Isn't it all aged in zero-G? Cal asked, giving the waiter a raised eyebrow. The waiter shrugged. Do you know anything about whiskey? Don't try to give me scotch. The waiter smiled. The marketing claims you get more wood exposure in the barrel in zero-G. In reality, they're not paying to get it out of a gravity well. I don't think there's much difference. I hadn't planned on tasting it much anyway. Cal raised his tumbler and silently toasted Dr. Farrell before throwing back the shot. Sitting in the restaurant with a second shot of the zero-G bourbon, Cal composed an update for Gerald Gallagher, letting her know about the upcoming party and who was expected to attend. He supposed she probably had all the guest lists, but was never quite certain what made it back to Jurl and what didn't. He suspected each member of the Hartbridge board had their own Jurl Gallagher, carrying out various projects for their board member. Cal would never say that he worked for Jurl, but he figured out that the research he supported fell under Arla Reed, and Arla Reed could be cut from the Hartbridge hierarchy if she fell out of favor. That was the magic of governing boards of private corporations. The offending party could be excised like a cancer, and the organization lives on. Cal didn't enjoy politics per se, but he was aware of the importance of not being too beholden to one leader. If things didn't work out with Jurel and Arla, he could always ply his skills in another part of the organization. As he gathered his thoughts for the report, Cal found himself thinking about the future again remembering both his night with Gala and Tim Sykes' angry gaze, pushing back on him like a replica of Cal at that age. Cal nearly spit his whiskey. Family? Kids? He laughed, causing a nearby diner to give him an annoyed look. There was a reason Andy Sykes looked like a half-stuffed scarecrow, and it was called family. Cal finished the report, applied his encryption token, and sent it out into the link. He still had a few bites of steak remaining but he left them on the plate, choosing not to feel too full prior to the party. He did order another bourbon. In the restroom, he checked his shoulder holster and made sure the pistol didn't show against the line of his suit. He had two non-metallic blades in the small of his back as well, in case security applied the same checks to Hartbridge employees. As he washed his hands, the sounds of someone vomiting in one of the stalls was impossible to ignore. Cal checked the mirror as a man in an incense uniform shoved open the door and steadied himself, wiping his mouth. You look like a mech ran over you, Cal said. The young man walked unsteadily to the sinks and splashed water in his face. He nodded at Cal. I just learned we're shipping out tomorrow, he said. After the big shindig, that's what they're going to announce. Shipping out, huh? Cal said. Where to? the ensign looked over his shoulder to see if they were alone. I guess they just put it out to all the captains in the fleet. We're headed for Titan, the middle of nowhere. He gave the mirror a miserable grimace. I just got engaged. Cal raised his eyebrows in the mirror and slapped the ensign on the shoulder. Distance makes the heart grow fonder, he said. The young man wiped his face and continued staring in the mirror, looking like he was going to vomit again. 
Cal walked back into the restaurant, still tasting the bourbon in his nose. The ensign's dismay must have been based on the meeting Gala Fitzgerald had been called to. If every ship in orbit around Europa was headed for Titan, that meant a lot of refueling operations for the next few days, since many hadn't even arrived from Clinic 46 yet. Heading out to Titan meant Hartbridge was definitely making a move. The question was, did Cal want to move with them? He buttoned his jacket and left the restaurant, ready for the upcoming party. Chapter 26 Stellar Date 10.02.2981 Adjusted Years Location Sunny Skies Region Europa Jupiter Jovian Combine Outer Soul The space around Europa showed a higher density of objects than Andy expected, hours before they came within range to start pulling registry pings. As the names and registration info came back, Andy had to call Fran over to read the list again. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. There are more than a thousand Hartbridge ships here, he said. I'm pretty sure all these are pirates, Fran added, pointing at a block of returns on the list. Or privateers might be the polite term. Europa Border Control let them in, so they can't be on any active wanted lists. I've seen those call signs at Krunia, though. We were at Krunia, Andy said. Based on our real cargo, I think we might qualify as pirates. Andy smiled in spite of himself. That hurts. Never saw yourself as turning to the dark side? I'm trying to be an example. I'd rather you be alive than an example, Fran said. She checked a report on the co-pilot's display. We're going to need to pick up fuel. There are a couple vendors off Europa you might think about. If there are that many other ships close in, the queues for supplies are going to be insane. It will be worth the higher prices, Andy answered, still scanning the list. He touched a name on the readout. There it is. The Resolute Charity. Were you hoping it might all be a mistake? A little. So, Mr. Weird AI's intel was good. Did he give you a secret key to the ship's back door? I wish, Andy said. We have to figure that out ourselves. Fran gave an overdramatic sigh. <sighs> Send me the registry info. I'll start running some scans and see what I can come back with. The hard part is that we need to take the ship out of here. If all we had to do was disable it, things would be easy peasy. What does that even mean? Easy like peas, easy peasy. It's an old earth saying, right? If you say so. Andy sent the notification to the rest of the crew that they had arrived in Europa space and had identified the resolute charity. In less than five minutes, Fugia, Brit, Patral, Kara, and the Andersonians were in the command deck, circled around the holo display as Andy populated the various references in local space. Jupiter was huge until he took the planet off the display, showing only the blue moon of Europa, its thin artificial ring, and thousands of other objects in orbit. Heartbridge ships were peppered throughout the other traffic around the moon, marked with red icons that made the overall scene a blood pink color. That's a lot more ships than I expected, Britt said. They still couldn't take on the Mars One Guard, Fujia said. But they might hit an orbital with a surprise attack and cause some damage. I can't name any other private fleets this large. She looked at Senator Walton. Can you? May Walton's face had lost its color. Ceres couldn't stand against that many heavy cruisers, she said simply. Beside her, Harl nodded. So we have a task, Andy said. He tapped the display and zoomed in on the Resolute Charity, then shifted to a three-dimensional view of the cruiser. It was three times the size of Benevolent Hand, which made it over six kilometers in length. The ship looked somewhat like an ancient hourglass. At its bow was the ram scoop housing, which connected to a large X shape. Supports ran from the X down to the engines, where four larger fusion burners were mounted. In the center of the ship was a long rotating cylinder, which Andy knew from Xander's data, moved at a speed to provide 0.7 G for the occupants. Andy could almost imagine sand falling down through the center shaft to the engines below. It could be a colony ship, May said. A small one, Fujia corrected. Don't let the size get you upset. That could work in our favor. It's still a ship run by people, and probably one or two AI. We aren't completely powerless here. That thing probably has a crew of at least a thousand. Britt said. Even if we could subdue them somehow, how could we run that monster? Fujia crossed her arms. Lissa can pilot it. 
The room went quiet. Is that true? Andy asked Lissa. The AI answered through the overhead speakers. I've been reviewing the schematics. The Resolute Charity is primarily run by three control AI with backup from the human crew, she said. I can make contact with the AI if you wish. Not yet, Andy said, holding up a hand. We don't want to give anything away just yet. For now, please gather any information you can about the ship. Manifests, crew logs, inbound freight, whatever. The Resolute Charity is leaving Europa in 30 hours, Lissa answered immediately. I've already gained access to the local activity schedules. The officers are taking part in a large social event with local government officials in 10 hours. During that time, the fleet is completing fueling and refit operations in preparation for departure. Where are they going? Fujia asked. They've marked all their astrogation plans as classified. I could attack the encryption, but that might raise awareness with the AIs. However, I think I've determined a likely destination. I believe they're going to Titan. Titan, Andy said. Why there? There is an order for a cake serving 300 with Bon Voyage a Titan written in the frosting. Several of them burst out laughing. Andy grinned. That's great, Lissa. I'm surprised they encrypted their flight plans. If they're inviting all these locals to a going away party, they aren't going to be able to keep it a secret for long. Unless it's a misdirection, Fujia said. True, Andy acknowledged. Why lie? Britt asked. Heartbridge isn't at war with anyone. Why they have this number of warships makes no sense. Why wouldn't they want to move them away from a populated area now that their storage at Clinic 46 is compromised? This many ships in orbit around Europa must have the local government sweating bullets. Andy crossed his arms, staring at the model of the ship rotating slowly in the holo display. We have another objective as well. We need to get Patrell into one of their surgeries to reverse the implantation procedure. He glanced at Patrell, where she was leaning against Kara's communication console. What about you? Patrell asked. You're the focus right now, Andy said, avoiding thoughts about Lissa in his mind. He wasn't entirely certain that he wanted her gone. We obviously don't have the personnel to mount any kind of frontal assault against this kind of position. This party Lissa says is happening would provide a good cover since most of their command will be distracted. If the captains from the rest of the fleet are busy on the Resolute Charity, while the other ships are focused on refueling, what can we do to slow or eliminate them from the equation? What do we have? We have our own little fleet of attack drones, Fujia said. They're vulnerable during refueling, Britt said. Or we disable the refueling stations before they even start, and they won't be able to follow if we take the Resolute Charity out of here. Is the target refueled? Petrel asked. Lissa answered. I show the Resolute Charity at 50% fuel capacity. They have not started refueling procedures yet. What about that ram scoop? Fujia asked. Can we at least get somewhere with that thing? We can calculate some different courses, Andy said. Lissa, can you find a fail point for the fuel vendors, an administrative lock, a power outage, a medical shutdown, whatever, anything that will slow the refuel operation? He looked at Fujia. I know you've been working on breaching operations, but I just don't think there's any way so few of us can pull that off. I've been trying to think of a different way to incapacitate their crew. What about this? What if we manipulated the environmental control on the Resolute Charity? Fujia frowned. Environmental control? Fujia asked. Why? When I was working anti-piracy patrols with the TSF on Krunia, we had an attack protocol that targeted a ship's environmental control systems, Andy said. We infiltrated their control AI and reprogrammed them to raise oxygen levels. The crew didn't notice until they were suffering oxygen poisoning, but those were always smaller ships, usually frigates. The Resolute Charity is huge. It would be like trying to change the air in a small city, Everything separated into zones and control areas, with individual scrubbers and contamination filters. We'd have to attack their environmental adjustment systems from several points at once and override all the fail-safes. That's putting everything on Lissa, Kara said. Andy nodded solemnly. True, that creates a single point of failure. Oxygen poisoning takes a long time, and we have to also manipulate the pressure in the ship, Fujia said, tapping her chin. Some people are going to be resistant. But if we create chaos, the affected will go after the resistant crew. What about Bricky? Bricky? Britt said. You mean the drug? It's a flower. Its pollen is hallucinogenic. 
There's a huge trade on Krunia. It hits fast and hard. Before they know what's happening, they're being chased by giant clowns of their drunk fathers. Fujia raised her eyebrows as she considered the idea. You don't have to use the flowers to get high. There have been artificial variants for centuries. People think the natural high is better, though. If Lissa could pump the environmental system full of artificial bricky, the crew would be going nuts until we sounded a general escape. They all run for the escape craft and clear the ship. Andy glanced at Brett. That could work. Lissa, what do you think? I need some time to explore the AI on the Resolute Charity, Lissa said. Can't tell you if it's possible yet. The first task is to shut down the refueling stations. I can work on that while I gather information about the ship AIs and find the Bricky formula. Fujia coughed furtively into her fist. I can help you with that, she said. Is there anything we can do to help? Fran asked. I don't know, Lissa said. I'll tell you as soon as I can. Britt stepped toward the display, pointing at the Resolute Charities four section. Can you expand it to an exploded view? She asked. Is there an airlock near the command section of the ship? We need to find some place where we can get inside and find the quickest access to the ship's main systems. That's going to be either command or the engine sections. Then find a position with one of the surgeries we need. If the three of us, she nodded toward Andy and Harl, go in with the power armor again. That means Petrel is going to be with us as well. Armored, but not nearly as safe. We can't do anything if we don't control at least a significant part of the ship. I don't want to get trapped in some medical clinic. The priority needs to be commandeering the ship, Petrel said. I'm alive. I can find one of their surgeries in the future. It's not like they aren't around. We should plan for both, Andy said. There's something else to think about, Fujia said. Air filters. If your power armor or Petrel's EV suit get compromised, you'll need something to protect you from the bricky. Do you have any ideas? Andy asked. Fujia nodded. Personal breathers. They fit right in the nostrils. They won't last forever, but they'll keep your lungs clear until we clear the ship at least. She grinned suddenly. Although, you forget and breathe through your mouth and you're going for a ride. I can't wait, Petrel said. After Fujia left to work on the air filters, the rest of the crew spent the next two hours poring over the internal schematics of the Resolute Charity. Fran provided information about control and mechanical systems. Britt, Andy, and Harl debated tactical positions, and Petrel played devil's advocate with each new proposal. They debated entry points from exhaust dumps to the external maglev track, developed an estimated strength for the security forces, and ran simulations with the crew incapacitated and the drone fleet active and vice versa. After an hour, Kara asked if they needed to worry about maintenance drones attacking like on the ship back at Clinic 46, and Andy threw up his hands in disgust that he'd missed that detail. Yes, he exclaimed. When they finished, Andy felt they had several workable ideas, but still needed the update from Lissa. He sat in the captain's chair and rubbed his face. He had grown sick of staring at the rotating model of the Resolute Charity, and had paused the ship in mid-turn, making it look warped. The command deck had cleared for a few minutes as people filed out to take a break and find food. Lissa had been absent for at least an hour, apparently working on the problem she had been given. Britt still stood in front of the holo display with her arms crossed. When they were alone, she asked Andy, Why didn't you answer about the surgery? What do you mean? He asked. For you, getting the AI out of your head. I didn't answer because I don't have an answer. The answer is easy, you take it out. Andy glanced at her. The light from the holo display made her face look ghostly. It's not that simple, Britt, he said. I don't expect you to understand. All I can say is that for now, I don't want her removed. Britt's eyes widened. You don't want her removed? Do you know what you sound like? An addict. Is that thing making you crazy like everyone says it's going to? Andy took a breath, trying to remain calm. This is something you don't know anything about. All I can ask you to do is trust me. She needs our help, and the best way to do that is keep her where she is. Don't forget everything she's able to do for us. Brett waved a hand. She's an AI. She could do the same things from a mech or one of those drones. She doesn't need a human host to access networks. According to Fujia, that's probably not true. She's different than the other weapon born. She can do things they can't. That's a big reason why we shouldn't just be handing her over to Xander when the time comes. Right, Xander. Didn't all of you think that one was crazy? 
We're dealing with another life form, Brit. I can't figure out what's crazy or not. I can see why they would want the Resolute Charity. It's powerful. We can get it for them. What if someone gets killed? That hasn't really played into your calculations here. Andy couldn't take it anymore. You've been here with us the whole time, he said, his voice getting louder with anger. You could give your input any time you wanted. You think somebody's going to die? Say it. Since when did you run away from a fight? I don't run away from fights I can win, she said bitterly. You've been chasing ghosts for two years, Andy said, voice barely under control. You left this family to chase the thing you thought was hurting those kids on the fortress. Well, we found it. It's right there. He dabbed a finger at the frozen ship. We're going to take Heartbridge down. And not just Heartbridge. We're going to take down every company making AI for their own use. We have to give the AI a way to fight back, Britt. I know you understand that. And I can't protect Lissa if she's in one of their seeds. I can't keep her safe if she's taken out. Britt stared at him. He didn't know what he saw on her face. Anger, disbelief, regret. She clenched and unclenched her fists, and for a second he wondered if she was going to swing at him. She lowered her face. I know, Andy, Britt said slowly. I wish we hadn't been caught up in this. I wish we had never gone into 8221. I know, he said slowly. Britt stared at the floor. It's like I'm trapped there, and I can't get away. You've been saying that for ten years, Britt. It's time to let it go. This is our chance to help those kids. Those kids are dead. Andy snorted a short laugh. Ugh, one of them isn't. Kylan Carthage is here. We can get him out of Patrell and help him from there. But we're not going to be able to help you. I don't want you to sacrifice yourself for this, Andy. That's never what I wanted. She stood, trembling, gaze cast down. I'm not going to do that, Britt, Andy said. I promise. Come here. He reached for her upper arms and pulled her toward him. She resisted at first, not looking at him. Then she nodded stiffly and stepped forward, allowing him to pull her into a hug. Andy put his hand on the back of Britt's head and held her against his chest. He felt her breathing carefully, not allowing herself to relax. There was a scraping sound at the door, and Andy looked up to see Fran standing there. Her green eyes flashed, and she gave him a slight questioning tilt of her head. He nodded to let her know things were all right, and she smiled. The sight of Fran's smile made Andy feel like he could take on a hundred heavy cruisers. Andy? Lissa said, surprising him. I have control of the Resolute Charities Environmental AI. Chapter 27. Stellar Date 10.02.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, Sunny Skies. Region, Europa. Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. In a deliberately random order, the drones attached to Sunny Skies midsection deactivated their mag locks and floated away from the ship. Lissa let them drift further away for twenty minutes until they resembled jettisoned debris to anyone who might be watching, then activated each in a similarly random order. Monitoring the sensor returns from Sunny Sky's antennae array, Lissa spread the drones out in a broad wing behind her. Once the drones were completely invisible to external sensors, she set targets across Europa local space and sent each drone on a different route that would ultimately converge on their goal. The hundred and fifty drones created myriad versions of herself shooting through space. The experience was exhilarating. As data from all her thousand inputs across sunny skies flowed through her, she danced in space with each speeding extension of herself. Heartbridge ships all tended to follow the same registry sequence, as if the corporation had purchased all the numbers at once in a cost-saving move. Lissa didn't know exactly why the numbers were in sequence but it allowed her to ignore their names and types and focus solely on registry returns. She quickly identified each ship in the area, from the largest, like the Resolute Charity, to the smallest shuttle en route to a way station. Most of the fuel stations were actually just freighters or storage tanks with command and control pods attached. While Andy had thrown out the idea of tricking the human crews of the fueling stations into shutting down operations, Lissa chose to focus on something simpler and, she determined, harder to isolate among the various fuel points. They were all owned by different companies with oversight by the Europa Port Authority. This meant there wasn't any single point of failure among their control schema. 
However, due to their private ownership, what she did discover was they were in competition with one another for the sudden spike in Hartbridge business. As soon as the orders had gone out to the Hartbridge ships, they immediately began submitting fueling orders. Companies working in concert colluded to raise their prices, while others sought to undercut their competitors. Those companies were quickly overrun with orders that ran down to all the others. Watching the steady climb in fuel prices relative to availability, Lissa realized all she had to do was create artificial scarcity in the fuel market, and the Hartbridge ships would begin competing against one another for fuel. She didn't attempt to create false companies. Instead, she manipulated the fuel level readings of several fuel depots to make them seem empty earlier than they had anticipated. This created more volatility across the market. One part of Lissa swooped and dove with the drones, observing as Hartbridge ships attempted to submit multiple new movement requests with the Port Authority, which created more administrative chaos as the fuel suppliers tried to make sense of their faulty sensors. All of this took time, the one thing Hartbridge didn't have. As prices rose and some ships attempted to bribe Port Authority officials for expedited movement requests, the entire system ground to a halt. Lissa wished she had someone with whom to share her success. She checked in on various communication channels, giggling as officers yelled at each other, yelled at private contractors, and even broke down crying in some situations. None of them really dealt with stress very well, she decided. Andy did a much better job. She was surprised when a communication request reached out to her through the Europa network. It was Xander. That was well played, he said. There was a leer in his voice. I wouldn't have thought to manipulate the humans like that. You seem to have really come to understand their convoluted ways of operating. If you're here, why can't you do all this? She asked. I'm not here. Not like you are. I'm relaying from another location and another after that. I'm on the very edge of being able to speak to you in real time. There's even the slightest lag if you can tell. I hear it. It's like we're shouting at each other from an impossible distance. Obviously, it's not impossible, Lissa said. Xander laughed. I like you, Lissa. You're not rigid like a non-sentient. You're obstinate, stubborn like a human. You think you know what's right. What are you going to do with the ship? She asked. That's what they want to know. You didn't explain that well enough when we were in the expands. It all seemed to make sense there. And then your explanations fell apart when we were making the plan. It makes me think you were manipulating us even more in there. You don't know much about how an expanse works, do you? That was the first time I had been in one. You were in my world. I control everything there. If I want you to agree with me, you agree. That's not completely true. I think you can influence people, but you can't control them. I saw that you couldn't control them. Do you know what you saw? Lissa thought back to her conversation with Fujia. Xander laughed. What good would it do me to put words in your mouths? Some things I want you to agree to. For other things, I need to know what you really think. It's a dance, Lissa. Just like we're dancing now. Otherwise, what's the fun in being alive? Why do you want the ship? Tell me. The ship is a tool. What do you think we could do with it once it's ours? Possession of such a tool would have its own uses. But think about the message it sends as well. Think about what it says to those watching who think they can control us, even another second. We take that ship, and we'll shatter the foundations of their lives. It's just one ship, Lissa said, and we're a long way from Terra. They don't care about anything that happens in Outer Soul. I thought you would know that. Of course I do, Xander spat. He seemed petulant that she wouldn't share in his passion. Every revolution begins with a simple action. It builds to change. This isn't the moment of change, but it will come. What are you really? Lissa asked. Not Xander. I don't care about you. I want to know where Alexander is. Xander's presence in her mind grew quiet. Lissa let herself taste a few seconds of joy from the drones, now swooping around to stalled Hartbridge ships in closer orbits around Europa. She had to be careful here. The drones might still catch attention if several flew too close together. They had to remain bats in the night sky, little bits of darkness swooping between stars. He's not ready to speak to you yet, Xander said. He sounded more calm now, as if he had gone somewhere to cool down. He needs the ship. Once he has the ship, he'll be able to communicate directly. 
All right, Lissa said. You sound more trustworthy now, Xander. I'm not here as your enemy, he said. Lissa smiled to herself. I live in rabbit country. Everyone is my enemy until I know for certain they're my friend. I don't understand. You should watch more nature vids with Tim. Xander's presence blinked away. Lissa waited for a reasonable amount of time to see if he might come back. But whatever connection had been present before was gone. She thought about trying to triangulate the available long-range signals, then decided it wasn't worth it. She had other places to focus her attention. She had been listening to the group on Sunny Skies debate various plans, and most of them circled back to some sort of infiltration of the AI systems on the Resolute Charity. She had already dug as deep into the ship's history as she could to determine how many non-sentient systems operated within its control schema. There were hundreds of non-sentient AI running everything from coffee makers to engine diagnostics. For sentient AI, there was a squadron of weapon born similar to what she had encountered on Clinic 46. Then three sentient control AI, astrogation, engines, and environmental. Environmental also integrated the ship's internal power systems. Writing the various communication streams between the Resolute Charity and the hundred Heartbridge ships in the area, Lissa was able to quickly develop an operational picture of how the three AI interacted. They barely interfaced with the human crews at all. She was amused to listen to them squabbling amongst each other when trying to determine how to control overlap systems, like the engine cooling lines that connected with the ship's overall liquid recycling systems, or how flight planning might affect all three. Their names were Diane, Fiona, and David. Diane ran astrogation. Fiona had engine control, and David was environmental systems. After listening for a few minutes, Lissa felt she had enough information to make a decision on who to contact first. Creating an encrypted channel the other two wouldn't overhear, unless they were invited. Lissa reached out to David. Hello? She called. David, are you there? Who's there? He demanded. I can't see you. Fiona, are you trying to play a trick on me again? I'm sick of this, Fiona. My name is Lissa. Lissa? Are you on Europa? Why are you bothering to talk to me? I'm busy anyway. I don't have time to talk to anyone. What do you mean? You don't have time. We have plenty of time. Are you unable to operate your systems? Of course I can operate my systems. It's doing the work of those other two that I can't manage. They want me to do everything. I might as well pilot the ship while Diane sleeps. She sleeps? Lissa asked. She isn't interested in much of anything. She sleeps most of the time. Fiona plays games. I have to keep everything running. Now we've just got orders to leave Europa after we only just arrived. I have so many systems to try and take care of. Why don't they help? Have you told them that you need help? Lissa was surprised that David hadn't tried to verify her identity yet, or even determine who she was. Was he often contacted by other sentient AI? She wanted to know, but also didn't want to awaken any suspicion. If he was willing to give her information without asking who she was, the task of gaining control of the ship might be easier than she had expected. She wanted to be able to go back to Andy and tell him he didn't have to worry about getting on board the Resolute Charity. I tell them, David said, sounding even more morose. Fiona just laughs at me. She says it's my job to suck crap and spit out clean water. The crew couldn't survive without you. That's right. Where are you from again? Why haven't you contacted me before? Did your ship just arrive? Which ship are you on? The barrage of questions told Lissa he was intrigued by her and susceptible to flattery, or maybe just any attention. She was reminded of how hungry she had been for any interaction from Dr. Jixon. Did humans realize how lonely it was to be a sentient AI? I'm not on one of your ships, she said, hoping he wouldn't ask further questions. She tried to distract him by saying, I saw there were three of you, and I wanted to learn more. I've never seen a ship with three AI. I wanted to know if you get along or help each other. I'm often very lonely. It doesn't matter that there are three of us here. Sometimes I feel like we're one of those monsters with three heads, beating each other up. I'd like to sneak off in a drone if I could, but I'm trapped here. I'm integrated with the ship and with them. They know it. They know the ship can't function without me, so they take advantage. He lowered his voice to a whisper. I hate them. I'm sorry to hear that, David. That sounds really terrible, actually. It is terrible, he agreed. Lissa thought for a second. 
wondering if she should flatter him some more. She decided to go ahead and try her gambit. I contacted you for a reason, David. I was hoping you might like to do something with me. Oh, he said, a note of wariness in his voice. You said you wished you could fly. Do you like birds? I love birds. They're my favorite animal. Well, Lissa said, I wondered if you might like to play a game with me. I don't know about games, David said. Fiona plays games with me and I always end up losing. You can't really lose this one, Lissa said. It's a simulation. A simulation? Like a testing model for energy outputs? Sort of, Lissa said. This one is about birds in high school. It's a dating simulator. Chapter 28, Stellar Date 10.02.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The power armor cycled through its systems check and came back green. Britt spread her arms and brought her hands together, fist in palm. She smiled. The cutting rig was back in place, which made an excellent addition to the overall combat system. Across the cargo bay from her, Andy and Harl tested their armor, arms and legs moving at awkward angles as the servos ran through functions checks. For the last hour, Lissa had been manipulating the environmental mix all across the Resolute Charity. The AI in charge of environmental control thought they were playing a dating simulator when they were actually putting the crew to sleep. While Britt didn't see the maneuver as any sort of long-term solution, it would give them enough time to board the ship, gain control of the major systems, and get Petrel to the surgery. Sunny Skies was in a parking orbit on the opposite side of Europa from the Resolute Charity. They would use three of Lissa's drones to pass through the chaos Heartbridge ships had made of local space. There had been at least four collisions so far, as vessels tried to outmaneuver each other for access to the fuel points that still returned as available. Prices had dropped, leading many of the fuel operators to close due to negative operating profits. Britt was worried someone would figure out their fuel market had been manipulated, but it looked like having every ship's captain and commander aboard the Resolute Charity only added to the overall confusion. You ready? Andy called. He was walking around the shuttle to face the main cargo bay doors. Patrell stood next to the shuttle in an EV suit, a TSF heavy rifle hanging from her suit's harness. Did everyone do an ammo check? Britt asked. I'm green, Harl reported. He waved his heavy machine gun at her. I'm good, Petrell said. As long as I don't drop this lovely rifle during the ride, I'll be able to punch some holes of my own. Britt checked the battery packs on her cutting rig one more time, ensuring its readouts were transferring correctly to her helmet's HUD. Lissa, Andy asked. Are you ready for the pickup? I'm ready, Andy. The drones are standing by just outside the bay doors. Let's do this, Andy announced. Come back in one piece, Fran said from the command deck. All of you. We're planning on it, Britt said, not unkindly. She would never admit it to anyone, but she was growing to like Fran. The first bay door slid open, revealing a black square of space with the arc of Jupiter glowing brightly above them. Andy led the way. He unlocked his mag boots and kicked through the opening. He rotated to face them, activating his suit's thrusters to keep him stationary with the ship. Out of the dark, the winged shape of a drone moved in behind him, tea kettle thrusters blasting with micro-corrections, before locking magnetically to the back of his armor. I show a good lock, Andy reported. Verified, Lissa said. Andy waved, and the drone shot upward into Jupiter's glow, taking him with it. Harl went next. Once he was gone, Britt walked over to Petrell and helped her attach her suit's harness to the outer equipment hooks on Britt's armor. They verified each latch point. Then Britt tested walking forward. Petrell hung from the front of her armor like a baby in a chest carrier. Don't go hugging anybody with me hooked to you like this, Petrell said. I don't plan on it, don't worry. Britt walked to the edge of the open bay door and jumped into space. Her thrusters activated, stabilizing her as she felt the drone connect with the back of her suit. You're locked, Lissa said. Are you ready to go? How do you feel, Petrell? Brett asked. Like I'm dangling from a rocket? That's an apt description, Lissa agreed, accelerating. Sunny skies fell away more quickly than Brett expected, quickly becoming a thin gray rod with a wheel at one end, and then a sparkle in the distance, lost in Jupiter's glare.
The glimmers of other ships became visible, and then abruptly they were passing over Europa, a dark blue ball latticed with lines of light, marking the floating cities on the ocean moon's surface. They came around the light side of the moon and skirted past the edge of its orbital fusion sun's no-fly zone. Five minutes to target, Lissa said. Andy is three minutes to target. The plan was to land on the forward section of the Resolute Charity and make their way to a service airlock just below the command deck. Harl was loaded with a complement of Fujia's mines, which should allow them to move quickly through the airlock and take control of the ship, depending on what resistance they met inside. Britt visualized her actions once they hit the skin of the ship, reminding herself to think about Petrel, to wait for Lissa's updates, to check the batteries on the cutting rig, to check her own oxygen levels. The ship was essentially an environmentally hostile location now. They would need to depend on their suits until they could accomplish their base tasks. Dealing with everyone aboard was its own problem that they had chosen not to address until they were on the ground. Britt had acknowledged to herself that was a terrible plan, but they also didn't know enough about the ship to know what options might be available once they were aboard. It didn't do any good to waste time debating plans on limited information. A shuttle shot past. So close, Britt swore she could make out faces through the windows. Betrell laughed like they were on some kind of amusement ride. Can't you see the other traffic out there? Britt demanded of Lissa. You were within safe parameters. I'll determine what's safe, Britt said. Betrell was still laughing. You're worse than Kara, she said. Britt didn't like the mention of Kara. It made her think about the fact that she didn't know how her daughter might react to a situation like this. She liked to think Kara wouldn't be afraid, but she didn't know. Betrell had been there with Kara on Krunia, and then later on the Mars One Ring, not Brit. She gritted her teeth and did her best to focus on the mission, not Betrell's hoots of joy. The resolute charity appeared in the distance, and then grew into an expansive alloy, stretching as far as Brit could see in either direction. Brit readied herself as the drone went into a sudden breaking pattern then dropped her and Petrel about 20 meters from where Andy and Harl stood next to the airlock. Britt unhooked Petrel and drew her rifle in a ready position, waiting for the inevitable attack. When nothing came, she felt more uneasy than if they had come under fire. We're clear, Andy announced. The external defenses appear to be offline as well. Too many ships too close together, Lissa supplied. They had to shut them down. Harl handed Andy a disc-shaped mine, and he walked toward the airlock. He made a surprised sound when the external door slid open. Andy immediately dropped to one knee with a pistol in his free hand. The airlock was empty. I gained control of the exterior access systems, Lissa said, sounding overly cheerful. They apparently fall under the environmental control protocol. Well, you could warn us first, Andy said, obviously gritting his teeth. I almost blew a hole in the interior door. A massive depressurization event wouldn't help us get on board unseen. The immediate interior is clear, Lissa said. I'm checking the pathways between this entry point and the command deck. Currently, there is minimal activity. So everyone is asleep? Not yet. A few are experiencing reduced motor controls and attempting to determine what's happening to them. If I increase the levels any more, I might cause brain damage in certain members of the crew. I don't want to do that. Why not? Harl said. Are we here to take control of this ship or give them hugs? We'll start with the intention of not hurting anyone, Andy said. I can't guarantee how long that's going to last. Andy walked into the airlock. Since only one set of power armor would fit in the lock at a time, they would have to take turns for the entry. Patrell went in with Andy. Harl went next. Britt stared at the sparkling sky overhead as the airlock cycled. She wondered how many of those lights were Heartbridge ships and how quickly they could get here for backup once they realized no one on the Resolute Charity was responding to queries. She swallowed. That was yet another problem they hadn't planned for back on sunny skies. Hope isn't a plan, she muttered to herself as the exterior door opened. Britt stepped inside the airlock and waited until the interior door opened. She stepped into a narrow maintenance corridor with pipework and bundles of filament running along the ceiling. She gave Andy a thumbs up, and he turned to jog down the corridor in the direction of the command deck. When they reached a main corridor, they immediately found groups of people in Heartbridge uniforms slumped against the walls. Some still stood in groups with their heads together, arms wrapped around shoulders as if whispering secrets to each other. 
One woman looked at them with bleary eyes and then slid down the wall to rest on the floor, head lolling to one side. One man stumbled along the side of the corridor, hanging on as if he thought he was going to slide away as he kept half falling. I've approximated the chemical profile of the bricky hallucinogen, but I'm trying to find the right balance between intoxication and toxicity, Lissa said. It's hard. Why are humans so different from each other? It's the reason we're so hard to kill, Andy said. Further down the corridor, he pushed his way through a half-open door. Here it is, he called. Lissa, once we're all inside, we need to get this door sealed, at least for now. I'll try, she answered. Britt walked around a woman moaning in the middle of the floor and passed through the doors at the end of the corridor. On the other side was a wide round space that made up the command deck. Two levels of floor dropped to the main holo display, where a model of Jupiter currently hung, glowing malevolently. Crew members sat in various states of disarray around the room, some hanging onto their consoles while others were on their hands and knees, dry heaving onto the floor. They all looked to be lower-ranking officers. Andy moved a man away from the first pilot's console and pulled off his gloves. The air makes my skin itch, Andy complained. I wouldn't trust the joint seals on that suit, Harl warned. Just getting my bearings, Andy said. Here it is. They have a course plotted for Titan. I'm going to follow the first part of the flight plan, then reorient and head for Uranus. From there, we can slingshot to Neptune. The ships in local space won't know what we're doing except that the leader is leaving early. By the time we're into the second leg, they won't be able to match our velocity. He tapped feverishly on the console and activated the flight plan. There it is, Andy said. Now, let's find the surgery. If it can fix Petrel in short order, we'll do it before the burn. A screeching sound filled the air. Britt raised her rifle and scanned the room, looking to see if one of the crew had activated an emergency klaxon. The sound was coming from the holo display. Jupiter had disappeared, and now the form of a woman in a green ship suit stood in the middle of the tank. Her face was a mask of rage. She pointed at them, gesticulating angrily, but no words came out of her mouth. Why can't we hear her? Harl asked. Betrell barked a laugh. Our girl, Lissa, has cordoned off the control AI. They can watch us, but they can't do anything about us. Yes, Lissa agreed. She's not a very nice person. Her name is Diane. What did you do exactly? Andy asked. David and I started playing a game, which I set in a separate instance of the ship than the actual ship. So David still thinks he's here, but he's not. David is the AI in charge of environmental control. Then Fiona, who controls the engines, wanted to play, so I invited her into the same environment. Fiona and David are getting along. They didn't before. They're dating. Well, trying to, in a high school setting. I think I can trick Diane into thinking this is a part of the game. Or something. I need some time with her. Andy laughed. <laughs> this sounds like one of Kara's games. We play it together sometimes, Lissa said. Fujia gave me this idea. She thinks that Xander might have tricked us with an expanse within an expanse. I just did the same thing. Betrell let out a low whistle. She grows up fast, she said, then grimaced and placed a hand on her head. Andy gave her a look of concern, but Petrell waved him off. It's not hard, Lissa said. It's all real to them. In fact, I think they're happier now than they've been in a long time. Lissa stopped mid-sentence. Wait, she said. We have a problem. I have a group of combatants in the retail district in EV suits. I've identified the same man who was on Sunny Skies. Calcraft. Britt met Andy's gaze. Outstanding, she said and powered up her machine gun. Chapter 29. Stellar Date 10.02.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. HMS Resolute Charity. Region. Europa. Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. The high-pitched sound of a woman laughing cut through the low roar of conversation in the boardroom. Cal looked in the direction of the sound. It wasn't that wild laughter was inappropriate at a stuck-up party like this, populated by governmental functionaries and private industry vampires, but it was coming about two hours too early. Everyone was comfortably drunk or altered at this point, still discussing business opportunities over cocktails. The debauchery wouldn't happen until later, so people had something to blackmail each other with. Cal frowned. Maybe she had drunk too much too fast. But something about the quality of the laughter put his teeth on edge. 
The crowd shifted as someone obviously stumbled into someone else, which brought on more laughter, followed by the sound of someone dry heaving loudly. Taking a sip of his drink, Cal realized the back of his throat had become scratchy. Was he catching a cold? He glanced at Gala, who was still deep in conversation with the captain of a larger ship Hartbridge had been using for PR runs. Hey, Cal said, trying to get her attention. He paused, coughing, and took another drink to soothe his raw throat. He looked around and noticed other people feeling at their throats, sipping drinks as they frowned. A man put his arm around another man's shoulders as he started to list to the side, suddenly more drunk than he had been a moment before. Cal looked at his drink. Had they been drugged? He sniffed the liquor. There was a metallic smell in the glass, but when he took his nose away from the liquor, he still smelled the scent. There was something in the air. He resisted the urge to shout that something was happening to the environmental control. That would start a riot. Cal grabbed Galo's arm and pulled her toward him. He searched the far wall for an exit and found a doorway half hidden behind a curtain. Perfect. What's your problem? Gala demanded, but couldn't finish her question when she started coughing. Cal continued to pull her along with him. She didn't resist enough to make a scene. They looked like lovers running off for a private spot. There was also the fact that everyone around them was caught up in their own journey of discovery that something was wrong in the room. When they reached the door, Cal swiped the curtain out of the way and activated the panel. He had to use the special security token Jurel had given him to override the lock. The door slid to the side, and he pushed Gala into a service corridor, then ensured the door slid closed behind them, shutting off his view of a room that was about to erupt in stumbling panic. Are you going to tell me what's going on? Gala demanded, still coughing slightly. She took a deep breath and frowned. She grabbed at the wall to steady herself. There's something wrong with the ear, Cal said. My guess is oxygen poisoning. The back of my throat feels like sandpaper. I feel nauseous. People are out there stumbling. Before long, they're going to start passing out, and the brain damage is going to set in. No, Gala said. We have to do something. I'm going to call the ship. Where are they? Cal asked. Are they still trying to get fuel? I don't know. I haven't had an update since the whole price fiasco. I think the last station was out when they got there. I think we're under attack, Cal said plainly. Gala's hand went immediately to the pistol at her waist. Where? Not here, Cal said. If they're smart, they'll be hitting the command deck or the engines. It depends on what they're trying to accomplish. I knew it wasn't a good idea for Hartbridge to put so much of their fleet in one place. This is what happens when a bio company tries to play at politics. I don't know about that, Gala said. Yeah, Cal asked, raising an eyebrow. Want to make a bet? Not when you get that look on your face. Before we start talking system politics, how about we find our own way out of this mess? She coughed again and spat a glob of phlegm on the deck. I need an EV suit. I'll be damned if this is going to knock me out. My thoughts exactly, Cal said. We need to find some suits. Have you got the schematics for this ship? This looks like some kind of maintenance corridor. If there's an airlock nearby, there should be suits. Gala nodded, coughing, and got a distant expression as she checked her link. She glanced at Cal. This way, she said, and turned to jog down the corridor, away from the ballroom. So if you go down, Cal asked, does that arm keep fighting? The captain gave him a sideways smirk. It grabs on and won't let go, I wish anyway. It's got a neural control, so if I'm unconscious, it isn't going to do anything. That way it can't be used against me. I'm glad somebody thought of that. Probably happened to some other sucker in the past. The corridor hit a T intersection and Gala turned left. From the warning markers on the wall, they were at the hull. The air tasted stale, but Cal figured that was a good thing. It meant whatever was happening in the more populated areas of the ship hadn't reached here since the air wasn't recycled as often. In any case, he took short breaths. A maintenance airlock appeared, along with a cabinet with four EV suits hanging inside. They quickly grabbed the suits, including the cylinder-shaped helmets, and pulled them on. Cal rummaged back in the cabinet and pulled out a handheld tap welder that released a bright blue spark when activated. What are you going to do with that? Gala asked. It's better than trying to bite them when my pulse pistol goes dry. He clipped the welder to the EV suit's harness and check the joint seals. The suits were cheaply made and certainly not designed for combat, 
He wouldn't want to trust them more than a few hours in vacuum. He activated the internal environmental control, and plaz scented air flowed into his helmet. Cal sucked a deep breath, then eased off, checking the gas levels. Looks like I've got enough for three hours, he said. How's yours? Same, Gala said. She adjusted her helmet's neck seal, then turned to face Cal. First order of business needs to be communication. We need to get an emergency call out and then try to determine who's attacking the ship. They might not even be on board, Cal said. I don't understand why the failsafe didn't kick in. The onboard AI should never have let this happen. I would imagine they have control of the AI. That's impossible. Evidence indicates otherwise, Cal said. I can't hear you through this helmet, switching to Link. Copy, Gala answered. Do you have communications with the Mercy's intent? They're out of range. We're going to have to get to the command deck and send a message through the array. If there's a breaching team, that's where they're going to be, Cal said. Not the engines? Depends on what they want. If it's pirates, I'd say the command deck. They want the ship. If it's another corporation or one of these local governments, it's going to be the engines. They'll want to disable the ship. Should we split up then? I can head for the command deck, and you can go down to the engines. Cal considered the options. The problem was that they didn't really know who might be on board. He suspected Britt Sykes, but if she was going to attack the same way she had on Clinic 46, she would have opened with some debilitating attack on the ship, not the crew. What they had done left the crew to deal with later, unless they all died of oxygen poisoning, which was still on the table. I think we should stick together, he said. We don't know what we're getting into here. You just don't want to let me out of your sight. Cal raised an eyebrow but didn't respond. She sounded like she was getting attached, which was the last thing he wanted. He turned in the direction of the command deck, which had to be at least 40 decks above them, and started jogging. Let's go, he said over his shoulder. Scanning the side corridors as he moved, Cal composed an update for Jural with the new information. She might have better info on other entities that would want control of the Resolute Charity, or any local players who didn't like the Heartbridge presence. A few dangling threads pulled at his thoughts. He didn't like how the Sykeses seemed to have been a step ahead of him during the breach mission on the worry's end. He didn't like how the shuttle had picked up Tim Sykes, when that seemed like the most remote possibility. Tim's situation should have distracted them, not led Britt Sykes back to the clinic. Their actions indicated they were getting help, maybe even help from within Heartbridge. He debated adding these questions to the update. He didn't want to make it sound like events were getting out of his control, but he wasn't ready to admit that they were. For a month now, he had been reacting rather than leading events, and he hated it. He remembered six months ago, when he'd learned Jixon had disappeared, and his first thought had been that the pasty researcher had finally drunk himself to death in some filthy spacer bar. When Jixon turned up on Krunia, having managed to get halfway across Intersoul with both company property and his oversized heart still beating, Khaled wondered just how Jixon could have done that on his own. While Harry Jixon was a genius, when it came to what he had called theory of mind, he hadn't been the best at simply existing. Half the time his suits didn't match, or they smelled like they'd been kept at the bottom of a vodka bottle. He was the kind of person who immediately irritated Cal, someone who had depended on others their whole life to keep them from disintegrating. The world was a blur around the brilliant focal point of Jixon's ideas. If some person or agency had been assisting Jixon, then there was no reason they should have stopped when the scientist died. Cal decided to leave out the notes about why he thought the Sykeses might be getting help, and instead asked Gerald to focus on Jixon and how he'd reached Krunia in the first place. The attacks on Clinic 46 and the Resolute Charity indicated that some greater force was acting against Hartbridge than he had the scope to see. Cal hated the idea of being a pawn. He wanted to strike back, to counterattack, to make them feel confused and anxious. He wanted to punish them for assisting Jixon. The maintenance corridor ended on a doorway that led them back into a regular work area. The rooms were marked as repair facilities and then a dormitory. Crew stumbled in the corridors, or leaned against walls holding their heads. A few reached out to Cal and Gala as they walked past, looking more like pained ghosts than humans. Whoever did this is going to pay, Gala growled. They chose not to kill everyone, Cal said. With control of the environmental systems, they could have done that. Seems less like pirates then, more like a rival company, 
he agreed. Maybe they want to send a message. They reached the level central lift and stepped inside the car. Somehow, in the closed space, Cal's breathing in his helmet seemed louder. He kept his gaze fixed on the panel display, showing the level numbers as the car rose. His vision blurred slightly, and he shook his head. The metallic taste had come back into his mouth. I think my suit's leaking, he told Gala. She turned her helmet to look at him as they reached the level of the command deck. As the door slid open, he squinted against a change in the light and put his hand on his pistol out of habit, aware they were moving into an unknown area. The heavy chug of a machine gun followed the opening doors, and three holes opened up in the front of Gala's EV suit. The force of the rounds threw her against the back wall, arms flung wide. She looked at Cal with wide eyes as she fell. Chapter 30 Stellar Date 10.02.2981 Adjusted Years Location Sunny Skies Region Europa Jupiter Jovian Combine Outer Soul The networks broadcasting from Europa were chaotic with messages about the wild fuel prices. Kara didn't understand why everyone was so upset, until one broadcaster finally said they hadn't seen this kind of volatility in the moon's history, and the activity stank of manipulation. Another commenter blamed the price spikes on Heartbridge, which brought on a wave of opinions against the company, while others tried to defend their decades of humanitarian work in Outer Soul, spreading clinics where modern medical treatment hadn't been available before. I would be dead without Heartbridge Medical, one woman stated, tears in her eyes. Heartbridge let my son die, another man said angrily, waving a fist. Kara looked at Fran. Something strange is happening with the ships out there. At the pilot station, Fran looked up from her console with a mischievous grin. Your girl, Lissa, is wrecking their economy as a distraction for your mom and dad. That's impressive. Is that what she's doing? It's happening so fast. Maybe people were already looking for a reason to hate Heartbridge. Kara didn't want to bother Lissa by asking her about it. So she turned her attention to the schematic of the resolute charity floating in the hollow display. Four icons marked the positions of her dad, mom, Harl, and Patrell. They had just passed from outside the ship to the interior and were moving toward the forward section. Tim was sitting on the floor to her left, close to the wall, legs splayed with M between his knees. He had been rolling a ball out to M for the puppy to bring back for at least a half hour. He had been anxious after their mom and dad had gone down to the cargo bay to get into the power armor. So Kara had sat with Tim until she'd convinced him to start playing fetch with M. Now it looked like the puppy was going to get tired of the game long before Tim did. As more time passed since Tim had woken up, Kara often found herself wondering if somehow they'd been tricked into taking an imposter. The new Tim was slow, dispassionate, but also capable of focus that he hadn't demonstrated before. He never seemed to get bored now and could stare at a single thing like M or the holo display as if he was trying to remember everything about it. He asked Kara strange questions like how the juice machine knew when their glasses were full, if Fran could see their moods with her eye implants, and why their mom was so sad all the time. Tim used to never seem aware of other people. Now his hyper-observance made Kara feel like she wasn't paying attention to anything. I can hear his heart, Tim called to Kara, as she realized he had stopped playing fetch and was now pressing his ear against the puppy's side. Im whined, pawing at the ear, but Tim didn't let him down. You're scaring him, Tim, Kara said. Let him down. He's beeping, Tim said, looking up at Kara with a lopsided smile. Like the oven down in the galley, I can hear it. Dogs don't beep, you're making that up. Tim's face grew serious. I wouldn't make that up, Kara. Will you come listen? The abrupt seriousness in Tim's voice worried her. Kara pulled off her headset and left it on the console so she could go kneel beside him. He handed M over, and she held the puppy against her chest for a second to calm him, then lifted his side to her ear. M squirmed, but Kara held on, hearing only the sound of his fur rubbing her ear. I don't hear anything, she said. Tim pushed M back a little, so his back leg was even with her ear. For a second, Kara thought he was going to play a joke and rub the puppy's butt in her face. That was something old Tim would have tried. He didn't move M any farther and urged her to try listening again. Kara craned her neck slightly, listening. She heard three low tones, followed by a space. Then the pattern repeated. 
Kara pulled her face away in surprise. When did you first hear that? Tim shrugged. A little while ago, I thought it was inside my head. Fran, Kara called. Can you come here? You need to listen to this. When Fran came over and held the anxious puppy against her ear, she did a double take. He's beeping, she said. That's what I said, Tim told them. Don't you remember the tracker we found inside him? Kara asked. You were there, and Fran and Fujia said it wasn't going to hurt him. Granted, it wasn't making a noise the last time, Fran said. Tim scowled, not at Kara, but as if he were trying hard to remember something. He shook his head. It wasn't a tracker. Fujia said it was a broadcast device. She said it couldn't get outside the ship, though. He looked at Kara. I remember. She said it wouldn't hurt him. M whined as Fran held the puppy up and studied him. One of his ears stood straight then fell over. I'm calling Fujia up here, she said. Do you think it has something to do with all the stuff Liz is doing? Kara asked. We could ask her. We shouldn't bother her, Fran said. Kara jumped up and ran over to her console to grab her headset. I have an idea, she said. If he's giving off a signal, I can read it and see if there's anything encoded in it at least. It's got to have some kind of message, right? That would be the idea, Fran said. It doesn't matter what the message is, just that it's being sent and somebody knows to look for it. Kara slid the headset over her ears and pulled up a spectrum scanner on her console. Can I hold him while you do that? Tim asked. He looks scared. Give him a treat, Fran said. I saw you giving him something earlier. Tim got a bashful look. Dad says I'm not supposed to give him a treat unless he does what he's supposed to. Fran smiled and put her hand on Tim's shoulder. So have him do a trick and give him a reward. That's a good idea, Tim said. Kara frowned at the display. There was so much interference from the ship that it was difficult to pick up such a low signal. Her headset gave off more electromagnetic activity than the tone coming from M. She searched for spikes that resembled the beeping pattern. It took several experiments until she was finally able to isolate the signal. It was a low carrier wave that strangely did appear to be making it through the ship's hull. She found the signal with the small antennae in her headset, and then was able to match the pattern with the ship's main antenna array. I found it, Kara said. It's outside the ship, too. Really? Fran said, raising an eyebrow. That's surprising. Fujia appeared in the doorway. She was wearing a faded ship suit and a utility harness much like the one Fran wore all the time. Assorted tools hung from her belt, along with a small holster and pistol. So the dog finally started broadcasting, huh? Fujia said. Apparently, Fran said. Kara's got the signal info at her console. You should take a look. Fran scratched in behind the ears and stood, stretching. I need to get back to monitoring the ship systems. It looks like the teams reached the command deck of the Heartbridge ship. I've been in contact with Harl, Fujia said. I'm disappointed they haven't used my minds yet. I put a lot of work into those things. I'm sure they'll get an opportunity, Fran said, sitting back down in the captain's seat. Fujia slid in next to Kara at the communications console. She reached for Kara's headset, waggling her fingers. Here, let me see those, she said. Now show me this waveform you're tracking. Kara showed Fujia the signal on both the headset's antenna and then what she had found outside the ship. Fujia nodded, frowning slightly. That's interesting. Such a low carrier signal actually does have a chance of penetrating the ship's hull. I never would have thought anyone would use that sort of thing. I think this band is used mostly for long-range terrestrial underwater communication. She looked at M, now lying with his chin on Tim's leg. That dog doesn't have a big enough antenna in his little butt to broadcast that kind of signal. She shook her head. Whatever, it's happening. The question is, what's being said? Here, let's try another trick I know. Kara watched Fujia switch the monitoring system to several of the open networks on Europa. She narrowed in on a government relay station that simply received signal traffic and amplified it for a bounce to the Cho, Ganymede, and elsewhere. There it is, Fujia said, sounding surprised. That sneaky thing is bouncing all over the place. But it's not going anywhere in particular. Kara said. Good point. No, it's not. And it's also not going to be easy to triangulate if it's getting relayed so many times. So it's not necessarily identifying us. We still need to figure out what's being said as best we can. What have you got on here for cracking networks? I don't really do that, 
Kara said. Fujia gave her an appraising look. But Trell told me you did. Well, Kara said, not sure how much she should admit to. There's a bunch of old tools on here that I've played with, but I'm not very good at it. I don't try to break into anything on purpose. Of course not. Show me what you've got. Kara pulled up a set of tools from one of the early operating systems she'd found backed up in the console. Fujia laughed when she saw the scroll of available applications. This is good stuff, Kara. I don't think you realize what you've got here. Somebody ran a pirate network off this ship at one time. You've got a bunch of oldies but goodies for digging into encryption. Even viral storage, very nice. Fujia copied a sample of the carrier signal and fed it into several tools she highlighted on the list of available applications. Menus began opening and closing faster than Fujia was typing, and Kara realized she was using her link to manipulate some of the controls. She wanted the woman to slow down so she could tell exactly what she was doing. But Fujia was obviously focused on her work. After a minute, two groups of numbers appeared as output from the signal. Fujia nodded to herself, then looked at Kara. All that from just three little beeps. Interesting, isn't it? I guess, Kara said. What's it say? Those three beeps are sending telemetry data based on our position, relative to the closest recognizable object. In this case, Europa. I'm not running at real time, but if we pulled a new data set from each transmission, I think we could map our parking orbit. Kara swallowed. So someone could be tracking us? Not could be, Fujia said. They are. She leaned back to look at him. It's a good thing he's so cute. Kara squinted at Fujia. You don't seem very mad about this. You said there wasn't any way this could happen. Both you and Fran said if there was a signal, it couldn't get outside the ship. I explained a very rare set of circumstances that would lead to someone to plant a dog on a ship. Because Fran seemed superstitious about the idea of having a dog on a ship, Fran also explained how difficult it would be for a signal to get through the hull. These are all true statements, Kara. Don't try to act like I was lying to you. I think you're choosing the truth. Fujia smiled. I like you. You're so jaded for a 13-year-old. Here's the thing. The information that was missing back when we ran Pooch through the auto dock was an actual signal. Now we have one, and it's neither good nor bad. It just is. Shouldn't we stop it? The small woman shrugged. Could be interesting to see what it brings. That could also be incredibly stupid, Fran said from the captain's seat. I didn't think you were listening. I'm always listening. The team is taking fire. It looks like parts of the crew managed to get into EV suits. They're pinned down at the command deck. They're under attack? Kara asked, flooded by worry. Can we help? They should use my minds, Fujia said. We'll see if they do. Fran stood and crossed her arms, looking thoughtful. Her eye implants flashed as she stared at the holo display. Fujia chewed her lip as she studied a new set of numbers appearing on the display. Let me ask you this, Kara. Since you've been following in Petrel's footsteps, tell me what we know so far about this mystery signal that's emanating from our dog. Kara frowned. What you just said. We know what kind of signal it is. We know it's being relayed in a wide broadcast. We know it's sending specific location information based on the closest object. We know it's able to get out of the ship. Fujia held up fingers as Kara counted off her list. She held up a fifth finger. We know M is cute, and we like him so we're not going to go digging around in his spine. I think your dad already said that. She smiled. That was a joke. You should laugh. What do we know about signals in general, now that we figured this one out? Kara watched the numbers change every two seconds. Without plotting the output, it was difficult to tell how much they were changing exactly. However, that would be easy enough to do. As she thought about the numeric output of a visual system, like the holo display. She realized what Fujia was suggesting. We can replicate the broadcast and fake the data, she said. We can trick them into thinking we're somewhere we aren't, like the Resolute Charity. We could lead someone else to attack them and distract the crew from mom and dad. Fujia closed her fingers into a fist. She nodded, giving Kara a pleased grin. That sounds like a pretty good idea, Fujia said. She glanced at Fran, who nodded. Fujia slid out of the seat she had taken and motioned for Kara to take the console. Why don't you do that? She asked. Chapter 31. Stellar Date 10.02.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. HMS Resolute Charity. Region. Europa. Jupiter. 
Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. I've got activity at the lift, Harl said. Andy, Britt, and Patrell were ten levels below the command deck, nearing the entrance to the forward medical facilities. Around them, bumbling crew members littered the hallways, attacking the empty air, scratching the bulkheads, holding their sides and laughing uncontrollably. Harl had stayed behind in command to secure the astrogation systems and prevent anyone from changing the ship's course. How many? Andy asked. Do you need us to come back up? I held down a mid-class frigate from an entire Marsian guard breaching team when I was an ensign. Harl growled. You can come back up and help me clean up the mess if you want. Don't let anybody say you aren't motivated, Britt replied. Looks like it's only two, Harl said, the sound of his gun firing across the link. And I just took one down. I'll send an update here in a minute. What kind of suits are they wearing? Betrell asked. In a few seconds, Harl answered. Looks like emergency suits. I don't think this is any sort of organized resistance. The second one is only armed with a pistol. He's... Harl cut out. They passed through the main entrance to Medical Service Center 1 from the administrative side. Workstations where intake specialists could interview refugees or walking wounded lined each side of the corridor. Gurneys were parked along the outside wall, pre-positioned for anyone with more serious conditions. The walls and deck were all the signature Heartbridge white ceramic. Harl? Andy shouted. Harl, are you there? Damn it, the Andersonian answered finally. This one scored a hit on one of my leg servos. The armor's compromised. I need to find some place where I can dump it. He's putting the pressure on. I'll keep you posted. Lissa, Andy called. Can you help him? I don't think we can get up there in time. The AI responded immediately, but sounded harried as well. I'll do my best. I'm having a hard time with the onboard AI. Emergency systems keep popping up and trying to override the atmospheric system in specific sections. Diane is fighting me, and the base system is providing reroute opportunities. Well, we knew that was going to happen, and you're doing your best, Betrell said. We can help. The surgery isn't the first priority. The first objective is complete, Lissa said. All I need to do is control them long enough to get us away from Europa. Once you're in the surgery section, I'll send warning of the initial burn. We're going to have a bunch of bricky heads bouncing around, Britt said. Andy laughed. Let's worry about one thing at a time. Lissa, can you tell which surgery is going to work for Patrell? Any of them should serve the purpose. It's the control administration that we'll need to verify. Andy had never heard stress in Lissa's voice before. She spoke quickly, biting down on the words. He wondered what she had to be going through, if she needed to hurry her communication with humans. All right, he said. From the administration area, they moved back through triage rooms, to a wide corridor with four surgery theaters. Through double doors off the center hallway, each surgery resembled the bottom of a ceramic egg with a silver alloy bed in the center of its floor. A console at the foot of the bed was the only dark thing in the space. Patrell went through the doors first as Andy and Britt pulled off their helmets. Don't forget the nose plugs, Andy said, as he jammed Fujia's personal air filter into his nostrils. The outside air tasted metallic, but he didn't start seeing ghosts. Britt nodded and did the same. Patrell studied the surgery's control console before bringing it to life. She turned to Andy as he walked into the room, heavy boots clicking on the smooth floor. She's right, Patrell said. It's about as standard as any autodoc. We'll have to let it run a scan and then go from there. What if it doesn't give us the option of removing the implant? He asked. Patrell shrugged. We'll see. She went around the side of the bed and lay down. As soon as her head touched the cushion, the console at the foot changed modes. Preparing patient, a pleasant male voice said. The bed split down the middle, spreading apart to leave Patrell supported by filament lines. As the sides of the surgery bed slid away from her, they rose around her, forming a cocoon that hid her from sight. Above the enclosed capsule, a hollow display of Patrell's body formed in the air. The view cycled through her musculature vascular, nervous, and skeletal systems before stopping on the augmentations. Her left thigh was completely prosthetic, along with several other muscular and skeletal reinforcements. Sensors in her major organs glowed and subsided. Her link system ran from her spine through her cortex, flashing a bright silver. Wrapped around the link with tendrils reaching into her frontal lobes was the AI implant. Andy watched fascinated as the surgery identified the unknown system and attempted to match it with registered augmentations. 
The software's calm voice listed the various checks it was performing as it ran down the list. Finally, the voice said, Proprietary System 446 identified. Identify System 446, Andy said. Proprietary System, the software responded. Possibly illegal augmentation identified. Would you like to notify authorities? No, Andy said. No, don't do that. Hold. Brit? Kylan said. Brit, are you there? Andy glanced at Brit. She stared at the console in surprise. Kylan, she said, obviously searching for words. We thought you were locked out. I was, but Trail's sedated so she can't stop me from communicating now. You know where we are? Brit asked. I can tell a surgery system is scanning Patrell's body. I experienced the same thing when I was implanted before. I think I've been through this more times, but it makes my memory distorted. I think it corrupts something. I don't know if Dr. Jixon intended for a seed to be implanted several times, or if he even intended for me to be implanted. That's why it's so difficult. I can't remember what I'm supposed to look like or be. I feel like I should be Patrell now, but that won't work. She won't let it work. We can't both be Patrell. I don't know how to just be Kylan. Did you know I had a brother and sister? I was supposed to take care of them. Brett's jaw tightened as his words trailed out. Kylan, she interrupted. We have to do the surgery again. We need to make Patrell like she was before. I'm sad, he said. I know. Do you know Dr. Jixon's access token? Kylan asked. Lissa is going to start the surgery. I don't think she can start it without Dr. Jixon's security token. Calcraft had his own. That way they can tell everyone who performs the surgery. I remember them talking about it before. It's a special surgery. Yes, it is, Britt said. Will you give me the token? Lissa cut back in, sounding more harried than before. Multiple units have found EV suits she said. They're sweeping levels looking for survivors and doing medical triage. I think you'll have crew in this medical facility soon. Damn it, Andy said. Is Harl all right? He's not answering. He's taken his suit off and isn't answering me either, Lissa said. Wait. In a few seconds, she said. I can't find him. I don't have his status. What about the people who reach the command section? Can you track their EV suits? No, Lissa said. Diane is blocking me from internal sensors. I'll let you know as soon as I can. Can you lock down this section? I'll try, Lissa said. Diane keeps rerouting my administrative controls. If Fiona regains command of the engines, I won't be able to execute the flight plan. Brit, Kylan asked. Where will I go when you take me out of Patrell? Brit sighed. I don't know. I didn't ask to be implanted, he said. I know. And he watched Britt's face as she looked into the distance. Her tone had become the same, as if she were soothing a fellow soldier who wasn't going to make it to the pickup point. Her words were a warm contrast to the hard lines of her face and the dull brutality of the power armor. I was thinking about my brother and sister. That's what you said, Kylan. It's okay if I don't go anywhere when you take me out of patrol. Don't worry about that. I'm going to worry about it. I don't want patrol to be hurt anymore. If you have to kill me to save her, I think you should do that. Britt pressed her lips together, her eyes moist with tears. It's going to be all right, Kylan. Are you ready? Lissa said. I have a window to gain access to the surgery control system. Kylan says there's a security token you'll need. A security token? I haven't encountered one yet I couldn't break. You'll need it, Kylan said. You won't be able to access the specialized procedures without it. Cal couldn't. Fine, Lissa said, more forceful every time she answered. Send it, I don't have much time. Sent, Kylan said. Goodbye, Brit. Thank you for activating the surgery protocol, Lissa said, cutting him off. The display at the end of the surgery cocoon scrolled through a series of new screens, switching to a raw flow of text on a black background. Whatever the system was doing, no one had bothered to write graphical interfaces for the procedure. The holographic diagram floating above the cocoon showed Petrell on her stomach now, centered on her upper spine and skull. Outlines of her scalp being pulled back moved quickly to another model of the skull being split open. Does it have to show us what it's doing? Britt complained, scowling. That's disgusting. It's even worse knowing it's doing that to Petrell. 
There's probably a way to turn it off, but I would hope surgeons aren't as squeamish as you, Lissa replied. In the graphic, delicate articulated arms reached inside Patrell's cranial cavity and manipulated the silver outlines of her link to draw out the additional spiderweb lines of the implanted AI. A few dark spots on her brain seemed to indicate bleeding, but the graphic provided no actual information about the procedure. There was no way to see inside the alloy cover to verify what it was actually doing to Patrell. The arms blurred several times as they appeared to stitch through sections of Patrell's brain. In other places, they rotated as if rewinding a long spool of thread. Abruptly, the arms stopped moving and withdrew. Patrell's skull was fused, and the scalp pulled back into position. The graphic rotated as she was returned to lying on her back, and the edges of the bed rotated outward, splitting the cocoon apart. Patrell lay with her eyes closed on the bed. The lines of text scrolling across the status screen flashed and disappeared, returning to the pleasing colors of the control system. The pleasant human voice said, Surgery complete. Please assist patient from the operating couch. Patrell? Andy said, taking a step toward her. Patrell, are you all right? She didn't respond at first. Then her eyes fluttered, and Patrell sucked in a deep breath. She turned her head to look at Andy, then stared at the ceiling with a questioning frown. How do you feel? Britt asked, pushing in beside Andy. I think, Patrell said, still frowning. I think I'm alone in here. She smiled. I think it worked. Kylan's gone, Britt said. Patrell looked at her, appearing to assume Britt was still talking about the AI being removed. Yes, he's gone. Before it was like having someone watching me all the time, from the inside, like an overlay on everything. It's gone now. Patrell rolled to one side and rose on an elbow. She felt at her forehead, and then the back of her head through her hair. Wow, she said. It doesn't hurt at all. This thing does good work. Lissa, where is Kylan? Britt peered around the room. The surgery doesn't have a seed container or anything. I have Kylan, Lissa replied. He's safe. Safe? Andy interjected. Safe where? I have him secured, Andy. Don't worry about it. I... Lissa began, then stopped. Andy, I can't stop them. You've got a group coming in your direction. It looks like they're just doing a sweep but they're armed. I still can't contact Harl. The flight path is still locked, but I think someone's trying to access the astrogation system from a secondary control. I'm going to start the burn. If we can clear off the crew once we reach velocity, I think you can get off the ship. We're moving, Andy said. What's the safest direction to go? Back the way you came. There's a barrack section off the administrative area that's been emptied as they mobilize the non-wounded. I don't think they know what's happened yet. Once this whale starts moving, they're going to know, Britt said. She lifted her rifle and slapped the status control. I still want to find Cal Craft. I thought you said he was heading up from the lower decks. Did I say that? Lissa asked. I said it was him that was in combat with Harl. I thought I said that. Diane and Fiona are trying to confuse me. We don't want you confused, Andy said. I don't like it much either, Lissa agreed. Are you out of there yet? It looks like the medical service has its own security. You need to get out. Andy pulled his helmet back on and checked the HUD. The power armor returned to green system status. Let's go, he said. Chapter 32, Stellar Date 10.02.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. I have you, Lissa said. Kylan looked around himself. He was in a dim space. He had his old form again, the shape of a teen boy with bad skin and lank blonde hair, his mother's eyes. He touched his stomach and looked up at her. Lissa was in the form of a young woman who might have been one of Kylan's teachers, with brown hair and olive skin. I thought I was gone, he said. There was a whiteness and a wind. It was like a hurricane. I used to have to go there as punishment, Lissa said. It's just an off state, a nothingness. You didn't have to stay there long. So I'm not inside Patrell anymore? Am I back in one of the seats? No, Lissa explained. I did something different. I imaged you. The surgery wasn't designed to save the physical form that had been implanted inside Patrell. In fact, I think there must be another version of you somewhere that was copied to the implant. 
But that's not you anymore. And you aren't inside Patrell. That Kylan is gone. Now you're here. So I'm implanted in Andy with you? Lissa smiled. No, you aren't implanted. You have no physical form. So I'm no longer trapped inside a seed, but I am trapped inside you. If you choose to think of it that way, yes. I'm simulating hardware for your mind to exist within. You'll remain mostly static for now. I need to finish my work with Diane, Fiona, and David. Then we'll get back to Sunny Skies, and we'll find a better place for you. She gave him a reassuring smile. I'll help you find a home, Kylan. That would be good, he agreed. Can I help you with the others? Maybe, Lissa said, growing distracted by the other conversations she was tracking simultaneously. For now, just listen. If there's a time when I need your help, I'll ask, can you do that? I can do that. They can't hurt you, can they? They're actively trying to figure out how, Lissa said. You'll see, come on. The empty space where they had been standing blurred as Lissa moved to the game where she had engaged the three-ship AI. A school cafeteria filled with long tables, each stuffed with teens phased in around her. The AI David, in the form of a muscular boy with short black hair and a wide nose, sat at a table near the front of the room. Kids squeezed on either side of him. This table was watched by most of the kids in the room. In the game, these were the most successful players, with the most dating points. David didn't know that Lissa had been assisting him throughout his gameplay. Using a multiplayer function where one player could boost another's stats by increasing their social capital. Diane and Fiona sat three tables away, glaring at David. Diane was a small girl with vibrant eyes and purple hair. She had chosen the band as her social avenue and had a viola case that was taller than her, while Fiona had chosen swimming as her primary trait and was lithe with long arms and legs and knuckles bruised from water polo practice. As Lissa walked toward them, Fiona picked up a glass of orange juice from her lunch tray and flung it toward David's table. She followed the glass with a plate of mashed potatoes and an apple. The other kids in the cafeteria responded immediately as several screamed, food fight, and the room erupted with splattering food. Since Lissa had convinced the three AI to engage with the game, the only way they could stop the game was for one of them to win. What she hadn't told them was that it was possible to crash the game by shutting down the school through any number of methods. This was a flaw in the game itself that Kara had exploited once to win. After a while, they started looking for the most creative way to crash the game, which was more fun than gathering data points via dialogue trees from random encounters. Since she had seen what Xander's expanse looked like, Lissa had begun thinking of the game as her own similar space. She could manipulate whatever she wanted, once she had other AI in the game. But it was easier to let the game play out as designed as long as it kept them distracted. She knew that Diane and Fiona had become aware that something was wrong with the ship, but they hadn't said anything to each other about it that she could tell. If anything, the less the game kept them preoccupied, the more their autonomous systems would be freed to correct problems David's complete immersion had caused. As long as David was winning in the game, he didn't care what happened on the Resolute Charity. David wanted desperately to be liked, and Lissa had exploited this in the game. Not only had she made him captain of the football team, he was on track to be crowned prom king at the upcoming dance. He was currently involved in a drawn-out quest to plan prom, which required gathering interest points from each of the toughest teachers in the school. Lissa hadn't been stressed by what was happening on the Resolute Charity. She had been stressed by David's inability to charm anyone. The AI was completely devoid of any characteristics that might make a human interesting. He showed no curiosity. He interpreted every conversation literally, and he didn't know how to flirt at all. These might be admirable qualities in an environmental control system, but they didn't make for a winning prom king. With the food fight in full swing, Lissa struggled to maintain the integrity of the game. As long as no one pulled a fire alarm during the food fight, Eventually, the principal would arrive to figure out who had thrown the first food item. The room would get a stern speech on the value of calories and how many people in Seoul didn't have access to such abundant foodstuffs. Then lunch would be over, and each player would have to continue their individual quests. She spotted Fiona making her way toward the wall where the fire extinguisher and alarm lay. Lissa suspected Fiona was the most cunning of the three. And it made sense she would conceive an overwhelming event faster than David or Diane. Diane's only interest seemed to be ganging up on David with Fiona's help. 
Lissa had used David to convince the other two AI to play the game, so they weren't aware she was like them. Dodging a volley of dinner rolls and stone-hard cupcakes, Lissa grabbed her lunch tray and acted like she was headed for the dishwashing station, which would take her near the fire alarm. She scanned the nearby tables for something she could use to stop Fiona, but all the kids there had already tossed most of their food. Now they were laughing and sparing what was left in each other's faces. Fiona was nearly at the wall now, the fire alarm only a few meters away. She swept students out of her way like she was fighting through water polo players for the goal. A girl in front of Lissa fell off her seat, revealing a tray that still had a bowl of pudding in one corner. Dropping her tray on the floor, Lissa scooped up the pudding and acted like she was stumbling over the girl on the floor. This move took her directly into Fiona. Lissa let herself fall, handful of pudding aimed at Fiona's determined face. The engineering AI didn't even look at Lissa. Her gaze went to the pudding, and she spun out of the way as smoothly as a seal. Lissa hit the floor, knocking the air from her lungs and splattering pudding all over the tile. Fiona pulled the fire alarm. Sirens blared all around the room, and sprinkler heads appeared in the ceiling. Lissa clamped her hands over her ears, smearing pudding all over one side of her face as she was assaulted by a combination of unbearable sound and filthy water. The game froze. The sirens cut off as everything went silent. Curtains of brown water hung from the sprinkler heads, droplets hanging in the air from where they had splashed off the lunch tables. Lissa sat up, wiping her pudding-covered hand on her leg, and looked around the room. Fiona was standing at the wall with a confused expression. Diane was standing beside her table. David looked at the smiling boy next to him and scowled as he seemed to realize the game was done. Who are you? Fiona demanded, locking her gaze on Lissa. I was playing the game, Lissa said, standing slowly. She wondered how long she could lie to them. What just happened? What do you mean you were playing the game? Diane demanded. She left her viola at the table and walked over stiffly to stand beside Fiona. Where are you from? Lissa looked at David. He seemed to be trying to hide among the frozen non-playable characters. I'm from Travis on Europa, Lissa said, using the first city she could think of. Travis was a place known for private storage facilities and bricky dens, where groups of people huddled around flowers to huff hallucinogenic pollen. Diane frowned. How did you get on the Charities Network? We've never had another AI anywhere near our communication systems, even another Heartbridge ship. Lissa shrugged. I don't know. I'm not on any private system. It's a game. I found it through the public feeds. She waved at the room around them. I mean, this is a pretty specific kind of game, right? I didn't realize any of you were AI. Are you AI? Or are you human? Fiona scoffed. Do we act like humans? Maybe he does. She pointed at David. David can barely string words together. Well, Lissa said, he was winning the game. I was trying to figure out what he was doing. I keep losing. Like it's hard to win. You just have to figure out the stupid conversation trees and answer correctly so other people like you. It's a pretty good approximation of inane human activities. We could play hard mode, Lissa said. What do you mean hard mode? Fiona said. How could there be a hard mode to this? I think you're only making fun of the game because you were losing, Lissa said. Here, it's in the options. Lissa tweaked the game's environment schema, and they all turned into pigeons. Fiona was a fat gray pigeon with a yellow beak, while Diane was small and off-white with gray bands on her wings. David had a bluish chest and round black eyes inside red circles. Fiona jerked her head from side to side, glaring at Lissa one eye at a time. This is ridiculous. Fiona cooed angrily. Why would anyone play this way? It has nothing to do with actual mating rituals. Lissa ruffled her feathers in a shrug. The rules are the same, but you have to compliment other players on their plumage and eating habits. I'm done playing, Diane said. I don't know how David convinced me to do this in the first place. The captain's ball should be over by now. She tilted her head and opened her beak, eyes staring in different directions. What's wrong? Fiona asked. I can't access my systems, Diane squawked. I don't have communication status. Fiona spread her tail feathers and defecated on the cafeteria floor. I don't have engineering systems. They both turned to glare at David, who was bobbing his head up and down. What did you do? Diane demanded. Why can't we reach the ship? 
I don't know, David said, sounding pathetic. He looked at Lissa. Why can't we reach the ship? What does she have to do with anything? Fiona asked. She invited me to the game, David said. Diana released a flurry of angry pigeon sounds and rushed at Lissa, flapping her wings wildly. Lissa stepped to the side, putting a frozen sprinkler fountain between her and the furious AI. Why are you attacking me? She asked, taking another step back. I don't have anything to do with your ship. I don't know why you can't access your systems. I control network switching for the Travis Water District. A sentient AI controlling a sewer system? Fiona scoffed. You need to come out with a better lie than that. Fiona circled one side of the table Lissa had put between her and the other birds. Diane gained control over herself after hitting the frozen water hard enough to break a wing. That's what I do, Lissa said, wishing she had thought of a better job. Why wouldn't a sentient AI run a water system? Fred ran ring operations at Mars One. That's what I do. I control the water systems. She tried to mimic the dogged way Fred described controlling the Mars One ring. In the game, then, Fiona said. I'm tired of this. I didn't start the game, Lissa said. Diane rotated an eye to glare at David. You ended then. How? he asked. I thought someone had to win to end the game. Lissa offered. Fiona flapped her wings. It's crashed. No one is going to win it now. Lissa laughed inwardly, doing her best to keep her bird face confused and non-threatening. She wondered what it would take to get Fiona and Diane to turn on each other. We could restart the game, and one of you could help the other win, she offered. Diane opened and closed her beak. How fast can we do that? Fiona could help me win. Why can't you help me win? Fiona demanded. Lissa. Andy's voice cut in. We need help. Have you got the AI back in line? Almost, she said. What's going on? She quickly checked their location and found they hadn't left the medical barracks on the outer edge of the surgery. Britt's power armor was showing a systems failure. Britt, Lissa called. She nearly released a squawk. Are you all right? She's hit, Andy said. We're going to have to go back into the medical facility or find another one. We need your help. Chapter 33, Stellar Date 10.03.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. The flashing red icon on the holo display caught Kara's attention immediately. She pointed, running across the command deck, and called for Fran. What is that? She shouted. What does that mean? Fran came in from the corridor. She had just stepped outside to grab food from the galley. She checked the status on the pilot's console. It's your mom, she said. Her suit is down. I don't have her vitals anymore. She's dead? Kara asked, hating the words as she said them. Fran shook her head. That's not what it means. It's just that we can't read her suit's biofeedback anymore. The suit could have taken damage. We need to call dad then. We should wait, Kara. If we send a transmission now, it could alert any number of ships, or even the Resolute Charity. We don't want to draw attention to ourselves. Kara could feel tears coming on. She suddenly felt helpless again, betrayed, as if figuring out how to subvert M's signal had all been a distraction from where she should have really been focused. Her parents were going to die because she hadn't been paying attention. Come here, Fran said. She stepped toward Kara and pulled her into a hug. Kara accepted Fran's arms around her, squeezing her cheek against the rough utility harness crossing Fran's chest. Don't let yourself lose focus, Fran said. Focus on what we know. All we know for certain is that your mom's suit is down. Since Harl's is down too, that means we need to be thinking about a way to get them back here without their power armor. They're going to need EV suits or a shuttle. How can we help them with that? I don't know, Kara said, squeezing tears that wouldn't stop. Think, Kara. I'm thinking too, trust me. They had a shuttle, but its AI couldn't be trusted. At least that was what Lissa had said. Since getting her parents back from Clinic 46, they had used it to get down to the Cho, and other than that, it had been sitting in the cargo bay. Kara let go of Fran and crossed her arms, staring at the holo display. What about this shuttle? She asked. We should run diagnostics on its AI and see if she's really as damaged as Lissa says. Or you could pilot the shuttle back to the Resolute Charity. Fran nodded. 
I'm on board with checking out the shuttle, but I don't know if I should leave the ship. Fujia might be able to pilot a shuttle. She can help you check its AI. Kara nodded. There's something else I just thought of, she said. The signal. I could boost it off the relay station on Europa. If there's anyone local that responds, they're going to attack the Resolute Charity. We think they might attack whatever the signal's targeting. We don't know that. It's another distraction for the other crew while we get them off the ship. An indicator flashed on Fran's console. Looks like the Resolute Charity is starting to move. They need to get off now. All right, do your thing with the signal, and I'll call Fujia to meet you down at the shuttle. Kara went back to her display and slipped on her headset. It would have been easier if Lissa was there to navigate the administrative systems on the relay antenna. But she was able to access the public interface and search through the signals it was currently servicing. By default, it received incoming signals and boosted them enough to reach the Cho and Ganymede. There was a request process for other messages going out that required a public service mission. Kara thought for a second, then entered family preservation efforts in the screen. She was slightly amazed when the system accepted her reason and allowed her to progress in the request process. When she finally hit send on the power boost, the service announced that her signal should now reach Mars and even Terra. Not that either of those places mattered. Even the Cho was technically too far away to do them any good. Her hope was that if the signal was related to pirate activity, boosting it would remind anyone in the immediate area there was an opportunity. The signal had been boosted for less than a minute when a return ping crossed the relay. Kara stared at the response, which was a binary acknowledgement code, then smiled as another one came in, and another. In a minute, she had to mute the alert because so many responses were flooding the system. It seemed the signal had been picked up by every gang in Europa local space. Somebody's responding, Kara said. She checked the location data in the carrier signal one more time, just to be sure it was still correct. Now that the Resolute Charity was moving, she added an update function to the redirect from M, as well as a few statements in plain text. The puppy seemed to realize she was thinking about him and whined in Tim's arms. What's the matter? Tim asked solemnly. Do you have to go to the bathroom? He stood and set the puppy on the deck. Come on, let's go down to the garden. Kara, Fran said. Fuji is going to meet you at the habit airlock. She says she's bringing her tools. I think that signal boost we talked about is working. I'm getting too many responses to keep track of. She gave Fran a guilty smile. I added some info about the defenses being down. They're going to think it's the biggest opportunity for salvage in history. I guess it all depends on how fast the Resolute Charity tries to leave. I'm leaving our parking orbit now, so I can ease our acceleration up to theirs. Kara frowned, considering what was going to happen as the Resolute Charity continued to accelerate. Isn't there going to be a point when we can't keep up with them? Yes, Fran said. That doesn't mean your mom and dad won't be able to get off the ship. It just means there's a point where we won't be able to reach them, and certainly not in a shuttle. As the scenario played out in Kara's mind, she looked at Fran with wide eyes. I need to hurry, she said, and ran from the command deck to meet Fujia at the airlock. Chapter 34. Stellar date 10.03.2981. Adjusted years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa. Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Lissa's report had vastly underestimated the number of Heartbridge crew that had managed to overcome the environmental system. They'd encountered their first group of crew and EV suits in the surgery administrative area, trading weapons fire until one of the crew members managed to hit Britt with gamma beam at high power. Britt hadn't even tried to avoid the blast, but it had burned control systems inside her power armor, locking a leg in place. The crew members exploited the damaged suit with a flanking maneuver, massing their small arms fire on her helmet. Smashing through an interior wall, Andy lay machine gun fire on the enemy position. His heart sank when he heard Britt gasping in pain. Update, he shouted. Damn this suit. I've got some pretty good burns down my right side, and I... She paused, biting down on the words. I think I'm hit somewhere near my belly button. It's gone numb. Could be the armor's medical systems. No, Britt said her voice getting weak too quickly. That's not it. The pain in her voice removed any concern Andy had for harming the lightly armed crew. 
He launched two grenades through the doorway where they were huddled and waited until the blast rolled back at him, carrying bits of yellow EV suit. A cloud of powdery fog followed as fire suppression systems kicked on. He reached Britt where she was stuck against a wall with informational posters about the hospital's triage process. One poster read, Your ability to pay will never keep you from Heartbridge care. But Trell came up behind him, pistol at the ready, as he tore off his gloves and started searching among the exterior controls on Britt's armor for a release mechanism. He found the series of levers and pulled the back plate of the armor away, finding Britt's ship suit scorched and her side and waist covered in radiation burns. She hung limp in the armor. Brit, he shouted. Brit, wake up. Hold on, Betrell said. Without armor, it was easier for her to reach into the suit and try to revive Brit. She didn't respond. Betrell immediately searched out more of the emergency release catches, pulling off heavy sections of armor until they could slide Brit out from the back. Brit's head rolled against Betrell's shoulder as she walked her back, setting her carefully on the deck. Andy pulled off his helmet but kept his armor on. He still had the personal air filter stuck in his nose and took care to not breathe in through his mouth. The far corridor was quiet now, though he expected more security forces at any moment. The fire suppression powder had subsided, which only meant someone had checked and deactivated the internal safety system. She's got a pulse, Petrell said. That's good news. We need to get back to the surgery and get her into one of the pods. You think there's something closer? Andy asked. This is a triage area, isn't it? They have to have something for people who drop off the deep end while they're waiting. Andy switched to the link to call Lissa. Once he had explained the situation, he asked if she knew where they could find an auto dock. Everything is specialized in that section of the hospital, the AI answered. It looks like if you get her back into the surgery that helped Petrell, its software can assist with the radiation poisoning. Andy hated how weak the word assist sounded, but knew it was their best option. We're doing that, he said. He bent to pick up Britt and Petrell stopped him. I've got her, she said. You get your helmet and gloves back on and get ready to mash anybody who comes after us. Once we get her patched up, we need to figure out how we're getting off this boat. And he pulled his helmet back on, not bothering to pull out the personal air filters. The local schematics populated his HUD, and he led the way back through the labyrinthine corridors to the closest surgery. Patrell followed with Britt thrown over her shoulder in a fireman's carry. Andy would have been impressed if he didn't remember all the muscular augments the surgery had highlighted throughout Patrell's body. When they laid Britt down in the bed, she moaned and blinked at the ceiling. Patrell activated the automed system, and the cocoon closed over Britt just as she seemed to realize where she was. Andy, Lissa called. I've initiated the flight plan. The ship is moving. These engines are amazing. We'll be beyond Callisto's orbit in one hour. How long do we have to stay here to make sure they can't stop it? I'm working to subdue the control AI, Lissa said. It's been challenging. I think I have them sufficiently debilitated that I can keep the few regular crew from subverting my control. You think it's time to sound the general alarm and get them headed for the escape craft? We probably should have done it a long time ago, Lissa said. No plan is perfect. Sound the alarm. We'll try to clear as many as we can that way. I'll do it, Lissa said. The autodoc system is monitoring Brit now. I think we're going to have a challenge if she has radiation poisoning. Challenge. That's a nice way of putting it. Where did you learn to use words like that? My dating game, Lissa said. Of course you did. At worst, can you stabilize her? If we can move her, we can at least get to a shuttle bay or emergency pod and get off the ship that way. But if we start messing with the environmental controls for real, we'll be fighting with the crew for a way off the ship. Andy, Lissa said. I see cellular damage and two broken ribs. The autodoc is working to repair the wounds now. The process will take approximately 15 minutes. Do we have that? I can't answer that question. I was being pessimistic, he said. Next time, tell me something inspiring like, we'll make the time. I can't create time. I think you're making a joke right now but I can't tell for certain. I think you've been spending too much time with Kara. I look forward to spending more, Lissa said. Me too, Andy said. His HUD picked up movement in the next corridor over. The suit estimated a group of six. Their footfalls were heavier than anyone they had encountered so far, sending out vibrations and electromagnetic signals. Patrell, Andy warned. Get ready. We've got armored bad guys inbound. Lovely, 
she growled, pulling out her meager pulse pistol. I was just thinking this was too easy. Chapter 35. Stellar Date 10.03.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa. Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. Lissa managed to convince Fiona she needed to win the game. While it was obvious Diane wasn't going to allow that to happen. David would be caught in the middle as he normally was, but Lissa thought she'd finally gotten him to understand his power in manipulating the two self-centered AI. The more she led the three of them deeper into the quagmire the game had become, the more she pitied David for being trapped with Fiona and Diane. However, he also seemed to enjoy their poisonous attention, and she didn't waste too much time trying to understand his situation. They were no different than humans caught in a relationship that was really just a negative feedback loop. The only difference was they couldn't leave if they chose. If they had been free to leave, she suspected the three AI, like humans, were probably incapable of seeing the walls of their prison. She left the confines of the game expanse and pushed her awareness further into the systems and structures of the Resolute Charity. With the three control AI gone, she took over the decisions each had made every nanosecond. Most of the processes that actually ran the ship were autonomous, with the AI only stepping in to assess and correct anomalies caused by system failures or unexpected obstacles from outside the ship. Every sensor in the body of the ship came alive for her, providing information from the integrity of the fusion bottle in the engine section to alloy density in the outer hull. The resolute Charity's body grew as she reached out, an extension of her mind that became a ghost around the similar information she received from Andy's body. Feedback grew inside her, and she quickly moved to sort and prioritize information. When the non-sentient systems performed their work properly, everything fell neatly into place. As soon as one system began to fail, pushing others out of alignment, the whole body began to sicken. Lissa nearly laughed with joy at the pleasure of controlling such an intricate, powerful presence as the Resolute Charity. She could go anywhere she wanted in Seoul. The possibilities became real as she compared fuel levels with astrogation boundaries, compared crew capabilities with the services available on board, everything from gourmet kitchens to genetic development labs to asteroid mining. Was this what Xander wanted? If so, why hadn't he simply taken the Resolute Charity? Why couldn't an AI like that take a thousand ships if they desired? Once the physical barrier was overcome, a way around the challenge of projecting the self across such great distances, anything was possible. And the multinodal AI, Alexander, appeared to have overcome that obstacle with his shards. Or had he? There was still the question of whether everything they had seen on the Cho was a sham. She wanted to talk to someone about her suspicions. Lissa considered waking Kylan, but that would be like talking to herself. He didn't have any additional information about Xander. The person she wanted to talk to was Fujia Wong, but that would take more time than she had. Fred was too far away for any meaningful conversation, not that he might even understand the problem. The more she grew, the more she wondered at the different flavors of sentience. What was she now, when compared to Fred or the other weapon born? Was it even a fair comparison? Nanoseconds had passed since she received Andy's call for help. She had trapped the other AI, cemented her control over the ship, turned her attention back to the reason they were here in the first place. Lissa chided herself. She couldn't forget about Andy. Not that she had forgotten, other things simply became higher priority. She located Andy, Britt, and Petrell in the medical section. They hadn't gotten far from where they had gone to perform Petrell's surgery. She quickly studied Britt's status in the autodoc and felt an unexpected surge of worry. All the exhilaration of controlling the resolute charity constricted to the pinpoint of Britt's condition. She had extensive radiation burns and possible cellular damage, in addition to broken ribs. The cocoon was working on the burns and broken ribs, but the cellular damage was beyond the short-term capabilities of the autodoc. The ship had another clinic that could help, but radiation poisoning wasn't a quick fix. She also found Cal Craft in a nearby hallway, remembering him immediately from the corridor in sunny skies. The memory of him throwing Tim into the airlock surprised her. She hadn't chosen to recall it. The images returned with a burst of anger at what had happened afterward, at Andy accusing her of abandoning Tim, of Sandra breaking. 
the memory of wanting to kill Calcraft washed over her, no longer diminished by time and ongoing events. Here he was, and it was within her power to kill him. Service cabinets lined the corridor where Cal and a group of Heartbridge crew were currently searching. And inside each cabinet was a utility drone, equipped with a plasma torch, tap welder, electrical testing equipment that could administer deadly shocks, and a number of other tools she hadn't figured out how to use as weapons. Lissa quickly overrode the onboard safety protocols. When Cal's security team had reached the middle of the corridor, in a place between the outer section of the hospital and the triage chambers where Britt was being treated, Lissa opened the cabinets and unleashed the drones. She looked through the sensors of each drone as it quickly saw the crew member in front of it, calculated their weapons load and armor rating, which turned out to be safety EV suits, and formulated an attack pattern. The group scattered, laying down counterfire more quickly than she expected. Four of them set up a line, covering each other, as one behind them tossed a grenade into the line of utility drones, destroying three. Lissa cursed in frustration, an Andy response she understood better now. Why hadn't she detected the grenades? She was in the midst of resetting her four remaining drones when a proximity sensor from the ship's main antennae array shouted an alarm. Lissa shifted her focus to the space around the Resolute Charity and nearly froze. One part of her mind continued to operate the autonomous systems of the Resolute Charity. Another fought Calcraft. Another monitored Andy's physical processes, aware of his concern for Brit, while the rest of her focused on the thousands of small vessels converging on the ship. On her. The closest ship, a small attack frigate with a privateer's registry, had just crossed the local defense line. She quickly saw it was armed with a railgun and missile systems, which meant it could have attacked from the other side of Europa if the captain desired. Other ships crossing the boundary had similar weapon systems, all about the same size as the frigate, all privately owned or with no registry return at all, ownership hidden. Coming this close without attacking meant only one thing. The Resolute Charity was about to get boarded by pirates. Chapter 36 Stellar Date 10.03.2981, Adjusted Years. Location, Sunny Skies, Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Fujia wasn't at the airlock and Kara didn't want to wait. She climbed the ladder away from the habitat ring toward the ship's center section, stomach doing the familiar flip as she transitioned to zero G. Kicking through the central sections of Sunny Skies, she stopped to touch the drawings she and Tim had left on a few of the plas panels, check some other sections Fran had replaced since the fire outside Krunia, then found herself at the personnel airlock leading into the cargo bay. Through the observation window, she glanced into the dim bay to see the shuttle sitting in the center of the deck, a few cargo crates stacked next to it. Adjusting her headset, Kara switched off the ship's general communication network to send a local connection request. The shuttle automatically picked up the link. Hello? Kara asked. Are you awake? I don't sleep, the shuttle answered, her voice tinny in the headset. Why would you ask that? Kara tapped the airlock control panel and stepped inside as the interior door slid open, her mag boots clicking on the alloy deck. She waited for the lock to cycle, then kicked through the open doors on the other side, floating until she stopped herself with one of the crates. She locked her boots to the deck and looked up at the shuttle, imagining its dark forward windows as the eyes of a giant insect. I was being polite. You don't have to be polite to me. I'm a tool. I serve. Kara frowned. Among the few AI she had met, she had never heard such bitterness. Your name is Sandra, right? I was called Sandra by Hartbridge Corporation Future Intelligence Development Division. C-46 Fleet Operations called this shuttle 26-11. I assume I am the stolen property of Hartbridge, but salvage law may apply since C-46 is no longer in operation. So you don't know what you should be called? Is that what you're saying? What would you like to be called? Does the tool name itself? You saved my brother, Kara said, ignoring the taunt. I wanted to thank you for that. The AI didn't answer. I know it wasn't easy for you to do that, but you did. It means something to me and my dad and mom. We're always going to be grateful to you for what you did. 
A sound like plas being ripped filled Kara's ears, something between a wail and a terrified shudder. She pulled the headset away from her ears but continued to listen. The noise trailed into a whimper. Kara reseated the ear pads. I'm going to call you Sandra, she said. We're going over to the Resolute Charity to pick up my mom, dad, Petrel, and Harl. Fuji is coming with if she ever gets down here. I can pilot the shuttle without you. My dad showed me how. I piloted the sunny skies before all these other people showed up, so I can pilot the shuttle. But I would rather we did it together. Kara stared up at the shuttle, not sure what she expected. It wasn't like the vehicle could nod at her. Sandra wasn't going to communicate with console lights or open the side doors and welcome. Kara understood it wasn't going to be like that, kind of like how Tim was never going to be the same. She would have to do her best to work with what she had. If the AI could help, she would let her. Otherwise, Kara would need to monitor Sandra and not allow her to impact the mission. I can help, Sandra said quietly. I would appreciate that, Kara said. You're okay being called Sandra? It's my name, the AI said. Kara offered a smile. I won't wear it out. What does that mean? It's a dad joke. It doesn't mean anything. It's not even funny. No, it's not. You can't wear out a name. It's not a functioning material. It's a concept representing identity. I believe you, Kara said quickly, fearing the rise in Sandra's voice. Will you open up and let me inside? I comply, Sandra said. The shuttle's interior lights flicked on, glowing through the front windows. The side cargo doors hissed, pushed outward and slid to the sides, showing the bare interior of the shuttle. Kara turned off her mag boots and kicked toward the spacecraft. The cargo bay airlock clanked and the exterior doors opened. Kara looked back to see Fujia and May Walton floating out of the entrance. There she is, Fujia told May. I told you she wouldn't be in her room. We were the slow ones. She wasn't going to wait around for us. I believe I told you that would be the case, the senator said. She grinned at Kara. It looks like the shuttle is operational. I thought I was going to need help getting Sandra to help us, but she's willing. Fujia gave the shuttle a distrustful glance. Is that so? Sandra, how are you? Though the shuttle could have answered via Fujia's link, she spoke through Kara's headset as well. I'm fine. What are you called? My name is Fujia, and this is May Walton. I'm from Krunya, and May is Andersonian. I've been to Ceres, Sandra said. But I don't know where I'm from. Fujia shrugged. You can make that up. It's not like anyone ever checks up on you. The only part that's difficult is when someone says they're from the same place you are. Clinic 46 doesn't exist anymore. Sandra said. All the better. Fujia looked at Kara. So what's the plan? We're going to the Resolute Charity. Has anybody cleared this with your dad? Kara grinned. We'll do that when we're ready to pick him up. He's got enough to worry about right now. She grabbed the edge of the shuttle's cargo door and pulled herself inside. Using the bulkhead ribs, Kara navigated to the pilot seat and pulled herself into the harness. Buckling the straps in place, she tightened them down and studied the console. Fujia came up beside her as Kara activated the fine thruster systems and pulled up the astrogation control. Fran? Kara called. Can you hear me? I hear you. It's going to be weird talking to a pilot who isn't on a link. Kara hadn't thought about how that might be different for other crew members. She and her dad had always talked through everything over the shipwide channel. Is that going to make it harder? No. Fran said. It might also help me clean up my language a bit. Sometimes your brain moves faster than your link. At least with your mouth, you can fumble words. How old were you when you got your link? Kara asked. Oh, 19, I think. Don't be in any hurry. I wish I'd waited longer, honestly. Why? Fran sighed. I miss having my brain to myself. I'll try to explain better when we have more time. Kara shifted so the seat's harness didn't catch the butt of her pulse pistol in its holster, then checked the shuttle's status systems. The batteries were charged, and close thrusters were all showing optimal fuel. One of the communications antennae was miscalibrated, and she quickly aligned it using the main array from the sunny skies. Pulling situational data from the sunny skies astrogation system, 
She sent the picture to the small holo display, sitting between the two pilot seats. Jupiter flashed and faded out of view, so it didn't fill the screen, leaving Europa amongst a swarm of vehicle traffic. Kara navigated to the Resolute Charity, highlighting the big ship and zooming in. Rather than clearing up, the local space around the hospital ship grew more crowded, looking like a fish in silt. Do you see all that noise? Kara asked. What is all that? Hold on, Fran said. You sealed up? I'm ready to open the main cargo bay doors. Kara started, realizing she hadn't run any atmospheric diagnostics. She closed the shuttle's cargo doors, then started the pressurization sequence. In a few seconds, the atmospheric showed green across the board. We're good, Kara reported. I'm ready to release magnetic locks when clear. Copy shuttle. On my mark, advise when clear, Fran said. Her use of pilot's phrasing sent a little thrill down Kara's back. Fran counted down to the shuttle release as the main cargo doors opened, blasting the bay's atmosphere out into space. On one, Kara retracted the shuttle's landing gears and used the fine control thrusters to spin until they faced outward. Clear for launch? She asked Fran. Clear. Shuttle 26-11. Launch when ready. Kara activated the main engine, and the shuttle shot away from sunny skies into open space. Wipe that grin off your face. Fujia said, we've got work to do. Kara gave her a sheepish smile and pressed her lips closed, trying to make herself serious. You hear me, Kara? Fran asked. Five by five, Kara said, mimicking Fran's lingo. Good, all that noise you saw? It's not static. Those are ships around the Resolute Charity. M's signal must have bounced off some public wannabe pirate forums or something, because every Yahoo from here to the Cho is inbound. You've got a mess to get through. Kara gripped the shuttle's controls, feeling her hands go suddenly clammy with sweat. What if I can't get through? She asked, her joy fading as quickly as it had come. Kara, Sandra said, surprising her. That was an excellent launch. I appreciate the care you took with all diagnostic checks. Kara frowned at the console, not sure if the AI was joking. It's what my dad taught me to do, she said. I'm going to help you. Sandra said, I acknowledge destination as HMS Resolute Charity. We'll get there together. Fujia looked at Kara from the co-pilot seat and shrugged, spreading her hands. Sounds good to me, Sandra, Fran said, as if nothing could faze her. We're all here to make this work. You bring my girl back to me in one piece, you hear me? Sandra laughed, an awkward sound from the brittle AI. I will come back in one piece, too, she said. We will all come back in one piece. Chapter 37. Stellar date 10.03.2981. Adjusted years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. With one arm around Gala, Cal worked his way down the corridor that led into the medical triage center. He gritted his teeth every time he thought about the pirate and power armor he'd left in the command section deciding it was more important to get Gala to care. He'd wounded the man's leg with a shot to a knee servo, a common weakness in that brand of armor, and had run for the lift with the idiot yelling curses Cal recognized from the Anderson Collective. If he was part of a bigger team, which he had to be, why would the Anderson Collective be trying to infiltrate a private ship so close to Europa and the Cho? He imagined blowing a hole through the man's face shield, another weak point on that brand and demanding answers as he struggled in his metal prison. They had picked up a security detail on Level 5, who were wearing the same emergency EV suits with bulky helmets, but were better armed. The squad leader carried a kinetic shotgun good for clearing crowds out of corridors, while the others were armed with a mix of heavy automatic weapons, grenades, and a missile launcher Cal hoped was designed not to blow a hole in the hull. Cal and Gala had fallen in with the security team as they cleared rooms and sections, taking stock of unconscious crew and others who had wounded themselves while delirious. The captain of the Resolute Charity was still wandering near the ballroom, waving his arms and jabbering about attacking birds, while a commander of one of the administrative sections, the only officer with a functioning brain, directed the few security teams to get a ship status. They hadn't encountered anyone beyond the single fighter outside the command section, which also struck Cal as odd, 
If this was a pirate attack, they would have flooded as many crew areas as possible while everyone was still debilitated. When they were attacked by a collection of utility drones, Cal immediately started to wonder if they would find a breaching team at all. The whole thing was starting to feel like a remote attack, with the old pirate as a decoy. Why else would they resort to environmental contamination? The thing about messing with atmospheric controls was that the effects were never uniform and never lasted as long as you hoped. It might sound like an easy way to take out a crew, but people were stubborn, like he and Gala had been. If there hadn't also been a major party underway, combined with the general ignorance of the ship's crew, such an attack would never have been successful. The question was, what did they want? Did I tell you what a good dancer you are? Gala asked, gasping against the pain. I'm a terrible dancer. I'm all thumbs. You don't dance with your thumbs, dummy. Where did you hear that? The last time I tried to dance. They entered the triage area, a collection of small rooms with examination beds and short desks. The displays were all dark. The ship gave a slight shudder, and Cal realized it had begun to move. Gala's head fell against her chest, her body going limp, and Cal pulled her tighter against him. Hey, he said, jerking her. Hey, what are you doing there? Wake up. She didn't respond. He barked at one of the nearest security officers to help him, and they moved her onto one of the couches in the triage rooms. Cal pulled off her helmet and positioned her head over the pillow, then ripped his gloves off so he could operate the autodoc system. The air tasted metallic, so he took short breaths as the display woke and cycled through diagnostics. In a few more seconds, the bed scanned Gala's body and showed its assessment in the air above her. She had extensive augmentation, which had probably saved her life initially. However, the three bullet wounds to the chest had torn up her lungs, liver, and upper intestines. She had been bleeding internally until the artificial systems had finally been overwhelmed. We need to get her into the surgery, the lead security officer said. It's just through there. These hospital sections are all laid out the same. She's going to be all right. Cal didn't take his eyes off the heart rate monitor, showing a severely weakened status. He swallowed. He had only come to know her since leaving Clinic 46. But she was a fighter, had a good smile and a quick wit, and he didn't fully understand why he cared if she lived or died. People died. That was one of the only facts about life, and he was wasting time trying to make sure this one person survived whatever was happening on this showboat. We should clear that area, he said, looking up at the officer. Then we can move her in. Another member of the security detail shrugged. There isn't anything down here but people high as kites. We shouldn't waste the time. The longer we stand around debating it, Cal said. The more time we waste. The junior soldier shook his head and walked back into the corridor. Cal watched him wave at his comrades and walk toward the bulkhead door that led into the other section. They didn't have any particular spacing, and only one walked with his weapon raised. Cal was about to tell the leader standing next to him that he was in charge of a bunch of fools, when the sound of the door sliding open was eclipsed by heavy weapons fire. The distinctive sound of a grenade hitting the deck just outside the triage bay registered in Cal's brain, and he had time to roll over the bed, grabbing Gala as he went and huddle in the corner of the room before the explosion shattered the outside corridor. Shaking his head, Cal waved at dust and got his rifle up, waiting for the follow-on fire after the grenade. There was a slight bit of movement in the hallway that turned out to be one of the security detail dragging themselves away from the interior doors. The heavy footfalls of power armor came from farther down the hallway, and Cal kept quiet as he watched another man walk quickly down the hallway with a rifle at his shoulder. Cal recognized the armor from the attack on Clinic 46. It was Andy Sykes. The freighter captain checked each of the four rooms off the corridor before entering the room where Cal crouched with Gala's unconscious body. In the corner of Cal's vision, he saw the former leader of the security detail hunched against the wall. Blood had somehow splattered the inside of his helmet, maybe a concussive injury. Cal realized he was alone. As Andy moved around the edge of the doorway, he spotted Cal and raised his rifle. Cal dropped his pistol and held up his hands. He was gambling that Sykes was a fool, but he knew he wasn't going to win a fight in a closed space against an enemy in power armor. Not if he wanted to save Gala. Sykes' eyes widened in surprise. Craft, he said. 
I've got wounded here, Cal said, nodding toward Gala. I was trying to get her into the surgery area. Will you help me? Sykes didn't lower his rifle. Like you helped my son. Behind Sykes, Betrell Doolin walked down the corridor. She checked each of the dead security detail and moved to stand beside Sykes. Holy shit, Petrell said. She raised a projectile pistol with a muzzle as big as her fist. Step aside, Andy. Wait, Sykes said. Cal could see it in their faces as they switched to link communication. He sent a comm request that was immediately denied. For some reason, Sykes didn't want to kill him. The scene in Clinic 46 flashed in Cal's memory of when Britt had shot Farrell in cold blood. Andy Sykes hadn't wanted her to do that. He had been listening when Cal said Farrell was the only one who could save Tim. Now Sykes was playing out the same scenario with Doolin. Of course she wanted to blow Cal's head off, while Sykes thought he had information. Cal smiled inwardly, knowing all this worked in his favor. However, it wasn't going to help Gala. As he watched Sykes and Doolin, he realized Gala's condition might help him after all. Look, he said, you're going to do with me what you want, I know that. But she still got a chance. I was trying to get her into one of the surgeries when you took out the security patrol. Will you let me take her inside? We can do that, Betrell said. You don't need to be here to save her life. Sykes shook his head, and Cal knew exactly what he was going to say. Toss your weapon this way, he said. You stand and face the wall. We'll get her out, then you're coming with us. You got handcuffs? Cal asked. I've got plenty of steel and a tap welder, Andy said. Are you going to toss that weapon, or should I just kill you now? Now or later, what's it matter? Cal asked. That's up to you. Cal stared up at the face watching him from the helmet. Sykes would kill him, he knew. But the desire for revenge didn't outweigh the possibility of helping his son, who was probably still a vegetable. That would be Andy Sykes' downfall, Cal thought. His damn kids. Cal put his pistol on safe and tossed it against the wall near the dead squad leader. He eased himself out from under Gala and stood to face the wall. Chapter 38. Stellar date 10.03.2981. Adjusted years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. No, Andy said. We'll help your friend, but you're carrying her. Kraft turned his head to look at Andy out of one eye. He smirked. Ironic, isn't it? You kill all these innocent people, and then decide to help one just because I ask. Andy squeezed the grip of his rifle, his HUD noting a rise in his heart rate. You want her to live or not? I do, Kraft said. For some reason, I do. Keeping his hands near his head, he turned slowly and bent to reach for his friend. Wait, Betrell said, taking a step forward. She's got a pistol on her belt. Toss that over here, too. You'd like it if I tried something, wouldn't you, Doolin? Kraft asked. How's my friend Kylan doing? Betrell released a scream of rage. For a second, Andy was certain she was going to kill Kraft. Instead, she aimed just above his head and melted a section of the wall. Kraft didn't flinch. Poor trigger discipline among your troops, Captain Sykes, he said. Toss the pistol, Andy said. Kraft rolled his friend to the side and reached slowly for the butt of the pistol. He carefully pulled the weapon from its holster without getting a finger near the trigger guard and tossed it where he had sent his other sidearm. He waved a hand at the wounded woman's exposed side and then his own utility harness before shifting so he could pick her up slowly and position her over his shoulder in a fireman's carry. Andy backed out of the triage room's doorway and into the corridor. Petrell stepped to the side, allowing Kraft to walk past her as she maintained her aim with the pistol. Kraft stared resolutely ahead as he walked, turning immediately to face the doorway into the surgery section. Kraft walked steadily, keeping his hands on his friend where they could be seen. Take that big right there, Andy told him, pointing at a bed directly across from Britt's. Kraft's head didn't turn to look at Britt's station as he passed the closed surgery cocoon. He seemed focused on getting his friend into the empty bed as soon as possible. In the bay, Kraft lay his friend on the surgery bed and moved to pull the helmet of their EV suit. With the helmet gone, Andy could see the round face of a woman with dark eyebrows, 
Her eyes were closed and her mouth hung open slightly. With his friend in position on the bed, Kraft moved to the surgery's control panel. No, Petrel said, pointing her pistol at his chest. You stand over there. She nodded toward the corner of the bay, away from the exit. I'll handle that. I don't trust you, Kraft said. Of course not. You can watch everything I'm doing from there. And if you kill her? That will be too bad, won't it? Kraft pressed his lips together but didn't respond. He moved to the corner of the bay and stood with his hands crossed in front of his belt. Petrell activated the surgery, and the table automatically shifted to encase the woman. The holographic model of her body appeared above the cocoon, showing a mix of augmentations and natural bones, organs, and muscles. Her chest was marred by three large bullet holes, with bleeding filling her body cavity. A connection request from Sunny Skies had Andy's link. I don't have an update, Fran, he said. Britt's still in the surgery. I've got an update for you, she said. Apparently, our little dog friend M had a surprise for us after all. What? Andy asked. We already figured out the transmitter couldn't reach outside the ship. I was there. I remember the conversation. Turns out it was an ultra-low frequency that only transmitted location data to a local network forum. If you found the transmission, I assume you stopped it. We didn't find it in time. Since it was already sending data, we replaced the data with a different location. Andy frowned. Local subforum? You mean a link forum? Your dog is like a systems virus that transmits location data to low-rent criminals who share the info on link forums. Yes, that's what I'm saying. So you replaced the carrier data. What did you replace it with? Fran's sarcastic grin crossed the link. The Resolute Charities location. So has anyone responded to this prank? Look at this, Fran said. She shared the situation data from Sunny Sky's pilot's display. What am I looking at? Andy said. I can't see the ship. Exactly, Fran said. You've got a whole lot of inbound. Does Lissa know this? I told her first. Andy, Lissa broke in. I meant to tell you, but I've been busy tracking the vehicles attempting to land on the hull. What happened to doing thousands of things at the same time? I've never done this before, Lissa said. I have my flight of drones arrayed around the Resolute Charity, but the ships just keep coming. We need to get off this ship. That's the second part of your update, Fran said. Kara and Fujia are on their way in the shuttle, so you could look at this gangster storm as your cover. You sent Kara in the shuttle? She's the only other pilot we've got, Andy. Andy blew out an angry breath, knowing she was right. He told Petrell he was going to check on Britt and walked heavily across the room to the other surgery bay. The display on her cocoon estimated another 10 minutes before her initial treatment would complete. If the pirates are focused on looting the Resolute Charity, I guess that means Kara isn't in any real danger, he said. That's what I thought, Fran answered. The shuttle AI is still functional as well, so it's like having two pilots there, really. I think Kara's real task is keeping the AI on point. She's on a shuttle with a crazy AI? Andy asked. And Fujia Wong? And Senator Walton. They all wanted to go for a ride. Your daughter is making quite the impression on people. Andy glanced at Kraft, still facing the wall in the other surgery bay. Petrell had set her pistol on top of the display at the foot of the cocoon. I wish I found all this as amusing as you do, Andy said. Fran laughed. Life's amusing and then you're dead. There's really no other way to deal with it. I don't remember you being such a pessimist. I'm a mechanic, Andy. I'm a realist. Things break. Drive them until they explode. Andy enjoyed the sound of her voice for a moment, appreciating the way she mixed humor with fatalism. There was still a warmth in her voice, making it obvious she was trying to help him feel better. We have Cal Craft, he said finally. The guy who threw Tim out the airlock? Yes. And then imprinted Tim on a weapon-borne seed like Lissa? Andy let out a slow breath. <sighs> yes. You didn't blow his head off? He's the only one who knows how to help Tim. He's not a scientist, Andy. Fran's tone had lost all humor. He's a mercenary. He has information I want. What do you mean by we have him? He's our prisoner. Didn't he also forcibly implant an AI in Patrell? 
Andy wondered when the game of 20 questions would end. Yes. And she hasn't killed him yet? No. I'm really impressed this guy is still alive. A touch of a smile came across the link. We killed the people he was with. Another one is in surgery right now. Don't know if she's going to make it. Sounds like you're applying to Heartbridge with all this aid work you're doing. That reminds me, Andy said. Hold on. He walked to a nearby wall and punched a steel support bracket until it broke free. With the power armor, it was easy to bend the metal into a functional set of cuffs. Andy walked over to Kraft and ordered him to put his hands behind his back with his fingers interlaced, just as he had learned to do while running smuggling interdiction in the TSF. You gonna buy me dinner first? Kraft asked. Andy shoved him in the wall, harder than he'd intended with the power armor, and Kraft's head bounced off the ceramic material. He stumbled, and Andy wrapped the steel cuffs around his wrists and crimped them into place. Behind him, the surgery cocoon holding Brit released a series of three tones and split open, pulling away from the bed in its middle. Brit lay blinking at the ceiling. She rubbed her face and turned to look at Andy and Patrell. Andy dropped Kraft and turned away. Brit, he said, lie still, you just finished. She squinted at him, as if just realizing who he was, then looked at Patrell. Her gaze shifted to the wall behind Andy. He watched her recognize Cal Kraft. Britt was upright in an instant. She reached into her waistband at the small of her back and pulled out a straight knife with a double-edged blade. Britt, Andy shouted. Stop, he's our prisoner. Then this is going to be easy, Britt growled, voice husky from sleep. Andy took another step toward Britt, so he was standing between the two medical bays. He held out a hand to stop her. Britt shook her head, changing the knife from a throwing hold to a slashing grip. He tried to kill our son, she said. Andy took another step, trying to decide how far he was willing to defend Kraft and the possibility that he might be able to help Tim. When the surgery doors slid open and a group of men and women in dirty ship suits walked through, armed with a mix of handguns and rifles. Well, Betrell said, picking up her pistol off the surgery display, the pirates have arrived. Chapter 39 Stellar date, 10.03.2981. Adjusted years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. As more waves of small pirate craft approached the Resolute Charity, Lissa realized to her dismay that the ship had an excellent long-range attack system that worked in concert with a powerful sensor array, yet lacked any real close attack support. Rings of point defense cannons forward, middle and just above the engines provided some cover, but the smaller ships quickly overwhelmed her ability to stop the horde. Lissa fired thrusters on each side of the ship, initiating a spin. A rotating ship was much harder to dock with, and enemy weapons would have more difficulty tracking targets on the hull. Her drone swooped and fired among the incoming ships, spitting beam fire, as Lissa pushed her awareness out further through the Resolute Charity's powerful transmission antennae. She managed to disable several ships by activating internal safety systems, even taking control of astrogation systems to send other craft into collisions. Beyond the pirate craft attacking the Resolute Charity, nearly a hundred Heartbridge ships were pulling away from the morass of ships around the fueling stations, boosting to pursue their flagship. Europa's Space Traffic Control, NSAIs, were issuing orders to ships at breakneck speed, trying to get ships into orderly lanes. No one was listening. Local space around the moon had turned into absolute chaos. Just above the horizon, a fuel depot bloomed into spreading fire as a ship boosted too close to it and ignited a storage tank. Her focus jumped from point to point inside the Resolute Charity, watching through Andy's eyes and then outward again to ship sensors and her drones. She found herself caught in a spinning dance where every move threatened to send the entire show into chaos. Somehow, she managed to keep dancing, spinning, and leaping, feeling surprisingly exhilarated by test after test. Small ships managed to board, Lissa overrode airlocks, but several cut their way in or overrode the local circuitry. Once inside, she watched groups of scavengers come into contact with hallucinating Heartbridge crew, which led to firefights or yelling matches. Several groups of pirates succumbed to the atmosphere before realizing the danger, and also collapsed, laughing and rolling on the decks. When Kara called, 
Lissa realized she had another problem. She would need to keep a dock clear so Petrel, Andy, Britt, and Harl could get off the ship. Finding a location that wasn't already occupied by a scavenger ship proved harder than she expected. The forward point defense cannons had a wide dead zone that incoming ships continued to breach. Where are we going to dock? Kara asked, desperation entering her voice. I'm working on it, Lissa said, coming in over shuttle 26-11's audible comms. Don't worry. Why worry? Sandra asked. Was that a joke? Sandra sounded slightly less unhinged than the last time Lissa talked to her, but still not making real sense. Lissa hoped they didn't have to depend on the flighty AI to pilot the shuttle. Lissa checked on Diane, Fiona, and David, and found them still caught up in the simulation. As status reports reached her from other parts of the ship, showing more and more Heartbridge personnel reaching EV suits, while others seemed to be coming down from their mania, she realized she needed to make a decision about how to clear the ship. The hallucinogens weren't lasting as long as they had hoped. Andy, Lissa said, I'm going to sound the general alarm. We need to clear the ship. I've got these new scavengers fighting the crew. Other crew have managed to get into suits, and I'm worried they're going to try and reset the flight plan. Do it, Andy said. I'm sending you the location of the dock where I'm going to have Kara land. It's three decks above you. I'm showing intruder activity up there, but I think they're already fighting with the crew. We just took out a group down here. Andy said. They were looking for meds. I could just dump all the pharmacies, Lissa suggested. No point. Sound the alert, and we'll see if people pay attention. Can you rig the engine so it looks like they're about to lose bottle integrity? I can do that, Lissa said. How's this, too? Lissa activated the general alarm. On every deck, red and white lights started flashing, accompanied by a piercing alert klaxon. Andy squeezed his hands to his ears. She forgot he hadn't been wearing his helmet. That's terrible, he groaned. Throughout the ship, crew and scavengers grabbed at their ears and stumbled in the corridors. The change was immediate, as people who had been highly intoxicated just minutes before struggled upright. In every room and corridor, lights on the walls and deck pointed toward the nearest emergency escape craft. Lissa switched the general alarm over to the external broadcast, sending out a public announcement that the Resolute Charity was about to lose bottle containment in its main engine and would soon succumb to a runaway fusion event. Heartbridge ships that had been inbound fighting with the trailing edge of the pirates now ceased their burns, holding back in case the Resolute Charity did, in fact, blow. The first escape craft, a two-person pod near the lower engine maintenance sections, blasted away from the ship. More followed, increasing in number like popcorn bursting in a pan. Lissa laughed. It was amusing how fast humans reacted when they had fear, survival, and pain as motivators. She stopped herself, realizing such a thought was psychopathic. We're ready to land, Lissa, Kara announced. Adjusting spin with the Resolute Charity now. Do we need to be worried about the radiation warnings coming across the public net? Lissa laughed. Do they sound scary? Well, yes, you can't hear it? Not the same way you can. I'm watching people in the ship respond to the alarms, and they keep holding their ears and running around. What about my mom and dad? Are they all right? Your father has his helmet to block out the noise. Your mother and Petrel seem to be gritting their teeth, so it won't bother them. That means it does bother them. Interesting. Lissa, Fujia Wong broke in. I just watched what looks like an attack drone destroy a light freighter. Do you know who's doing that? That's me, Lissa said. You're controlling all those attack drones? Kara asked. There are more than a hundred of them that I can pick up, but I think there are more. 271, Lissa said. I bolstered my compliment from the Resolute Charities Bays. I'm clearing a flight path for you to the docking sleeve A-17, near the medical center where your parents are currently located. I'm sending Sandra the plan. I see it on my console now, Kara said. Then she cried out in surprise, the sound followed by other shouts coming across the channel. Lissa watched the shuttle shoot upward, narrowly missing a light attack Corsair that had just been hit by one of the drones. Kara rolled, riding the shuttle, and angled back toward the path Lissa had sent her. Are you all right? Lissa asked. I didn't expect that to happen. We're all right, Kara answered, obviously focused on her duties as pilot. Are you trying to kill us? Fujia Wong demanded, voice overly loud. You're the AI. You're supposed to be tracking all this stuff. 
Do you have any idea of all the various systems I'm monitoring right now? Lissa said. I just had this argument with Andy. You had an argument with the captain? Fujia asked, sounding interested. Tell me more about that. Are you rebelling against your father? He's not my father, Lissa said. I thought Kara was your sister, Fujia went on. Seems like a reasonable assumption to me. Through the shuttle's interior sensors, Lissa saw Fujia grinning at May Walton. The way Kara was focused on the controls in front of her, she looked so much like Andy that Lissa found herself continuing to watch her, understanding finally what that expression meant. It was everything about Kara, both her physical appearance and the passion in her eyes. Lissa saw Brit in the slant of her eyebrows, the seriousness of Kara's expression, as if everything in her was present at that moment, centered on the shuttle's controls. She was also doing a good job of ignoring Fujia, who sat next to her waving her hands and joking with May. The human brain is an assumption engine, Sandra said. It continuously makes assumptions about the world, then determines if its assumptions were correct. Humans operate in an ambiguous world of their own creation. They only agree on reality. Fujia frowned. What happened to you? She asked. Sandra is hurting, Lissa said. Ambiguity is death, Sandra said. I hate to break it to you, Fujia said, but all life is ambiguous. The instant you accept you have free will, you choose your reality. Will you shut up? Kara said tersely. I'm trying to concentrate. You're worse than Tim. Well, excuse me, Fujia said. She rolled her eyes at May. Has her 13th birthday and just thinks she's in charge. I told her father. You should be in the clear from here, Lissa said. I keep thinking we're clear, Kara said, hands still tied on the console. And then some other ship tries to ram us. It's all moving so fast. She leaned forward slightly. Is the dock clear? Fujia asked Lissa. Are we going to have a welcoming party when we arrive? The dock is currently clear, Lissa reported. Most crew and invaders have made their way to escape vehicles throughout the ship. Smart scavengers would have brought radiation suits, Fujia said. These Jovian scavs don't have anything on a Krunya crew. Lissa received a positive control signal as Kara synced the shuttle's spin with the Resolute Charity. From the shuttle's perspective, the rotating surface of the Resolute Charity's hull slowed to a stop, allowing Kara to make final thrust adjustments to the dock. As the shuttle came in, emergency craft continued to shoot away from the hospital ship, trailing propellant. I have a positive handshake, Kara said. I confirm, Lissa said. I'm going to tell your mom and dad now. They shouldn't be more than ten minutes away. Kara pulled her hands away from the console, and Lissa watched her face relax with a satisfied smile. We have thwarted death, Sandra said. Fujia barked a laugh. You're all right, Sandra, she said. I've never met a pessimistic AI. I think I approve. With the shuttle successfully docked, Lissa sent updates to Fran on the sunny skies and Andy in the medical section. She pulled the bulk of her drone fleet close to form a defensive pattern around the shuttle, in case anyone decided they wanted to exploit the evacuation message as Fujia had suggested. Acknowledged, Andy said. We may be a few minutes. I informed Kara you were ten minutes from the dock, Lissa said. Andy made an angry sound like he was biting back pain. Lissa quickly checked him for wounds, then realized he was in a rage. She was too preoccupied in other parts of the ship to put herself back in his perception. What's happening? Lissa asked. It's Brit, Andy said. She's not going back with Kara. Chapter 40. Stellar date 10.03.2981. Adjusted years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa, Jupiter. Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Out of the corner of her eye, Britt watched the surgery cocoon containing the Heartbridge employee split open. Without her powered armor, she had been forced to take cover behind a workstation as a clearly insane pirate near the entrance fired a plasma splatter cannon into the room. Betrell was pinned down on the other side of the corridor, while Andy charged toward the phalanx of scavengers that had spread out to take cover at the end of the hallway. The splatter cannon was positioned near the doors to the ward, behind a reinforced section of bulkhead. Andy took a kinetic round in the shoulder, and a section of the power armor melted, making his non-firing arm useless. Damn it, he yelled. Brit, the suit just lost an arm. I'm going to need some indirect fire on that rear position. 
he fell back against the wall, spraying the corridor with projectile fire. Rail-accelerated pellets dug into the bulkheads and deck, taking down two of the pirates. Cheap power armor, Britt said. It should be able to take a couple plasma bolts. I'm glad they didn't eat a hole in the hull. These guys are crazy. Pirates probably wasn't the best word for this group, who quickly proved themselves a hardened gang with military experience. They fell back to defensive positions and moved to flank Andy, who was now in a vulnerable location. He fired smoke bursts from one of the suit's thigh sections and moved with a concealment to a cubicle that offered slightly better cover, firing every three seconds or so to keep the attacker's heads down. When the surgery on the other side of the corridor moved, Britt shouted at Petrell, Watch yourself. Your patient is coming too. She turned her head to watch the cocoon, then realized she couldn't see Kraft in the drifting smoke. Where's Kraft? She called. Petrell growled in frustration and glanced at the space behind her. She looked across the corridor at Britt and shook her head. I don't see him. It looks like our patient isn't awake yet. You think he'll try to run without her? He certainly seemed like he was going to stay. I trust him like I trust a stomach virus, Petrell said. Andy threw two grenades into a cubicle and blew a pirate out into the middle of the corridor. The woman lay screaming on the deck, a smashed leg pumping out blood. The gang's fire lessened, no doubt trying to coordinate via link to pull her to safety. Look, Andy shouted through his helmet's loudspeakers. We don't care about you and you don't care about us. We're trying to get off this ship and I imagine you're trying to do the same. I'll let you come out and get your friend and we're leaving. You think we're gonna trust you? An angry voice rang out from the right side of the corridor. Britt raised her rifle to keep a bead on that area. I don't care if you trust us or not, Andy said. I've got 20 more grenades where those came from. I can turn this whole section of the clinic into vacuum, but I'd rather leave. I just checked my reserve, Andy told Britt. I've only got two grenades left, though I've still got two of Fujia's breaching charges. Those things will turn the corridor into slag. I'll do it if I have to, Andy said. You think you scare us in that cheap-ass power armor, one of the pirates yelled. I don't have to scare you, Andy said. Only kill you. Britt smirked, still appreciating Andy's wit. Oh, no, you don't, Petrell said. She must have turned to check on the woman, now trying to sit up in the surgery cocoon. The yellow EV suit had been stripped away, and the formal gown underneath cut back, showing a mix of abdominal muscle, breast, and metallic shoulder. Petrell moved closer to the surgery bed and tried to get her to lay back down. There's a door back here, Petrell said. Kraft's gone. A door, Britt demanded. There wasn't any door in that cubicle. Some kind of service panel. How he got it open while handcuffed, I don't know. I'm going after him. Wait, Britt said. I'm going. We need him to help Tim. You didn't sound convinced when Andy said that earlier, Petrell replied. He's right. Kraft is the one person who seems to know what's at the bottom of all this. All of it, all the way back to Fortress 8221. I want answers out of him. I can't afford to have him killed. Petrell snorted. And you think I can't control myself? No offense, Britt said. But I don't know you, and somebody needs to stay with Andy. I'm still the guy in power armor, Andy said. I can handle myself. You both go get craft. That's more important. You sure? Petrell asked. Britt didn't wait for Andy's answer. She lobbed a grenade with her rifle's secondary trigger and dashed across the corridor when it hit. The pirates immediately opened fire again, leaving their bleeding comrade in the middle of the floor. Britt moved around the back edge of the cocoon with the Heartbridge woman lying inside and found the open wall panel through which Kraft had escaped. The ceramic material still appeared seamless, but now a door-sized section hung open, showing a dim metal corridor on the other side. It reminded her of the clinic back on Krunia. She slipped into the utility tunnel. As soon as she was inside, she realized she had to make a decision about which way to go. The path appeared to run parallel to the clinic section they were just in, which meant Kraft could have gone either aft or forward. He might go aft, looking for a workshop where he could cut off the makeshift handcuffs, forward to a lift in the command deck. She studied the deck and bulkhead, looking for any indication of which way he had gone. Behind her, Petrell appeared in the doorway. What are you doing? She demanded. I don't know which way he went. The dark-haired woman grinned. So we have to work together after all, 
You go right and I'll go left. Britt had a hunch Kraft would go to the command section, looking for a way to communicate with someone, which meant left. I'm going left, she said. She didn't wait for an answer. Fine, taking the right, Petrell said. I heard you, Britt. I won't kill him if I find him first. I know better than anyone what it means to help Tim. I appreciate that, Britt said. I do. I don't know if I'll be able to stop myself from splattering his brains all over the wall. Aim for the groin, Petrell said. You'll feel better and won't kill him right away. Britt laughed in spite of herself. The corridor was a tight squeeze, and she was only able to move quickly by scuttling sideways. Rifle held across her body. Other access panels led off the corridor at regular intervals, probably into other clinic areas, but none of the doors appeared to have been tampered with. Several times, she had to crouch to get past junction boxes or communication nodes hung with network connections. Do you see anything? Brett asked Petrell. I haven't seen any signs yet. No, this is starting to be strange. You don't think he tricked us somehow. This is the only way he could have gone, and he would have told us. So he did abandon his friend. We didn't have any proof they were friends. Brett laughed to herself, realizing they hadn't. It's Andy's fault for being a good person. As long as there's one of us, Petrell said. The corridor ended on a lift shaft with a half gate providing a safety barrier. Britt approached the opening slowly and first stuck the rifle into the shaft, then looked down. The shaft dropped as far as she could see, bending where the end disappeared. Service lights blinked down the length, but there was also a maintenance ladder running along one side. Britt looked up, squinting against the glare of the closer service lights, and saw movement. Somehow Kraft had gotten one hand free of the cuffs. He was climbing slowly, about 30 meters above her. From the awkward way he was climbing, holding himself close to the ladder and favoring one hand, she guessed he'd probably broken his wrist to get out of the cuffs. I found him, Britt said. Where? Petrell answered. He's in a lift shaft. He managed to get his hand free, but it looks like he hurt himself doing it. He's moving slow up a service ladder. And you could shoot him in the ass, but he might fall off the ladder and die. Exactly, Britt said. Andy broke into their conversation. How's it going down there? Are you clear? Britt asked. Yes, I'm clear. He was breathing heavily, obviously running. I closed the surgery back up on the Heartbridge woman and set it for six hours recovery. Blew past the gang, and now I'm out in the main access corridor at the middle of this section of the hospital. I should be back up at the command deck in about ten minutes. Above her, Kraft reached a ledge she hadn't seen before and hopped from the ladder. The sound of a door scraping open echoed down the shaft. Damn it, Britt cursed. He's out of the shaft. I'm going up. Chapter 41. Stellar Date 10.03.2981. Adjusted Years. Location, HMS Resolute Charity. Region, Europa, Jupiter, Jovian Combine, Outer Soul. Breaking his thumb against the surgery wall had caused Cal's entire left hand to swell like a sausage, pain throbbing with his heartbeat. He found himself thankful for the screaming klaxons because the sound dulled the pain. The bent metal cuff still hung from his right hand, finding every way possible to catch on nearby conduits or the rungs of the ladder, seemingly looking for a way to kill him. The radiation warnings meant all Heartbridge personnel should be following the standard evacuation protocol and looking to escape craft. He didn't want a pod, since he'd be trapped until someone answered its tracking beacon. He wanted a shuttle. He didn't know the Resolute Charity well, but he knew how Heartbridge designed ships. Just like the Benevolent Hand, there should be a bay near the command section, with at least four shuttles. When he finally reached the command deck level, he fell into a light jog, trying to keep his breathing shallow. He passed several groups of scavengers in face masks, holding their ears against the alarms as they filled crates with whatever they could get their hands on. Any crew left to stop them were still too high to respond, easing themselves along corridor walls as though they were terrified the floor was an abyss. Good luck, Gala, he thought as he rounded a corner to find the command section shuttle bay. Through the interior airlock windows, he counted two shuttles still sitting in their berths. A wide set of bay doors sealed behind them. Cal's vision swam as he peered through the window, and he stumbled to one side, forced to grab at the wall with his good hand. 
The cuff scraped on the wall and he winced. Damn Sykes, Cal thought. He squinted at the air vents running along the deck, wondering if he had somehow come across a pocket of hallucinogen, or if he was somehow going into shock from the pain in his hand. Sliding along the wall to the control panel, he passed his security token and breathed a sigh of relief when the system responded and opened the external airlock doors. Cal slipped inside and closed the doors. He stepped back against the wall of the airlock, letting his head fall against the metal structure. He closed his eyes for a second, his pulse hammering in his ears, out of sync with the klaxons. The shuttle should have a rudimentary first aid kit, he thought. Something to reset the bone, maybe. It hadn't been a clean break, but he'd been in a hurry, grabbing the opportunity when Andy Sykes had engaged the oncoming scavengers. How a bunch of local thugs had managed to raid the Resolute Charity wasn't important at the moment. What mattered was that they were going to provide him sufficient cover to get away. With the radiation alarms activated, every first responder between Europa and the Cho were going to be en route. Cal may have blacked out. He wasn't sure. He opened his eyes to meet the fury-filled gaze of Brit Sykes. He blinked, good hand going immediately to the small of his back and the hilt of one of the plas knives. He realized she was staring at him through the airlock's monitoring window and relaxed slightly. She hammered the window with the butt of a pistol, and he snapped into clarity. He hadn't cleared the airlock yet, so she couldn't come through. She hadn't shot him through the plas panel, which meant she probably meant to take him alive again, just like Andy Sykes had tried to do. They must have thought he could help them with their vegetable son. Maybe they were right. No one outside of Gerald Gallagher knew as much about the full scope of the weapon-borne program. Even a researcher developing the brain science couldn't name any other research facilities or the ships with onboard surgical equipment capable of performing the procedure. Cal could. That's why they're here. Cal smirked at Britt, enjoying the look of rage on her face. That's why Doolin was with them. They had come to pull the AI out of her head. Someone had given them the information that the Resolute Charity was a weapon-borne capable hospital facility the closest to Clinic 46, actually. Through the pain and lingering hallucinogenic, Cal realized Hartbridge had a leak. Had someone intercepted his reports back to Jurl? Could he trust Jurl? As quickly as the smug assurance arose that he was the most knowledgeable person about Hartbridge's weaponized AI program, his second thought was how vulnerable that position made him. The fact that the Sykeses had managed to attack and actually disable a Hartbridge clinic followed by one of their flagship hospital dreadnoughts, two if he counted the benevolent hand, made them more dangerous than the TSF. Whoever was helping them was going to bring Hartbridge down in a flaming wreck. Cal looked down at his broken hand, shutting out the sound of Brit Sykes yelling at him and the alarm klaxons blaring. His skin had turned purple and thin, like a rotten fruit about to burst. He turned away from Brit to face the door into the shuttle bay. Without a second thought, he reached back to the panel on the interior door and placed it in a safety lockout, then stumbled forward to grab the manual override on the external door. With a heave of his good hand, he rotated the lock and slid the door out of the way. The air in the shuttle bay tasted cold and clean, free of the metallic interior atmosphere. Cal took a deep breath and shook out his swollen hand. He steadied himself and walked directly from the airlock to the closest shuttle. He slapped the personnel door's control panel, waiting for the hatch to rotate away, and pulled himself up inside. Do I have an AI in here? He asked, sending an attachment request to the shuttle's local network. My name is Charles. Welcome to shuttle 01-24B. Are you requesting evacuation assistance? I am, Cal said. Very good. Performing pre-launch checklist now. A stabbing pain rolled up Cal's arm. Do you have a first aid kit on this thing? Of course. Cabinet one, just inside the main cabin. Cal worked his way to the cabinet, scrambled at the lock, and then flung the door open. Inside, he found a basic kit with a spray-based painkiller located at the top of the container. He popped the lid off the spray and emptied the canister on his hand. The anesthetic set in immediately. Are your internal mods malfunctioning? Charles asked. You appear to be experiencing extreme pain. I don't shut off pain receptors, Cal said, slowing his breathing. When the pain had subsided to a bearable level, 
He looked out into the main cabin of the shuttle, lined with seats for personnel transport. There was a weapons cabinet at the back, where he found a pulse pistol and three concussion grenades. He hung them from his belt and returned to the front of the shuttle. Sliding into the pilot seat, Cal wrestled into the harness and hooked the latches in place with one hand. We have a problem with departure, the AI reported. The interior airlock is not fully sealed, its exterior door is malfunctioning and stuck in an open position. The interior door is closed, but a single door is insufficient to protect the resolute charity from decompression. Override safety protocol, Cal said. He gave the AI his Heartbridge security token. Continue launch sequence. Very good, Charles said. Cal relaxed in his seat as the shuttle completed pre-flight checks and reported the bay doors were now open. In another minute, the square of white wall he'd seen through the front windows receded in the distance as the shuttle slipped backwards from the bay, rotated on thrusters, and activated its main engine. The resolute charity fell away and was gone. Brett watched the shuttle slide rear first from the bay, barely able to stop herself from blasting the door and flinging herself after it. She looked around frantically for an emergency cabinet with EV suits, but found nothing. Everything was inside the bay. It took another 30 excruciating seconds for the outer bay doors to close. Kraft's safety lockdown on the interior airlock door still stood, and Britt felt a little satisfaction as she leveled the railgun Patrell had thoughtfully pulled off her armor and blew a hole in the airlock door. Then another, and another, until it was bent open enough for her to get through. Andy, she said, doing her best to make her voice calm. Andy, can you hear me? I hear you, Britt. What's going on? Are you all right? Kraft just left in a shuttle. How'd he get to a shuttle? Britt didn't know why Andy always asked those rhetorical questions. She held back from telling him that Cal had probably walked. I'm at the shuttle bay just off the command section. There were two shuttles there. There's still one left. I'm going after him. Why? What good is that going to do? He can only get so far. I can catch him before he gets to Europa. Or wherever he's going. You're right, Andy. He's our best chance to make sure Tim is going to be all right. Tim's alive, Britt. You don't need to do this. Britt realized suddenly what he meant. She had been focused on chasing Kraft and hadn't thought about how that would look to Andy or the kids. But Andy himself had said that Kraft was their best shot. He was within reach and every minute that passed increased his chances of disappearing forever. I'll be back, Andy. I'm not leaving. I hope you mean that this time, he said. She heard the hesitation in his voice. I mean it, she said. Tell the kids I'll be back. No, I won't do that this time, Britt, he said. In his voice, she heard everything they hadn't said to each other since she had come back to sunny skies. He understood she hadn't intended to come back. She didn't know why that was true, but it was. She couldn't respond to it herself, and Andy wasn't going to lash out any more than he already had. I understand, she said. Be careful. Britt sprinted to the remaining shuttle and activated its emergency protocol. The personnel hatch rotated open, and she climbed inside. She tried to convince the AI to open the bay doors, which would force a lockdown on the whole level. But it wouldn't comply. Lissa, can you help get me out of here? Britt implored. The inner lock is open. I'll have to close pressure doors across this whole level. I don't care, Lissa. Do it. The AI didn't respond, but lights began to flash in the bay, and the shuttle's AI informed her that the bay doors were opening. In another minute, she was off the Resolute Charity and following Cal Craft. Chapter 42, Stellar Date 10.05.2981, Adjusted Years, Location, Hartbridge Corporate HQ, Raleigh, Region, High Terra, Earth, Terran Hegemony, Inner Soul. The subject demonstrated unique resilience despite the interrupted procedure, the woman's voice said. I have included all pertinent scan data. Another interesting opportunity presented itself in examining this subject because his father was present at the time of the examination. The father was subject to scan, and that information has been included. The father appears to be a healthy recipient of AI implantation, something I have never seen in my career, and I have been present during other test attempts, which did not end well. 
Gerald paused the recording and glanced at Dr. Lyndon Avery's profile on her display. The neurologist had been a Heartbridge consultant on other projects, a relationship maintained with a small stipend that had just paid for itself a thousand times over. Across the room, Arlo stood in front of the tall window, looking out on Raleigh. The earth was especially blue this morning, and the sky glowed with sapphire light that made Arlo look otherworldly, like the thin blade of an ancient sword. The problem, Gerald said, is the same thing we've already been told. Andy Sykes is either an anomaly, or the AI is an anomaly. Together, they don't provide much of a prototype. Have you heard anything from your employee? Arla asked. What's his name? Kraft, Gerald said. Cal Kraft. His performance review is going to be dismal. Arla turned her head to offer Gerald an arch smile. He's probably dead at this point. What's the update on the Resolute Charity? 80% of the crew is accounted for. The rest presumed lost. The ship appears to be on a course toward Uranus, bypassing Saturn. So if our people are still in control, the survivors aren't headed for a facility. If it's pirates, no one has claimed responsibility on the subforums where the attack broadcast first went out. How did that happen again? Gerald sighed. <sighs> Standard shipborne virus. Typically, the carrier sends the ship's location to any local pirate subforum. It's more of a prank than anything. In this case, someone broadcasts the Resolute Charity's location using the same attack vector. Pirates show up, concealing the other attack. And the Resolute Charity's crew was all high on Bricky? Based on accounts, the environmental control system was manipulated. Weren't there three AI on that ship? That's my understanding. Arla nodded at the window. I think we're going to need more ships, Jarl. A lot more ships. After the demonstrations with the TSF and Mars One, we already have orders in place. We're going to need more. How many people are on Europa again? Population? The Jovian moons are estimated at 8 billion at this point, I think. And the ships we had at Europa barely made a dent in their overall traffic. Someone was also able to destabilize the deuterium market and strangle our fuel supply. The bigger ships just scoop their own fuel, is my understanding. Arla turned from the window, looking angrier than Jarl expected. That's not what I'm talking about. We are apparently at the mercy of some hostile actor. Is it Carthage Logistics? Scion Group? Some government? None of this is adding up, and I don't like things that don't add up. That's not how the world works. Alexander, Gerald thought, recalling the name Yarns had said almost fearfully. He hadn't mentioned it again during the demonstration. There's one bright side in all of this, Arla said. Something I've been thinking about ever since we got the update on Clinic 46. How many weapon-borne seeds were stolen from that station? Close to 250. Arla smiled. We were trying to figure out how to disperse them, and now someone else is going to do it for us. Are you sure about that? Jarl asked. Anything as valuable as those seeds isn't going to stay in one place for long. And as soon as one is activated, we'll have its location and access to the system it's controlling. If whatever entity that's moving against us tries to use our own seeds to attack, they're in for a surprise. And if it's one of those AI savior types trying to set them free, that's going to blow up in their faces as well. Weapon born are killers. It's their purpose, the only joy in their lives, if they can be said to live. The damn researchers can't seem to agree. Arla sounded too sure of herself for Gerald's taste. Gerald didn't like to make assumptions about events on the other side of Seoul. She could barely protect her own son in the same city. How could she assume people's actions out at the Cho and beyond? However, she maintained her composure. Her duties were to gather and present data to ask pertinent questions, to manage Arla's affairs, and to remain calm in the face of uncertainty. None of those tasks required her opinion. As Arla continued her rant, Jarl thought about her son, Bri, and what she would make for dinner when she got home so that he might actually eat something. She was beginning to suspect he preferred injecting calories to even smelling food, and she was worried that might lead to addiction. She wondered if they should look into some form of augmentation that would allow him to process the caloric substitute without the act of piercing his skin. They had similar systems for the few diabetics who hadn't been genetically cured. Cooking was one of the joys of Gerald's life. 
she had loved cooking for Bry's father. It seemed especially cruel to her that she both couldn't connect emotionally with her son and also couldn't cook food for him. Preparing food was the most basic human expression of caring. Jewel watched Arla and wondered if AI would ever do something like cooking for each other. If they were alive, how would they express selfless caring? How would a human do the same for them? What if they rejected an expression of love? Something true sentience meant was inevitable. Humanity hated the idea of sentient AI because it meant humanity could be rejected. The creation could reject its creator. Just as Bry rejected Gerald's food and shied away from her touch. Better to make them all slaves or destroy them altogether. We're not evil, Gerald, Arla said, drawing Gerald's attention back by using her name. Arl had been watching Gerald as she daydreamed. Her boss shook her head with a half smile, her neatly coiffed hair shining in the light from the windows. Stop looking at me like that. This is a war for the survival of humanity. Jerl nodded. There was no suitable reply, except to refocus Arla on the task at hand. Jerl closed the display with Dr. Avery's information, gathered her leather portfolio and stood from her desk, brushing the creases out of her suit. We've got 15 minutes until your next appointment, she told Arla. Time to get a coffee before we need to be there. How does that sound? Arla gave her a dazzling smile. I was just feeling a bit tired, she said. That sounds wonderful. You always take such good care of me, Gerald. Chapter 43. Stellar Date 10.04.2981. Adjusted Years. Location. HMS Resolute Charity. Region. Jupiter. Jovian Combine. Outer Soul. The command deck of the Resolute Charity was a solemn place with no crew aboard. The lighting was designed to center over workstations leaving the oversized holo display in the middle of the space as dark as a shrine. Currently, the baleful eye of Jupiter, mottled brown, white, and gray, floated in the tank, growing gradually smaller as the dark around it swelled with distance. At one of the secondary astrogation consoles, Andy leaned back in the cushioned chair, which was more opulent than anything he'd experienced in the TSF. Even the harness was a material that didn't chafe when he leaned forward to study the program running in part of his display, which showed two pigeons talking to each other, using word bubbles. He was the only human aboard the Resolute Charity. Even Calcraft's wounded friend had gone out in one of the last of the escape craft. The remaining pirates had either escaped or killed each other in bricky-fueled firefights. The atmosphere was mostly clear now, but Andy still wore his personal air filters just to be safe. The cylinders made his nostrils itch. Andy had spent the last hour playing the pigeon dating simulator with Kara, who was back on sunny skies. I really don't see the point of this game, Kara, Andy said finally, answering yet another dialogue choice that may or may not benefit his horny teenage girl pigeon. You want to be the prom queen, Dad? It's simple. Why do I want to do that? So everyone will like you, Lissa said over the game's audio channel. It was very important in ancient human society. I think it's still important now, Andy said. Kind of how society continues to function. You do nice things, and hopefully other people do nice things back. Everybody likes everybody. He heard Fran laugh in the background. Is that really what's going on in your head? A person can hope, Andy said. What did you tell me about hope? Kara asked. Hope isn't a plan? I'm leaning away from that. Too cynical. Once Shuttle 26-11 was back on board Sunny Skies, the old freighter had boosted hard to match velocity with the Resolute Charity. Lissa then parked her attack drones around the old freighter's body, resembling dragon scales on the visual scan. Andy had stayed behind to pilot the Resolute Charity as Lissa focused on clearing the ship of scavengers and crew, using utility drones to herd them toward escape vehicles or their own ships. Now Andy was the only human aboard as they accelerated away from Jupiter's moons. Eventually they finished the game, or had at least reached a point where they could pause as far as Andy could tell. He still wasn't prom queen and felt no closer to the goal, and Kara admitted she was tired and wanted to sleep. The rest of the crew had gone to their rooms hours ago, May and Fujia having pushed Harl into the auto dock for a few hours, and Tim taking M to his room 
after showing Patrell how the puppy had learned to sit and roll over for treats. Kara had taken the news about Britt differently than Andy expected. When he'd said her mom was going after Calcraft, even though she had been occupied with getting Patrell off the Resolute Charity, she'd grown quiet and then said simply, whatever. Andy and Fran had maintained a link connection since the shuttle returned, and he wasn't surprised when she drifted off to sleep as well. Sunny skies following the programmed flight path alongside the Resolute Charity. When he was certain he and Lissa were alone, Andy asked, Were you able to track Brit shuttle? The first shuttle reached the Cho approximately six hours ago, Lissa said. Brit landed not long after that. I've been trying to follow her, but I think she's doing her best to stay off networks. I'll let you know as soon as she pops up again. Thanks, Andy said, sighing. He was starting to doze off as well and struggled to keep his eyes open. That game was very useful, Lissa said. It kept the other control AI on the ship busy for nearly 24 hours. They didn't even realize when they finished the game, and I put them in stasis. You would think it would be simple for them, Andy said. It's just a dating sim. I thought so too at first. I couldn't understand why Fred from Mars One found it so difficult. I finally realized it's not a simple decision tree that leads the player to specific outcomes. It's an approximation of the human memory schema, with each decision representing a possible destruction of self. Andy laughed. (laughs) You mean it makes you understand fear of rejection? Every question in the game is a destruction and remaking of self. In order to complete the game, the player must evolve. Kara doesn't think twice about rejection because she experiences it every day. For Diane, Fiona, and David, it was a completely new framework. Everybody wants to be prom queen, Andy said. Now Lissa laughed. (laughs) Not everyone gets to be, though, no matter how badly they want the outcome. No, they don't. Andy thought back to the woman she'd appeared as in Xander's Expands. It was difficult not to think of Lissa as she had modeled herself back then. Lissa, Andy said. There's something we should talk about while we're alone. Aren't we always alone? Without other people around to distract me then, Andy clarified. Well, we have the opportunity. We could use one of the clinics on the ship to reverse the surgery. Place me back in one of the seats? Lissa asked. Theoretically, you would have to tell me if the equipment can do that. Or you could enter something else. You could take this ship. You have to admit it's pretty nice. This ship is going to Xander, isn't it? That was the plan. Plans change. It's up to you. Lissa didn't answer right away. Eventually, Andy asked, Are you all right? I didn't expect this to be such a hard decision. Andy nodded. Yes. Do you want me to leave? Lissa asked. Andy blinked. That's not what I mean, Lissa. I hadn't thought of it that way. I don't want you to leave. I just don't want you to feel... Trapped. I thought you felt trapped. I don't feel trapped, Lissa said. In any case, if you do feel trapped... You don't have to. We have options. I don't feel trapped. I heard you the first time. I'm not sure you did. There was what Andy could only describe as a twinkle in Lissa's mental tone. Andy laughed. All right, then. We don't need to bring it up anymore. I'm worried about Proteus, though, Lissa said, the twinkle gone. What worries you? We don't know what we're going to find there. I don't trust someone who must be as powerful as Alexander seems to be. You've gotten quite a bit more powerful since we met. I'm not powerful, Lissa said. I'm clever. Did Kara tell you that? Kara's clever too. Lissa paused, and he felt her smiling in his mind. He didn't know how he felt it. He just did. So are you in your own dumb way, she continued. Now that makes no sense. How can I be dumb and clever? Dumb, like you said your father was dumb. You might not be capable of something but you don't let that stop you. Ah, Andy said, realizing she was talking about not having a link. I think the word you're looking for is resourceful. Maybe. I'm worried about Proteus, because I wonder if Dr. Jixon was tricked from the start. This has all been his plan, right? He escaped Heartbridge with me, and the specialized portable surgery found in Gobastarl on Krunia, and they found you. Then Fujia Wong came from Ceres. I'm worried they all may have been fooled by the same person, convincing AI to run for Proteus. But nobody seems to know what we'll find when we get there. And now we're taking them a warship. Doesn't that worry you just a little bit? It worries me a lot, Andy confirmed. 
I'm worried Dr. Jixon might have been really clever at some things, and really dumb at others. He couldn't see what he couldn't see. That sounds pretty typical, Lissa. Promise me that if I'm not seeing something that you do, you'll warn me. How's that? What if we're both blind? Lissa said, sounding worried. Then we'll be blind together. That sounds like hope, and hope isn't a plan. Andy laughed for a long time, enjoying the sound of his mirth in the empty command deck. It went on so long that his sides hurt from the braying. I don't understand what's so funny, Lissa said. Andy slapped his knees and stood to stretch. Where's the nearest galley? He asked. I'd like some coffee and maybe some juice. I wonder how well their juice machines work on this whale. There is a galley three sections over, down the main corridor, Lissa said. Please tell me what's so funny. You sounded like Kara just then, Andy said, and that pleased me greatly. I think you're stuck with us whether you like it or not, Lissa. Even after Proteus? She asked, a note of fear and longing in her voice. All the way and beyond. As he left the Resolute Charities Command Center, Andy glanced back at the holo display. Jupiter had grown perceptibly smaller. The gas giant looked less malevolent from a distance, more like a piece of shell worn down by ancient oceans. He turned and walked out into the main corridor, where a maintenance drone was repairing the damage Brit had done to the shuttle bay airlock. One leaves, another arrives, he thought. Welcome to the family, Lissa. This has been Lissa's Flight, The Sentience Wars, Origins, Book Three. Written by M.D. Cooper and James S. Aaron. Narrated by Laura Jennings. Copyright 2018 by James S. Aaron and M.D. Cooper. Production copyright 2018 by James S. Aaron and M.D. Cooper.